Section 39 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 43. Louis the Fourteenth, the Fronde, and the Government of Cardinal Mazarin. Part 2. There was already a great tumult in the streets when he arrived at the Palais Royal. The people were shouting, quote, Bruxelles, Bruxelles, end quote. The coadjutor was accompanied by Marshal La Mairet, and both of them reported the excitement amongst the people. The queen grew angry, quote, There is revolt in imagining that there can be revolt, she said. These are the ridiculous stories of those who desire it. The king's authority will soon restore order, end quote. Then, as old Monsieur de Guiteau, who had just come in, supported the coadjutor, and said that he did not understand how anybody could sleep in the state in which things were, the cardinal asked him, with some slight irony, quote, Well, Monsieur de Guiteau, and what is your advice? Quote, My advice, said Guiteau, is to give up that old rascal of a Bruxelles, dead or alive. Quote, the former, replied the coadjutor, would not accord with either the queen's piety or her prudence. The latter might stop the tumult. End quote. At this word, the queen blushed, and exclaimed, quote, I understand you, Mr. Coadjutor, and you would have me set Broussel at liberty. I would strangle him with these hands first. Quote, and as she finished the last syllable, she put them close to my face, says de Retz, adding, And those who... The cardinal advanced and whispered in her ear. End quote. Advices of a more and more threatening character continued to arrive, and at last it was resolved to promise that Broussel should be set at liberty, provided that the people dispersed and ceased to demand it tumultuously. The coadjutor was charged to proclaim this concession throughout Paris. He asked for a regular order, but was not listened to. Quote, the queen had retired to her little grey room. Monseigneur pushed me very gently with his two hands, saying, Restore the peace of the realm. Marshal Maillaret drew me along, and so I went out with my Rochet and Camel, bestowing benedictions right and left. But this occupation did not prevent me from making all the reflections suitable to the difficulty in which I found myself. The impetuosity of Marshal Maillaret did not give me opportunity to weigh my expressions. He advanced sword in hand, shouting with all his might, Hurrah for the King! Liberation for Bruxelles! As he was seen by many more folks than heard him, he provoked with his sword far more people than he appeased with his voice. End quote. The tumult increased. There was a rush to arms on all sides. The coadjutor was felled to the ground by a blow from a stone. He had just picked himself up when a burgess put his musket to his head. Quote, Though I did not know him a bit, says Retz, I thought it would not be well to let him suppose so at such a moment. On the contrary, I said to him, Ah, oh, wretch, if thy father saw thee! He thought I was the best friend of his father, on whom, however, I had never set eyes. End quote. The coadjutor was recognized, and the crowd pressed round him, dragging him to the market place. He kept repeating everywhere that quote, the queen promised to restore Bruxelles. End quote. The flippers laid down their arms, and thirty or forty thousand men accompanied him to the Palais Royal. Quote, said Marshal Maillaret as he entered, "Here is he to whom I owe my life, and your Majesty the safety of the Palais Royal." End quote. The queen began to smile. Quote, the marshal flew into a passion and said with an oath, Madame, no proper man can venture to flatter you in the state in which things are, and if you do not this very day set Bruxelles at liberty, tomorrow there will not be left one stone upon another in Paris. I wished to speak in support of what the marshal said, but the queen cut me short, saying with an air of raillery, Go and rest yourself, sir, you have worked very hard. End quote. The coadjutor left the Palais Royal, quote, in what is called a rage, end quote and he was in a greater one in the evening when his friends came and told him that he was being made fun of at the queen's supper-table that she was convinced that he had done all he could to increase the tumult that he would be the first to be made a great example of and that the parliament was about to be interdicted paul de gondy had not waited for their information to think of revolt quote, i did not reflect as to what i could do says he for i was quite certain of that i reflected only as to what i ought to do and i was perplexed End quote. The jests and the threats of the court appeared to him to be sufficient justification. Quote, what effectually stopped my scruples was the advantage I imagined I had in distinguishing myself from those of my profession by a state of life in which there was something of all professions. In disorderly times, things lead to a confusion of species, and the vices of an archbishop may, in an infinity of conjunctures, be the virtues of a party leader. End quote. 
The coadjutor recalled his friends. Quote, we are not in such bad case as you supposed, gentlemen, he said to them. There is an intention of crushing the public. It is for me to defend it from oppression. Tomorrow, before midday, I shall be master of Paris. End quote. For some time past, the coadjutor had been laboring to make himself popular in Paris. The general excitement was only waiting to break out, and when the Chancellor's carriage appeared in the streets in the morning, on the way to the Palace of Justice, the people, secretly worked upon during the night, all at once took up arms again. The Chancellor had scarcely time to seek refuge in the Hotel de Luynes. The mob rushed in after him, pillaging and destroying the furniture, whilst the Chancellor, flying for refuge into a small chamber, and believing his last hour had come, was confessing to his brother, the Bishop of Meaux. He was not discovered, and the crowd moved off in another direction. Quote, it was like a sudden and violent conflagration lighted up from the Pont Neuf over the whole city. Everybody without exception took up arms. Children of five and six years of age were seen dagger in hand, and the mothers themselves carried them. In less than two hours they were in Paris more than two hundred barricades, bordered with flags and all the arms that the League had left entire. Everybody cried, Hurrah for the king, but the echo answered, None of your Mazarin. End quote. The coadjutor kept himself shut up at home, protesting his powerlessness. The Parliament had met at an early hour. The Palace of Justice was surrounded by an immense crowd, shouting, quote, Brussel, Brussel. End quote. The Parliament resolved to go in a body and demand of the Queen the release of their members arrested the day before. Quote, we set out in full court, says the Premier President Mollet, without sending, as the custom is, to ask the Queen to appoint a time, the ushers in front with their square caps and a foot. From this spot, as far as the Trawar Cross, we found the people in arms and barricades thrown up at every hundred paces. End quote. Memoir de Mathieu Mollet, page 255. Quote, if it were not blasphemy to say that there was any one in our age more intrepid than the great Gustavus and the prince, I should say it was Monsieur Mollet, Premier President, writes Cardinal Loretz. Sincerely devoted to the public weal, and a magistrate to the very bottom of his soul, Mollet nevertheless inclined towards the side of power, and understood better than his brethren the danger of factions. He represented to the Queen the extreme danger the sedition was causing to Paris and to France. Quote, she, who feared nothing because she knew but little, flew into a passion and answered furiously, I am quite aware that there is disturbance in the city, but you shall answer to me for it, gentlemen of the Parliament, you, your wives, and your children. Quote, the Queen was pleased, says Mollet, in his dignified language, to signify in terms of wrath that the magisterial body should be answerable for the evils which might ensue, and which the King on reaching his majority would remember. End quote. The Queen had retired to her room, slamming the door violently. The Parliament turned back to the Palace of Justice. The angry mob thronged about the magistrates. When they arrived at Rue Saint-Honoré, just as they were about to turn on to the Pont Neuf, a band of armed men fell upon them, quote, and a cookshop lad, advancing at the head of two hundred men, thrust his halberd against the Premier President's stomach, saying, Turn, traitor, and if thou wouldst not thyself be slain, give up to us Bruxelles, or Mazarin and the Chancellor as hostages, end quote. Matthew Mollet quietly put the weapon aside and said, quote, You forget yourself, he said, and are oblivious of the respect you owe to my office. Quote, Thrice an effort was made to thrust me into a private house, says his account in his memoir, but I still kept my place, and attempts having been made with swords and pistols on all sides of me to make an end of me, God would not permit it, some of the members, or monsieur, and some true friends having placed themselves in front of me. I told President de Mem that there was no other plan but to return to the Palais Royal, and thither take back the body, which was much diminished in numbers, five of the presidents having dropped away, and also many of the members on whom the people had inflicted unworthy treatment. Quote, Thus, having given himself time to rally as many as he could of the body, and still preserving the dignity of the magistracy both in his words and in his movements, the Premier President returned at a slow pace to the Palais Royal, amidst a running fire of insults, threats, execrations, and blasphemies. End quote. Memoir de Retz. The whole court had assembled in the gallery. Mollet spoke first. Quote, this man, says Retz, had a sort of eloquence peculiar to himself. He knew nothing of apostrophes, he was not correct in his language, but he spoke with a force which made up for all that, and he was naturally so bold that he never spoke so well as in the midst of peril. Monsieur made as if he would throw himself on his knees before the Queen, who remained inflexible. Four or five princesses, who were trembling with fear, did throw themselves at her feet. 
The Queen of England, who had come that day from Saint-Germain, represented that the troubles had never been so serious at their commencement in England, nor the feelings so heated or united. End quote. Histoire du temps, 1647-1648. Archive Curieuse, page 162. At last the cardinal made up his mind. He, quote, had been roughly handled in the queen's presence by the presidents and councillors in their speeches, some of them telling him in mockery that he had only to give himself the trouble of going as far as the Pont Neuf to see for himself the state in which things were, end quote. And he joined with all those present in entreating Anne of Austria. Finally, the release of Bruxelles was extorted from her, quote, not without a deep sigh, which showed what violence she did her feelings in the struggle. Quote, we returned in full court by the same road, says Matthew Mollet, and the people demanding, with confused clamor of voices, whether Monsieur Broussel were at liberty, we gave them assurances thereof, and entered by the back door of my lodging. Before crossing the threshold, I took leave of Presidents de Mem and Le Coigneux, and waited until the members had passed, testifying my sentiments of gratitude for that they had been unwilling to separate until they had seen to the security of my person, which I had not at all deserved, but such was their good pleasure. After this business, which had lasted from six in the morning until seven o'clock, there was need of rest, seeing that the mind had been agitated amidst so many incidents, and not a morsel had been tasted. End quote. Memoir de Mathieu Mollet, page 265. Broussel had taken his seat in the Parliament again. The Prince of Condé had just arrived in Paris. He did not like the Cardinal, but he was angry with the Parliament, which he considered imprudent and insolent. Quote, they are going ahead, said he. If I were to go ahead with them, I should perhaps do better for my own interests, but my name is Louis de Bourbon, and I do not wish to shake the throne. These devils of square caps, are they mad about bringing me either to commence a civil war before long, or to put a rope round their own necks, and place over their heads and over mine own, an adventurer from Sicily, who will be the ruin of us all in the end? I will let the Parliament plainly see that they are not where they suppose, and that it would not be a hard matter to bring them to reason." End quote. The coadjutor, to whom he thus expressed himself, answered that, quote, the cardinal might possibly be mistaken in his measures, and that Paris would be a hard nut to crack. End quote. Whereupon the prince rejoined angrily, quote, it will not be taken, like Dunkirk, by mining and assaults, but if the bread of Gonesse were to fail them for a week. End quote. The coadjutor took the rest as said. Some days afterwards, during the night between the 5th and 6th of January, 1649, the Queen, with a little king and the whole court, set out at four a.m. from Paris for the castle of Saint-Germain, empty, unfurnished, as was then the custom in the king's absence, where the courtiers had great difficulty in finding a bundle of straw. Quote, the Queen had scarcely a bed to lie upon, says Mademoiselle de Montpensier, but never did I see any creature so gay as she was that day. Had she won a battle, taken Paris, and had all who had displeased her hanged, she could not have been more so, and nevertheless she was very far from all that. End quote. Paris was left to the malcontents. Everybody was singing, quote, A frondly wind got up today, gainst Mazarin, it howls, they say. End quote. On the 8th of January, the Parliament of Paris, all the chambers in assembly, issued a decree whereby Cardinal Mazarin was declared an enemy to the king and the state, and a disturber of the public peace, and injunctions were laid upon all subjects of the king to hunt him down. War was declared. Scarcely had it begun when the greatest lords came flocking to the popular side. On the departure of the court for Saint-Germain, the Duchess of Longueville had remained in Paris. Her husband and her brother, the Prince of Conti, were not slow in coming to look after her. And already the Duke of Elbeuf, of the House of Lorraine, had offered his services to the Parliament. Levies of troops were beginning in the city, and the command of the forces was offered to the Prince of Conti. The Dukes of Bouillon and Beaufort, and Marshal de la Motte, likewise embraced the party of revolt. The Duchesses of Longueville and Bouillon established themselves with their children at the Hôtel de Ville as hostages given by the Fronde of Princes to the Fronde of the People. The Parliaments of Esch and Rouen made common cause with that of Paris. A decree ordered the seizure, in all the exchequers of the kingdom, of the royal monies, in order that they might be employed for the general defence. Every evening Paris wore a festive air. There was dancing at the Hôtel de Ville, and the gentlemen who had been skirmishing during the day around the walls came for recreation in the society of the princesses. Quote, this commingling of blue scarfs, of ladies, of cuirasses, of violins in the hall, and of trumpets in the square offered a spectacle which is oftener seen in romances than elsewhere. Memoir du Cardinal de Retz. 
Affairs of gallantry were mixed up with the most serious resolves. Madame de Longueville was of the Fronde because she was in love with Monsieur de Marcillac, afterwards Duke of La Rochefoucauld, and he was on bad terms with Cardinal Mazarin. Meanwhile, war was rumbling round Paris. The post of Charenton, fortified by the Frondeurs, had been taken by the Prince of Condé at the head of the King's troops. The Parliament was beginning to perceive its mistake, and desired to have peace again, but the great lords engaged in the contest aspired to turn it to account. They had already caused the gates of Paris to be closed against a herald sent by the Queen to recall her subjects to their duty. They were awaiting the army of Germany, commanded by M. de Turenne, whom his brother, the Duke of Bouillon, had drawn into his culpable enterprise. Nay, more, they had begun to negotiate with Spain, and they brought up to the Parliament a pretended envoy from Archduke Leopold, but the court refused to receive him. Quote, what, sir, said President de Mem, turning to the Prince of Conti, is it possible that a prince of the blood of France should propose to give a seat upon the fleur de lis to a deputy from the most cruel enemy of the fleur de lis End quote. The Parliament sent a deputation to the Queen, and conferences were opened at Ruel on the 4th of March. The great lords of the Fronde took no part in it. Quote, they contented themselves with having at Saint-Germain low-voiced, or a bas note, secret agents, says Madame de Motteville, commissioned to negotiate in their favour. Paris was beginning to lack bread. It was festival time, and want began to make itself felt. A, quote, complaint of the carnival, end quote, was current amongst the people. Quote, in my extreme affliction yet, I can this consolation get, that at his hands my enemy, old Lent, will fare the same as I, that at the times when people eat, we both shall equal worship meet, thus joining with the whole of France, in war against him a outrance. Grim Lent and festive carnival will fight against the cardinal. End quote. It was against the cardinal, in fact, that all attacks were directed, but the queen remained immovable in her fidelity. Quote, I should be afraid, she said to Madame de Motteville, that if I were to let him fall, the same thing would happen to me that happened to the King of England. Charles I had just been executed. And that after he had been driven out, my turn would come. End quote. Grain had found its way into Paris during the truce, and when on the 13th of March the Premier President Mollet and the other negotiators returned to Paris, bringing the peace which they had signed at Ruel, they were greeted with furious shouts, quote, None of your peace, none of your Mazarin. We must go to Saint-Germain to seek our good king. We must fling into the river all the Mazarin. End quote. A rioter had just laid his hand on the Premier President's arm, quote, when you have killed me, said the latter calmly, I shall only want six feet of earth, end quote. and when he was advised to get back into his house by way of the record offices, quote, the court never hides itself, he said, if I were certain to perish I would not commit this poltroonery, which, moreover, would but serve to give courage to the rioters. They would, of course, come after me to my house if they thought that I shrank from them here, end quote. The deputies of the Parliament were sent back to Ruel, taking a statement of the claims of the great lords, quote, according to their memorials, they demanded the whole of France, end quote. Memoire de Madame de Motteville, page 247. End of section 39. Section 40 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter 43. Louis XIV, The Fronde, and the Government of Cardinal Mazarin, Part 3. Whilst Paris was in disorder, and the agitation, through its example, was spreading over almost the whole of France, M. de Turenne, obliged to fly from his army, was taking refuge, he and five others, with the landgrave of Hesse. His troops had refused to follow him in revolt. The last hope of the Frondeurs was slipping from them. They found themselves obliged to accept peace, not without obtaining some favours from the court. There was a general amnesty, and the Parliament preserved all its rights. Quote, the king will have the honour of it, and we the prophet, said Guy Patin. The great lords reappeared one after another at Saint-Germain. It is the way of our nation to return to their duty with the same airiness with which they depart from it, and to pass in a single instant from rebellion to obedience. End quote. La Rochefoucauld. The return to rebellion was not to be long delayed. The Queen had gone back to Paris, and the Prince of Condé with her. He, proud of having beaten the parliamentary fronde, affected the conqueror's heirs, and the throng of his courtiers, the quote unquote petit maître, as they were called, spoke very slightingly of the cardinal. 
Condé, reconciled with the Duchess of Longueville, his sister, and his brother, the Prince of Conti, assumed to have the lion's share in the government, and claimed all the favors for himself or his friends. The frondeurs made skilful use of the ill-humor which this conduct excited in Cardinal Mazarin. The minister responded to their advances. The coadjutor was secretly summoned to the Louvre. The dowager princess of Condé felt some apprehensions, but, quote, "'What have I to fear?' her son said to her. "'The cardinal is my friend.' Quote, "'I doubt it,' she answered. "'You are wrong. I rely upon him as much as upon you.' Quote, "'Please, God, you may not be mistaken,' replied the princess, who was setting out for the Palais Royal to see the queen, said to be indisposed that day. Anne of Austria was upon her bed. Word was brought to her that the council was waiting. This was the moment agreed upon. She dismissed the princess, shut herself up in her oratory with the little king, to whom she gave an account of what was going to be done for his service. Then, making him kneel down, she joined him in praying to God for the success of this great enterprise. As the Prince of Condé arrived in the Grand Gallery, he saw Guiteau, captain of the guards, coming towards him. At the same instant, through a door at the bottom, out went the cardinal, taking with him Abbe de la Riviere, who was the usual confidant of the Duke of Orléans, but from whom his master had concealed the great secret. The prince supposed that Guiteau was coming to ask him some favor. The captain of the guard said in his ear, quote, My lord, what I want to say is that I have orders to arrest you, you, the Prince of Conti, your brother, and Monsieur de Longueville. Quote, me? Monsieur Guiteau, arrest me? End quote. Then, reflecting for a moment, quote, In God's name, he said, go back to the queen and tell her that I entreat her to let me have speech of her. End quote. Guiteau went to her, whilst the prince, returning to those who were waiting for him, said, quote, Gentlemen, the queen orders my arrest, and yours too, brother, and yours too, Monsieur de Longueville. I confess that I am astonished, I who have always served the king so well, and believed myself secure of the cardinal's friendship. End quote. The chancellor, who was not in the secret, declared that it was Guiteau's pleasantry. Quote, "'Go and seek the queen, then,' said the prince, "'and tell her of the pleasantry that is going on. As for me, I hold it to be very certain that I am arrested.'" Quote. The chancellor went out and did not return. M. Servien, who had gone to speak to the cardinal, likewise did not appear again. M. de Guiteau entered alone. Quote, "'The queen cannot see you, my lord,' he said. Quote, "'Very well, I am content. Let us obey.'" answered the prince, but whither are you going to take us? I pray you let it be to a warm place. Quote, we are going to the wood of Vincennes, my lord, said Guiteau. The prince turned to the company and took his leave without uneasiness and with the calmest countenance. As he was embracing Monsieur de Brienne, secretary of state, he said to him, quote, Sir, as I have often received from you marks of your friendship and generosity, I flatter myself that you will some day tell the king the services I have rendered him. End quote. The princes went out, and as they descended the staircase, Condé leaned towards Comminges, who commanded the detachment of guards, saying, quote, Comminges, you are a man of honor and a gentleman. Have I anything to fear? End quote. Comminges assured him he had not, and that the orders were merely to escort him to the wood of Vincennes. The carriage upset on the way. As soon as it was righted, Comminges ordered the driver to urge on his horses. The prince burst out laughing, quote, don't be afraid, Comminges, he said. There is nobody to come to my assistance. I swear to you that I have not taken any precautions against this trip. End quote. On arriving at the castle of Vincennes, there were no beds to be found, and the three princes passed the night playing at cards. The princess of Condé and the dowager princess received orders to retire to their estates. The Duchess of Longueville, fearing with good cause that she would be arrested, had taken with all speed the road to Normandy, whither she went and took refuge at Dieppe in her husband's government. The state stroke had succeeded. Mazarin's skill and prudence once more checkmated all the intrigues concocted against him. When the news was told to Chavigny, in spite of all his reasons for bearing malice against the cardinal, who had driven him from the council and kept him for some time in prison, he exclaimed, quote, that is a great misfortune for the prince and his friends, but the truth must be told. The cardinal has done quite right. Without it he would have been ruined. End quote. The contest was begun between Mazarin and the great Condé, and it was not without the prince that the victory was to remain. Already hostilities were commencing. Mazarin had done everything for the frondeurs who remained faithful to him, but the house of Condé was rallying all its partisans. The dukes of Bouillon and La Rochefoucauld had thrown themselves into Bordeaux, which was in revolt against the royal authority, represented by the Duke of Epernon. The princess of Condé and her young son left Chantilly to join them. Madame de Longueville occupied Stenay, a strong place belonging to the prince of Condé. 
she had there found Turenne. On the other hand, the queen had just been through Normandy. All the towns had opened their gates to her. It was just the same in Burgundy. The princess of Condé's able agent, Lenet, could not obtain a declaration from the Parliament of Dijon in her favor. Bordeaux was the focus of the insurrection. The people, passionately devoted to, quote-unquote, the dukes, as the saying was, were forcing the hand of the Parliament. Riots were frequent in the town. The little king, with the queen and the cardinal, marched in person upon Bordeaux. One of the faubourgs was attacked, the dukes negotiated, and obtained a general amnesty, but no mention was made of the prince's release. The Parliament of Paris took the matter up. The premier president spoke in so bitter a tone of the unhappy policy of the minister that the little king, feeling hurt, told his mother that, if he thought it would not displease her, he would have made the premier president hold his tongue and would have dismissed him. On the 30th of January, Anne of Austria sent word to the Parliament that she would consent to grant the release of the princes, quote, provided that the armaments of Stenay and of M. de Touraine might be discontinued, end quote. But it was too late. The Duke of Orléans had made a treaty with the princes. England served as pretext. Mazarin compared the Parliament to the House of Commons, and the coadjutor to Cromwell. Monsieur took the matter up for his friends and was angry. He openly declared that he would not set foot again in the Palais Royal as long as he was liable to meet the cardinal there, and joined the Parliament in demanding the removal of Mazarin. The Queen replied that nobody had a right to interfere in the choice of ministers. By way of answer, the Parliament laid injunctions upon all the officers of the Crown to obey none but the Duke of Orléans, Lieutenant General of the Kingdom. A meeting of the noblesse, at a tumultuous assembly in the house of the Duke of Nemours, expressed themselves in the same sense. It was the 6th of February, 1651. During the night, Cardinal Mazarin set out for Saint-Germain. A rumor spread in Paris that the Queen was preparing to follow him with the King. A rush was made to the Palais Royal. The King was in his bed. Next day, Anne of Austria complained to the Parliament, quote, The Prince is at liberty, said the Premier President, and the King, the King our master, is a prisoner. Quote, Monsieur, who felt no fear, says Retz, because he had been more cheered in the streets and the hall of the palace than he had ever been, answered with vivacity, the king was a prisoner in the hands of Mazarin, but thank God he is not any longer. End quote. The premier president was right. The king was a prisoner to the Parisians. Patrols of Burgesses were moving incessantly round the Palais Royal. One night the queen was obliged to let the people into her chamber. The king was asleep, and two officers of the town guard watched for some hours at his pillow. The yoke of Richelieu and the omnipotence of Mazarin were less hard for royalty to bear than the capricious and jealous tyranny of the populace. The cardinal saw that he was beaten. He made up his mind, and anticipating the queen's officers, he hurried to La Havre to release the prisoners himself. He entered the castle alone, the governor having refused entrance to the guards who attended him. Quote, the prince told me, says Mademoiselle de Montpensier, that when they were dining together, Cardinal Mazarin was not so much in the humor to laugh as he himself was, and that he was very much embarrassed. Liberty to be gone had more charms for the prince than the cardinal's company. He said that he felt marvelous delight at finding himself outside Le Havre, with his sword at his side, and he might well be pleased to wear it. He is a pretty good hand at using it. As he went out, he turned to the cardinal and said, Farewell, Cardinal Mazarin, who kissed the tip of sleeve to him. End quote. The cardinal had slowly taken the road to exile, summoning to him his nieces, Mademoiselles Mancini and Martinozzi, whom he had a short time since sent for to court. He crossed from Normandy into Picardy, made some stay at Doulen, and impelled by his enemy's hatred, he finally crossed the frontier on the 12th of March. The Parliament had just issued orders for his arrest in any part of France. On the 6th of April, he fixed his quarters at Brulle, a little town belonging to the electorate of Cologne, in the same territory which had but lately sheltered the last days of Mary de Medici. The frondeurs, old and new, had gained the day, but even now there was disorder in their camp. Condé had returned to the court, quote, like a raging lion, seeking to devour everybody, and in revenge for his imprisonment, to set fire to the four corners of the realm, end quote. Memoire de Montglas after a moment's reconciliation with the Queen, he began to show himself more and more haughty towards her in his demands every day. He required the dismissal of the ministers Le Tellier, Servien, and Lyon, all three creatures of the Cardinal, and in correspondence with him at Brull. As Anne of Austria refused, the Prince retired to Seymour. He was already in negotiation with Spain, being inveigled into treason by the influence of his sister, Madame de Longueville, who would not leave the Duke of La Rochefoucauld or return into Normandy to her husband. 
fatal results of a guilty passion which enlisted against his country the arms of the hero of Roqua. When he returned to Paris, the queen had, in fact, dismissed her ministers, but she had formed a fresh alliance with the coadjutor, and on the 17th of August, in the presence of an assembly convoked for that purpose at the Palais Royal, she openly denounced the intrigues of the prince with Spain, accusing him of being in correspondence with the archduke. Next day, Condé brought the matter before the Parliament. The coadjutor quite expected the struggle, and had brought supporters. The queen had sent some soldiers. The prince arrived with a numerous attendance. On entering, he said to the company that he could not sufficiently express his astonishment at the condition in which he found the palace, which seemed to him more like a camp than a temple of justice, and that it was not merely that there could be found in the kingdom people insolent enough to presume to dispute, or superiority, the pavement, or disputer le pavé, with him. Quote, I made him a deep obeisance, says Retz, and said that I very humbly begged his highness to pardon me if I told him that I did not believe that there was anybody in the kingdom insolent enough to dispute the wall, or le haut du pavé, with him, but I was persuaded that there were some who could not and ought not, for their dignity's sake, to yield the pavement, or quitter le pavé, to any but the king. The prince replied that he would make me yield it. I said that that would not be easy, end quote. The dispute grew warm. The presidents flung themselves between the disputants. Condé yielded to their entreaties, and begged the Duke of La Rochefoucauld to go and tell his friends to withdraw. The coadjutor went out to make the same request to his friends. Quote, when he would have returned into the usher's little court, writes Mademoiselle de Montpensier, he met at the door the Duke of La Rochefoucauld, who shut it in his face, just keeping it ajar to see who accompanied the coadjutor. He, seeing the door ajar, gave it a good push, but he could not pass quite through, and remained, as it were, jammed between the two folds, unable to get in or out. The Duke of La Rochefoucauld had fastened the door with an iron catch, keeping it so to prevent its opening any wider. The coadjutor was in an ugly position, for he could not help fearing lest a dagger should pop out and take his life from behind. A complaint was made to the Grand Chamber, and Champlatreux, son of the Premier President, went out and by his authority had the door opened, in spite of the Duke of La Rochefoucauld. Quote. The coadjutor protested, and the Duke of Brissac, his relative, threatened the Duke of La Rochefoucauld, whereupon the latter said that, if he had them outside, he would strangle them both, to which the coadjutor replied, quote, My dear La Franchise, the duke's nickname, do not act the bully, you are a poltroon and I am a priest, we shall not do one another much harm. End quote. There was no fighting, and the Parliament, supported by the Duke of Orleans, obtained from the Queen a declaration of the innocence of the Prince of Condé, and at the same time a formal disavowal of Mazarin's policy, and a promise never to recall him. Anne of Austria yielded everything, the king's majority was approaching, and she flattered herself that under cover of his name, she would be able to withdraw the concessions which she felt obliged to make as regent. Her declaration, nevertheless, deeply wounded Mazarin, who was still taking refuge at Brull, whence he wrote incessantly to the queen, who did not neglect his counsels, quote, Ten times I have taken up my pen to write you, he said on the 26th of September, 1651. Lettre du Cardinal Mazarin à la Reine, pages 292 and 293 but could not, and I am so beside myself at the mortal wound I have just received, that I am not sure whether anything I could say to you would have rhyme or reason. The king and the queen, by an authentic deed, have declared me a traitor, a public robber, an incapable, and an enemy to the repose of Christendom, after I had served them with so many signs of my devotion to the advancement of peace. It is no longer a question of property, repose, or whatever else there may be of the sort." I demand the honour which has been taken from me, and that I be let alone, renouncing very heartily the cardinalate and the benefices, whereof I send in my resignation joyfully, consenting willingly to have given up to France twenty-three years of the best of my life, all my pains and my little of wealth, and merely to withdraw with the honour which I had when I began to serve her." End quote. The persistent hopes of the adroit Italian appeared once more in the postscript of the letter, quote, I had forgotten to tell you that it was not the way to set me right in the eyes of the people to impress upon their mind that I am the cause of all the evils they suffer, and of all the disorders of the realm, in such sort that my ministry will be held in horror forever. End, quote. End of section 40 Section 41 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. 
Chapter 43. Louis XIV, the Fronde, and the Government of Cardinal Mazarin. Part 4. Condé did not permit himself to be caught by the Queen's declarations. Of all the princes, he alone was missing at the ceremony of the bed of justice, whereat the youthful Louis the Fourteenth, when entering his fourteenth year, announced on the 7th of September to his people that, according to the laws of his realm, he, quote, intended himself to assume the government, hoping of God's goodness that it would be with piety and justice, end quote. The prince had retired to Chantilly, on the pretext that the new minister, the president of the council, Chateauneuf, and the keeper of the seals, Matthew Mollet, were not friends of his. The Duchess of Longueville at last carried the day. Condé was resolved upon civil war. Quote, you would have it, he said to his sister on repelling the envoy, who had followed him to Bourges, from the Queen and the Duke of Orleans. Remember that I draw the sword in spite of myself, but I will be the last to sheathe it. End quote. And he kept his word. A great disappointment awaited the rebels. They had counted upon the Duke of Bouillon and Monsieur de Turenne, but neither of them would join the faction. The relations between the two great generals had not been without rubs. Turenne had, moreover, felt some remorse because he, being a general in the king's army, had but lately declared against the court, quote, doing thereby a deed at which Le Balafro and Admiral de Coligny would have hesitated, says Cardinal de Retz. The two brothers went before long and offered their services to the queen. Meanwhile, Condé had arrived at Bordeaux. A part of Guienne, Saint-Ange, and Perigord had declared in his favor. Count d'Arcourt, at the head of the royal troops, marched against La Rochelle, which he took from the revolters under the very beard of the prince, who had come from Bordeaux to the assistance of the place, whilst the king and the queen, resolutely quitting Paris, advanced from town to town as far as Poitiers, keeping the centre of France to its allegiance by their mere presence. The treaty of the Prince of Condé with Spain was concluded. Eight Spanish vessels, having money and troops on board, entered the Gironde. Condé delivered over to them the castle and harbour of Talmont. The queen had commissioned the cardinal to raise levies in Germany, and he had already entered the country of Liège, embodying troops and forming alliances. On the 17th of November, Anne of Austria finally wrote to Mazarin to return to the king's assistance. In the presence of Condé's rebellion, she had no more appearances to keep up with anybody, and it was already in the master's tone that Mazarin wrote to the queen on the 30th of October to put her on her guard against the Duke of Orléans, quote, the power committed to his royal highness and the neutrality permitted to him, being as he is wholly devoted to the prince, surrounded by his partisans, and adhering blindly to their counsels, are matters highly prejudicial to the king's service, and for my part I do not see how one can be a servant of the king's with ever so little judgment and knowledge of affairs, and yet dispute these truths. The queen, then, must bide her time to remedy all this." The cardinal's penetration had not deceived him. The Duke of Orléans was working away in Paris, where the queen had been obliged to leave him, on the Prince of Condé's side. The Parliament had assembled to enregister against the princes the proclamation of high treason dispatched from Bourges by the court. Gaston demanded that it should be sent back, threatened as they were, he said, with a still greater danger than the rebellion of the princes in the return of Mazarin, who was even now advancing to the frontier. But the premier president took no notice, and put the proclamation to the vote in these words, quote, It is a great misfortune when princes of the blood give occasion for such proclamations, but this is a common and ordinary misfortune in the kingdom, and for five or six centuries past it may be said that they have been the scourges of the people and the enemies of the monarchy. End quote. The decree passed by a hundred votes to forty. On the 24th of December, the cardinal crossed the frontier with a large body of troops, and was received at Sedan by Lieutenant General Faber, faithful to his fortunes even in exile. The Parliament was furious, and voted, almost unanimously, that the cardinal and his adherents were guilty of high treason. Ordering the communes to hound him down, and promising from the proceeds of his furniture and library, which were about to be sold, a sum of five hundred thousand livres to whoever should take him, dead or alive. At once began the sale of the magnificent library which the cardinal had liberally opened to the public. The dispersion of the books was happily stopped in time to still leave a nucleus for the Mazarin library. Meanwhile, Mazarin had not allowed himself to be frightened by parliamentary decrees or by dread of assassins. Re-entering France with six thousand men, he forced the passage of pont sur yonne in spite of the two councillors of the parliaments who were commissioned to have him arrested. The Duke of Beaufort, at the head of Monsieur's troops, did not even attempt to impede his march, and on the 28th of January the Cardinal entered Poitiers, at once resuming his place beside the King, who had come to meet him a league from the town. The court took leisurely the road to Paris. 
The coadjutor had received the price of his services in the royal cause. He was a cardinal, quote, sooner, said he, than Mazarin would have had him, end quote, and so the new prince of the church considered himself released from any gratitude to the court, and sought to form a third party, at the head of which was to be placed the Duke of Orleans as nominal head. Monsieur, harried by intrigues in all directions, remained in a state of inaction, and made a pretension of keeping Paris neutral. His daughter, Mademoiselle de Montpensier, who detested Anne of Austria and Mazarin, and would have liked to marry the king, had boldly taken the side of the princes. The court had just arrived at Blois on the 27th of March, 1652. The keeper of the seals, Mollet, presented himself in front of Orléans to summon the town to open its gates to the king. At that very moment arrived Mademoiselle, the great Mademoiselle as she was then called, and she claimed possession of Orléans in her father's name. Quote, it was the appanage of monsieur, but the gates were shut and barricaded. After they had been told that it was I, writes mademoiselle, they did not open, and I was there three hours. The governor sent me some sweetmeats, and what appeared to me rather funny was that he gave me to understand that he had no influence. At the window of the sentry box was the Marquis d'Alluy, who watched me walking up and down by the fossé. The rampart was fringed with people who shouted incessantly, Hurrah for the king! Hurrah for the princes! None of your Mazarin! I could not help calling out to them, Go to the Hôtel de Ville and get the gate open to me. The captain made signs that he had not the keys. I said to him, It must be burst open, and you owe me more allegiance than to the gentlemen of the town, seeing that I am your master's daughter. The boatman offered to break open for me a gate which was close by there. I told them to make haste, and I mounted upon a pretty high mound of earth overlooking that gate. I thought but little about any nice way of getting thither. I climbed like a cat. I held on to briars and thorns, and I leapt all the hedges without hurting myself at all. Two boats were brought up to serve me for a bridge, and in the second was placed a ladder by which I mounted. The gate was burst at last. Two planks had been forced out of the middle. Signs were made to me to advance, and as there was a great deal of mud, a footman took me up, carried me along, and put me through this hole, through which I had no sooner passed my head than the drums began beating. I gave my hand to the captain and said to him, You will be very glad that you can boast of having managed to get me in. End quote. The keeper of the seals was obliged to return to Blois, and Mademoiselle kept Orleans, but not without being able to effect an entrance for the troops of the dukes of Nemours and Beaufort, who had just tried a surprise against the court. Had it not been for the aid of Turenne, who had defended the bridge of Jargot, the king might have fallen into the hands of his revolted subjects. The queen rested at Guien whilst the princes went on as far as Montargis, thus cutting off the communications of the court with Paris. Turenne was preparing to fall upon his incapable adversaries when the situation suddenly changed. The prince of Condé, weary of the bad state of his affairs in Guien, where the veteran soldiers of the Count of Harcourt had the advantage everywhere over the new levies, had traversed France in disguise, and forming a junction on the 1st of April with the Dukes of Nemours and Beaufort, threw himself upon the quarters of Marshal d'Auquincourt, defeated him, burnt his camp, and drove him back to Blenot. A rapid march on the part of Turenne, coming to the aid of his colleague, forced Condé to fall back upon Chantillon. On the 11th of April he was in Paris. The princes had relied upon the irritation caused by the return of Mazarin to draw Paris into the revolt but they were only half successful. The Parliament would scarcely give Condé admittance. President de Bailleul, who occupied the chair in the absence of Molay, declared that the body always considered it an honour to see the prince in their midst, but that they would have preferred not to see him there in the state in which he was at the time, with his hands still bloody from the defeat of the king's troops. Amelot, premier president of the Court of Aids, said to the prince's face, quote, that it was a matter of astonishment, after many battles delivered or sustained against His Majesty's troops, to see him not only returning to Paris without having obtained letters of amnesty, but still appearing amongst the sovereign bodies as if he gloried in the spoils of His Majesty's subjects, and causing the drum to be beaten for levying troops to be paid by money coming from Spain, in the capital of the realm, the most loyal city possessed by the king, end quote. The city of Paris resolved not to make, quote, common cause or furnish money to assist the princes against the king under pretext of its being against Mazarin, end quote. The populace alone were favorable to the prince's party. Meanwhile, Turenne had easy work with the secondary generals remaining at the head of the factious army. By his able maneuvers, he had covered the march of the court, which established itself at Saint-Germain. Condé assembled his forces and camped around Paris. He intended to fortify himself at the confluence of the Seine and the Marne, 
hoping to be supported by the little army which had just been brought up by Duke Charles of Lorraine, as capricious and adventurous as ever. Turenne and the main body of his troops barred the passage. Condé threw himself back upon Faubourg Saint-Antoine, and there entrenched himself at the outlet of the three principal streets which abutted upon Port Saint-Antoine, now Place de la Bastille. Turenne had meant to wait for reinforcements and artillery, but the whole court had flocked upon the heights of Charonne to see the fight. Pressure was put upon him, and the marshal gave the word to attack. The army of the Fronde fought with fury. Quote, I did not see a prince of Condé, Turenne used to say. I saw more than a dozen. End quote. The king's soldiers had entered the houses, thus turning the barricades. Marshal Ferté had just arrived with the artillery, and was sweeping Rue Saint-Antoine. The prince's army was about to be driven back to the foot of the walls of Paris, when the cannon of the Bastille, replying all on a sudden to the volleys of the royal troops, came like a thunderbolt on M. de Turenne. The Porte Saint-Antoine opened, and the Parisians, under arms, fringing the streets, protected the return of the rebel army. Mademoiselle de Montpensier had taken the command of the city of Paris. For a week past the Duke of Orléans had been ill, or pretended to be. He refused to give any order. When the prince began his movement on the 2nd of July, early, he sent to beg Mademoiselle not to desert him. Quote, I ran to the Luxembourg, she says, and I found Monsieur at the top of the stairs. I thought I should find you in bed, said I. Count Fiesque told me that you didn't feel well. He answered, I am not ill enough for that, but enough not to go out. I begged him to ride out to the aid of the prince, or at any rate to go to bed and assume to be ill, but I could get nothing from him. I went so far as to say, short of having a treaty with the court in your pocket, I cannot understand how you can take these things so easily, but can you really have one to sacrifice the prince to Cardinal Mazarin? He made no reply. All I said lasted quite an hour, during which every friend we had might have been killed, and the prince as well as another, without anybody's caring. Nay, there were people of messieurs in high spirits, hoping that the prince would perish. They were friends of Cardinal de Retz. At last, monsieur gave me a letter for the gentlemen of the hotel, leaving it to me to tell them his intention. I was there in a moment, assuring those present that if ill luck would have it that the enemy should beat the prince, no more quarter would be shown to Paris than to the men who bore arms. Marshal de l'Hôpital, governor of Paris for the king, said to me, You are aware, mademoiselle, that if your troops had not approached this city, those of the king would not have come thither, and that they only came to drive them away. Madame de Nemours did not like this and began to argue the point. I broke off their altercation. Consider, sir, that whilst time is being wasted in discussing useless matters, the prince is in danger in your faubourg. End quote. She carried with her the aid of the Duke of Orléans' troops, and immediately moved forwards, meeting everywhere on her road her friends wounded or dying. Quote, when I was near the gate, I went into the house of an exchequer master, or maître des comptes. As soon as I was there, the prince came thither to see me. He was in a pitiable state. He had two fingers' breadth of dust on his face, and his hair all matted. His collar and his shirt were covered with blood, although he was not wounded. His breastplate was riddled all over, and he held his sword bare in his hand, having lost the scabbard. He said to me, You see a man in despair. I have lost all my friends. Messieurs de Nemours, de la Rochefoucauld, and Clinchamp are wounded to death. I consoled him a little by telling him that they were in better case than he supposed. Then I went off to the Bastille, where I made them load the cannon which was trained right upon the city, and I gave orders to fire as soon as I had gone. I went thence to the Porte Saint-Antoine. The soldiers shouted, Let us do something that will astonish them. Our retreat is secure. Here is Mademoiselle at the gate, and she will have it open for us if we are hard-pressed. The prince gave orders to march back into the city. He seemed to me quite different from what he had been early in the day, though he had not changed at all. He paid me a thousand compliments and thanks for the great service he considered that I had rendered him. I said to him, I have a favor to ask of you, that is, not to say anything to Monsieur about the lash he has displayed towards you. At this very moment up came Monsieur, who embraced the prince with as gay an air as if he had not left him at all in the lurch. The prince confessed that he had never been in so dangerous a position. The fight at Porte Saint-Antoine had not sufficiently compromised the Parisians, who began to demand peace at any price. The mob, devoted to the princes, set themselves to insult in the street all those who did not wear in their hats a tuft of straw, the rallying sign of the faction. On the 4th of July, at the General Assembly of the City, when the city's attorney-general proposed to conjure His Majesty to return to Paris without Cardinal Mazarin, the princes, who demanded the union of the Parisians with themselves, rose up and went out, leaving the assembly to the tender mercies of the crowd assembled on the Place de Grève.
Quote, down on the Mazarin, end quote, was the cry. Quote, there are none but Mazarin any longer at the Hotel de Ville, end quote. Fire was applied to the doors defended by the archers. All the outlets were guarded by men beside themselves. More than thirty burgesses of note were massacred. Many died of their wounds. The Hotel de Ville was pillaged. Marshal de l'Hôpital escaped with great difficulty, and the provost of tradesmen yielded up his office to Councillor Broussel. Terror reigned in Paris. It was necessary to drag the magistrates to the Palace of Justice to decree, on the 19th of July, by seventy-four votes against sixty-nine, that the Duke of Orléans should be appointed, quote, Lieutenant General of the Kingdom, and the Prince of Condé Commandant of all the armies, end quote. The usurpation of the royal authority was flagrant. The city assembly voted subsidies, and Paris wrote to all the good towns of France to announce to them her resolution. Chancellor Seguier had the poltroonery to accept the presidency of the council, offered him by the Duke of Orléans. He thus avenged himself for the preference the queen had but lately shown for Molé by confiding the seals to him. At the same time, the Spaniards were entering France, for all the strong places were dismantled or disgarrisoned. The king, obliged to confront civil war, had abandoned his frontiers. Gravelines had fallen on the 18th of May, and the archduke had undertaken the siege of Dunkirk. At Condé's instance, he detached a body of troops, which he sent, under the orders of Count Fuendalsagna, to join the Duke of Lorraine, who had again approached Paris. Everywhere the fortune of arms appeared to be against the king. Quote, this year we lost Barcelona, Catalonia, and Casal, the key of Italy, says Cardinal de Retz. We saw Brissac in revolt, on the point of falling once more into the hands of the House of Austria. We saw the flags and standards of Spain fluttering on the Pont Neuf. The yellow scarves of Lorraine appeared in Paris as freely as the Isabels in the Blues. End quote. Dissension, ambition, and poltroonery were delivering France over to the foreigner. End of section 41. Section 42 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 43. Louis XIV, the Fronde, and the Government of Cardinal Mazarin, Part 5. The evil passions of men under the control of God help sometimes to destroy and sometimes to preserve them. The interests of the Spaniards and of the Prince of Condé were not identical. He desired to become the master of France and to command in the king's name. The enemy were laboring to humiliate France and to prolong the war indefinitely. The Archduke recalled Count Fuendalsagna to Dunkirk, and Turenne, withstanding the terrors of the court, which would fain have fled first into Normandy and then to Lyon, prevailed upon the Queen to establish herself at Pontoise, whilst the army occupied Compiègne. At every point, cutting off the passage of the Duke of Lorraine, who had been reinforced by a body of Spaniards, Turenne held the enemy in check for three weeks, and prevented them from marching on Paris. All parties began to tire of hostilities. Cardinal Mazarin took his line, and proudly demanded of the king permission to withdraw, in order by his departure to restore peace to the kingdom. The queen refused. Quote, there is no consideration shown, she said, for my son's honor and my own. We will not suffer him to go away. End quote. But the cardinal insisted. Prudent and far-sighted as he was, he knew that to depart was the only way of remaining. He departed on the 19th of August, but without leaving the frontier. He took up his quarters at Bouillon. The queen had summoned the parliament to her at Pontoise. A small number of magistrates responded to her summons, enough, however, to give the Queen the right to proclaim rebellious the Parliament remaining at Paris. Chancellor Seguier made his escape in order to go and rejoin the court. Nobody really believed in the Cardinal's withdrawal. Men are fond of yielding to appearances in order to excuse in their own eyes a change in their own purposes. Disorder went on increasing in Paris. The great lords, in their discontent, were quarrelling one with another. The Prince of Condé struck M. de Rieux, who returned the blow. The Duke of Nemours was killed in a duel by M. de Beaufort. The Burgesses were growing weary of so much anarchy. A public display of feeling in favour of peace took place on the 24th of September in the garden of the Palais Royal. Those present stuck in their hats pieces of white paper in opposition to the frondeurs' tufts of straw. People fought in the streets on behalf of these tokens. 
For some weeks past, Cardinal de Retz had remained inactive, and his friends pressed him to move. Quote, you see quite well, they said, that Mazarin is but a sort of jack-in-the-box, out of sight today, and popping up tomorrow. But you also see that, whether he be in or out, the spring that sends him up or down is that of the royal authority, the which will not, apparently, be so very soon broken by the means taken to break it. The obligation you are under towards Monsieur, and even towards the public, as regards Mazarin, does not allow you to work for his restoration. He is no longer here, and though his absence may be nothing but a mockery and a delusion, it nevertheless gives you an opportunity for taking certain steps which naturally lead to that which is for your good. End quote. Retz lost no time in going to Compiègne, where the king had installed himself after Mazarin's departure. He took with him a deputation of the clergy, and received in due form the cardinal's hat. He was the bearer of proposals for an accommodation from the Duke of Orléans, but the queen cut him short. The court perceived its strength, and the instructions of Cardinal Mazarin were precise. The ruin of de Retz was from that moment resolved upon. The Prince of Condé was ill. He had left the command of his troops to Monsieur de Tavannes. During the night between the 5th and 6th of October, Turenne struck his camp at Villeneuve-Saint-Georges crossed the Seine at Corbeil, the Marne at Meaux, without its being in the enemy's power to stop him, and established himself in the neighborhood of Damartin. Condé was furious. Quote, Tavannes and Vallon ought to wear bridles, he said. They are asses. End quote. He left his house and placed himself once more at the head of his army, at first following after Turenne, and soon to sever himself completely from that Paris which was slipping away from him. Quote, he would find himself more at home at the head of four squadrons in the Ardennes than commanding a dozen millions of such fellows as we have here, without excepting President Charton, said the Duke of Orléans. Quote, the prince was wasting away with sheer disgust. He was so weary of hearing all the talk about Parliament, Court of Aids, Chambers in Assembly, and Hôtel de Ville, that he would often declare that his grandfather had never been more fatigued by the parsons of La Rochelle. End quote. The great Condé was a thirst for the thrilling emotions of war, and the crime he committed was to indulge at any price that boundless passion. Ever victorious at the head of French armies, he was about to make experience of defeat in the service of the foreigner. The king had proclaimed a general amnesty on the 18th of October, and on the 21st he set out in state for Paris. The Duke of Orléans still wavered. Quote, you wanted peace, said Madame, when it depended but on you to make war. You now want war when you can make neither war nor peace. It is of no use to think any longer of anything but going with a good grace to meet the king. End quote. At these words he exclaimed aloud, as if it had been proposed to him to go and throw himself in the river, quote, And where the devil should I go? he answered. He remained at the Luxembourg. On drawing near Paris, the king sent word to his uncle that he would have to leave the city. Gaston replied in the following letter, quote, Monseigneur, having understood from my cousin the Duke of Danville and from Sieur d'Aligre the respect that your majesty would have me pay you, I most humbly beseech your majesty to allow me to assure you by these lines that I do not propose to remain in Paris longer than till tomorrow, and that I will go my way to my house at Limours, having no more passionate desire than to testify by my perfect obedience that I am with submission, Monseigneur, your most humble and most obedient servant and subject, Gaston. End quote. The Duke of Orleans retired before long to his castle at Blois, where he died in 1660, deserted, towards the end of his life, by all the friends he had successively abandoned and betrayed. Quote, he had, with the exception of courage, all that was necessary to make an honorable man, says Cardinal de Retz, but weakness was predominant in his heart through fear, and in his mind through irresolution. It disfigured the whole course of his life. He engaged in everything because he had not strength to resist those who drew him on, and he always came out disgracefully because he had not the courage to support them. End quote. He was a prey to fear, fear of his friends as well as of his enemies. The fronde was all over, that of the gentry of the long robe as well as that of the gentry of the sword. The Parliament of Paris was falling once more in the state to the rank which had been assigned to it by Richelieu, and from which it had wanted to emerge by a supreme effort. The attempt had been the same in France as in England, however different had been the success. It was the same yearnings of patriotism and freedom, the same desire on the part of the country to take an active part in its government, which had inspired the opposition of the Parliament of England to the despotism of Charles I, and the opposition of the French Parliaments to Richelieu as well as to Mazarin. 
It was England's good fortune to have but one Parliament of politicians, instead of ten Parliaments of magistrates, the latter more fit for the theory than the practice of public affairs. And the Reformation had, beforehand, accustomed its people to discussion as well as to liberty. Its great lords and its gentlemen placed themselves from the first at the head of the national movement, demanding nothing and expecting nothing for themselves from the advantages they claimed for their country. The remnant of the feudal system had succumbed with the Duke of Montmorency under Richelieu. France knew not the way to profit by the elements of courage, disinterestedness, and patriotism offered her by her magistracy. She had the misfortune to be delivered over to noisy factions of princes and great lords, ambitious or envious, greedy of honors and riches, as ready to fight the court as to be on terms with it, and thinking far more of their own personal interests than of the public service. Without any unity of action or aim, and by turns excited and dismayed by the examples that came to them from England, the Frondeurs had to guide them no Hampton or Cromwell. They had at their backs neither people nor army. The English had been able to accomplish a revolution. The Fronde failed before the dexterous prudence of Mazarin and the Queen's fidelity to her minister. In vain did the coadjutor aspire to take his place. Anne of Austria had not forgotten the Earl of Strafford. Cardinal de Retz learned before long the hollowness of his hopes. On the 19th of December, 1652, as he was repairing to the Louvre, he was arrested by M. de Villequier, captain of the guards on duty, and taken the same evening to the Bois de Vincennes. There was a great display of force in the street and around the carriage, but nobody moved. Quote, Whether it were, says Retz, that the dejection of the people was too great, or that those who were well inclined towards me lost courage on seeing nobody at their head. End quote. People were tired of raising barricades and hounding down the king's soldiers. Quote, I was taken into a large room where there were neither hangings nor bed. That which was brought in about eleven o'clock at night was of Chinese taffeta, not at all the thing for winter furniture. I slept very well, which must not be attributed to stout-heartedness, because misfortune has naturally that effect upon me. I have on more than one occasion discovered that it wakes me in the morning and sends me to sleep at night. I was obliged to get up the next day without a fire, because there was no wood to make one, and the three exons who had been posted near me had the kindness to assure me that I should not be without it the next day. He who remained alone on guard over me took it for himself, and I was a whole fortnight at Christmas in a room as big as a church without warming myself. I do not believe that there could be found under heaven another man like this exon. He stole my linen, my clothes, my boots, and I was sometimes obliged to stay in bed eight or ten days for lack of anything to put on. I could not believe that I was subjected to such treatment without orders from some superior and without some mad notion of making me die of vexation. I fortified myself against that notion, and I resolved at any rate not to die that kind of death. At last I got him into the habit of not tormenting me any more, by dint of letting him see that I did not torment myself at all. In point of fact I had risen pretty nearly superior to all these ruses, for which I had a supreme contempt. But I could not assume the same loftiness of spirit in respect of the prison's entity, or substance, if one may use the term, and the sight of myself every morning when I awoke in the hands of my enemies made me perceive that I was anything rather than a stoic. The Archbishop of Paris had just died, and the dignity passed to his coadjutor. As the price of his release, Mazarin demanded his resignation. The clergy of Paris were highly indignant. Cardinal de Retz was removed to the castle of Nantes, whence he managed to make his escape in August 1653. For nine years he lived abroad in Spain, Italy, and Germany, everywhere mingling in the affairs of Europe, engaged in intrigue, and not without influence. When at last he returned to France in 1662, he resigned the Archbishopric of Paris, and established himself in the Principality of Commercy, which belonged to him, occupied up to the day of his death in paying his debts, doing good to his friends and servants, writing his memoirs, and making his peace with God. This was in those days a solicitude which never left the most worldly. The Prince of Conti had died very devout, and Madame de Longueville had just expired at the Carmelites. After twenty-five years' penance, when Cardinal de Retz died on the 24th of August, 1679. At the time of his arrest, it was a common saying of the people in the street that together with, quote, Cardinal de Retz, it would have been a very good thing to imprison Cardinal Mazarin as well, in order to teach them of the clergy not to meddle for the future in the things of this world, end quote. Language which was unjust to the grand government of Cardinal Richelieu, unjust even to Cardinal Mazarin. 
the latter was returning with greater power than ever at the moment when Cardinal de Retz, losing forever the hope of supplanting him in power, was beginning that life of imprisonment and exile which was ultimately to give him time to put retirement and repentance between himself and death. Cardinal Mazarin had once more entered France, but he had not returned to Paris. The Prince of Condé, soured by the ill success of the Fronde, and demented by illimitable pride, had not been ashamed to accept the title of Generalissimo of the Spanish armies. Turenne had succeeded in hurling him back into Luxembourg, and it was in front of Bar, besieged, that Mazarin, with a body of four thousand men, joined the French army. Bar was taken, and the campaign of 1652, disastrous at nearly every point, had just finished with this success, when the cardinal re-entered Paris at the end of January 1653. Six months later, at the end of July, the insurrection in Guienne was becoming extinguished by a series of private conventions. The king's armies were entering Bordeaux. The revolted princes received their pardon, waiting for the Prince of Conti to marry, as he did next year, Mademoiselle Martinozzi, one of Mazarin's nieces. Madame de Longueville retired to Moulins in the convent where her aunt, Madame de Montmorency, had for the last twenty years been mourning for her husband. Condé was the only rebel left, more dangerous for France than all the hostile armies he commanded. Cardinal Mazarin was henceforth all-powerful. Whatever may have been the nature of the ties which united him to the Queen, he had proved their fidelity and strength too fully to always avoid the temptation of adopting the tone of a master. The young king's confidence in his minister, who had brought him up, equaled that of his mother. The merits as well as the faults of Mazarin were accordingly free to crop out. He was neither vindictive nor cruel towards even his most inveterate enemies, whom he could not manage, as Richelieu did, to confound with those of the state. The excesses of the factions had sufficed to destroy them. Quote, Time is an able fellow, the cardinal would frequently say. If people often complained of being badly compensated for their services, Mazarin could excuse himself on the ground of the deplorable condition of the finances. He nevertheless feathered his own nest inordinately, taking care, however, not to rob the people, it was said. He confined himself to selling everything at a profit to himself, even the offices of the royal household, without making, as Richelieu had made, any, quote, advance out of his own money to the state, when there was none in the treasury, end quote. The power had been honestly won, if the fortune were of a doubtful kind. M. Mignet has said with his manly precision of language, quote, Amidst those unreasonable disturbances which upset for a while the judgment of the great Turenne, which, in the case of the great Condé, turned the sword of Rocroi against France, and which led Cardinal Retz to make so poor a use of his talent, there was but one firm will, and that was Anne of Austria's, but one man of good sense, and that was Mazarin, end quote. Introduction aux négociations pour la succession d'Espagne. From 1653 to 1657, Turenne, seconded by Marshal La Ferté and sometimes by Cardinal Mazarin in person, constantly kept the Spaniards and the Prince of Condé in check, recovering the places but lately taken from France and relieving the besieged towns. Without ever engaging in pitched battles, he almost always had the advantage. Mazarin resolved to strike a decisive blow. It was now three years since, after long negotiations, the Cardinal had concluded with Cromwell, protector of the Commonwealth of England, a treaty of peace and commerce, the prelude and first fruits of a closer alliance which the able minister of Anne of Austria had not ceased to wish for and pave the way for. On the 23rd of March, 1657, the Parleys ended at last in a treaty of alliance, offensive and defensive. It was concluded at Paris between France and England. Cromwell promised that a body of six thousand English, supported by a fleet prepared to victual and aid them along the coasts, should go and join the French army, twenty thousand strong, to make war on the Spanish Low Countries, and especially to besiege the three forts of Gravelines, Mardic, and Dunkirk, the last of which was to be placed in the hands of the English and remain in their possession. Six weeks after the conclusion of the treaty, the English troops disembarked at Boulogne. They were regiments formed and trained in the long struggles of the Civil War, drilled to the most perfect discipline, of austere manners, and of resolute and stern courage. The king came in person to receive them on their arrival. Mardic was soon taken and placed as a pledge in the hands of the English. Cromwell sent two fresh regiments for the siege of Dunkirk. In the spring of 1658, Turenne invested the place. Louis the Fourteenth and Mazarin went to Calais to be present at this great enterprise. End of section 42. Section 43 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 43. Louis the Fourteenth, the Fronde, and the Government of Cardinal Mazarin. Part 6. Quote, at Brussels, says M. Guizot in his Histoire de la République d'Angleterre et de Cromwell, neither Don Juan nor the Marquis of Caracena would believe that Dunkirk was in danger. Being at the same time indolent and proud, they disdained the council at one time of vigilant activity and at another of prudent reserve, which was constantly given them by Condé. They would not have anybody come and rouse them during their siesta if any unforeseen incident occurred, nor allow any doubt of their success when once they were up and on horseback. They hurried away to the defense of Dunkirk, leaving behind them their artillery and a portion of their cavalry. Condé conjured them to entrench themselves whilst awaiting them. Don Juan, on the contrary, was for advancing on to the dunes and marching to meet the French army. "'You don't reflect,' said Condé, "'that ground is fit only for infantry,' and that of the French is more numerous and has seen more service. I am persuaded, replied Don Juan, that they will not ever dare to look his most Catholic Majesty's army in the face. Ah, you don't know Monsieur de Turenne. No mistake is made with impunity in the presence of such a man as that. Don Juan persisted, and in fact made his way on to the dunes. Next day, the 13th of June, Condé, more and more convinced of the danger, made fresh efforts to make him retire. Retire, cried Don Juan, if the French dare fight, this will be the finest day that ever shone on the arms of his most Catholic majesty. Very fine, certainly, answered Condé, if you give orders to retire. Turenne put an end to this disagreement in the enemy's camp. Having made up his mind to give battle on the 14th at daybreak, he sent word to the English general Lockhart by one of his officers, who wanted at the same time to explain the commander-in-chief's plan and his grounds for it. "'All right,' answered Lockhart. "'I leave it to Monsieur de Turenne. "'He shall tell me his reasons after the battle, if he likes.' "'A striking contrast between the manly discipline of English good sense "'and the silly blindness of Spanish pride. "'Condé was not mistaken. "'The issue of a battle begun under such auspices could not be doubtful. "'My lord,' said he to the young Duke of Gloucester, "'who was serving in the Spanish army by the side of his brother, the Duke of York, "'did you ever see a battle?' No, prince. Well, then, you are going to see one lost. The Battle of the Dunes was, in fact, totally lost by the Spaniards, after four hours very hard fighting, during which the English regiments carried bravely and with heavy losses the most difficult and the best defended position. All the officers of Lockhart's regiment, except two, were killed or wounded before the end of the day. The Spanish army retired in disorder, leaving four thousand prisoners in the hands of the conqueror. The enemy came to meet us, wrote Turenne in the evening to his wife. They were beaten, God be praised. I have worked rather hard all day. I wish you good night, and am going to bed. Ten days afterwards, on the 23rd of June, 1658, the garrison of Dunkirk was exhausted. The aged governor, the Marquis of Leyden, had been mortally wounded in a sortie. The place surrendered, and the next day but one, Louis the Fourteenth entered it, but merely to hand it over at once to the English. Though the court and the army are in despair at the notion of letting go what he calls a rather nice morsel, wrote Lockhart the day before, to Secretary Thurlow, nevertheless the cardinal is staunch to his promises, and seems as well satisfied at giving up this place to his highness as I am to take it. The king also is extremely polite and obliging, and he has in his soul more honesty than I had supposed." End quote. The surrender of Dunkirk was soon followed by that of Gravelines and several other towns. The great blow against the Spanish arms had been struck. Negotiations were beginning. Tranquillity reigned everywhere in France. The Parliament had caused no talk since the 20th of March, 1655, when, they having refused to enregister certain financial edicts for want of liberty of suffrage, the King, setting out from the castle of Vincennes, quote, had arrived early at the Palace of Justice, in scarlet jacket and grey hat, attended by all his court in the same costume, as if he were going to hunt the stag, which was unwanted up to that day. When he was in his bed of justice, he prohibited the Parliament from assembling, and after having said a word or two, he rose and went out, without listening to any address. Memoire de Montglas The sovereign courts had learned to improve upon the old maxim of Matthew Mollet, quote, I am going to court, I shall tell the truth, after which the king must be obeyed. End quote. Not a tongue wagged, and obedience at length was rendered to Cardinal Mazarin, as it had but lately been to Cardinal Richelieu. 
The court was taking its diversion. Quote, there were plenty of fine comedies and ballets going on. The king, who danced very well, liked them extremely, says Mademoiselle de Montpensier, at that time exiled from Paris. All this did not affect me at all. I thought that I should see enough of it on my return. But my ladies were different, and nothing could equal their vexation at not being in all these gaieties. End quote. It was still worse when announcement was made of the arrival of Queen Christina of Sweden, that celebrated princess who had reigned from the time she was six years old, and had lately abdicated in 1654, in favor of her cousin Charles Gustavus, in order to regain her liberty, she said, but perhaps also because she found herself confronted by the ever-increasing opposition of the grandees of her kingdom, hostile to the foreign fashions favored by the queen, as well as to the design that was attributed to her of becoming converted to Catholicism. When Christina arrived at Paris in 1656, she had already accomplished her abjuration at Brussels, without assigning her motives for it to anybody. Quote, Those who talk of them know nothing about them, she would say, and she who knows something about them has never talked of them. End quote. There was great curiosity at Paris to see this queen. The king sent the Duke of Guise to meet her, and he wrote to one of his friends as follows, quote, she is not tall, she has a good arm, a hand white and well made, but rather a man's than a woman's, a high shoulder, a defect which she so well conceals by the singularity of her dress, her walk, and her gestures, that you might make a bet about it. Her face is large, without being defective, all her features are the same and strongly marked, a pretty tolerable turn of countenance, set off by a very singular headdress, that is, a man's wig, very big, and very much raised in front. The top of the head is a tissue of hair, and the back has something of a woman's style of headdress. Sometimes she also wears a hat. Her bodice, laced behind, crosswise, is made something like our doublets, her chemise bulging out all round her petticoat, which she wears rather badly fastened and not over straight. She is always very much powdered, with a good deal of pomade, and almost never puts on gloves. She has, at the very least, as much swagger and haughtiness as the great Gustavus, her father, can have had. She is mighty civil and coaxing, speaks eight languages and principally French, as if she had been born in Paris. She knows as much about it as all our academy and the Sorbonne put together, has an admirable knowledge of painting as well as of everything else, and knows all the intrigues of our court better than I. In fact, she is quite an extraordinary person. Quote, the king, though very timid at that time, says Madame de Motteville, and not at all well informed, got on so well with this bold, well informed, and haughty princess, that from the first moment they associated together with much freedom and pleasure on both sides. It was difficult, when you had once had a good opportunity of seeing her, and above all of listening to her, not to forgive all her irregularities, though some of them were highly blamable. End quote. All the court and all Paris made a great fuss about this queen, who insisted upon going everywhere, even to the French Academy, where no woman had ever been admitted. Patru thus relates to one of his friends the story of her visit. Quote, no notice was given until about eight or nine in the morning of this princess's purpose, so that some of our body could not receive information in time. Monsieur de Gombeau came without having been advertised, but as soon as he knew of the queen's purpose, he went away again, for thou must know that he is wroth with her, because he, having written some verses in which he praised the great Gustavus, she did not write to him, she who, as thou knowest, has written to a hundred impertinent apes. I might complain with far more reason, but so long as kings, queens, princes, and princesses do me only that sort of harm, I shall never complain. The chancellor, Siguier, at whose house the academy met, had forgotten to have the portrait of this princess, which she had given to the society, placed in the room, which in my opinion ought not to have been forgotten. Word was brought that the carriage was entering the courtyard. The chancellor, followed by the whole body, went to receive the princess. As soon as she entered the room, she went off-hand, according to her habit, and sat down in her chair, and at the same moment, without any order given us, we also sat down. The princess, seeing that we were at some little distance from the table, told us that we could draw up close to it. There was some little drawing up, but not as if it were a dinner party. Several pieces were read, and then the director, who was Monsieur de la Chambre, told the queen that the ordinary exercise of the society was to work at the dictionary, and that if it were agreeable to Her Majesty, a sheet should be read. By all means, said she. Monsieur de Meseret, accordingly, read the word je, under which, amongst other proverbial expressions, there was... Jeux de prince, qui ne plaise qu'à ceux qui les font, or prince's jokes, which amuse only those who make them. 
She burst out laughing. The word, which was in fair copy, was finished. It would have been better to read a word which had to be weeded, because then we should all have spoken. But people were taken by surprise. The French always are. After about an hour, the princess rose, made a courtesy to the company, and went away as she had come. Here is really what passed at this famous interview, which, no doubt, does great honor to the Academy. The Duke of Anjou talks of coming to it, and the zealous are quite transported with this bit of glory. End quote. Oeuvre diverse de Patru, page 512. Queen Christina returned the next year and passed some time at Fontainebleau. It was there, in a gallery that King Louis Philippe caused to be turned into apartments, which M. Guizot at one time occupied, that she had her first equerry, Mondaldeschi, whom she accused of having betrayed her, assassinated almost before her own eyes, and she considered it astonishing and very bad taste that the court of France should be shocked at such an execution. Quote, this barbarous princess, says Madame de Motteville, after so cruel an action as that, remained in her room laughing and chatting as easily if she had done something of no consequence or very praiseworthy. The Queen Mother, a perfect Christian, who had met with so many enemies whom she might have punished, but who had received from her nothing but marks of kindness, was scandalized by it. The King and Monsieur blamed her, and the minister, who was not a cruel man, was astounded." The Queen Mother had other reasons for being less satisfied than she had been at the first trip of Queen Christina of Sweden. The young king testified much inclination for Mary de Mancini, Cardinal Mazarin's niece, a bold and impassioned creature, whose sister Olympia had already found favor in his eyes before her marriage with the Count of Soissons. The eldest of all had married the Duke of Mercoeur, son of the Duke of Vendôme. The other two were destined to be united, at a later period, to the Dukes of Bouillon and La Maillere. The hopes of Mary went still higher. Relying on the love of young Louis the Fourteenth, she dared to dream of the throne, and the Queen of Sweden encouraged her. Quote, the right thing is to marry one's love, she told the king. No time was lost in letting Christina understand that she could not remain long in France. The cardinal, quote, with a moderation for which he cannot be sufficiently commended, says Madame de Motteville, himself put obstacles in the way of his niece's ambitious designs. He sent her to the convent of Brouage, threatening, if that exile were not sufficient, to leave France and take his niece with him. End quote. Quote, no power, he said to the king, can wrest from me the free authority of disposal which God and the laws give me over my family. Quote, you are king, you weep, and yet I am going away, said the young girl to her royal lover, who let her go. Mary de Mancini was mistaken, he was not yet king. Cardinal Mazarin and the queen had other views regarding the marriage of Louis the Fourteenth. For a long time past the object of their labors had been to terminate the war by an alliance with Spain. The Infanta Maria Teresa was no longer heiress to the crown, for King Philip at last had a son. Spain was exhausted by long-continued efforts and dismayed by the checks received in the campaign of 1658. The alliance of the Rhine, recently concluded at Frankfurt between the two leagues, Catholic and Protestant, confirmed immutably the advantages which the Treaty of Westphalia had secured to France. The electors had just raised to the head of the empire young Leopold I on the death of his father, Ferdinand III, and they proposed their mediation between France and Spain. Whilst King Philip IV was still hesitating, Mazarin took a step in another direction. The king set out for Lyon, accompanied by his mother and his minister, to go and see Princess Margaret of Savoy, who had been proposed to him a long time ago as his wife. He was pleased with her, and negotiations were already pretty far advanced, to the great displeasure of the Queen Mother, when the Cardinal, on the 29th of November, 1659, in the evening, entered Anne of Austria's room. Quote, he found her pensive and melancholy, but he was all smiles. "'Good news, madame,' said he. "'Ah!' cried the Queen. "'Is it to be peace?' "'More than that, madame. I bring your Majesty both peace and the Infanta.'" The Spaniards had become uneasy, and Don Antonio de Pimentel had arrived at Lyon at the same time with the court of Savoy, bearing a letter from Philip IV for the queen, his sister. The Duchess of Savoy had to depart and take her daughter with her, disappointed of her hopes. All the consolation she obtained was a written promise that the king would marry Princess Margaret, if the marriage with the Infanta were not accomplished within a year. The year had not yet rolled away, and the Duchess of Savoy had already lost every atom of illusion. Since the 13th of August, Cardinal Mazarin had been officially negotiating with Don Luis de Aro, representing Philip IV. The ministers had held a meeting in the middle of the Bidassoa, on the island of Pheasants, where a pavilion had been erected on the boundary line between the two states. 
On the 7th of November, the Peace of the Pyrenees was signed at last. It put an end to a war which had continued for twenty-three years, often internecine, always burdensome, and which had ruined the finances of the two countries. France was the gainer of Artois and Roussillon, and of several places in Flanders, Hainaut, and Luxembourg and the peace of Westphalia was recognized by Spain, to whom France restored all that she held in Catalonia and in Franche-Comté. Philip IV had refused to include Portugal in the treaty. The Infanta received as dowry five hundred thousand gold crowns, and renounced all her right to the throne of Spain. The Prince of Condé was taken back to favor by the king, and declared that he would fain redeem with his blood all the hostilities he had committed in and out of France. The king restored him to all his honors and dignities, gave him the government of Burgundy, and bestowed on his son, the Duke of Enghien, the office of Grand Master of France. The honor of the king of Spain was saved, he did not abandon his allies, and he made a great match for his daughter. But the eyes of Europe were not blinded. It was France that triumphed. The policy of Cardinal Richelieu and of Cardinal Mazarin were everywhere successful. The work of Henry the Fourth was completed, the House of Austria was humiliated and vanquished in both its branches. The man who had concluded the Peace of Westphalia and the Peace of the Pyrenees had a right to say, quote, I am more French in heart than in speech. End quote. The Prince of Condé returned to court, quote, as if he had never gone away, says Mademoiselle de Montpensier. Memoir, page 451. Quote, the king talked familiarly with him of all that he had done both in France and in Flanders, and that with as much gusto as if all those things had taken place for his service. Quote, the prince discovered him to be so great in every point that from the first moment at which he could approach him he comprehended, as it appeared, that the time had come to humble himself. That genius for sovereignty and command which God had implanted in the king, and which was beginning to show itself, persuaded the Prince of Condé that all which remained of the previous reign was about to be annihilated. Memoir de Madame de Matteville, page 39. From that day, King Louis the Fourteenth had no more submissive subject than the great Condé. The court was in the south, travelling from town to town, pending the arrival of the dispensations from Rome. On the 3rd of June, 1660, Don Louis de Aro, in the name of the King of France, espoused the Infanta in the church of Fonfrabia. Mademoiselle de Montpensier made up her mind to be present, unknown to anybody, at the ceremony. When it was over, the new queen, knowing that the king's cousin was there, went up to her, saying, quote, I should like to embrace this fair unknown, end quote, and led her away to her room, chatting about everything but pretending not to know her. The Queen Mother and King Philip the Fourth met next day on the island of Pheasants, after forty-five years' separation. The King had come privately to have a view of the Infanta, and he watched her through a door ajar, towering a whole head above the courtiers. Quote, May I ask my niece what she thinks of this unknown, said Anne of Austria to her brother. Quote, it will be time when she has passed that door, replied the King. Young Monsieur, the King's brother, leaned forward towards his sister-in-law and, quote, What does Your Majesty think of this door? he whispered. Quote, I think it very nice and handsome, answered the young Queen. The King had thought her handsome, quote, despite the ugliness of her headdress and of her clothes, which had at first taken him by surprise. End quote. King Philip the Fourth kept looking at Monsieur de Turenne, who had accompanied the King. Quote, that man has given me dreadful times, he repeated twice or thrice. Quote, you can judge whether M. de Turenne felt himself offended, says Mademoiselle de Montpensier. The definitive marriage took place at Saint-Jean-de-Luz on the 9th of June, and the court took the road leisurely back to Vincennes. Scarcely had the arrival taken place when all the sovereign bodies sent a solemn deputation to pay their respects to Cardinal Mazarin and thank him for the peace he had just concluded. It was an unprecedented honor paid to a minister upon whose head the Parliament had but lately set a price. The cardinal's triumph was as complete at home as abroad. All foes had been reduced to submission or silence, Paris and France rejoicing over the peace and the king's marriage. But like Cardinal Richelieu, Mazarin succumbed at the very pinnacle of his glory and power. The gout to which he was subject flew to his stomach, and he suffered excruciating agonies. One day, when the king came to get his advice upon a certain matter, quote, Sir, said the cardinal, you are asking counsel of a man who no longer has his reason and who raves, end quote. He saw the approach of death calmly, but not unregretfully. Concealed one day, behind a curtain in the new apartments of the Mazarin Palace, now the National Library, young Brienne heard the cardinal coming. Quote, he dragged his slippers along like a man very languid, and just recovering from some serious illness. He paused at every step, for he was very feeble. 
He fixed his gaze first on one side and then on the other, and letting his eyes wander over the magnificent objects of art he had been all his life collecting, he said, "'All that must be left behind,' and turning round, he added, "'And that, too, what trouble I have had to obtain all these things. I shall never see them more where I am going.'" He had himself removed to Vincennes, of which he was governor. There he continued to regulate all the affairs of state, striving to initiate the young king in the government. Quote, Nobody, Turenne used to say, works so much as the cardinal, or discovers so many expedients with great clearness of mind for the terminating of much business of different sorts. End quote. The dying minister recommended to the king Messieurs Le Tellier and de Lyon, and he added, quote, Sir, to you I owe everything, but I consider that I, to some extent, acquit myself of my obligation to your majesty by giving you Monsieur Colbert, end quote. The cardinal, uneasy about the large possessions he left, had found a way of securing them to his heirs by making, during his lifetime, a gift of the whole of them to the king. Louis the Fourteenth at once returned it. The minister had lately placed his two nieces, the Princess of Conti and the Countess of Soissons, at the head of the household of two queens. He had married his niece, Hortensia Mancini, to the Duke of La Maire, who took the title of Duke of Mazarin. The father of this duke was the relative and protégé of Cardinal Richelieu, for whom Mazarin had always preserved a feeling of great gratitude. It was to him and his wife that he left the remainder of his vast possessions, after having distributed amongst all his relatives liberal bequests to an enormous amount. The pictures and jewels went to the king, to monsieur, and to the queens. A considerable sum was employed for the foundation and endowment of the Collège des Quatre Nations, now the Palais de l'Institut intended for the education of sixty children of the four provinces reunited to France by the treaties of Westphalia and the Pyrenees, Alsace, Roussillon, Artois, and Pignerol. The cardinal's fortune was estimated at fifty millions. Mazarin had scarcely finished making his final dispositions when his malady increased to a violent pitch. Quote, On the 5th of March, forty hours public prayers were ordered in all the churches of Paris, which is not generally done except in the case of kings, says Madame de Motteville. The cardinal had sent for M. Jol, parish priest of Saint-Nicolas-des-Champs, a man of great reputation for piety, and begged him not to leave him. Quote, I have misgivings about not being sufficiently afraid of death, he said to his confessor. He felt his own pulse himself, muttering quite low, quote, I shall have a great deal more to suffer. End quote. The king had left him on the 7th of March in the evening. He did not see him again, and sent to summon the ministers. Already the living was taking the place of the dying, with a commencement of pomp and circumstance which excited wonder at the changes of the world. Quote, On the ninth, between two and three in the morning, Mazarin raised himself slightly in his bed, praying to God and suffering greatly. Then he said aloud, Ah, oh, holy virgin, have pity upon me, receive my soul. And so he expired, showing a fair front to death up to the last moment. End quote. The Queen Mother had left her room for the last two days, because it was too near that of the dying man. Quote, she wept less than the King, says Madame de Motteville, being more disgusted with the creatures of his making by reason of the knowledge she had of their imperfections, insomuch that it was soon easy to see that the defects of the dead man would before long appear to her greater than they had yet been in her eyes, for he did not content himself with exercising sovereign power over the whole realm but he exercised it over the sovereigns themselves who had given it him, not leaving them liberty to dispose of anything of any consequence. End quote. Memoire de Madame de Motteville, page 103. Louis XIV was about to reign with a splendor and puissance without precedent. His subjects were submissive, and Europe at peace. He was reaping the fruits of the labors of his grandfather Henry IV, of Cardinal Richelieu, and of Cardinal Mazarin. Whilst continuing the work of Henry IV, Richelieu had rendered possible the government of Mazarin. He had set the kingly authority on foundations so strong that the princes of the blood themselves could not shake it. Mazarin had destroyed party and secured to France a glorious peace. Great minister had succeeded great king, and able man, great minister. Italian prudence, dexterity, and finesse had replaced the indomitable will, the incomparable judgment, and the grandeur of view of the French priest and nobleman. Richelieu and Mazarin had accomplished their patriotic work. The king's turn had come. End of section 43. End of chapter 43. Section 44 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. 
Chapter forty four Louis the fourteenth His Wars and His Conquests sixteen sixty one to sixteen ninety seven Part one Cardinal Mazarin on his deathbed had given the young king this advice quote, Manage your affairs yourself, sir, and raise no more premier ministers to where your bounties have placed me. I have discovered, by what I might have done against your service, how dangerous it is for a king to put his servants in such a position. End quote. Mazarin knew thoroughly the king whose birth he had seen. Quote, he has in him the making of four kings and one honest man, he used to say. Scarcely was the minister dead when Louis XIV sent to summon his council. Chancellor Seguier, Superintendent Fouquet, and Secretaries of State Le Tellier, de Lyonne, Brienne, Duplessis Guenguot, and La Vrillière. Then, addressing the Chancellor, quote, Sir, said he, I have had you assembled together with my ministers and my secretaries of state to tell you that until now I have been well pleased to leave my affairs to be governed by the late cardinal. It is time that I should govern them myself. You will aid me with your counsels when I ask for them. Beyond the general business of the seal, in which I do not intend to make any alteration, I beg and command you, Mr. Chancellor, to put the seal of authority to nothing without my orders, and without having spoken to me thereof, unless a secretary of state shall bring them to you on my behalf. And for you, gentlemen, addressing the secretaries of state, I warn you not to sign anything, even a safety warrant or passport, without my command, to report every day to me personally, and to favor nobody in your monthly rolls. Mr. Superintendent, I have explained to you my intentions. I beg that you will employ the services of M. Colbert, whom the late Cardinal recommended to me. The King's counsellors were men of experience, and they all recognized the master's tone. From timidity or respect, Louis the Fourteenth had tolerated the yoke of Mazarin, not, however, without impatience and in expectation of his own turn. Portrait de la Cour, Archive Curieuse, page 371. Quote, the cardinal, said he one day, does just as he pleases, and I put up with it because of the good service he has rendered me, but I shall be master in my turn. And he added, the king, my grandfather, did great things, and left some to do. If God gives me grace to live twenty years longer, perhaps I may do as much or more. End quote. God was to grant Louis the Fourteenth more time and power than he asked for, but it was Henry the Fourth's good fortune to maintain his greatness at the sword's point, without ever having leisure to become intoxicated with it. Absolute power is in its nature so unwholesome and dangerous that the strongest mind cannot always withstand it. It was Louis the Fourteenth's misfortune to be king for seventy-two years, and to reign fifty-six as sovereign master. Quote, Many people made up their minds, says the king in his memoir, page 392, that my assiduity in work was but a heat which would soon cool. But time showed them what to think of it, for they saw me constantly going on in the same way, wishing to be informed of all that took place, listening to the prayers and complaints of my meanest subjects, knowing the number of my troops and the condition of my fortresses, treating directly with foreign ministers, receiving dispatches, making in person part of the replies, and giving my secretaries the substance of the others, regulating the receipts and expenditures of my kingdom, having reports made to myself in person by those who were in important offices, keeping my affairs secret, distributing graces according to my own choice, reserving to myself alone all my authority, and confining those who served me to a modest position very far from the elevation of premier ministers." End quote. The young king, from the first, regulated his life and his time. Quote, I laid it down as a law to myself, he says in his Instruction au Dauphin, to work regularly twice a day. I cannot tell you what fruit I reaped immediately after this resolution. I felt myself rising, as it were, both in mind and courage. I found myself quite another being. I discovered in myself what I had no idea of, and I joyfully reproached myself for having been so long ignorant of it. Then it dawned upon me that I was king, and was born to be. A taste for order and regularity was natural to Louis the Fourteenth, and he soon made it apparent in his councils. Quote, Under Cardinal Mazarin there was literally nothing but disorder and confusion. He had the council held whilst he was being shaved and dressed, without ever giving anybody a seat, not even the Chancellor or Marshal Villeroy, and he was often chattering with his linnet and his monkey all the time he was being talked to about business. After Mazarin's death, the King's Council assumed a more decent form. 
The king alone was seated, all the others remained standing, the chancellor leaned against the bed-rail, and Monsieur de Lyonne upon the edge of the chimney-piece. He who was making a report placed himself opposite the king, and if he had to write, sat down on a stool which was at the end of the table, where there was a writing-desk and paper. End quote. Histoire de France by Le P. Daniel, page 89. Quote, I will settle this matter with your majesty's ministers, said the Portuguese ambassador one day to the young king. Quote, I have no ministers, Mr. Ambassador, replied Louis the Fourteenth. You mean to say my men of business. End quote. Long habituation to the office of king was not destined to wear out, to exhaust the youthful ardor of King Louis the Fourteenth. He had been for a long while governing when he wrote, quote, you must not imagine, my son, that affairs of state are like those obscure and thorny passages in the sciences which you will perhaps have found fatiguing, at which the mind strives to raise itself by an effort beyond itself, and which repel us quite as much by their, at any rate, apparent uselessness as by their difficulty. The function of kings consists principally in leaving good sense to act, which always acts naturally, without any trouble. All that is most necessary in this kind of work is at the same time agreeable, for it is in a word, my son, to keep an open eye over all the world, to be continually learning news from all the provinces and all nations, the secrets of all courts, the temper and the foible of all foreign princes and ministers, to be informed about an infinite number of things of which we are supposed to be ignorant, to see in our own circle that which is most carefully hidden from us to discover the most distant views of our own courtiers and their most darkly cherished interests which come to us through contrary interests, and in fact I know not what other pleasure we would not give up for this, even if it were curiosity alone that caused us to feel it. End quote. Memoir de Louis XIV, page 428. At twenty-two years of age, no more than during the rest of his life was Louis the Fourteenth disposed to sacrifice business to pleasure, but he did not sacrifice pleasure to business. It was on a taste so natural to a young prince, for the first time free to do as he pleased, that Superintendent Fouquet counted to increase his influence and probably his power with the king. Quote, the Attorney General, for Fouquet was Attorney General in the Parliament of Paris, though a great thief, will remain master of the others, the Queen Mother had said to Madame de Motteville at the time of Mazarin's death. Fouquet's hopes led him to think of nothing less than to take the minister's place. Fouquet, who was born in 1615 and had been superintendent of finance in conjunction with Servien since 1655, had been in sole possession of that office since the death of his colleague in 1659. He had faithfully served Cardinal Mazarin through the troubles of the Fronde. The latter had kept him in power in spite of numerous accusations of malversation and extravagance. Fouquet, however, was not certain of the cardinal's good faith. He bought Belle-Ile to secure for himself a retreat, and prepared for his personal defence a mad project which was destined subsequently to be his ruin. From the commencement of his reign, the counsels of Mazarin on his deathbed, the suggestions of Colbert, the first observations made by the king himself, irrevocably ruined Fouquet in the mind of the young monarch. Whilst the superintendent was dreaming of the ministry and his friends calling him the future, when he was preparing in his castle of vaux le vicomte an entertainment in the king's honour at a cost of forty thousand crowns, Louis the Fourteenth, in concert with Colbert, had resolved upon his ruin. The form of trial was decided upon. The king did not want to have any trouble with the Parliament, and Colbert suggested to Fouquet the idea of ridding himself of his office of attorney-general. Achille d'Arlay bought it for fourteen hundred thousand livres. A million in ready money was remitted to the king for his majesty's urgent necessities. The superintendent was buying up everybody, even the king. On the 17th of August, 1661, the whole court thronged the gardens of Vaux, designed by Le Nettre. The king, whilst admiring the pictures of Lebrun, the Fâcheux of Molière represented that day for the first time, and the gold and silver plate which encumbered the tables, felt his inward wrath redoubled. Quote, Ah, madame, he said to the queen, his mother, shall not we make all these fellows disgorge? End quote. He would have had the superintendent arrested in the very midst of those festivities, the very splendor of which was an accusation against him. Anne of Austria, inclined in her heart to be indulgent towards Fouquet, restrained him. Quote, Such a deed would scarcely be to your honor, my son, she said. Everybody can see that this poor man is ruining himself to give you good cheer, and you would have him arrested in his own house. Quote, 
I put off the execution of my design, says Louis the Fourteenth in his memoir, which caused me incredible pain, for I saw that during that time he was practicing new devices to rob me. You can imagine that at the age I then was, it required my reason to make a great effort against my feelings in order to act with so much self-control. All France commended especially the secrecy with which I had for three or four months kept a resolution of that sort, particularly as it concerned a man who had such special access to me, who had dealings with all that approached me, who received information from within and from without the kingdom, and who of himself must have been led by the voice of his own conscience to apprehend everything." Fouquet apprehended and became reassured by turns. The king, he said, had forgiven him all the disorder which the troubles of the times and the absolute will of Mazarin had possibly caused in the finances. However, he was anxious when he followed Louis the Fourteenth to Nantes, the king being about to hold an assembly of the states of Brittany. Quote, Nantes, Belle-Ile, Nantes, Belle-Ile, he kept repeating. On arriving, Fouquet was ill and trembled as if he had the ague. He did not present himself to the king. On the 5th of September, in the evening, the king himself wrote to the Queen Mother, quote, My dear mother, I wrote you word this morning about the execution of the orders I had given to have the superintendent arrested. You know that I have had this matter for a long while on my mind, but it was impossible to act sooner, because I wanted him, first of all, to have thirty thousand crowns paid in for the marine, and because, moreover, it was necessary to see to various matters which could not be done in a day and you cannot imagine the difficulty I had in merely finding means of speaking in private to D'Artagnan. I felt the greatest impatience in the world to get it over, there being nothing else to detain me in this district. At last, this morning, the superintendent having come to work with me as usual, I talked to him first of one matter, and then of another, and made a show of searching for papers, until, out of the window of my closet, I saw D'Artagnan in the castle-yard, and then I dismissed the superintendent, who, after chatting a little while at the bottom of the staircase with La Feuillade, disappeared during the time he was paying his respects to Monsieur Le Tellier, so that poor D'Artagnan thought he had missed him, and sent me word by Maupertuis that he suspected that somebody had given him warning to look to his safety. But he caught him again in the place where the great church stands, and arrested him for me about midday. They put the superintendent into one of my carriages, followed by my musketeers, to escort him to the castle of Angers, whilst his wife, by my orders, is off to Limoges. I have told those gentlemen who are here with me that I would have no more superintendents, but myself take the work of finance, in conjunction with faithful persons who will do nothing without me, knowing that this is the true way to place myself in affluence and relieve my people." During the little attention I have as yet given thereto, I observed some important matters which I did not at all understand. You will have no difficulty in believing that there have been many people placed in a great fix, but I am very glad for them to see that I am not such a dupe as they supposed, and that the best plan is to hold to me. Three years were to roll by before the end of Fouquet's trial. In vain had one of the superintendent's valets, getting the start of all the king's couriers, shown sense enough to give timely warning to his distracted friends. Fouquet's papers were seized, and very compromising they were for him, as well as for a great number of court personages of both sexes. Colbert prosecuted the matter with a rigorous justice that looked very like hate. The king's self-esteem was personally involved in procuring the condemnation of a minister guilty of great extravagances and much irregularity rather than of intentional want of integrity. Public feeling was at first so greatly against the superintendent that the peasant shouted to the musketeers told off to escort him from Angers to the Bastille, quote, No fear of his escaping, we would hang him with our own hands. End quote. But the length and the harshness of the proceedings, the efforts of Fouquet's family and friends, the wrath of the Parliament, out of whose hands the case had been taken in favor of carefully chosen commissioners, brought about a great change. Of the two prosecuting counsel, or conseiller rapporteur, one, M. de Saint-Hélène, was inclined towards severity. The other, Olivier d'Ormesson, a man of integrity and courage, thought of nothing but justice, and treated with contempt the hints that reached him from the court. Colbert took the trouble one day to go and call upon old M. d'Ormesson, the council's father, to complain of the delays that the son, as he said, was causing in the trial. Quote, it is very extraordinary, said the minister, that a great king, feared throughout Europe, cannot finish a case against one of his own subjects. Quote, I am sorry, answered the old gentleman, that the king is not satisfied with my son's conduct. I know that he practices what I have always taught him, to fear God, serve the king, and render justice without respect of persons. 
The delay in the matter does not depend upon him. He works at it night and day, without wasting a moment. Olivier d'Ormesson lost the stewardship of Soissonnes, to which he had the titular right, but he did not allow himself to be diverted from his scrupulous integrity. Nay, he grew wroth at the continual attacks of Chancellor Seguier, more of a courtier than ever in his old age, and anxious to finish the matter to the satisfaction of the court. Quote, I told many of the chamber, he writes, that I did not like to have the whip applied to me every morning, and that the Chancellor was a sort of chastiser I would not put up with. End quote. Journal de Livier d'Ormesson, page 88. Fouquet, who claimed the jurisdiction of the Parliament, had at first refused to answer the interrogatory. It was determined to conduct his case, quote, as if he were dumb, end quote. But his friends had him advised not to persist in his silence. The courage and presence of mind of the accused more than once embarrassed his judges. The ridiculous scheme which had been discovered behind a looking-glass in Fouquet's country-house was read. The instructions given to his friends in case of his arrest seemed to foreshadow a rebellion. Fouquet listened with his eyes bent upon the crucifix. Quote, you cannot be ignorant that this is a state crime, said the Chancellor. Quote, I confess that it is outrageous, sir, replied the accused, but it is not a state crime. I entreat these gentlemen, turning to the judges, to kindly allow me to explain what a state crime is. It is when you hold a chief office, when you are in the secrets of your prince, and when all at once you range yourself on the side of his enemies, and list all your family in the same interest, cause the passes to be given up by your son-in-law, and the gates to be opened to a foreign army, so as to introduce it into the heart of the kingdom. That, gentlemen, is what is called a state crime. End quote. The Chancellor could not protest. Nobody had forgotten his conduct during the Fronde. M. d'Ormesson summed up for banishment and confiscation of all the property of the accused. It was all that the friends of Fouquet could hope for. M. de saint Hélène summed up for the beheadal. Quote, the only proper punishment for him would be rope and gallows, exclaimed M. Poussard, the most violent of the whole court against the accused. But in consideration of the offices he has held and the distinguished relatives he has, I relent so far as to accept the opinion of M. de saint Hélène. Quote, what say you to this moderation? writes Madame de Sévigné to M. de Pomponne, like herself a faithful friend of Fouquet's. It is because he is Colbert's uncle and was objected to that he was inclined for such handsome treatment. As for me, I am beside myself when I think of such infamy. You must know that M. Colbert is in such a rage that there is apprehension of some atrocity and injustice which will drive us all to despair. If it were not for that, my poor dear sir, in the position in which we now are, we might hope to see our friend, although very unfortunate, at any rate with his life safe, which is a great matter. End quote. Quote, Pray much to your God and entreat your judges, was the message sent to Mesdames Fouquet by the Queen Mother. For so far as the King is concerned, there is nothing to be expected. Quote, if he is sentenced, I shall leave him to die, proclaimed Louis the Fourteenth. Fouquet was not sentenced. The court declared for the view of Olivier d'Ormesson. Praise God, sir, and thank him. On the 20th of December, 1664, our poor friend is saved. It was thirteen for Monsieur d'Ormesson's summing up, and nine for St. Helene's. It will be a long while before I recover from my joy. It is really too overwhelming. I can hardly restrain it. The king changes exile into imprisonment, and refuses him permission to see his wife, which is against all usage but take care not to abate one jot of your joy. Mine is increased thereby, and makes me see more clearly the greatness of our victory. Fouquet was taken to Pignerol, and all his family were removed from Paris. He died piously in his prison in 1680, a year before his venerable mother, Marie Maupiot, who was so deeply concerned about her son's soul at the very pinnacle of greatness that she threw herself upon her knees on hearing of his arrest, and exclaimed, quote, I thank thee, O God, I have always prayed for his salvation, and here is the way to it. End quote. Fouquet was guilty. The bitterness of his enemies and the severities of the king have failed to procure his acquittal from history any more than from his judges. End of section 44. Section 45 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 44. Louis the Fourteenth, His Wars and His Conquests. Part 2. Even those who, like Louis the Fourteenth and Colbert, saw the canker in the state, 
deceived themselves as to the resources at their disposal for the cure of it. The punishment of the superintendent and the ruin of the farmers of taxes, or traitants, might put a stop for a while to extravagances. The powerful hand of Colbert might re-establish order in the finances, found new manufactures, restore the marine, and protect commerce. But the order was but momentary, and the prosperity superficial, as long as the sovereign's will was the sole law of the state. Master as he was over the maintenance of peace in Europe, after so many and such long periods of hostility, young Louis the Fourteenth was only waiting for an opportunity of recommencing war. Quote, the resolutions I had in my mind seemed to me very worthy of execution, he says. My natural activity, the ardor of my age, and the violent desire I felt to augment my reputation, made me very impatient to be up and doing. But I found at this moment that love of glory has the same niceties, and if I may say so, the same timidities, as the most tender passions. For the more ardent I was to distinguish myself, the more apprehensive I was of failing, and regarding as a great misfortune the shame which follows the slightest errors, I intended in my conduct to take the most extreme precautions. End quote. The day of reverses was farther off from Louis the Fourteenth than that of errors. God had vouchsafed him incomparable instruments for the accomplishment of his designs. Whilst Colbert was replenishing the exchequer, all the while diminishing the imposts, a younger man than the king himself, the Marquis of Louvois, son of Michael Le Tellier, admitted to the council at twenty years of age, was eagerly preparing the way for those wars which were nearly always successful so long as he lived. However insufficient were the reasons for them, however unjust was their aim. Foreign affairs were in no worse hands than the administration of finance and of war. M. de Lyon was an able diplomatist, broken in for a long time past to important affairs, shrewd and sensible, more celebrated amongst his contemporaries than in history, always falling into the second rank behind Mazarin or Louis the Fourteenth, quote, who have appropriated his fame, says M. Mignet. The negotiations conducted by M. de Lyon were of a delicate nature. Louis the Fourteenth had never renounced the rights of the Queen to the succession in Spain. King Philip the Fourth had not paid his daughter's dowry, he said. The French ambassador at Madrid, the Archbishop of Embrun, was secretly negotiating to obtain a revocation of Maria Theresa's renunciation, or, at the very least, a recognition of the right of devolution over the Catholic Low Countries. This strange custom of Hainaut secured to the children of the first marriage succession to the paternal property, to the exclusion of the offspring of the second marriage. Louis the Fourteenth claimed the application of it to the advantage of the Queen, his wife, daughter of Elizabeth of France. Quote, it is absolutely necessary that justice should sooner or later be done the Queen, as regards the rights that may belong to her, or that I should try to exact it myself, wrote Louis the Fourteenth to the Archbishop of Embrun. This justice and these rights were, sooth to say, the pivot of all the negotiations and all the wars of King Louis the Fourteenth. I cannot all in a moment change from black to white all the ancient maxims of this crown, said the king. He obtained no encouragement from Spain, and he began to make preparations in anticipation for war. In this view, and with these prospects, he needed the alliance of the Hollanders. Shattered as it had been by the behavior of the United Provinces at the Congress of Munster, and by their separate peace with Spain, the friendship between the States-General and France had been re-soldered by the far-sighted policy of John Van Witt, Grand Pensionary of Holland, and preponderant with good right in the policy of his country. Bold and prudent, courageous and wise, he had known better than anybody how to estimate the true interests of Holland, and how to maintain them everywhere, against Cromwell as well as Mazarin, with high-spirited moderation. His great and cool judgment had inclined him towards France, the most useful ally Holland could have. In spite of the difficulties put in the way of their friendly relations by Colbert's commercial measures, a new treaty was concluded between Louis the Fourteenth and the United Provinces. Quote, I am informed from a good quarter, says a letter to John Van Witt from his ambassador at Paris, Boreal, June 8, 1662, that His Majesty makes quite a special case of the new alliance between him and their high mightinesses, which he regards as his own particular work. He expects great advantages from it as regards the security of his kingdom and that of the United Provinces, which, he says, he knows to have been very affectionately looked upon by Henry the Great, 
and he desires that if their high mightinesses looked upon his ancestor as a father, they should love him from this moment as a son, taking him for their best friend and principal ally. End quote. A secret negotiation was at the same time going on between John van Witt and Count d'Estrade, French ambassador in Holland, for the formation and protection of a Catholic republic in the Low Countries, according to Richelieu's old plan, or for partition between France and the United Provinces. John van Witt was anxious to act, but Louis the Fourteenth seemed to be keeping himself hedged in view of the King of Spain's death feeling it impossible, he said, with propriety and honor, to go contrary to the faith of the treaties which united him to his father-in-law. Quote, that which can be kept secret for some time cannot be forever, nor be concealed from posterity, he said to Count d'Estrade in a private letter. Anyhow, there are certain things which are good to do and bad to commit to writing. End quote. An understanding was to come without any writing. Louis the Fourteenth well understood the noble heart and great mind with which he had to deal when he wrote to Count d'Estrade, April 20, 1663, quote, It is clear that God caused Monsieur de Witt to be born, in 1632, for great things, seeing that at his age he has already for many years deservedly been the most considerable person in his state. And I believe, too, that my having obtained so good a friend in him was not a simple result of chance, but of divine providence, who is thus early arranging the instruments of which he is pleased to make use for the glory of this crown, and for the advantage of the United Provinces. The only complaint I make of him is, that having so much esteem and affection as I have for his person, he will not be kind enough to let me have the means of giving him some substantial tokens of it, which I would do with very great joy." End quote. Louis the Fourteenth was not accustomed to meet at foreign courts with the high-spirited disinterestedness of the Burgess patrician, who since the age of five-and-twenty had been governing the United Provinces. Thus, then, it was a case of strict partnership between France and Holland, and Louis the Fourteenth had remained faithful to the policy of Henry the Fourth and Richelieu when Philip the Fourth died on the 17th of September, 1665. Almost at the same time, the dissension between England and Holland, after a period of tacit hostility, broke out into action. The United Provinces claimed the aid of France. Close ties at that time united France and England. Monsieur, the king's only brother, had married Henrietta of England, sister of Charles the Second. The king of England, poor and debauched, had scarcely been restored to the throne when he sold Dunkirk to France for five millions of livres, to the great scandal of Cromwell's old friends, who had but lately helped Turenne to wrest it from the Spaniards. Quote, I knew without doubt that the aggression was on the part of England, writes Louis the Fourteenth in his memoir, and I resolved to act with good faith towards the Hollanders, according to the terms of my treaty. But as I purposed to terminate the war on the first opportunity, I resolved to act towards the English as handsomely as could be, and I begged the Queen of England, who happened to be at that time in Paris, to signify to her son that, with the singular regard I had for him, I could not without sorrow form the resolution which I considered myself bound by the obligation of my promise to take. For at the origin of this war I was persuaded that he had been carried away by the wishes of his subjects farther than he would have been by his own, insomuch that between ourselves I thought I had less reason to complain of him than for him. It is certain that this subordination which places the sovereign under the necessity of receiving the law from his people is the worst calamity that can happen to a man of our rank. I have pointed out to you elsewhere, my son, the miserable condition of princes who commit their people and their own dignity to the management of a premier minister, but it is little beside the misery of those who are left to the indiscretion of a popular assembly. The more you grant, the more they claim. The more you caress, the more they despise. And that which is once in their possession is held by so many arms that it cannot be wrenched away without an extreme amount of violence. End quote. In his compassion for the misery of the king of a free country, Louis the Fourteenth contented himself with looking on at the desperate engagements between the English and the Dutch fleets. Twice the English destroyed the Dutch fleet under the orders of Admiral Van Tromp. John Van Witt placed himself at the head of the squadron. Quote, Tromp has courage enough to fight, he said, but not sufficient prudence to conduct a great action. The heat of battle is liable to carry officers away, confuse them, and not leave them enough independence of judgment to bring matters to a successful issue. That is why I consider myself, bound by all the duties of manhood and conscience, to be myself on the watch, in order to set bounds to the impetuosity of valor when it would fain go too far. The resolution of the Grand Pensionary and the skill of Admiral Reuter 
who was on his return from an expedition in Africa, restored the fortunes of the Hollanders. Their vessels went and offered the English battle at the very mouth of the Thames. The French squadron did not leave the Channel. It was only against the Bishop of Munster, who had just invaded the Dutch territory, that Louis the Fourteenth gave his allies effectual aid. M. de Turenne marched against the troops of the bishop, who was forced to retire in the month of April, 1666. Peace was concluded at Breda, between England and Holland, in the month of July, 1667. Louis the Fourteenth had not waited for that moment to enter Flanders. Everything, in fact, was ready for this great enterprise. The regent of Spain, Marianne of Austria, a feeble creature, under the thumb of one father Nitard, a Jesuit, had allowed herself to be sent to sleep by the skilful manoeuvres of the Archbishop of Embrun. She had refused to make a treaty of alliance with England, and to recognize Portugal, to which Louis the Fourteenth had just given a French queen, by marrying Mademoiselle de Namur to King Alfonso the Sixth. The League of the Rhine secured to him the neutrality, at the least, of Germany. The emperor was not prepared for war. Europe, divided between fear and favor, saw with astonishment Louis the Fourteenth take the field in the month of May, 1667. Quote, it is not, said the manifesto sent by the king to the court of Spain, either the ambition of possessing new states or the desire of winning glory by arms which inspires the most Christian king with the design of maintaining the rights of the queen his wife. But would it not be shame for a king to allow all the privileges of blood and of law to be violated in the persons of himself? his wife, and his son. As king, he feels himself obliged to prevent this injustice, as master, to oppose this usurpation, and as father, to secure the patrimony to his son. He has no desire to employ force to open the gates, but he wishes to enter, as a beneficent son, by the rays of his love, and to scatter everywhere, in country, towns, and private houses, the gentle influences of abundance and peace, which follow in his train." End quote. To secure the gentle influences of peace, Louis the Fourteenth had collected an army of fifty thousand men, carefully armed and equipped under the supervision of Turenne, to whom Louvois as yet rendered docile obedience. There was none too much of this fine army for recovering the Queen's rights over the Duchy of Brabant, the Marquisate of Antwerp, Limbourg, Hainaut, the Countship of Namur, and other territories. Quote, Heaven not having ordained any tribunal on earth at which the kings of France can demand justice, the most Christian king has only his own arms to look to for it, said the manifesto. Louis the Fourteenth set out with M. de Turenne. Marshal Crequy had orders to observe Germany. The Spaniards were taken unprepared. Armentières, Charleroi, Douai, and Tournai had but insufficient garrisons, and they fell almost without striking a blow. Whilst the army was busy with the siege of Courtrai, Louis the Fourteenth returned to Compiègne to fetch the queen. The whole court followed him to the camp, quote, All that you have read about, the magnificence of Solomon and the grandeur of the king of Persia, is not to be compared with the pomp that attends the king in his expedition, says a letter to Bussy Rabutin from the Count of Coligny. Quote, you see passing along the streets nothing but plumes, gold-laced uniforms, chariots, mules superbly harnessed, parade horses, housings with embroidery of fine gold. Quote, I took the queen to Flanders, says Louis the Fourteenth, to show her to the peoples of that country, who received her, in point of fact, with all the delight imaginable, testifying their sorrow at not having had more time to make preparations for receiving her more befittingly. End quote. The Queen's quarters were at Courtrai. Marshal Turenne had moved on to Dandermonde, but the Flemings had opened their sluices. The country was inundated. It was necessary to fall back on Audenarde. The town was taken in two days. And the King, still attended by the court, laid siege to Lille. Vauban, already celebrated as an engineer, traced out the lines of circumvallation. The army of M. de Crequy formed a junction with that of Turenne. There was expectation of an attempt on the part of the governor of the Low Countries to relieve the place. The Spanish force, sent for that purpose, arrived too late, and was beaten on its retreat. The Burgesses of Lille had forced the garrison to capitulate, and Louis the Fourteenth entered it on the 27th of August, after ten days' open trenches. On the 2nd of September, the king took the road back to Saint-Germain. But Turenne still found time to carry the town of Allot before taking up his winter quarters. Louis the Fourteenth's first campaign had been nothing but playing at war, almost entirely without danger or bloodshed. It had, nevertheless, been sufficient to alarm Europe, 
Scarcely had peace been concluded at Breda when another negotiation was secretly entered upon between England, Holland, and Spain. It was in vain that King Charles the Second leaned personally towards an alliance with France. His people had their eyes, quote unquote, open to the dangers, incurred by Europe from the arms of Louis the Fourteenth. Quote, certain persons of the greatest influence in Parliament come sometimes to see me, without any lights and muffled in a cloak in order not to be recognized, says a letter of September 26, 1669, from the Marquis of Ruvigny to Monsieur de Lyon. They give me to understand that common sense and the public security forbid them to see, without raising a finger, the whole of the low countries taken, and that they are bound in good policy to oppose the purposes of this conquest, if His Majesty intend to take all for himself. End quote. On the 23rd of January, 1668, the celebrated treaty of the Triple Alliance was signed at The Hague. The three powers demanded of the King of France that he should grant the Low Countries a truce up to the month of May, in order to give time for treating with Spain, and obtaining from her, as France demanded, the definitive cession of the conquered places, or Franche-Comté, in exchange. At bottom, the Triple Alliance was resolved to protect helpless Spain against France. A secret article bound the three allies to take up arms to restrain Louis the Fourteenth and to bring him back, if possible, to the peace of the Pyrenees. At the same time, Portugal was making peace with Spain, who recognized her independence. The king refused the long armistice demanded of him. Quote, I will grant it up to the 31st of March, he had said, being unwilling to miss the first opportunity of taking the field. End quote. The Marquis of Castel Rodrigo made merry over this proposal. Quote, I am content, said he, with the suspension of arms that winter imposes upon the King of France. End quote. The governor of the Low Countries made a mistake. Louis the Fourteenth was about to prove that his soldiers, like those of Gustavus Adolphus, did not recognize winter. He had entrusted the command of his new army to the Prince of Condé, amnestied for the last nine years, but up to that time a stranger to the royal favor. Condé expressed his gratitude with more fervor than loftiness when he wrote to the king on the 20th of December, 1667, quote, My birth binds me more than any other to your majesty's service, but the kindnesses and the confidence you deign to show me, after I have so little deserved them, bind me still more than my birth. Do me the honor to believe it, sir, that I hold neither property nor life, but to cheerfully sacrifice them for your glory and for the preservation of your person, which is a thousand times dearer to me than all the things of the world. Quote, On pretense of being in Burgundy at the States, writes Olivier d'Ormesson, the prosecutor of Fouquet, the prince had obtained perfect knowledge that Franche-Comté was without troops and without apprehension, because they had no doubt that the king would accord them neutrality, as in the last war, the inhabitants having sent to him to ask it of him. He kept them amused. Meanwhile the king had set his army in motion without disclosing his plan, and the inhabitants of Franche-Comté found themselves attacked without having known that they were to be. Bessançon and Salin surrendered at sight of the troops. The king, on arriving, went to Dole, and superintended an affair of counterscarps and some demi lune whereat there were killed some four or five hundred men. The inhabitants, astounded and finding themselves without troops or hope of succor, surrendered on Shrove Tuesday, February 14. The king, at the same time, marched to Grey. The governor made some show of defending himself, but the Marquis of Yenne, governor-general under Castel Rodrigo, who belongs to the district and has all his property there, came and surrendered to the king, and then, having gone to Grey, persuaded the governor to surrender. Accordingly, the king entered it on Sunday, February 19, and had a Te Deum sung there, having at his right the governor-general, and at his left the special governor of the town, and the same day he set out on his return. And so, within twenty-two days of the month of February, he had set out from Saint-Germain, been in Franche-Comté, taken it entirely, and returned to Saint-Germain. This is a great and wonderful conquest from every point of view. Having paid a visit to the prince to make my compliments, I said that the glory he had won had cost him dear, as he had lost his shoes. He replied laughing that it had been said so, but the truth was that, happening to be at the guard's attack, somebody came and told him that the king had pushed forward to M. de Gadeng's attack, that he had ridden up full gallop to bring back the king, who had put himself in too great peril, and that having dismounted at a very moist spot, his shoe had come off, and he had been obliged to re-shoe himself in the king's presence. End quote. Journal de Livier d'Ormesson, page 542. End of section 45.
Section 46 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 44. Louis the Fourteenth, His Wars and His Conquests, Part 3. Louis the Fourteenth had good reason to, quote, push forward to the attack and put himself in too great peril, end quote. A rumor had circulated that, having run the same risk at the siege of Lille, he had let a moment's hesitation appear. The old Duke of Charot, captain of his guards, had come up to him and, quote, Sir, he had whispered in the young king's ear, the wine is drawn and it must be drunk, end quote. Louis the Fourteenth had finished his reconnaissance, not without a feeling of gratitude towards Charot for preferring before his life that honor which ended by becoming his idol. The king was back at Saint-Germain, preparing enormous armaments for the month of April. He had given the Prince of Condé the government of Franche-Comté. I had always esteemed your father, he said to the young Duke of Enghien, but I had never loved him. Now I love him as much as I esteem him. End quote. Young Louvois, already in high favor with the king, as well as his father, Michael Le Tellier, had contributed a great deal towards getting the prince's services appreciated. They still smarted under the reproaches of M. de Turenne touching the deficiency of supplies for the troops before Lille in 1667. War seemed to be imminent. The last days of the armistice were at hand. Quote, the opinion prevailing in France as to peace is a disease which is beginning to spread very much, wrote Louvois in the middle of March. But we shall soon find a cure for it, as here is the time approaching for taking the field. You must publish almost everywhere that it is the Spaniards who do not want peace. End quote. Louvois lied brazen-facedly. The Spaniards were without resources, but they had even less of spirit than of resources. They consented to the abandonment of all the places won in the Low Countries during 1667. A congress was opened at Aix-la-Chapelle, presided over by the nuncio of the new pope, Clement the Ninth, as favorable to France as his predecessor, Innocent the Tenth, had been to Spain. Quote, a phantom arbiter between phantom plenipotentiaries, says Voltaire, in the siècle de Louis XIV. The real negotiations were going on at Saint-Germain. I did not look merely, writes Louis the Fourteenth, to profit by the present conjuncture, but also to put myself in a position to turn to my advantage those who might probably arrive. In view of the great increments that my fortune might receive, nothing seemed to me more necessary than to establish for myself amongst my smaller neighbors such a character for moderation and probity as might assuage in them those emotions of dread which everybody naturally experiences at sight of too great a power. I was bound not to lack means of breaking with Spain when I pleased. Franche-Comté, which I gave up, might become reduced to such a condition that I should be master of it at any moment, and my new conquests, well secured, would open for me a surer entrance into the Low Countries. End quote. Determined by these wise motives, the king gave orders to sign the peace. Quote, Monsieur de Turenne appeared yesterday like a man who had received a blow from a club, writes Michael Le Tellier to his son. When Don Juan arrives, matters will change. He says that meanwhile all must go on just the same, and he repeated it more than a dozen times, which made the prince laugh. End quote. Don Juan did not protest, and on the 2nd of May, 1668, the peace of Aix la Chapelle was concluded. Before giving up Franche Comte, the king issued orders for demolishing the fortifications of Dole and Gray. He at the same time commissioned Vauban to fortify Arth, Lille, and Tournay. The Triple Alliance was triumphant, the Hollanders at the head. Quote, I cannot tell Your Excellency all that these beer brewers write to our traders, said a letter to M. de Lyon from one of his correspondents. As there is just now nothing further to hope for in respect of the Low Countries, I vent all my feelings upon the Hollanders, whom I hold at this day to be our most formidable enemies, and I exhort Your Excellency, as well for your own reputation as for the public satisfaction, to omit from your policy nothing that may tend to the discovery of means to abase this great power, which exalts itself too much. Louis the Fourteenth held the same views as M. de Lyon's correspondent, not merely from resentment against the Hollanders, who had stopped him in his career of success, but because he quite saw that the key to the barrier between the Catholic Low Countries and himself remained in the hands of the United Provinces. He had relied upon his traditional influence in the estates, as well as on the influence of John Van Witt. But the latter's position had been shaken. Quote, 
I learn from a good quarter that there are great cabals forming against the authority of M. de Witt, and for the purpose of ousting him from it, writes M. de Lyonne on the 30th of March, 1668. Louis the Fourteenth resolved to have recourse to arms in order to humiliate this insolent republic which had dared to hamper his designs. For four years every effort of his diplomacy tended solely to make Holland isolated in Europe. It was to England that France would naturally first turn her eyes. The sentiments of King Charles the Second and of his people as regarded Holland were not the same. Charles had not forgiven the estates for having driven him from their territory at the request of Cromwell. The simple and austere manners of the republican patricians did not accord with his taste for luxury and debauchery. The English people, on the contrary, despite of that rivalry in trade and on the seas which had been the source of so much ancient and recent hostility between the two nations, esteemed the Hollanders and leaned towards an alliance with them. Louis the Fourteenth, in the eyes of the English Parliament, was the representative of Catholicism and absolute monarchy, two enemies which it had vanquished but still feared. The king's proceedings with Charles the Second had therefore necessarily to be kept secret. The ministers of the King of England were themselves divided. The Duke of Buckingham, as mad and as prodigal as his father, was favourable to France. The Earl of Arlington had married a Hollander and persisted in the Triple Alliance. Louis the Fourteenth employed in this negotiation his sister-in-law, Madame Henriette, who was much attached to her brother, the King of England, and was intelligent and adroit. She was on her return from a trip to London, which she had with great difficulty snatched from the jealous susceptibilities of Monsieur, when she died suddenly at Versailles on the 30th of June, 1670. Quote, it were impossible to praise sufficiently the incredible dexterity of this princess in treating the most delicate matters, in finding a remedy for those hidden suspicions which often keep them in suspense, and in terminating all difficulties in such a manner as to conciliate the most opposite interests. This was the subject of all talk, when on a sudden resounded like a clap of thunder that astounding news, Madame is dying, Madame is dead, and there, in spite of that great heart, is this princess, so admired and so beloved, there as death has made her for us. Bossuet, Horizon Funèbre d'Henriette d'Angleterre. Madame's work was nevertheless accomplished, and her death was not destined to interrupt it. The Treaty of Alliance was secretly concluded, signed by only the Catholic councillors of Charles the Second. It bore that the King of England was resolved to publicly declare his return to the Catholic Church. The King of France was to aid him towards the execution of this project, with assistance to the amount of two millions of livres of Tours. The two princes bound themselves to remain faithful to the peace of Aix la chapelle as regarded Spain, and to declare war together against the United Provinces, the King of France would have to supply to his brother of England for this war a subsidy of three million livres of Tours every year. When the Protestant ministers were admitted to share the secret, silence was kept as to the declaration of Catholicity, which was put off till after the war in Holland. Parliament had granted the king thirteen hundred thousand pounds sterling to pay his debts, and eight hundred thousand pounds to, quote, equip in the ensuing spring, end quote, a fleet of fifty vessels, in order that he might take the part he considered most expedient for the glory of his kingdom and the welfare of his subjects. Quote, the government of our country is like a great bell which you cannot stop when it is once set going, said King Charles the Second, anxious to commence the war in order to handle the subsidies the sooner. He was, nevertheless, obliged to wait. Louis the Fourteenth had succeeded in dragging him into an enterprise contrary to the real interests of his country as well as of his national policy. In order to arrive at his ends, he had set at work all the evil passions which divided the court of England. He had bought up the king, his mistresses and his ministers. He had dangled before the fanaticism of the Duke of York the spectacle of England converted to Catholicism. But his work was not finished in Europe. He wished to assure himself of the neutrality of Germany in the great duel he was meditating with the Republic of the United Provinces. As long ago as 1667, Louis the Fourteenth had practically paved the way towards the neutrality of the Empire by a secret treaty regulating the eventual partition of the Spanish monarchy. In case the little King of Spain died without children, France was to receive the Low Countries, Franche-Comté, Navarre, Naples, and Sicily. Austria was to keep Spain and Milaness. The Emperor Leopold therefore turned a deaf ear to the entreaties of the Hollanders, who would fain have bound him down to the Triple Alliance. A new convention between France and the Empire, secretly signed on the 1st of November, 1670, made it reciprocally obligatory on the two princes not to aid their enemies. 
the German princes were more difficult to win over. They were beginning to feel alarm at the pretensions of France. The electors of Treves and of Mayence had already collected some troops on the Rhine. The Duke of Lorraine seemed disposed to lend them assistance. Louis the Fourteenth seized the pretext of the restoration of certain fortifications contrary to the Treaty of Marsal. On the 23rd of August, 1675, he ordered Marshal Crequy to enter Lorraine. At the commencement of September, the whole duchy was reduced, and the duke a fugitive. Quote, the king had at first been disposed to give up Lorraine to some one of the princes of that house, writes Louvois, but just now he no longer considers that province to be a country which he ought to quit so soon, and it appears likely that, as he sees more and more every day how useful that conquest will be for the unification of his kingdom, he will seek the means of preserving it for himself. End quote. In point of fact, the king, in answer to the emperor's protests, replied that he did not want to turn Lorraine to account for his own profit, but that he would not give it up at the solicitations of anybody. Brandenburg and Saxony alone refused point-blank to observe neutrality. France had renounced Protestant alliances in Germany, and the Protestant electors comprehended the danger that threatened them. Sweden also comprehended it, but Gustavus Adolphus and Ochsenstiern were no longer there. There remained nothing but the remembrance of old alliances with France. The Swedish senators gave themselves up to the buyer one after another. Quote, when you have made some stay at Stockholm, wrote Courtin, the French ambassador in Sweden, to Monsieur de Pompon, and seen the vanity of the Gascons of the North, the little honesty there is in their conduct, the cabals which prevail in the Senate, and the feebleness and inertness of those who compose it, you cannot be surprised at the delays and changes which take place. If the Senate of Rome had shown as little inclination as that of Sweden at the present time for war, the Roman Empire would not have been of so great an extent. End quote. The treaty, however, was signed on the 14th of April, 1672. In consideration of an annual subsidy of 600,000 livres, Sweden engaged to oppose by arms those princes of the empire who should determine to support the United Provinces. The gap was forming round Holland. In spite of the secrecy which enveloped the negotiations of Louis XIV, Van Witt was filled with disquietude. Favorable as ever to the French alliance, he had sought to calm the irritation of France, which set down the Triple Alliance to the account of Holland. Quote, I remarked, says a letter in 1669 from M. de Pompon, French ambassador at The Hague, that it seemed to me a strange thing that, whereas this republic had two kings for its associates in the Triple Alliance, it affected in some sort to put itself at their head so as to do all the speaking, and that it was willing to become the seat of all the manoeuvres that were going on against France, which was very likely to render it suspected of some prepossession in favour of Spain. End quote. John Van Witt defended his country with dignified modesty. Quote, I know not whether to regard as a blessing or a curse, said he, the incidents which have for several years past brought it about that the most important affairs of Europe have been transacted in Holland. It must no doubt be attributed to the situation and condition of this state which, whilst putting it after all the crowned heads, cause it to be readily agreed to as a place without consequence. But as for the prepossession of which we are suspected in favour of Spain, it cannot surely be forgotten what aversion we have, as it were sucked in with our milk towards that nation, the remnants that still remain of a hatred fed by so much blood and such long wars, which make it impossible for my part that my inclination should ever turn towards that crown. End quote. Hatred to Spain was not so general in Holland as Van Witt represented, and internal dissensions amongst the estates, sedulously fanned by France, were slowly ruining the authority of the aristocratic and republican party only to increase the influence of those who favoured the House of Nassau. In his far-sighted and sagacious patriotism, John Van Witt had for a long time past foreseen the defeat of his cause, and he had carefully trained up the heir of the stadtholders, William of Nassau, the natural head of his adversaries. It was this young prince whom the policy of Louis XIV at that time opposed to Van Witt in the councils of the United Provinces, thus strengthening in advance the indomitable foe who was to triumph over all his greatness and vanquish him by dint of defeats. The dispatch of an ambassador to Spain to form there an alliance offensive and defensive was decided upon. Quote, Monsieur de Beverninck, who has charge of this mission, is without doubt a man of strength and ability, said Monsieur de Pompon, and there are many who put him on a par with Monsieur de Witt. It is true that he is not on a par with the other the whole day long, and that with the sobriety of morning he often loses the desert and capacity that were his up to dinner-time. 
The Spaniards at first gave but a cool reception to the overtures of the Hollanders. Quote, they look at their monarchy through the spectacles of Philip the Second, said Beverninck, and they take a pleasure in deceiving themselves whilst they flatter their vanity. End quote. Fear of the encroachments of France carried the day, however. Quote, they consider, wrote M. de Lyon, that if they left the United Provinces to ruin, they would themselves have but the favor granted by the Cyclops to be eaten last. End quote. A defensive league was concluded between Spain and Holland, and all the efforts of France could not succeed in breaking it. John van Witt was negotiating in every direction. The treaty of Charles II with France had remained a profound secret, and the Hollanders believed that they might calculate upon the good will of the English nation. The arms of England were effaced from the royal Charles, a vessel taken by Van Tromp in 1667, and a curtain was put over a picture in the town hall of Dordrecht of the victory of Chatham, representing the Ruart, or Inspector of Dykes, Cornelius Van Witt leaning on a cannon. These concessions to the pride of England were not made without a struggle. Quote, Some, says M. de Pomponne, thought it a piece of baseness to despoil themselves during peace of tokens of the glory they had won in the war. Others, less sensitive on this point of delicacy, and more affected by the danger of disobliging a crown which formed the first and at this date the most necessary of their connections, preferred the less spirited but safer to the honorable but more dangerous councils. End quote. Charles II played with Boreal, ambassador of the United Provinces at the Court of London. Taking advantage of the estate's necessity in order to serve his nephew, the Prince of Orange, he demanded for him the office of Captain-General, which had been filled by his ancestors. Already the Prince had been recognized as Premier Noble of Zealand, and he had obtained entrance to the Council. John Van Witt raised against him the vote of the Estates of Holland, still preponderant in the Republic. Quote, the grand pensionary soon appeased the murmurs and complaints that were being raised against him, writes M. de Pomponne. He prefers the greatest dangers to the re-establishment of the Prince of Orange, and to his re-establishment on the recommendation of the King of England. He would consider that the Republic accepted a double yoke, both in the person of a chief who, from the post of Captain-General, might rise to all those which his fathers had filled, and in accepting him at the instance of a suspected crown. End quote. The Grand Pensionary did not err. In the spring of 1672, in spite of the loss of M. de Lyon, who died September 1, 1671, all the negotiations of Louis XIV had succeeded. His armaments were completed. He was at last about to crush that little power which had for so long a time past presented an obstacle to his designs. Quote, the true way of arriving at the conquest of the Spanish Low Countries is to abase the Hollanders and annihilate them if it be possible, said Louvois to the Prince of Condé on the 1st of November, 1671. And the king wrote in an unpublished memorandum, quote, In the midst of all my successes during my campaign of 1667, neither England nor the Empire, convinced as they were of the justice of my cause, whatever interest they may have had in checking the rapidity of my conquests, offered any opposition. I found in my path only my good, faithful, and old friends, the Hollanders, who, instead of interesting themselves in my fortune as the foundation of their dominion, wanted to impose laws upon me and oblige me to make peace, and even dared to use threats in case I refused to accept their mediation. I confess that their insolence touched me to the quick, and that at the risk of whatever might happen to my conquests in the Spanish Low Countries, I was very near turning all my forces against this proud and ungrateful nation." but having summoned prudence to my aid, and considered that I had neither number of troops nor quality of allies requisite for such an enterprise, I dissimulated, I concluded peace on honorable conditions, resolved to put off the punishment of such perfidy to another time. End quote. The time had come. To the last attempt towards conciliation made by Van Groot, son of the celebrated Grotius, in the name of the States General, the king replied with threatening haughtiness. Quote, when I discovered that the United Provinces were trying to debauch my allies, and were soliciting kings, my relatives, to enter into offensive leagues against me, I made up my mind to put myself in a position to defend myself, and I levied some troops. But I intend to have more by the spring, and I shall make use of them at that time in the manner I shall consider most proper for the welfare of my dominions and for my own glory. End, quote. End of section 46 Section 47 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 44. 
Louis the Fourteenth, his wars and his conquests. Part four. Quote, the king starts tomorrow, my dear daughter, writes Madame de Sevigny to Madame de Grignan on the twenty seventh of April. There will be a hundred thousand men out of Paris. The two armies will form a junction. The king will command Monsieur, Monsieur the Prince, the Prince Monsieur de Turenne, and Monsieur de Turenne, the two marshals, and even the army of Marshal Crequy. The king spoke to Monsieur de Belfond and told him that his desire was that he should obey Monsieur de Turenne without any fuss. The marshal, without asking for time, that was his mistake, said that he should not be worthy of the honor his majesty had done him if he dishonored himself by an obedience without precedent. Marshal Dumière and Marshal Crequy said much the same. M. de la Rochefoucauld says that Belfond has spoiled everything because he has no joints in his mind. Marshal Crequy said to the king, Sir, take from me my baton, for are you not master? Let me serve this campaign as Marquis of Crequy. Perhaps I may deserve that your majesty give me back the baton at the end of the war. The king was touched, but the result is that they have all three been at their houses in the country planting cabbages, or have ceased to serve. Quote, you will permit me to tell you that there is nothing for it but to obey a master who says that he means to be obeyed, wrote Louvois to M. de Crequy. The king wanted to have order and one sole command in his army, and he was right. The Prince of Orange, who had at last been appointed captain-general for a single campaign, possessed neither the same forces nor the same authority. The violence of party struggles had blinded patriotic sentiment and was hampering the preparations for defence. Out of sixty-four thousand troops inscribed on the registers of the Dutch army, a great number neglected the summons. In the towns, the burgesses rose up against the magistrates, refusing to allow the faubourg to be pulled down, and the peasants threatened to defend the dikes and close the sluices. Quote, when word was sent yesterday to the peasants to come and work on the Rhine at the redoubts and at piercing the dikes, not a man presented himself, says a letter of June 28 from John Van Witt to his brother Cornelius. All is disorder and confusion here. Quote, I hope that for the moment we shall not lack gunpowder, said Bevernink, but as for gun carriages, there is no help for it. A fortnight hence we shall not have more than seven. End quote. Louvois had conceived the audacious idea of purchasing in Holland itself the supplies of powder and ball necessary for the French army, and the commercial instincts of the Hollanders had prevailed over patriotic sentiment. Reuter was short of munitions in the contest already commenced against the French and English fleet. Quote, Out of thirty-two battles I have been in, I never saw any like it, said the Dutch admiral after the battle of Sult Bay, or Sol Bay, on the 7th of June. Quote, Reuter is an admiral, captain, pilot, sailor, and soldier all in one, exclaimed the English. Cornelius van Witt, in the capacity of commissioner of the estates, had remained seated on the deck of the admiral's vessel during the fight, indifferent to the bullets that rained around him. The issue of the battle was indecisive. Count d'Estrée, at the head of the French flotilla, had taken little part in the action. It was not at sea and by the agency of his lieutenants that Louis the Fourteenth aspired to gain the victory. He had already arrived at the banks of the Rhine, marching straight into the very heart of Holland. Quote, I thought it more advantageous for my designs, and less common on the score of glory, he wrote to Colbert on the 31st of May, to attack four places at once on the Rhine, and to take the actual command in person at all four sieges. I chose for that purpose Rheinberg, Wessel, Burek, and Orsoy, and I hope that there will be no complaint of my having deceived public expectation. The four places did not hold out four days. On the 12th of June, the king and the Prince of Condé appeared unexpectedly on the right bank of the intermediary branch of the Rhine, between the Vahal and the Issel. The Hollanders were expecting the enemy at the ford of the Issel, being more easy to pass. They were taken by surprise. The king's cuirassier regiment dashed into the river, and crossed it partly by fording and partly by swimming. The resistance was brief. Meanwhile, the Duke of Longueville was killed, and the Prince of Condé was wounded for the first time in his life. Quote, I was present at the passage, which was bold, vigorous, full of brilliancy, and glorious for the nation, writes Louis the Fourteenth. Arnheim and Deventer had just surrendered to Turenne and Luxembourg. Duisbourg resisted the king for a few days. Monsieur was besieging Zutphen. John van Witt was for evacuating The Hague and removing to Amsterdam the centre of government and resistance. The Prince of Orange had just abandoned the province of Utrecht, which was immediately occupied by the French. The defensive efforts were concentrated upon the province of Holland. Already Narden, three leagues from Amsterdam, was in the king's hands. 
Quote, we learn the surrender of towns before we have heard of their investment, wrote Van Witt. A deputation from the States was sent on the 22nd of June to the king's headquarters to demand peace. Louis XIV had just entered Utrecht, which, finding itself abandoned, opened its gates to him. On the same day, John Van Witt received in a street of The Hague four stabs with a dagger from the hand of an assassin, whilst the city of Amsterdam, but lately resolved to surrender and prepared to send its magistrates as delegates to Louis XIV, suddenly decided upon resistance to the bitter end. Quote, if we must perish, let us at any rate be the last to fall, exclaimed the town councillor Valkernier, and let us not submit to the yoke it is desired to impose upon us until there remain no means of securing ourselves against it. End quote. All the sluices were opened and the dikes cut. Amsterdam floated amidst the waters. Quote, I thus found myself under the necessity of limiting my conquests as regarded the province of Holland to Narden, Utrecht and Verden, writes Louis the Fourteenth in his unpublished memoir touching the campaign of 1672, and he adds with rare impartiality, quote, the resolution to place the whole country under water was somewhat violent, but what would not one do to save oneself from foreign domination? I cannot help admiring and commending the zeal and stout-heartedness of those who broke off the negotiation of Amsterdam, though their decision, salutary as it was for their country, was very prejudicial to my service. The proposals made to me by the deputies from the States General were very advantageous, but I could never prevail upon myself to accept them. End quote. Louis the Fourteenth was as yet ignorant what can be done amongst a proud people by patriotism driven to despair. The States-General offered him Maastricht, the places on the Rhine, Brabant, and Dutch Flanders, with a war indemnity of ten millions. It was an open door to the Spanish Low Countries, which became a patch enclosed by French possessions. But the king wanted to annihilate the Hollanders. He demanded southern Guldre, the island of Bonmel, twenty-four millions, the restoration of Catholic worship, and every year an embassy commissioned to thank the king for having a second time given peace to the United Provinces. This was rather too much, and whilst the deputies were negotiating with heavy hearts, the people of Holland had risen in wrath. From the commencement of the war, the party of the House of Nassau had never ceased to gain ground. John Van Witt was accused of all the misfortunes of the state. The people demanded with loud outcries the restoration of the Stadtholderat, but lately abolished by a law voted by the states under the presumptuous title of perpetual edict. Dordrecht, the native place of the Van Witts, gave the signal of insurrection. Cornelius Van Witt, who was confined to his house by illness, yielded to the prayers of his wife and children, and signed the municipal act which destroyed his brother's work. The contagion spread from town to town, from province to province. On the 4th of July, the States General appointed William of Orange stadtholder, captain general, and admiral of the Union. The national instinct had divined the savior of the country, and with tumultuous acclamations placed in his hands the reins of the state. William of Orange was barely two and twenty when the fate of revolutions suddenly put him at the head of a country invaded, devastated, half-conquered. But his mind as well as his spirit were up to the level of his task. He loftily rejected at the Assembly of the Estates the proposals brought forward in the King's name by Peter van Groot. Quote, to subscribe them would be suicide, he said. Even to discuss them is dangerous, but if the majority of this assembly decide otherwise, there remains but one course for the friends of Protestantism and liberty, and that is to retire to the colonies in the West Indies, and there found a new country, where their consciences and their persons will be beyond the reach of tyranny and despotism. End quote. The States General decided to, quote, reject the hard and intolerable conditions proposed by their lordships the kings of France and Great Britain, and to defend this state and its inhabitants with all their might, end quote. The province of Holland, in its entirety, followed the example of Amsterdam. The dikes were everywhere broken down, at the same time that the troops of the electors of Brandenburg and Saxony were advancing to the aid of the United Provinces, and that the emperor was signing with those two princes a defensive alliance for the maintenance of the treaties of Westphalia, the Pyrenees, and Aix-la-Chapelle. Louis XIV could no longer fly from conquest to conquest. Henceforth his troops had to remain on observation. Care for his pleasures recalled him to France. He left the command-in-chief of his army to M. de Turenne, and set out for Saint-Germain, where he arrived on the 1st of August. Before leaving Holland, he had sent home almost without ransom twenty thousand prisoners of war, who before long entered the service of the States again. Quote, it was an excess of clemency of which I had reason afterwards to repent, says the king himself. 
His mistake was that he did not understand either Holland or the new chief she had chosen. Dispirited and beaten, like his country, John Van Witt had just given in his resignation as councillor pensionary of Holland. He wrote to Reuter on the 5th of August as follows, quote, the capture of the towns on the Rhine in so short a time, the eruption of the enemy as far as the banks of the Issel, and the total loss of the provinces of Guldre, Utrecht, and over Issel, almost without resistance and through unheard-of poltroonery, if not treason, on the part of certain people, have more and more convinced me of the truth of what was in olden times applied to the Roman Republic. Successes are claimed by everybody, reverses are put down to one, or... Prospera omnes sibi vindicant, adversa uni imputantur. That is my own experience. The people of Holland have not only laid at my door all the disasters and calamities that have befallen our republic, they have not been content to see me fall unarmed and defenceless into the hands of four individuals whose design was to murder me, but when by the agency of divine providence I escaped the assassin's blows and had recovered from my wounds, they conceived a violent hatred against such of their magistrates as they believed to have most to do with the direction of public affairs. It is against me chiefly that this hatred has manifested itself, although I was nothing but a servant of the state. It is this that has obliged me to demand my discharge from the office of councillor pensionary. He was at once succeeded by Gaspard van Fegel, passionately devoted to the Prince of Orange. Popular passion is as unjust as it is violent in its excesses. Cornelius van Witt, but lately sharing with his brother the public confidence, had just been dragged as a criminal to the Hague, accused by a wretched barber of having planned the assassination of the Prince of Orange. In vain did the magistrates of the town of Dordrecht claim their right of jurisdiction over their fellow citizen. Cornelius van Witt was put to the torture to make him confess his crime. Quote, you will not force me to confess a thing I never even thought of, he said, whilst the pulleys were dislocating his limbs. His baffled judges heard him repeating Horace's ode, Justum et tenacem propiciti virum. At the end of three hours he was carried back to his cell, broken but indomitable. The court condemned him to banishment. His accuser, Tichelair, was not satisfied. Before long, at his instigation, the mob collected about the prison, uttering imprecations against the judges and their clemency. Quote, they are traitors, cried Tichelair, but let us first take vengeance on those whom we have. End quote. John van Witt had been brought to the prison by a message supposed to have come from the Ruar. In vain had his daughter conjured him not to respond to it. Quote, what are you come here for? exclaimed Cornelius on seeing his brother enter. Quote, Did you not send for me? Quote, no, certainly not. Quote, then we are lost, said John van Witt calmly. The shouts of the crowd redoubled. A body of cavalry still preserved order. A rumor suddenly spread that the peasants from the environs were marching on the Hague to plunder it. The states of Holland sent orders to the Count of Tilly to move against them. The brave soldier demanded a written order. Quote, I will obey, he said, but the two brothers are lost. End quote. The troops had scarcely withdrawn, and already the doors of the prison were forced. The Ruard, exhausted by the torture, was stretched upon his bed, whilst his brother sat by his side reading the Bible aloud. The madman rushed into the chamber, crying, quote, Traitors, prepare yourselves, you are going to die. End quote. Cornelius van Witt started up, joining his hands in prayer. The blows aimed at him did not reach him. John was wounded. They were both dragged forth. They embraced one another. Cornelius, struck from behind, rolled to the bottom of the staircase. His brother would have defended him. As he went out into the street, he received a pike-thrust in the face. The Ruar was dead already. The murderers vented their fury on John Van Witt. He had lost nothing of his courage or his coolness, and lifting his arms towards heaven, he was opening his mouth in prayer to God when a last pistol-shot stretched him upon his back. Quote, "'There's the perpetual edict floored,' shouted the assassins, lavishing upon the two corpses insults and imprecations. It was only at night, and after having with difficulty recognized them, so disfigured had they been, that poor Jacob van Witt was able to have his son's bodies removed. He was before long to rejoin them in everlasting rest. William of Orange arrived next day at The Hague, too late for his fame and for the punishment of the obscure assassins whom he allowed to escape. The compassers of the plot obtained before long appointments and rewards, Quote, he one day assured me, says Gourville, that it was quite true he had not given any orders to have the Witts killed, but that having heard of their death without having contributed to it, he had certainly felt a little relieved. End quote. History and the human heart have mysteries which it is not well to probe to the bottom. 
For twenty years John Van Witt had been the most noble exponent of his country's traditional policy. Long faithful to the French alliance, he had desired to arrest Louis the Fourteenth in his dangerous career of triumph. Foreseeing the peril to come, he had forgotten the peril at hand. He had believed too much and too long in the influence of negotiations and the possibility of regaining the friendship of France. He died unhappy, in spite of his pious submission to the will of God. What he had desired for his country was slipping from him abroad as well as at home. Holland was crushed by France, and the aristocratic republic was vanquished by monarchical democracy. With the weakness characteristic of human views, he could not open his eyes to a vision of constitutional monarchy freely chosen, preserving to his country the independence, prosperity, and order which he had labored to secure for her. A politician as bold as, and more far-sighted than Admiral Coligny, twice struck down like him by assassins, John Van Witt remained in history the unique model of a great Republican chief, virtuous and able, proud and modest, up to the day at which other United Provinces, fighting like Holland for their liberty, presented a rival to the purity of his fame, when they chose for their governor General Washington. For all their brutal ingratitude, the instinct of the people of Holland saw clearly into the situation— John Van Witt would have failed in the struggle against France. William of Orange, prince, politician, and soldier, saved his country and Europe from the yoke of Louis XIV. End of section 47《Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 44. Louis the Fourteenth, His Wars and His Conquests, Part 5. On quitting his army, the king had inscribed in his notebook, quote, My departure. I do not mean to have anything more done. End quote. The temperature favored his designs. It did not freeze. The country remained inundated and the towns unapproachable. The troops of the Elector of Brandenburg, together with a corps sent by the Emperor, had put themselves in motion towards the Rhine. Turenne kept them in check in Germany. Condé covered Alsace. The Duke of Luxembourg, remaining in Holland, confined himself to burning two large villages, Beaudegrave and Summerdam. Quote, there was a grill of all the Hollanders who were in those burgs, wrote the Marshal to the Prince of Condé, not one of whom was let out of the houses. This morning we were visited by two of the enemy's drummers, who came to claim a colonel of great note amongst them, I have him in cinders at this moment, as well as several officers that we have not, and that are demanded of us, who I suppose were killed at the approaches to the villages, where I saw some rather pretty little heaps. The attempts of the Prince of Orange on Charleroi had failed, as well as those of Luxembourg on the Hague. The Swedes had offered their mediation, and negotiations were beginning at Cologne. On the 10th of June, 1673, Louis XIV laid siege to Maastricht. Condé was commanding in Holland, with Luxembourg under his orders. Turenne was observing Germany. The king alone was with Vauban. Maastricht held out three weeks. Quote, Monsieur de Vauban, in this siege, as in many others, saved a number of lives by his ingenuity, wrote a young subaltern, the Count of Aligny. Quote, in times past it was sheer butchery in the trenches, now he makes them in such a manner that one is as safe as if one were at home. Quote, I don't know whether it ought to be called swagger, vanity, or carelessness, the way we have of showing ourselves unadvisedly and without cover, Vauban used to say, but it is an original sin of which the French will never purge themselves if God, who is all-powerful, do not reform the whole race. End quote. Maestricht taken, the king repaired to Alsace, where skilful negotiations delivered into his hands the towns that had remained independent. It was time to consolidate past conquests. The coalition of Europe was forming against France. The Hollanders held the sea against the hostile fleets. After three desperate fights, Reuter had prevented all landing in Holland. The states no longer entertained the proposals they had but lately submitted to the king at Utrecht. The Prince of Orange had recovered Narden, and just carried Bonn, with the aid of the imperialists, commanded by Montecuccilli. Luxembourg had already received orders to evacuate the province of Utrecht. At the end of the campaign of 1673, Gulder and Overissel were likewise delivered from the enemies who had oppressed and plundered them. Spain had come forth from her lethargy, and the Emperor, resuming the political direction of Germany, had drawn nearly all the princes after him into the league against France. 
the Protestant qualms of the English Parliament had not yet yielded to the influence of the Marquis of Ruvigny, a man of note amongst the French reformers, and at this time ambassador of France in London. The nation desired peace with the Hollanders, and Charles II yielded, in appearance at least, to the wishes of his people. On the 21st of February, 1674, he repaired to Parliament to announce to the two houses that he had concluded with the United Provinces, quote, a prompt peace as they had prayed, honorable, and as he hoped, durable, end quote. He at the same time wrote to Louis XIV to beg to be condoled with, rather than upbraided, for a consent which had been wrung from him. The regiments of English and Irish auxiliaries remained quietly in the service of France, and the king did not withdraw his subsidies from his royal pensioner. Thus was being undone, link by link, the chain of alliances which Louis the Fourteenth had but lately twisted round Holland. France, in her turn, was finding herself alone, with all Europe against her, scared and consequently active and resolute. The Congress of Cologne had broken up. Not one of the belligerents desired peace. The Hollanders had just settled the heredity of the Stadtholderat in the House of Orange. Louis the Fourteenth saw the danger. Quote, so many enemies, says he in his memoir, obliged me to take care of myself, and think what I must do to maintain the reputation of my arms, the advantage of my dominions, and my personal glory. End quote. It was in Franche Comte that Louis the Fourteenth went to seek these advantages. The whole province was reduced to submission in the month of June, sixteen seventy four. Turenne had kept the Rhine against the imperialists. The marshal alone escaped the tyranny of the king and Louvois, and presumed to conduct the campaign in his own way. When Louis the Fourteenth sent him instructions, he was by this time careful to add, quote, You will not bind yourself down to what I send you hereby as to my intentions, save when you think that the good of my service will permit you, and you will give me of your news the oftenest you find it possible. End quote. 30th of March, 1674. Turenne did not always write, and it sometimes happened that he did not obey. This redounded to his honor in the campaign of 1674. Condé had gained, on the 11th of August, the bloody victory of Senef over the Prince of Orange and the Allied generals. The four squadrons of the King's household, posted within range of the fire, had remained for eight hours in order of battle, without any movement but that of closing up as the men fell. Madame de Sévigny, to whom her son, standard-bearer in the Dauphin gendarmes, had told the story, wrote to M. de bussy rabutin quote, but for the Te Deum and some flags brought to Notre Dame, we should have thought we had lost the battle. End quote. The Prince of Orange, ever indomitable in his cold courage, had attacked Audenarde on the fifteenth of September, but he was not in force, and the approach of Condé had obliged him to raise the siege. To make up, he had taken Grave, spite of the heroic resistance made by the Marquis of Chemilly, who had held out ninety-three days. Advantages remained balanced in Flanders. The result of the campaign depended on Turenne, who commanded on the Rhine. Quote, if the king had taken the most important place in Flanders, he wrote to Louvois, and the emperor were master of Alsace, even without Philipsburg or Brissac, I think the king's affairs would be in the worst plight in the world. We should see what armies we should have in Lorraine, in the bishoprics, and in Champagne. I do assure you that if I had the honor of commanding in Flanders, I would speak as I do. End quote. On the 16th of June, he engaged in battle, at Sinsheim, with the Duke of Lorraine, who was coming up with the advance guard. Quote, I never saw a more obstinate fight, said Turenne. Those old regiments of the emperors did mighty well. End quote. He subsequently entered the Palatinate, quartering his troops upon it, whilst the superintendents sent by Louvois were burning and plundering the country, crushed as it was under war contributions. The king and Louvois were disquieted by the movement of the enemy's troops, and wanted to get Turenne back into Lothringen. Quote, an army like that of the enemy, wrote the marshal to Louvois on the 13th of September, and at the season it is now, cannot have any idea but that of driving the king's army from Alsace, having neither provisions nor means of getting into Lorraine, unless I be driven from the country. End quote. On the 20th of September, the burgesses of the free city of Strasbourg delivered up the bridge over the Rhine to the imperialists who were in the heart of Alsace. The victory of Ensheim, the fights of Mulhausen and Turkheim, sufficed to drive them back, but it was only on the 22nd of January, 1675, that Turenne was at last enabled to leave Alsace reconquered. Quote, there is no longer in France an enemy that is not a prisoner, he wrote to the king, whose thanks embarrassed him. Quote, Everybody has remarked that M. de Turenne is a little more bashful than he was wont to be, said Pellisson. The coalition was proceeding slowly. The Prince of Orange was ill. 
the king made himself master of the citadel of Liège and some small places. Limburg surrendered to the Prince of Condé, without the Allies having been able to relieve it. Turenne was posted with the Rhine in his rear, keeping Montecuculli in his front. He was preparing to hem him in and hurl him back upon Black Mountain. His army was thirty thousand strong. Quote, I never saw so many fine fellows, Turenne would say, nor better intentioned. End quote. Spite of his modest reserve, he felt sure of victory. Quote, this time I have them, he kept saying, they cannot escape me. End quote. On the 27th of June, 1675, in the morning, Turenne ordered an attack on the village of Salzbach. The young Count of Saint-Hilaire found him at the head of his infantry, seated at the foot of a tree, into which he had ordered an old soldier to climb, in order to have a better view of the enemy's manoeuvres. The Count of Vois sent to conjure him to reconnoiter in person the German column that was advancing. Quote, I shall remain where I am, said Turenne, unless something important occur. End quote. And he sent off reinforcements to M. de Roy. The latter repeated his entreaties. The marshal asked for his horse, and at a hard gallop reached the right of the army, along a hollow, in order to be under cover from two small pieces of cannon, which kept up an incessant fire. Quote, I don't at all want to be killed today, he kept saying. He perceived M. de Saint-Hilaire, the father, coming to meet him, and asked him what column it was on account of which he had been sent for. Quote, my father was pointing it out to him, writes young Saint-Hilaire, when unhappily the two little pieces fired. A ball, passing over the quarters of my father's horse, carried away his left arm and the horse's neck, and struck M. de Turenne in the left side. He still went forward about twenty paces on his horse's neck, and fell dead. I ran to my father, who was down, and raised him up. No need to weep for me, he said. It is the death of that great man. You may perhaps lose your father, but neither your country nor you will ever have a general like that again. Oh, poor army, what is to become of you? Tears fell from his eyes, then suddenly recovering himself. Go, my son, and leave me, he said. With me it will be as God pleases. Time presses. Go and do your duty. End quote. Memoire du Marquis de Saint-Hilaire, page 205. They threw a cloak over the corpse of the great general and bore it away. Quote, the soldiers raised a cry that was heard two leagues off, writes Madame de Sévigny. No consideration could restrain them. They roared to be led to battle. They wanted to avenge the death of their father. With him they had feared nothing, but they would show how to avenge him. Let it be left to them. They were frantic. Let them be led to battle. End quote. Montecuculli had for a moment halted. Quote, "'Today a man has fallen who did honour to man,' said he, as he uncovered respectfully. He threw himself, however, on the rear guard of the French army, which was falling back upon Alsace, and recrossed the Rhine at Altenheim. The death of Turenne was equivalent to a defeat. The Emperor Napoleon said of Turenne, quote, "'He is the only general whom experience ever made more daring.'" He had been fighting for forty years, and his fame was still increasing, without effort or ostentation on his part. Quote, M. de Turenne, from his youth up, possessed all good qualities, wrote Cardinal de Retz, who knew him well, quote, and the great he acquired full early. He lacked none but those that he did not think about. He possessed nearly all virtues, as it were, by nature. He never possessed the glitter of any. He was believed to be more fitted for the head of an army than of a party, and so I think, because he was not naturally enterprising. But, however, who knows? He always had in everything, just as in his speech, certain obscurities, which were never cleared up save by circumstances, but never save to his glory. End quote. He had said, when he set out, to this same Cardinal de Retz, then in retirement at Commercy, quote, Sir, I am no talker, or diseur, but I beg you to believe that, if it were not for this business in which perhaps I may be required, I would go into retirement as you have gone, and I give you my word that if I come back, I, like you, will put some space between life and death. End quote. God did not leave him time. He summoned suddenly to him this noble, grand, and simple soul. Quote, I see that cannon loaded with all eternity, says Madame de Sévigny. I see all that leads M. de Turenne thither, and I see therein nothing gloomy for him. What does he lack? He dies in the meridian of his fame. Sometimes, by living on, the star pales. It is safer to cut to the quick, especially in the case of heroes whose actions are also watched. M. de Turenne did not feel death. Count you that for nothing. End quote. Turenne was sixty-four. He had become a convert to Catholicism in 1668, seriously and sincerely, as he did everything. For him, Bossuet had written his exposition of faith. Heroic souls are rare, and those that are heroic and modest are rarer still. 
That was the distinctive feature of M. de Turenne. Quote, when a man boasts that he has never made mistakes in war, he convinces me that he has not been long at it, he would say. At his death, France considered herself lost. Quote, the premier president of the court of aids has an estate in Champagne, and the farmer of it came the other day to demand to have the contract dissolved. He was asked why. He answered that in M. de Turenne's time one could gather in with safety and count upon the lands in that district, but that since his death everybody was going away, believing that the enemy was about to enter Champagne. End quote. Lettre de Madame de Sévigny. Quote, I should very much like to have only two hours' talk with the shade of M. de Turenne, said the Prince of Condé, on setting out to take command of the Army of the Rhine, after a check received by Marshal Crequy. Quote, I would take the consequences of his plans if I could only get at his views, and make myself master of the knowledge he had of the country, and of Montecuccioli's tricks of feint. Quote, God preserves you for the sake of France, my lord, people said to him, but the prince made no reply beyond a shrug of the shoulders. It was his last campaign. The king had made eight marshals, quote, change for a Turenne, end quote. Crequy began by getting beaten before Treves, which surrendered to the enemy, quote, Why did the marshal give battle? asked a courtier. The king turned round quickly, quote, I have heard, said he, that the Duke of Weimar, after the death of the great Gustavus, commanded the Swedish allies of France. One parabere, an old blue ribbon, said to him, speaking of the last battle which he had lost, Sir, why did you give it? Sir, answered Weimar, because I thought I should win it. Then, leaning over towards somebody else, he asked, Who is that fool with the blue ribbon? End quote. The Germans retired. Condé returned to Chantilly once more, never to go out of it again. Montecuccioli, old and ill, refused to serve any longer. Quote, a man who has had the honor of fighting against Mohammed Caproli, against the prince, and against M. de Turenne, ought not to compromise his glory against people who are only just beginning to command armies, said the veteran general to the emperor on taking his retirement. The chiefs were disappearing from the scene. The heroic period of the war was over. Europe demanded a general peace. England and Holland desired it passionately. Quote, I am as anxious as you for an end to be put to the war, said the Prince of Orange to the deputies from the estates, provided that I get out of it with honor. End quote. He refused obstinately to separate from his allies. Quote, it is not astonishing that the Prince of Orange does not at once give way even to things which he considers reasonable, said Charles the Second. He is the son of a father and mother whose obstinacy was carried to extremes, and he resembles them in that. End quote. Meanwhile, William had just married, November 15, 1677, the Princess Mary, eldest daughter of the Duke of York and Anne Hyde. An alliance offensive and defensive between England and Holland was the price of this union, which struck Louis XIV an unexpected blow. He had lately made a proposal to the Prince of Orange to marry one of his natural daughters. Quote, the first notice I had of the marriage, wrote the king, was through the bonfires lighted in London. Quote, the loss of a decisive battle could not have scared the King of France more, said the English ambassador, Lord Montague. For more than a year past, negotiations had been going on at Nijmegen. Louis the Fourteenth resolved to deal one more great blow. The campaign of 1676 had been insignificant, save at sea. John Bart, a corsair of Dunkirk, scoured the seas and made foreign commerce tremble. He took ships by boarding and killed with his own hands the Dutch captain of the Neptune, who offered resistance. Messina, in revolt against the Spaniards, had given herself up to France. The Duke of Vivonne, brother of Madame de Montespan, who had been sent thither as governor, had extended his conquests. Duquesne, quite young still, had triumphantly maintained the glory of France against the great Reuter, who had been mortally wounded off Catana on the 21st of April. But already the possession of Sicily was becoming precarious, and these distant successes had paled before the brilliant campaign of 1677. The capture of Valenciennes, Cambrai, and Saint-Omer, the defense of Lorraine, the victory of Castle, gained over the Prince of Orange, had confirmed the king in his intentions. Quote, we have done all that we were able and bound to do, wrote William of Orange to the Estates on the 13th of April, 1677, and we are very sorry to be obliged to tell your high mightinesses that it has not pleased God to bless on this occasion the arms of the state under our guidance. End quote. Quote, I was all impatience says Louis the Fourteenth in his memoir, to commence the campaign of 1678, and greatly desirous of doing something therein as glorious as, and more useful than, what had already been done. But it was no easy matter to come by it, and to surpass the luster conferred by the capture of three large places, and the winning of a battle. 
I examined what was feasible, and Ghent being the most important of all I could attack, I fixed upon it to besiege. End quote. The place was invested on the 1st of March, and capitulated on the 11th. Ypres, in its turn, succumbed on the 25th, after a vigorous resistance. On the 7th of April, the king returned to Saint-Germain, quote, pretty content with what I had done, he says, and purposing to do better in the future, if the promise I had given not to undertake anything for two months were not followed by the conclusion of peace, end quote. Louis XIV sent his ultimatum to Nijmegen. Holland had weight in Congress as well as in war, and her influence was now enlisted on the side of peace. Quote, not only is it desired, said the grand pensionary Fagel, but it is absolutely indispensable, and I would not answer for it that the States-General, if driven to extremity by the sluggishness of their allies, will not make a separate peace with France. I know nobody in Holland who is not of the same opinion. End quote. The Prince of Orange flew out at such language. Quote, well, then I know somebody, said he, and that is myself. I will oppose it to the best of my ability, but, he added more slowly, upon reflection, if I were not here, I know quite well that peace would be concluded within twenty-four hours. End, quote. End of section forty-eight. Section forty-nine of A Popular History of France, Volume Five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume Five, by François Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter forty four Louis the fourteenth His Wars and His Conquests Part six One man alone, though it were the Prince of Orange, cannot long withstand the wishes of a free people. The Republican Party, for a while cast down by the death of John Van Witt, had taken courage again, and Louis the fourteenth secretly encouraged it. William of Orange had let out his desire of becoming Duke of Gueldre and Count of Zutphen. These foreshadowings of sovereignty had scared the province of Holland, which refused its consent. The influence of the Stadtholder was weakened thereby. The estates pronounced for peace, spite of the entreaties of the Prince of Orange. Quote, I am always ready to obey the orders of the State, said he, but do not require me to give my assent to a peace which appears to me not only ruinous, but shameful as well. End quote. Two deputies from the United Provinces set out for Brussels. Quote, it is better to throw oneself out of the window than from the top of the roof, said the Spanish plenipotentiary to the nuncio, when he had cognizance of the French proposals, and he accepted the treaty offered him. Quote, the Duke of Villa Hermosa says that he will accept the conditions. For ourselves we will do the same, said the Prince of Orange bitterly, and so here is peace made, if France continues to desire it on this footing, which I very much doubt. End quote. At one moment, in fact, Louis the Fourteenth raised fresh pretensions. He wished to keep the places on the Meuse until the Swedes, almost invariably unfortunate in their hostilities with Denmark and Brandenburg, should have been enabled to win back what they had lost. This was to postpone peace indefinitely. The English Parliament and Holland were disgusted and concluded a new alliance. The Spaniards were preparing to take up arms again. The king, who had returned to the army, all at once cut the knot. Quote, the day I arrived at the camp, writes Louis the Fourteenth, I received news from London apprising me that the King of England would bind himself to join me in forcing my enemies to make peace, if I consented to add something to the conditions he had already proposed. I had a battle over this proposal, but the public good, joined to the glory of gaining a victory over myself, prevailed over the advantage I might have hoped for from war. I replied to the King of England that I was quite willing to make the treaty he proposed to me, and at the same time I wrote to the States-General a letter, stronger than the first, being convinced that since they were wavering, they ought not to have time given to them to take counsel upon the subject of peace with their allies, who did not want it. Bavernink went to visit the king at Ghent, and he showed so much ability that the special peace concluded by his plans received in Holland the name of Benernink's peace. Quote, I settled more business in an hour with M. de Bevernink than the plenipotentiaries would have been able to conclude in several days, said Louis the Fourteenth. The care I had taken to detach the Allies one from another overwhelmed them to such an extent that they were constrained to submit to the conditions of which I had declared myself in favour at the commencement of my negotiations. I had resolved to make peace, but I wished to conclude one that would be glorious for me and advantageous for my kingdom. I wish to recompense myself by means of the places that were essential for the probable conquests I was losing, and to console myself for the conclusion of a war which I was carrying on with pleasure and success. 
Amidst such turmoil, then, I was quite tranquil, and saw nothing but advantage for myself, whether the war went on or peace were made. End quote. All difficulties were smoothed away. Sweden had given up all stipulations for her advantage. The firm will of France had triumphed over the vacillations of Charles the Second and the Allies. Quote, the behavior of the French in all this was admirable, says Sir W. Temple, an experienced diplomatist, long versed in all the affairs of Europe. Whilst our own counsels and behavior resembled those floating islands which winds and tide drive from one side to the other. End quote. On the 10th of August, in the evening, the special peace between Holland and France was signed after twenty-four hours' conference. The Prince of Orange had concentrated all his forces near Mons, confronting Marshal Luxembourg, who occupied the plateau of Casteaux. He had no official news as yet from Nijmegen, and on the 14th he began the engagement outside the Abbey of Saint-Denis. The affair was a very murderous one, and remained indecisive. It did more honor to the military skill of Prince of Orange than to his loyalty. Holland had not lost an inch of her territory during this war, so long, so desperate, and notoriously undertaken in order to destroy her. She had spent much money, she had lost many men, she had shaken the confidence of her allies by treating alone and being the first to treat, but she had furnished a chief to the European coalition, and she had shown an example of indomitable resistance. The States-General and the Prince of Orange alone, besides Louis the Fourteenth, came the greater out of the struggle." The King of England had lost all consideration both at home and abroad, and Spain paid all the expenses of the war. Peace was concluded on the 17th of September, thanks to the energetic intervention of the Hollanders. The King restored Courtrai, Audenarde, Hattes, and Charleroi, which had been given him by the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle, Ghent, Limbourg, and saint Ghislain. But he kept by definitive right Saint-Omer, Cassel, Air, Ypres, Cambrai, Bouchain, Valenciennes, and all Franche Comte. Henceforth he possessed in the north of France a line of places extending from Dunkirk to the Meuse. The Spanish monarchy was disarmed. It still required a successful campaign under Marshal Crequy to bring the emperor and the German princes over to peace. Exchanges of territory and indemnities re-established the Treaty of Westphalia on all essential points. The Duke of Lorraine refused the conditions on which the king proposed to restore to him his duchy, so Louis the Fourteenth kept Lorraine. The king of France was at the pinnacle of his greatness and power. Quote, Singly against all, as Louvois said, he had maintained the struggle against Europe, and he came out of it victorious. Everywhere, with good reason, was displayed his proud device, nec pluribus impar. Quote, my will alone, says Louis the Fourteenth in his memoir, concluded this peace, so much desired by those on whom it did not depend. For as to my enemies, they feared it as much as the public good made me desire it, and that prevailed on this occasion over the gain and personal glory I was likely to find in the continuation of the war. I was in full enjoyment of my good fortune and the fruits of my good conduct, which had caused me to profit by all the occasions I had met with for extending the borders of my kingdom at the expense of my enemies. End quote. Quote, here is peace made, wrote Madame de Sévigny to the Count of Bussy. The king thought it handsomer to grant it this year to Spain and Holland than to take the rest of Flanders. He is keeping that for another time. End quote. The Prince of Orange thought as Madame de Sévigny. He regarded the peace of Nijmegen as a truce, and a truce fraught with danger to Europe. For that reason did he soon seek to form alliances in order to secure the repose of the world against the insatiable ambition of King Louis the Fourteenth. Intoxicated by his successes and the adulation of his court, the King of France no longer brooked any objections to his will or any limits to his desires. The poison of absolute power had done its work. Louis the Fourteenth considered the quote unquote, office of king grand, noble, delightful, quote, for he felt himself worthy of acquitting himself well in all matters in which he engaged. Quote, the ardor we feel for glory, he used to say, is not one of those feeble passions which grow dull by possession. Its favors, which are never to be obtained without effort, never, on the other hand, cause disgust, and whoever can do without longing for fresh ones is unworthy of all he has received. End quote. Standing at the king's side and exciting his pride and ambition, Louvois had little by little absorbed all the functions of prime minister without bearing the title. Colbert alone resisted him, and he, weary of the struggle, was about to succumb before long, 1683 driven to desperation by the burdens that the wars and the king's luxury caused to weigh heavily upon France. Peace had not yet led to disarmament. An army of a hundred and forty thousand men remained standing, ever ready to uphold the rights of France during the long discussions over the regulation of the frontiers. 
In old papers ancient titles were found, and by degrees the villages, burgs, and even principalities, claimed by King Louis the Fourteenth, were reunited quietly to France. King Charles the Eleventh was thus alienated, in consequence of the seizure of the countship of Deux Ponts, to which Sweden laid claim. Strasbourg was taken by a surprise. This free city had several times violated neutrality during the war. Louvois had kept up communications inside the place. Suddenly he had the approaches and the passage over the Rhine, occupied by thirty-five thousand men, on the night between the 16th and 17th of September, 1681. The Burgesses sent up to ask aid from the Emperor, but the messengers were arrested. On the 30th, Strasbourg capitulated, and Louis Fourteenth made his triumphant entry there on the 24th of October. Quote, Nobody, says a letter of the day, can recover from the consternation caused by the fact that the French have taken Strasbourg without firing a single shot. Everybody says it is one of the wheels of the chariot to be used for a drive into the empire, and that the door of Alsace is shut from this moment. End quote. The very day of the surrender of Strasbourg, September 30th, 1681, Catinat, with a corps of French troops, entered Casal, sold to Louis XIV by the Duke of Mantua. The king thought to make sure of Piedmont by marrying his niece, Monsieur's daughter, to the Duke of Savoy, Victor Amadeo, quite a boy, delicate and taciturn, at loggerheads with his mother and with her favorites. Marie-Louise d'Orléans, elder sister of the young Duchess of Savoy, had married the King of Spain, Charles II, a sickly creature of weak intellect. Louis the Fourteenth felt the necessity of forming new alliances. The old supports of France had all gone over to the enemy. Sweden and Holland were already allied to the Empire. The German princes joined the coalition. The Prince of Orange, with an ever-vigilant eye on the frequent infractions of the treaties which France permitted herself to commit, was quietly negotiating with his allies, and ready to take up arms to meet the common danger. Quote, he was, says Massillon, a prince profound in his views, skilful in forming leagues and banding spirits together, more successful in exciting wars than on the battlefield, more to be feared in the privacy of the closet than at the head of armies, a prince and an enemy whom hatred of the French name rendered capable of conceiving great things and of executing them, one of whose geniuses seemed born to move at their will both peoples and sovereigns. End quote. French diplomacy was not in a condition to struggle with the Prince of Orange. M. de Pompon had succeeded Lyon. He was disgraced in 1679. Quote, I order his recall, said the king, because all that passes through his hands loses the grandeur and force which ought to be shown in executing the orders of a king who is no poor creature. End quote. Colbert de Croissy, the minister's brother, was from that time employed to manage with foreign countries all the business which Louvois did not reserve to himself. Duquesne had bombarded Algiers in 1682. In 1684 he destroyed several districts of Genoa, which was accused of having failed in neutrality between France and Spain. And at the same time Marshals Humière and Crequy occupied Audenarde, Courtrai, and Dichemude, and made themselves master of Luxembourg. The king reproached Spain with its delays in the regulation of the frontiers, and claimed to occupy the Low Countries specifically. The Diet of Ratisbon intervened. The emperor, with the aid of Sobieski, king of Poland, was occupied in repelling the invasions of the Turks. A truce was concluded for twenty-four years. The empire in Spain acquiesced in the king's new conquests. Quote, it seemed to be established, said the Marquis de Lafarge, that the empire of France was an evil not to be avoided by other nations. End quote. Nobody was more convinced of this than King Louis the Fourteenth. He was himself about to deal his own kingdom a blow more fatal than all those of foreign wars and of the European coalition. Intoxicated by so much success and so many victories, he fancied that consciences were to be bent like states, and he set about bringing all his subjects back to the Catholic faith. Himself returning to a regular life, under the influence of age and of Madame de Maintenon, he thought it a fine thing to establish in his kingdom that unity of religion which Henry the Fourth and Richelieu had not been able to bring about. He set at naught all the rites consecrated by edicts, and the long patience of those Protestants whom Mazarin called, quote-unquote, the faithful flock. In vain had persecution been tried for several years past. Tyranny interfered, and the Edict of Nantes was revoked on the 13th of October, 1685. Some years later, the reformers, by hundreds of thousands, carried into foreign lands their industries, their wealth, and their bitter resentments. Protestant Europe, indignant, opened her doors to these martyrs to conscience, living witnesses of the injustice and arbitrary power of Louis the Fourteenth. All the princes felt themselves at the same time insulted and threatened in respect of their faith, as well as of their puissance. 
In the early months of 1686, the League of Augsburg united all the German princes, Holland and Sweden. Spain and the Duke of Savoy were not slow to join it. In 1687, the Diet of Ratisbon refused to convert the Twenty Years' Truce into a definitive peace. By his haughty pretensions, the king gave to the coalition the support of Pope Innocent XI. Louis XIV was once more single-handed against all when he invaded the electorate of Cologne in the month of August 1686. Philipsburg, lost by France in 1676, was recovered on the 29th of October. At the end of the campaign, the king's armies were masters of the Palatinate. In the month of January 1689, war was officially declared against Holland, the Emperor, and the Empire. The commander-in-chief of the French forces was entrusted to the Dauphin, then twenty-six years of age. Quote, I give you an opportunity of making your merit known, said Louis XIV to his son. Exhibit it to all Europe, so that when I come to die, it shall not be perceived that the king is dead. End quote. The Dauphin was already tasting the pleasures of conquest, and the coalition had not stirred. They were awaiting their chief. William of Orange was fighting for them in the very act of taking possession of the kingdom of England. Weary of the narrow-minded and cruel tyranny of their king, James the Second, disquieted at his blind zeal for the Catholic religion, the English nation had summoned to their aid the champion of Protestantism. It was in the name of the political liberties and the religious creed of England that the Prince of Orange set sail on the 11th of November, 1688. On the flags of his vessels was inscribed the proud device of his house, I will maintain. Below were the words, Pro Libertate et Protestante Religione. William landed without obstacle at Torbay on the 15th of November. On the 4th of January, King James, abandoned by everybody, arrived in France, whither he had been preceded by his wife, Mary of Modena, and the little Prince of Wales. The convention of the two houses in England proclaimed William and Mary kings, or roi, king and queen. The Prince of Orange had declined the modest part of mere husband of the queen. Quote, I will never be tied to a woman's apron strings, he had said. By his personal qualities, as well as by the defects and errors of his mind, Louis the Fourteenth was a predestined acquisition to the cause of James the Second. He regarded the revolution in England as an insolent attack by the people upon the kingly majesty, and William of Orange was the most dangerous enemy of the crown of France. The king gave the fallen monarch a magnificent reception. Quote, the king acts towards these majesties of England quite divinely, writes Madame de Sévigny on the 10th of January, 1689. For is it not to be the image of the Almighty to support a king outdriven, betrayed, abandoned as he is? The king's noble soul is delighted to play such a part as this. He went to meet the Queen of England with all his household and a hundred six-horse carriages. He escorted her to Saint-Germain, where she found herself supplied, like the Queen, with all sorts of knick-knacks, amongst which was a very rich casket with six thousand lois d'or. The next day the King of England arrived late at Saint-Germain. The king was there waiting for him, and went to the end of the guards' hall to meet him. The king of England bent down very low, as if he meant to embrace his knees. The king prevented him, and embraced him three or four times over, very cordially. At parting his majesty would not be escorted back, but said to the king of England, This is your house. When I come hither you shall do me the honours of it, as I will do you when you come to Versailles. The king subsequently sent the king of England ten thousand louis. The latter looked aged and worn, the queen thin and with eyes that have wept, but beautiful black ones. A fine complexion, rather pale, a large mouth, fine teeth, a fine figure, and plenty of wits. All that makes up a very pleasing person. All she says is quite just and full of good sense. Her husband is not the same, he has plenty of spirit, but a common mind which relates all that has passed in England with a want of feeling which causes the same towards him. It is so extraordinary to have this court here that it is the subject of conversation incessantly. Attempts are being made to regulate ranks and prepare for permanently living with people so far from the restoration. In his pride and his kingly illusions, Louis the Fourteenth had undertaken a burden which was to weigh heavily upon him to the very end of his reign. Catholic Ireland had not acquiesced in the elevation of William of Orange to the throne of England. She invited over King James. Personally brave and blinded by his hopes, he set out from Saint-Germain on the 25th of February, 1689. Quote, Brother, said the king to him on taking leave, the best I can wish you is not to see you back. End quote. He took with him a corps of French troops commanded by M. de Rosan and the Count of Avaux as adviser. Quote, it will be no easy matter to keep any secret with the king of England, wrote Avaux to Louis XIV. He has said before the sailors of the St. Michael what he ought to have reserved for his greatest confidants. 
Another thing which may cause us trouble is his indecision, for he has frequent changes of opinion, and does not always determine upon the best. He lays great stress on little things, over which he spends all his time, and passes lightly by the most essential. Besides, he listens to everybody, and as much time has to be spent in destroying the impressions which bad advice has produced upon him, as in inspiring him with good. It is said here that the Protestants of the North will entrench themselves in Londonderry, which is a pretty strong town for Ireland, and that is a business which will probably last some days. The siege of Londonderry lasted a hundred and five days. Most of the French officers fell there. The place had to be abandoned. The English army had just landed at Carrick Fergus, August 25th, under the orders of Marshal Schomberg. Like their leader, a portion of Schomberg's men were French Protestants who had left their native country after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. They fought to the bitter end against the French regiments of Rosin. The Irish Parliament was beginning to have doubts about James II. Quote, Too English, it was said, to render full justice to Ireland. End quote. There was disorder everywhere, in the government as well as in the military operations. Schomberg held the Irish and French in check. At last William III appeared. He landed on the 14th of June, and at once took the road to Belfast. The Protestant opposition was cantoned in the province of Ulster, peopled to a great extent by Cromwell's Scotch colonists. Three parts of Ireland were still in the hands of the Catholics and King James. Quote, I haven't come hither to let the grass grow under my feet, said William to those who counseled prudence. He had brought with him his old Dutch and German regiments, and numbered under his orders thirty-five thousand men. Representatives from all the Protestant churches of Europe were there in arms against the enemies of their liberties. The forces of King James were scarcely inferior to those of his son-in-law. Louis the Fourteenth had sent him a reinforcement of eight thousand men under the orders of the Duke of Lausanne. On the first of July the two armies met on the banks of the Boyne, near the town of Drogheda. William had been slightly wounded in the shoulder the evening before during a reconnaissance. Quote, "'There's no harm done,' said he at once to his terrified friends, but as it was, the ball struck quite high enough." End quote. He was on horseback at the head of his troops. At daybreak the whole army plunged into the river. Marshal Schomberg commanded a division. He saw that the Huguenot regiments were staggered by the death of their leader, M. de Caimotte, younger brother of the Marquis of Ruvigny. He rushed his horse into the river, shouting, quote, Forward, gentlemen, yonder are your persecutors. End quote. He was killed in his turn as he touched the bank. King William himself had just entered the Boyne. His horse was taken to swimming, and he had difficulty in guiding it with his wounded arm. A ball struck his boot. Another came and hit against the butt of his pistol. The Irish infantry, ignorant and undisciplined, everywhere took flight. Quote, we were not beaten, said a letter to Louvois from M. de la Hoguette, a French officer, but the enemy drove the Irish troops like sheep before them, without their having attempted to fire a single musket shot. End quote. All the burden of the contest fell upon the troops of Louis the Fourteenth and upon the Irish gentlemen who fought furiously. William rallied around him the Protestants of Enniskillen and led them back to the charge. The Irish gave way on all sides. King James had prudently remained at a distance, watching the battle from afar. He turned bridle and hastily took the road back to Dublin. On the 3rd of July he embarked at Waterford, himself carrying to Saint-Germain the news of his defeat. Quote, Those who love the King of England must be very glad to see him in safety, wrote Marshal Luxembourg to Louvois, but those who love his glory have good reason to deplore the figure he made. Quote, I was in trouble to know what had become of the king my father, wrote Queen Mary to William the Third. I dared not ask anybody but Lord Nottingham, and I had the satisfaction of learning that he was safe and sound. I know that I need not beg you to spare him, but to your tenderness add this, that for my sake the world may know that you would not have any harm happen to him. You will forgive me this. End quote. The rumor had spread at Paris that King William was dead. The populace lighted bonfires in the streets, and the governor of the Bastille fired a salute. The anger and hatred of a people are perspicacious. End of section 49The insensate pride of king and nation was to be put to other trials. The campaign of 1689 had been without advantage or honour to the king's arms. Disembarrassed of the great Condé, of Turenne, and even of Marshal Luxembourg, who was compromised in some distressing law proceedings, 
Louvois exercised undisputed command over generals and armies. His harsh and violent genius encountered no more obstacles. He had planned a defensive war which was to tire out the Allies, all the while ravaging their territories. The Palatinate underwent all its horrors. Mannheim, Heidelberg, Spier, Worms, Bingen were destroyed and burned. Quote, I don't think, wrote the Count of Tesse to Louvois, that for a week past my heart has been in its usual place. I take the liberty of speaking to you naturally, but I did not foresee that it would cost so much to personally look to the burning of a town with a population in proportion like that of Orléans. You may rely upon it that nothing at all remains of the superb castle of Heidelberg. There were yesterday at noon, besides the castle, four hundred and thirty-two houses burned, and the fire was still going on. I merely caused to be set apart the family pictures of the Palatine house, that is, the fathers, mothers, grandmothers, and relatives of Madame, intending, if you order me or advise me so, to make her a present of them, and have them sent to her when she is somewhat distracted from the desolation of her native country. For except herself, who can take any interest in them? Of the whole lot there is not a single copy worth a dozen livres. End quote. The poor Princess Palatine, Monsieur's second wife, was not yet distracted from her native country, and she wrote in March, 1689, quote, Should it cost me my life, it is impossible for me not to regret, not to deplore, having been, so to speak, the pretext for the destruction of my country. I cannot look on in cold blood and see the ruin at a single blow in poor Mannheim of all that cost so much pains and trouble to the late Prince Elector, my father." When I think of all the explosions that have taken place, I am so full of horror that every night, the moment I begin to go asleep, I fancy myself at Heidelberg or Mannheim, and an eyewitness of the ravages committed. I picture to myself how it all was in my time, and to what condition it has been reduced now, and I cannot refrain from weeping hot tears. What distresses me above all is that the king waited to reveal his orders until the very moment of my intercession in favor of Heidelberg and Mannheim and yet it is thought bad taste for me to be afflicted. End quote. The elector of Bavaria, an able prince and a good soldier, had roused Germany to avenge his wrongs. France had just been placed under the ban of the empire, and the Grand Alliance was forming. All the German princes joined it. The United Provinces, England and Spain, combined for the restoration of the treaties of Westphalia and of the Pyrenees. Europe had mistaken hopes of forcing Louis the Fourteenth to give up all his conquests. Twenty years of wars and reverses were not to suffice for that. Fortune, however, was tiring of being favorable to France. Marshals Durat and Humière were unable to hamper the movements of the Duke of Lorraine, Charles V, and of the Elector of Bavaria. The French garrisons of Mayence and of Bonn were obliged to capitulate after an heroic defense their munitions failed. The king recalled Marshal Luxembourg to the head of his armies. The able courtier had managed to get reconciled with Louvois. Quote, you know, sir, he wrote to him on the ninth of May, 1690, with what pleasure I shall seek after such things as will possibly find favor with the king and give you satisfaction. I am too well aware how far my small authority extends to suppose that I can withdraw any man from any place without having written to you previously. It is with some repugnance that I resolve to put before you what comes into my head, knowing well that all that is good can come only from you, and looking upon anything I conceive as merely simple ideas produced by the indolence in which we are living here. End quote. The wary indolence and the observations of Luxembourg were not long in giving place to activity. The marshal crossed the Sambre on the twenty ninth of June, entered Charleroi and Namur, and on the second day of July attacked the Prince of Waldeck near the rivulet of Fleury. A considerable body of troops had made a forced march of seven leagues during the night and came up to take the enemy in the rear. It was a complete success, but devoid of result, like the victory of Staffard, gained by Catina over the Duke of Savoy, Victor Amadeo, who had openly joined the coalition. The triumphant naval battle delivered by Tourville to the English and Dutch fleets off Beachy Head was a great humiliation for the maritime powers. Quote, I cannot express to you, wrote William III to the grand pensionary Heinsius, holding in his absence the government of the United Provinces, how distressed I am at the disasters of the fleet. I am so much the more deeply affected, as I have been informed that my ships did not properly support those of the estates, and left them in the lurch. End quote. William had said, when he left Holland, quote, The Republic must lead off the dance. End quote. The moment had come when England was going to take her part in it. In the month of January, 1691, William III arrived in Holland. Quote, I am languishing for that moment, he wrote six months before to Heinsius. All the Allies had sent their ambassadors thither. Quote, 
"'It is no longer the time for deliberation, but for action,' said the King of England to the Congress. "'The King of France has made himself master of all the fortresses which bordered on his kingdom. "'If he be not opposed, he will take all the rest. "'The interest of each is bound up in the general interest of all. "'It is with the sword that we must wrest from his grasp the liberties of Europe, "'which he aims at stifling, or we must submit forever to the yoke of servitude.' As for me, I will spare for that purpose neither my influence, nor my forces, nor my person, and in the spring I will come, at the head of my troops, to conquer or die with my allies. End quote. The spring had not yet come, and already, March 15, Mons was invested by the French army. The secret had been carefully kept. On the 21st, the king arrived in person with the Dauphin. William of Orange collected his troops in all haste, but he did not come up in time. Mons capitulated on the 8th of April. Five days later, Nice, besieged by Catina, surrendered like Mons. Louis the Fourteenth returned to Versailles, according to his custom, after a brilliant stroke. Louvois was pushing on the war furiously. The naturally fierce temper of the minister was soured by excess of work and by his decline in the king's favor. He felt his position towards the king shaken by the influence of Madame de Maintenon. Venting his wrath on the enemy, he was giving orders everywhere for conflagration and bombardment, when on the 17th of July, 1691, after working with the king, Louvois complained of pain. Louis the Fourteenth sent him to his rooms. On reaching his chamber, he fell down fainting. The people ran to fetch his third son, Monsieur de Barbezieux. Madame de Louvois was not at Versailles, and his two elder sons were in the field. He arrived too late. His father was dead. Quote, so he is dead, this great minister, this man of such importance, whose egotism, or le moi, as M. Nicole says, was so extensive, who was the centre of so many things. What business, what designs, what projects, what secrets, what interests to unfold, what wars begun, what intrigues, what beautiful moves in check to make and to superintend. Ah, oh, my God, grant me a little while. I would fain give check to the Duke of Savoy and mate to the Prince of Orange. No, no, thou shalt not have one, one single moment. End quote. Thus wrote Madame de Sévigny to her daughter, Madame de Grignan. Louis the Fourteenth, in whose service Louvois had spent his life, was less troubled at his death. Quote, Tell the King of England that I have lost a good minister, was the answer he sent to the complimentary condolence of King James, but that his affairs and mine will go on none the worse. End quote. In his secret heart, and beneath the veil of his majestic observance of the proprieties, the king thought that his business, as well as the agreeableness of his life, would probably gain from being no longer subject to the tempers and the roughnesses of Louvois. The grand monarch considered that he had trained, or instruit, his minister, but he felt that the pupil had got away from him. He appointed Barbezieux secretary for war. Quote, I will form you, said he. No human hand had formed Louvois, not even that of his father, the able and prudent Michael Le Tellier. He had received straight from God the strong qualities, resolution, indomitable will, ardor for work, the instinct of organization and command, which had made of him a minister without equal for the warlike and ambitious purposes of his master. Power had spoiled him, his faults had prevailed over his other qualities without destroying them. Violent, Fierce, without principle and without scruple in the execution of his designs, he had egged the king on to incessant wars, treating with disdain the internal miseries of the kingdom, as well as any idea of pity for the vanquished. He had desired to do everything, order everything, grasp everything, and he died at fifty-three, dreaded by all, hated by a great many, and leaving in the government of the country a void which the king felt all the time that he was angrily seeking to fill it up. Louvois was no more. Negotiations were beginning to be whispered about, but the war continued by land and sea. The campaign of 1691 had completely destroyed the hopes of James II in Ireland. It was decided to attempt a descent upon England. A plot was being hatched to support the invasion. Tourville was commissioned to cover the landing. He received orders to fight, whatever might be the numbers of the enemy. The wind prevented his departure from Brest. The Dutch fleet had found time to join the English. Tourville wanted to wait for the squadrons of Estrées and Rochefort. Pontchartrain had been Minister of Finance and Marine since the death of Seignelay, Colbert's son, in 1690. He replied from Versailles to the experienced sailor, familiar with battle from the age of fourteen, quote, It is not for you to discuss the king's orders. It is for you to execute them and enter the channel. If you are not ready to do it, the king will put in your place somebody more obedient and less discreet than you. End quote. Tourville went out and encountered the enemy's squadron between the headlands of the Hogue and Barfleur. He had forty-four vessels against ninety-nine, the number of English and Dutch together. 
Tourville assembled his council of war, and all the officers were for withdrawing, but the king's orders were peremptory, and the admiral joined battle. After three days' desperate resistance, backed up by the most skilful manoeuvres, Tourville was obliged to withdraw beneath the forts of La Hogue, in hopes of running his ships ashore. But in this King James and Marshal Belfont opposed him. Tourville remained at sea, and lost a dozen vessels. The consternation in France was profound. The nation had grown accustomed to victory. On the 20th of June, the capture of Namur raised their hopes again. This time again, William III had been unable to succor his allies. He determined to revenge himself on Luxembourg, whom he surprised on the 31st of August, between Enghap and Steinkirk. The ground was narrow and uneven, and the King of England counted upon thus paralyzing the brilliant French cavalry. M. de Luxembourg, ill of fever as he was, would fain have dismounted to lead to the charge the brigades of the French guards and of the Swiss, but he was prevented. The Duke of Bourbon, the Prince of Conti, the Duke of Chartres, and the Duke of Vendôme placed themselves at the head of the infantry, and sword in hand led it against the enemy. A fortunate movement on the part of Marshal Boufflet resulted in rendering the victory decisive. Next year at Nervinden, 29th of July, 1693, the success of the day was likewise due to the infantry. On that day the French guards had exhausted their ammunition. Putting the bayonet at the end of their pieces, they broke the enemy's battalions. This was the first charge of the kind in the French armies. The king's household troops had remained motionless for four hours under the fire of the Allies. William III thought for a moment that his gunners made bad practice. He ran up to the batteries. The French squadrons did not move except to close up the ranks as the files were carried off. The King of England could not help an exclamation of anger and admiration. Quote, Insolent nation, he cried. The victory of Nervinden ended in nothing but the capture of Charleroi. The successes of Catina at Marsalia, in Piedmont, had washed out the shame of the Duke of Savoy's incursion into Dauphiny in 1692. Tourville had remained with the advantage in several maritime engagements off Cape St. Vincent, and burned the English vessels in the very roads of Cadiz. On every sea the corsairs of Saint-Malo and Dunkirk, John Bart and du Guetroin, now enrolled in the King's Navy, towed at their sterns numerous prizes. The King and France, for a long time carried away by a common passion, had arrived at that point at which victories no longer suffice in the place of solid and definitive success. The nation was at last tiring of its glory. Quote, People were dying of want to the sound of the Te Deum, says Voltaire in the Siècle de Louis XIV. Everywhere there was weariness equal to the suffering. Madame de Maintenon and some of her friends at that time, sincerely devoted to the public good, rather Christians than warriors, Fenelon, the Dukes of Bouvilliers and Chevreuse, were laboring to bring the king over to pacific views. He saw generals as well as ministers falling one after another. Marshal Luxembourg, exhausted by the fatigues of war and the pleasures of the court, died on the 4th of January, 1695, at sixty-seven years of age. An able general, a worthy pupil of the great Condé, a courtier of much wits and no shame, he was more corrupt than his age, and his private life was injurious to his fame. He died, however, as people did die in his time, turning to God at the last day, quote, I haven't lived like M. de Luxembourg, said Bordelou, but I should like to die like him. End quote. History has forgotten Marshal Luxembourg's death and remembered his life. Louis the Fourteenth had lost Condé and Turenne, Luxembourg, Colbert, Louvois, and Signolet. With the exception of Vauban, he had exhausted the first rank. Catina alone remained in the second. The king was about to be reduced to the third, sad fruits of a long reign, of an incessant and devouring activity, which had speedily used up men and was beginning to tire out fortune, grievous result of mistakes long hidden by glory, but glaring out at last before the eyes most blinded by prejudice. Quote, the whole of France is no longer anything but one vast hospital, wrote Fenelon to the king under the veil of the anonymous. The people who so loved you are beginning to lose affection, confidence, and even respect. The Allies prefer carrying on war with loss to concluding a peace which would not be observed. Even those who have not dared to declare openly against you are nevertheless impatiently desiring your enfeeblement and your humiliation as the only resource for liberty and for the repose of all Christian nations. Everybody knows it, and none dares tell you so. Whilst you in some fierce conflict are taking the battlefield and the cannon of the enemy, whilst you are storming strong places, you do not reflect that you are fighting on ground which is sinking beneath your feet, and that you are about to have a fall in spite of your victories. It is time to humble yourself beneath the mighty hand of God. You must ask peace, and by that shame expiate all the glory of which you have made your idol. 
Finally, you must give up, the soonest possible, to your enemies, in order to save the state, conquests that you cannot retain without injustice. For a long time past God has had his arm raised over you, but he is slow to smite you because he has pity upon a prince who has all his life been beset by flatterers." Noble and strong language, the cruel truth of which the king did not as yet comprehend, misled as he was by his pride, by the splendor of his successes, and by the concert of praises which his people, as well as his court, had so long made to reverberate in his ears. Louis the Fourteenth had led France on to the brink of a precipice, and he had in his turn been led on by her. King and people had given themselves up unreservedly to the passion for glory, and to the intoxication of success. The day of awakening was at hand." Louis the Fourteenth was not so blind as Fenelon supposed. He saw the danger at the very moment when his kingly pride refused to admit it. The King of England had just retaken Namur, without Villeroy, who had succeeded Marshal Luxembourg, having been able to relieve the place. Louis the Fourteenth had already let out that he, quote, should not pretend to avail himself of any special conventions until the Prince of Orange was satisfied as regarded his person and the crown of England, end quote. This was a great step towards that humiliation recommended by Fenelon. The secret negotiations with the Duke of Savoy were not less significant. After William III, Victor Amadeo was the most active and most devoted, as well as the most able and most stubborn of the Allied princes. In the month of June, 1696, the treaty was officially declared. Victor Amadeo would recover Savoy, Souza, the Countship of Nice and Pignerol dismantled. His eldest daughter, Prince Mary Adelaide, who was to marry the Duke of Burgundy, eldest son of the Dauphin, and the ambassadors of Piedmont henceforth took rank with those of crowned heads. In return for so many concessions, Victor Amadeo guaranteed to the king the neutrality of Italy, and promised to close the entry of his dominions against the Protestants of Dauphiny, who came thither for refuge. If Italy refused her neutrality, the Duke of Savoy was to unite his forces to those of the king, and command the combined army. Victory would not have been more advantageous for Victor Amadeo than his constant defeats were, but by detaching him from the coalition, Louis the Fourteenth had struck a fatal blow at the Great Alliance. The campaign of 1696 in Germany and in Flanders had resolved itself into mere observations and insignificant engagements. Holland and England were exhausted, and their commerce was ruined. In vain did Parliament vote fresh and enormous supplies. Quote, I should want ready money, wrote William III to Heinsius, and my poverty is really incredible. End quote. There was no less cruel want in France. Quote, I calculate that in these latter days more than a tenth part of the people, said Vauban, are reduced to beggary, and in fact beg. End quote. Sweden had for a long time been proffering mediation. Conferences began on the ninth of May, sixteen ninety seven, at Newburg, a castle belonging to William III, near the village of Ryswick. These great halls opened one into another. The French and the plenipotentiaries of the coalition of princes occupied the two wings. The mediators sat in the center. Before arriving at Ryswick, the most important points of the treaty between France and William III were already settled. Louis the Fourteenth had at last consented to recognize the king that England had adopted. William demanded the expulsion of James the Second from France. Louis the Fourteenth formally refused his consent. Quote, I will engage not to support the enemies of King William directly or indirectly, said he. It would not comport with my honor to have the name of King James mentioned in the treaty. End quote. William contented himself with the concession, and merely desired that it should be reciprocal. Quote, All Europe has sufficient confidence in the obedience and submission of my people, said Louis the Fourteenth, and when it is my pleasure to prevent my subjects from assisting the King of England, there are no grounds for fearing lest he should find any assistance in my kingdom. There can be no occasion for reciprocity. I have neither sedition nor faction to fear. End quote. Language too haughty for a king who had passed his infancy in the midst of the troubles of the Fronde, but language explained by the patience and fidelity of the nation towards the sovereign who had so long lavished upon it the intoxicating pleasures of success. France offered restitution of Strasbourg, Luxembourg, Mons, Charleroi, and Dinan, restoration of the House of Lorraine, with the conditions proposed at Nijmegen, and recognition of the King of England. Quote, we have no equivalent to claim, said the French plenipotentiaries haughtily. Your masters have never taken anything from ours. End quote. On the 27th of July, a preliminary deed was signed between Marshal Boufflet and Bentinck, Earl of Portland, the intimate friend of King William. The latter left the army and retired to his castle of Loo. There it was that he heard of the capture of Barcelona by the Duke of Vendôme. 
Spain, which had hitherto refused to take part in the negotiations, lost all courage and loudly demanded peace. But France withdrew her concessions on the subject of Strasbourg and proposed to give as equivalent Freiburg in Brisgau and Brisach. William III did not hesitate. Heinsius signed the peace in the name of the States General on the 20th of September at midnight. The English and Spanish plenipotentiaries did the same. The Emperor and the Empire were alone in still holding out. The Emperor Leopold made pretensions to regulate in advance the Spanish succession, and the Protestant princes refused to accept the maintenance of the Catholic worship in all the places in which Louis XIV had restored it. Here again the will of William III prevailed over the irresolution of his allies. Quote, the Prince of Orange is sole arbiter of Europe, Pope Innocent XII had said to Lord Perth, who had a commission to him from James II. Peoples and kings are his slaves. They will do nothing which might displease him. End quote. Quote, I ask, said William, where anybody can see a probability of making France give up a concession, where anybody can see a probability of making France give up a succession for which she would maintain, at need, a twenty years' war. And God knows if we are in a position to dictate laws to France. End quote. The emperor yielded, despite the ill humor of the Protestant princes. For the ease of their consciences, they joined England and Holland in making a move on behalf of the French reformers. Louis the Fourteenth refused to discuss the matter, saying, quote, "It is my business, which concerns none but me." End quote. Up to this day, the refugees had preserved some hope. Henceforth, their country was lost to them. Many got themselves naturalized in the countries which had given them asylum. The revolution of 1789 alone was to reopen to their children the gates of France. For the first time since Cardinal Richelieu, France moved back her frontiers by the signature of a treaty. She had gained the important place of Strasbourg, but she lost nearly all she had won by the Treaty of Nijmegen in the Low Countries and in Germany. She kept Franche-Comté, but she gave up Lothringen. Louis the Fourteenth had wanted to aggrandize himself at any price and at any risk. He was now obliged to precipitately break up the Grand Alliance, for King Charles the Second was slowly dying at Madrid, and the Spanish succession was about to open. Ignorant of the supreme evils and sorrows which awaited him on this fatal path, the King of France began to forget, in this distant prospect of fresh aggrandizement and war, the checks that his glory and his policy had just met with. End of section 50 End of chapter 44《セクション51 of a Popular History of France, Volume 5。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot。Translated by Robert Black。Chapter 45 。Louis XIV, His Wars and His Reverses, 1697-1713, Part 1 。France was breathing again after nine years of a desperate war。But she was breathing uneasily, and as it were in expectation of fresh efforts. Everywhere the memorials of the superintendents repeated the same complaints. Quote, war, the mortality of 1693, the constant quarterings and movements of soldiery, military service, the heavy dues and the withdrawal of the Huguenots have ruined the country. Quote, the people, said the superintendent of Rouen, are reduced to a state of want which moves compassion. Out of 750,000 souls of which the public is composed, if this number remain, it may be taken for certain that there are not 50,000 who have bread to eat when they want it, and anything to lie upon but straw. End quote. Agriculture suffered for lack of money and hands. Commerce was ruined. The manufactures established by Colbert no longer existed. The population had diminished more than a quarter since the palmy days of the king's reign. Pontchartrain, Secretary of Finance, was reduced to all sorts of expedients for raising money. He was anxious to rid himself of this heavy burden, and became Chancellor in 1699. The King took for his substitute Chamillard, already controller of finance, honest and hard-working, incapable and docile. Louis XIV counted upon the inexhaustible resources of France, and closed his ears to the grievances of the financiers. Quote, what is not spoken of is supposed to be put an end to, said Madame de Maintenon. The camp at Compiègne, in 1698, surpassed in splendor all that had till then been seen. The enemies of Louis XIV in Europe called him, quote, the King of Reviews, end quote. Meanwhile, the King of Spain, Charles II, dying as he was, was regularly besieged at Madrid by the Queen, his second wife, Marianne of Neuburg, sister of the Empress, as well as by his minister, Cardinal Porto Carrero. 
the competitors for the succession were numerous. The king of France and the emperor claimed their rights in the name of their mothers and wives, daughters of Philip III and Philip IV. The elector of Bavaria put up the claims of his son by right of his mother, Mary Antoinette of Austria, daughter of the emperor. For a short time Charles II had adopted this young prince. The child died suddenly at Madrid in 1699. For a long time past King Louis XIV had been secretly negotiating for the partition of the King of Spain's dominions, not with the emperor who still hoped to obtain from Charles II a will in favor of his second son, the Archduke Charles, but with England and Holland, deeply interested as they were in maintaining the equilibrium between the two kingly houses which divided Europe. William III considered himself certain to obtain the acceptance by the emperor of the conditions subscribed by his allies. On the 13th and 15th of May, 1700, after long hesitation and a stubborn resistance on the part of the city of Amsterdam, the Treaty of Partition was signed in London and at The Hague. Quote, king William is honorable in all this business, said a letter to the king from his ambassador, Count de Talard. His conduct is sincere. He is proud. None can be more so than he. But he has a modest manner, though none can be more jealous in all that concerns his rank. End quote. The Treaty of Partition secured to the Dauphin all the possessions of Spain in Italy, save Milaness, which was to indemnify the Duke of Lorraine, whose duchy passed to France. Spain, the Indies, and the Low Countries were to belong to Archduke Charles. Great was the wrath at Vienna when it was known that the treaty was signed. Quote, Happily, said the minister von Kaunitz to the Marquis of Villars, ambassador of France, there is one on high who will work for us in these partitions. Quote, that one, replied M. de Villars, will approve of their justice. Quote, it is something new, however, for the King of England and for Holland to partition the monarchy of Spain, continued the Count. Quote, Allow me, replied M. de Villars, to excuse them in your eyes. Those two powers have quite recently come out of a war which cost them a great deal, and the Emperor nothing. For, in fact, you have been at no expense but against the Turks. You had some troops in Italy, and in the Empire two regiments only of hussars which were not on its pay list. England and Holland alone bore all the burden. End quote. William the Third was still negotiating with the Emperor and the German princes to make them accept the Treaty of Partition, when it all at once became known in Europe that Charles the Second had breathed his last at Madrid on the first of November, seventeen hundred, and that by a will dated October two he disposed of the Spanish monarchy in favor of the Duke of Anjou, grandson of Louis the Fourteenth. This will was the work of the Council of Spain, at the head of which sat Cardinal Porto Carrero. Quote, the national party, says M. Mignet in his Introduction au document relatif de la succession d'Espagne, detested the Austrians because they had been so long in Spain. It liked the French because they were no longer there. The former had been there time enough to weary by their dominion, whilst the latter were served by the mere fact of their removal. Single-handed, Louis the Fourteenth appeared powerful enough to maintain the integrity of the Spanish monarchy before the face and in the teeth of all the competitors. Quote, the king of Spain was beginning to see the things of this world by the light alone of that awful torch which is lighted to lighten the dying. End quote. Memoire de Saint-Simon, page 16. Wavering, irresolute, distracted within himself, he asked the advice of Pope Innocent XII, who was favorable to France. The hopes of Louis XIV had not soared so high. On the ninth of November, 1700, he heard at one and the same time of Charles II's death and the contents of his will. It was a solemn situation. The acceptance by France of the King of Spain's will meant war. The refusal did not make peace certain. In default of a French prince, the crown was to go to Archduke Charles. Neither Spain nor Austria would hear of dismemberment. Could they be forced to accept the treaty of partition which they had hitherto rejected angrily? The King's council was divided. Louis the Fourteenth listened in silence to the arguments of the Dauphin and of the ministers. For a moment, the resolution was taken of holding by the treaty of partition. Next day the king again assembled his council, without as yet making known his decision. On Tuesday, November 16, the whole court thronged into the galleries of Versailles. It was known that several couriers had arrived from Madrid. The king sent for the Spanish ambassador into his closet. Quote, the Duke of Anjou had repaired thither by the back way, says the Duke of Saint-Simon in his memoir. The king, introducing him to him, told him he might salute him as his king. The instant afterwards the king, contrary to all custom, had the folding doors thrown open, and ordered everybody who was there, and there was a crowd, to come in. Then, casting his eyes majestically over the numerous company, quote, Gentlemen, he said, introducing the Duke of Anjou, here is the King of Spain. 
His birth called him to that crown. The last king gave it him by his will. The grandees desired him and have demanded him of me urgently. It is the will of heaven, and I have yielded with pleasure. End quote. And turning to his grandson, quote, Be a good Spaniard, he said. That is from the moment your first duty. But remember that you are French born in order to keep up the union between the two nations. That is the way to render them happy and to preserve the peace of Europe. End quote. Three weeks later, the young king was on the road to Spain. Quote, there are no longer any Pyrenees, said Louis the Fourteenth, as he embraced his grandson. The rights of Philip V to the crown of France had been carefully reserved by a formal act of the king's. Great were the surprise and wrath in Europe. William the Third felt himself personally affronted. Quote, I have no doubt, he wrote to Heinsius, that this unheard of proceeding on the part of France has caused you as much surprise as it has me. I never had much confidence in engagements contracted with France, but I confess I never could have supposed that that court would have gone so far as to break, in the face of Europe, so solemn a treaty before it had even received the finishing stroke. Granted that we have been dupes, but when beforehand you are resolved to hold your word of no account, it is not very difficult to overreach your mail. I shall be blamed perhaps for having relied upon France, I who ought to have known by the experience of the past that no treaty has ever bound her. Would to God I might be quit for the blame, but I have only too many grounds for fearing that the fatal consequences of it will make themselves felt shortly. I groan in the very depths of my spirit to see that in this country the majority rejoice to find the will preferred by France to the maintenance of the Treaty of Partition, and that too on the ground that the will is more advantageous for England and Europe. This opinion is founded partly on the youth of the Duke of Anjou. He is a child, they say. He will be brought up in Spain. He will be indoctrinated with the principles of that monarchy, and he will be governed by the Council of Spain. But these are surmises which it is impossible for me to entertain, and I fear that we shall before long find out how erroneous they are. Would it not seem as if this profound indifference with which, in this country, they look upon everything that takes place outside of this island were a punishment from heaven? Meanwhile are not our causes for apprehension and our interests the same as those of the peoples of the continent? End quote. William III was a more far-sighted politician than his subjects either in England or Holland. The States-General took the same view as the English. Quote, Public funds and shares have undergone a rise at Amsterdam, wrote Heinsius to the King of England, and although this rests on nothing solid, your Majesty is aware how much influence such a fact has. End quote. Louis the Fourteenth had lost no time in explaining to the powers the grounds of his acceptance. Quote, the King of Spain's will, he said in his manifesto, establishes the peace of Europe on solid bases. Quote, Talard did not utter a single word on handing me his sovereign's letter, the contents of which are the same as of that which the states have received, wrote William to Heinsius. I said to him that perhaps I had testified too eager a desire for the preservation of peace, but that nevertheless my inclination in that respect had not changed. Whereupon he replied, The king my master, by accepting the will, considers that he gives a similar proof of his desire to maintain peace. Thereupon he made me a bow and withdrew. End quote. William of Orange had not deceived himself in thinking that Louis the Fourteenth would govern Spain in his grandson's name. Nowhere are the old king's experience and judgment more strikingly displayed than in his letters to Philip V. Quote, I very much wish, he wrote to him, that you were as sure of your own subjects as you ought to be of mine in the posts in which they may be employed. But do not be astounded at the disorder you find amongst your troops, and at the little confidence you are able to place in them. It needs a long reign and great pains to restore order, and secure the fidelity of different peoples accustomed to obey a house hostile to yours. If you thought it would be very easy and very pleasant to be a king, you were very much mistaken." End quote a sad confession for that powerful monarch who in his youth found, quote, the vocation of king beautiful, noble, and delightful. Quote, the eighteenth century opened with a fullness of glory and unheard of prosperity, end quote. But Louis the Fourteenth did not suffer himself to be lulled to sleep by the apparent indifference with which Europe, the empire accepted, received the elevation of Philip V to the throne of Spain. On the 6th of February, 1701, the seven barrier towns of the Spanish Low Countries, which were occupied by Dutch garrisons in virtue of the Peace of Ryswick, opened their gates to the French on an order from the King of Spain. Quote, the instructions which the Elector of Bavaria, governor of the Low Countries, had given to the various governors of the places were so well executed, says M. de Vaux in his account of the campaign in Flanders, that we entered without any hindrance. Some of the officers of the Dutch troops grumbled and would have complained, but the French general officers who had led the troops pacified them, declaring that they did not come as enemies, and that all they wanted was to live in good understanding with them. 
the twenty-two Dutch battalions took the road back before long to their own country, and became the nucleus of the army which William of Orange was quietly getting ready in Holland as well as in England. His peoples were beginning to open their eyes. The States General, deprived of the barrier towns, had opened the dikes. The meadows were flooded. On the 7th of September, 1701, England and Holland signed for the second time with the Emperor a grand alliance, engaging not to lay down arms until they had reduced the possessions of King Philip V to Spain and the Indies, restored the barrier of Holland, and secured an indemnity to Austria, and the definitive severance of the two crowns of France and Spain. In the month of June, the Austrian army had entered Italy under the orders of Prince Eugène of Savoy Carignano, son of the Count of Soissons and Olympia Mancini, conqueror of the Turks and revolted Hungarians, and passionately hostile to Louis Fourteenth, who in his youth had refused to employ him. He had already crossed the Adige and the Mincio, driving the French back behind the Olio. Marshal Catina, a man of prudence and far-sightedness, but discouraged by the bad condition of his troops, coldly looked upon at court, and disquieted by the aspect of things in Italy, was acting supinely. The king sent Marshal Villeroy to supersede him. Catina, as modest as he was warmly devoted to the glory of his country, finished the campaign as a simple volunteer. The king of France and the emperor were looking up allies. The princes of the north were absorbed by the war which was being waged against his neighbors of Russia and Poland by the young king of Sweden, Charles the Twelfth, a hero of eighteen, as irresistible as Gustavus Adolphus in his impetuous bravery, without possessing the rare qualities of authority and judgment which had distinguished the line of the north. He joined the Grand Alliance, as did Denmark and Poland, whose new king, the Elector of Saxony, had been supported by the Emperor in his candidature and in his abjuration of Protestantism. The Elector of Brandenburg, recently recognized as King of Prussia under the name of Frederick I, and the new Elector of Hanover, were eager to serve Leopold, who had aided them in their elevation. In Germany, only Maximilian, Elector of Bavaria, Governor of the Low Countries, and his brother, the Elector of Cologne, embraced the side of France. The Duke of Savoy, generalissimo of the king's forces in Italy, had taken the command of the army. Quote, but in that country, wrote the Count of Tesse, there is no reliance to be placed on places or troops or officers or people. I have had another interview with this incomprehensible prince, who received me with every manifestation of kindness, of outward sincerity, and if he were capable of it, I would say of friendship for him of whom his majesty made use but lately in the work of peace in Italy. The king is master of my person, of my dominions, he said to me. He has only to give his commands, but I suppose that he still desires my welfare and my aggrandizement. As for your aggrandizement, Monseigneur, said I, in truth I do not see much material for it just at present. As for your welfare, we must be allowed to see your intentions a little more clearly first, and take the liberty of repeating to you that my prescience does not extend so far. I do him the justice to believe that he really feels the greater part of all that he expresses for your majesty, but that horrid habit of indecision and putting off till tomorrow what he might do today is not eradicated and never will be. The Duke of Savoy was not so undecided as M. de Tesse supposed. He managed to turn to good account the mystery which hung habitually over all his resolutions. A year had not rolled by, and he was openly engaged in the Grand Alliance, pursuing against France the cause of that aggrandizement which he had but lately hoped to obtain from her, and by which, by the Treaty of Utrecht, was worth the title of king to him. Pending the time to declare himself, he had married his second daughter, Princess Marie-Louise Gabrielle, to the young king of Spain, Philip V. Quote, Never had the tranquillity of Europe been so unstable as it was at the commencement of 1702, says the correspondence of Chamillard, published by General Pellet. It was but a phantom of peace that was enjoyed, and it was clear, from whatever side matters were regarded, that we were on the eve of a war which could not but be of long duration, unless by some unforeseen accident the houses of Bourbon and Austria should come to an arrangement which would allow them to set themselves in accord touching the Spanish succession. But there was no appearance of conciliation. End, quote. End of section 51《セクション52 of a Popular History of France, Volume 5》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter 45: Louis XIV, His Wars and His Reverses, Part 2. Louis XIV had just done a deed which destroyed the last faint hopes of peace. King James II was dying at Saint-Germain, and the king went to see him. 
The sick man opened his eyes for a moment when he was told that the king was there. Memoire de Danjou, page 192. And closed them again immediately. The king told him that he had come to assure him that he might die in peace as regarded the Prince of Wales, and that he would recognize him as King of England, Ireland, and Scotland. All the English who were in the room fell upon their knees and cried, quote, God save the king. End quote. James the second expired a week later, on the 16th of September, 1701, saying to his son as his last advice, quote, I am about to leave this world, which has been to me nothing but a sea of tempests and storms. The Omnipotent has thought right to visit me with great afflictions. Serve him with all your heart, and never place the crown of England in the balance with your eternal salvation. End quote. James the second was justified in giving his son this supreme advice the solitary ray of greatness in his life and in his soul had proceeded from his religious faith, and his unwavering resolution to remain loyal to it at any price and at any risk. Quote, on returning to Marly, says Saint Simon, the king told the whole court what he had just done. There was nothing but acclamations and praises. It was a fine field for them, but reflections too were not less prompt, if they were less public. The king still flattered himself that he would hinder Holland and England, the former of which was so completely dependent, from breaking with him in favor of the House of Austria. He relied upon that to terminate before long the war in Italy, as well as the whole affair of the succession in Spain and its vast dependencies, which the emperor could not dispute with his own forces only, or even with those of the empire. Nothing, therefore, could be more incompatible with this position, and with the solemn recognition he had given at the Peace of Reiswick, as the Prince of Orange as King of England. It was to hurt him personally in the most sensitive spot, all England with him and Holland into the bargain, without giving the Prince of Wales, by recognition, any solid support in his own case. William III was at table in his castle at Deeren in Holland, when he received this news. He did not utter a word, but he coloured, crushed his hat over his head, and could not command his countenance. The Earl of Manchester, English ambassador, left Paris without taking leave of the king otherwise than by this note to M. Torcy. Quote, Sir, the king my master, being informed that his most Christian majesty has recognised another king of Great Britain, does not consider that his dignity and his service will permit him to any longer keep an ambassador at the court of the king your master, and he has sent me orders to withdraw at once, of which I do myself the honour to advertise you by this note. Quote, All the English, says Torcy in his memoir, unanimously regarded as a mortal affront on the part of France, that she should pretend to arrogate to herself the right of giving them a king, to the prejudice of him whom they had themselves invited and recognized for many years past. End quote. Voltaire declares in the Siècle de Louis XIV that M. de Torcy attributed the recognition of the Prince of Wales by Louis the Fourteenth to the influence of Madame de Maintenon, who was touched by the tears of the Queen, Mary of Modena. Quote, he had not, he said, inserted the fact in his memoir, because he did not think it to his master's honour that two women should have made him change a resolution to the contrary taken in his council. Perhaps the deplorable state of William the Third's health, and the inclination supposed to be felt by Princess Anne of Denmark to restore the Stuarts to the throne, since she herself had lost the Duke of Gloucester, the last survivor of her seventeen children, might have influenced the unfortunate resolution of Louis the Fourteenth. His kingly magnanimity and illusions might have bound him to support James the Second, dethroned and fugitive, but no obligation of that sort existed in the case of a prince who had left England at his nurse's breast, and who had grown up in exile. In the Atelier of Racine, or Jayada, invokes upon the impious queen, quote, that spirit of infatuation and error, the fatal avant courier of the fall of kings, end quote. The recognition of the Prince of Wales as King of England was, in the case of Louis the Fourteenth, the most indisputable token of that fatal blindness. William the Third had paid dear for the honour of being called to the throne of England. More than once he had been on the point of abandoning the ungrateful nation which so ill requited his great services. He had thought of returning to live in the midst of his Hollanders, affectionately attached to his family as well as to his person. The insult of the King of France restored to his already dying adversary all the popularity he had lost. When William returned from Holland to open a new Parliament on the 10th of January, 1702, manifestations of sympathy were lavished upon him on all sides of the house. Quote, I have no doubt, said he, that the late proceedings of His Most Christian Majesty and the dangers which threaten all the powers of Europe have excited your most lively resentment. All the world have their eyes fixed upon England. 
There is still time. She may save her religion and her liberty, but let her profit by every moment, let her arm by land and sea, let her lend her allies all the assistance in her power, and swear to show her enemies, the foes of her religion, her liberty, her government, and the king of her choice, all the hatred they deserve. End quote. This speech, more impassioned than the utterances of William the Third generally were, met with an eager echo from his people. The houses voted a levy of forty thousand sailors and fifty thousand soldiers. Holland had promised ninety thousand men, but the health of the King of England went on declining. He had fallen from his horse on the fourth of March and broken his collarbone. This accident hastened the progress of the malady which was pulling him down. When his friend Keppel, whom he had made Earl of Albemarle, returned on the eighteenth of March from Holland, William received him with these words, quote, I am drawing towards my end. end quote. He had received the consolations of religion from the bishops and had communicated with great self-possession. He scarcely spoke now and breathed with difficulty. Quote, Can this last long? he asked the physician, who made a sign in the negative. He had sent for the Earl of Portland, Bentinick, his oldest and most faithful friend. When he arrived, the king took his hand and held it between both his own upon his heart. Thus he remained for a few moments. Then he yielded up his great spirit to God on the 19th, or 8th, of March, 1702, at eight in the morning. He was not yet fifty-two. In a greater degree, perhaps, than any other period, the eighteenth century was rich in men of the first order. But never did more of the spirit of policy, never did loftier and broader views, never did steadier courage animate and sustain a weaker body than in the case of William of Orange. Saviour of Holland at the age of twenty-two in the war against Louis the Fourteenth, protector of the liberties of England against the tyranny of James the Second, defender of the independence of the European states against the unbridled ambition of the King of France, he became the head of Europe by the proper and free ascendancy of his genius. Cold and reserved, more capable of feeling than of testifying sympathy, often ill, always unfortunate in war, he managed to make his will triumph in England, despite Jacobite plots and the jealous suspicions of the English parliaments. In Holland, despite the constant efforts of the Republican and Aristocratic Party, in Europe, despite envy and the waverings of the Allied sovereigns, Intrepid, spite of his bad health, to the extent of being ready, if need were, to die in the last ditch, of indomitable obstinacy in his resolutions, and of rare ability in the manipulation of affairs, he was one of those who are born masters of men, no matter what may at the outset be their condition and their destiny. In vain had Cromwell required of Holland the abolition of the Stadtholderat in the House of Nassau. In vain had John Van Witt obtained the voting of the perpetual edict. William of Orange lived and died Stadtholder of Holland, and king of that England which had wanted to close against him forever the approaches to the throne in his own native country. When God has created a man to play a part and hold a place in this world, all efforts and all counsels to the contrary are but so many stalks of straw under his feet. William of Orange at his death had accomplished his work. Europe had risen against Louis the Fourteenth. The campaigns of 1702 and 1703 presented an alternation of successes and reverses favorable, on the whole, to France. Marshal Villeroy had failed in Italy against Prince Eugène. He was superseded by the Duke of Vendôme, grandson of Henry IV and captor of Barcelona, indolent, debauched, free in tone and in conduct, but able, bold, beloved by the soldiers, and strongly supported at court. Catina had returned to France and went to Versailles at the commencement of the year 1702. Quote, M. de Chamillard had told him the day before, from the king, that his majesty had resolved to give him the command of the army in Germany. He excused himself for some time from accepting this employment. The king ended by saying, Now we are in a position for you to explain to me, and open your heart about all that took place in Italy during the last campaign. The marshal answered, Sir, those things are all past. The details I could give you thereof would be of no good to the service of your majesty, and would serve merely, perhaps, to keep up eternal heart-burnings and so I entreat you to be pleased to let me preserve a profound silence as to all that. I will only justify myself, sir, by thinking how I may serve you still better, if I can, in Germany than I did in Italy. End quote. Worn out and disgusted, Catina failed in Germany as he had in Italy. He took his retirement and never left his castle of saint Gratien any more. It was the Marquis of Villars, lately ambassador at Vienna, who defeated the imperialists at Friedlingen on the 14th of August, 1702. A month later, Talard retook the town of Landau. The perfidious maneuvers of the Duke of Savoy had just come to light. The king ordered Vendôme to disarm the five thousand Piedmontais who were serving in his army. That operation effected, the prince sent Victor Amadeo this note, written by Louis XIV's own hand. Quote, 
Sir, as religion, honour, and your own signature count for nothing between us, I send my cousin, the Duke of Vendôme, to explain to you my wishes. He will give you twenty-four hours to decide. End quote. The mind of the Duke of Savoy was made up. From this day forth, the father of the Duchess of Burgundy took rank amongst the declared enemies of France and Spain. Whilst Louis the Fourteenth was facing Europe in coalition against him with generals of the second and third order, the Allies were discovering in the Duke of Marlborough a worthy rival of Prince Eugène. A covetous and able courtier, openly disgraced by William the Third in consequence of his perfidious intrigues with the court of Saint Germain, he had found his fortune suddenly retrieved by the accession of Queen Anne, over whom his wife had for a long time held the sway of a haughty and powerful favourite. The campaigns of 1702 and 1703 had shown him to be a prudent and a bold soldier, fertile in resources and novel conceptions, and those had earned him the thanks of Parliament and the title of Duke. The campaign of 1704 established his glory upon the misfortunes of France. Marshals Tallard and Marsin were commanding in Germany together with the Elector of Bavaria. The Emperor, threatened with a fresh insurrection in Hungary, recalled Prince Eugène from Italy. Marlborough effected a junction with him by a rapid march, which Marshal Villeroy would fain have hindered, but to no purpose. On the 13th of August, 1704, the hostile armies met between Blenheim and Hochstedt, near the Danube. The forces were about equal, but on the French side the councils were divided, the various corps acted independently. Talas sustained single-handed the attack of the English and the Dutch, commanded by Marlborough. He was made prisoner, his son was killed at his side. The cavalry, having lost their leader and being pressed by the enemy, took to flight in the direction of the Danube. Many officers and soldiers perished in the river. The slaughter was awful. Marseille and the Elector, who had repulsed five successive charges of Prince Eugène, succeeded in effecting their retreat. But the electorates of Bavaria and Cologne were lost. Landau was recovered by the Allies after a siege of two months. The French army recrossed the Rhine. Elsass was uncovered, and Germany evacuated. In Spain the English had just made themselves master of Gibraltar. Quote, this shows clearly, sir, wrote Tallard to Chamillard after the defeat, what is the effect of such diversity of counsel, which makes public all that one intends to do, and it is a severe lesson never to have more than one man at the head of an army. It is a great misfortune to have to deal with a prince of such a temper as the Elector of Bavaria. End quote. Villard was of the same opinion. It had been his fate in the campaign of 1703 to come to open loggerheads with the Elector. Quote, the king's army will march to-morrow, as I have had the honour to tell your highness, he had declared. Quote, At these words, says Villard, the blood mounted to his face. He threw his hat and wig on the table in a rage. I commanded, said he, the emperor's army in conjunction with the Duke of Lorraine. He was a tolerably great general, and he never treated me in this manner. The Duke of Lorraine, answered I, was a great prince and a great general, but for myself I am responsible to the king for his army, and I will not expose it to destruction through the evil counsel so obstinately persisted in. Thereupon I went out of the room. Complete swaggerer as he was, Villard had more wits and resolution than the majority of the generals left to Louis the Fourteenth. but in 1704 he was occupied in putting down the insurrection of the Camisards in the south of France. Neither Tallard nor Marsin had been able to impose their will upon the elector. In 1705, Villard succeeded in checking the movement of Marlborough on Lothringen and Champagne. Quote, he flattered himself he would swallow me like a grain of salt, wrote the marshal. The English fell back, hampered in their adventurous plans by the prudence of the Hollanders, controlled from a distance by the grand pensionary Heinsius. The imperialists were threatening Alsace, the weather was fearful, letters had been written to Chamillard to say that the inundations alone would be enough to prevent the enemy from investing Fort Louis. Quote, there is nothing so nice as a map, replied Villard. With a little green and blue, one puts under water all that one wishes, but a general who goes and examines it, as I have done, finds in diverse places distances of a mile where these little rivers, which are supposed to inundate the country, are quite snug in their natural bed larger than usual, but not enough to hinder the enemy in any way in the world from making bridges. Fort Louis was surrounded, and Villard found himself obliged to retire upon Strasbourg, whence he protected Alsace during the whole campaign of 1706. End of section 52. Section 53 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 45. Louis XIV. His Wars and His Reverses. 
Part 3 The defeat of Hochstedt in 1704 had been the first step down the ladder. The defeat of Ramilly on the 23rd of May, 1706, was the second and the fatal rung. The king's personal attachment to Marshal Villois blinded him as to his military talents. Beaten in Italy by Prince Eugène, Villois, as presumptuous as he was incapable, hoped to retrieve himself against Marlborough. Quote, the whole army breathed nothing but battle. I know it was your majesty's own feeling, wrote Villois to the king after the defeat. Could I help committing myself to a course which I considered expedient? End quote. The marshal had deceived himself as regarded his advantages, as well as the confidence of his troops. There had been eight hours fighting at Hochstedt, inflicting much damage upon the enemy. At Ramilly the Bavarians took to their heels at the end of an hour. The French, who felt that they were badly commanded, followed their example. The rout was terrible, and the disorder inexpressible. Villois kept recoiling before the enemy, Marlborough kept advancing. Two-thirds of Belgium and sixteen strong places were lost, when Louis the Fourteenth sent Chamillard into the Low Countries. It was no longer the time when Louvois made armies spring from the very soil, and when Vauban prepared the defence of Dunkirk. The king recalled Villois, showing him to the last unwavering kindness. Quote, there is no more luck at our age, Marshal, was all he said to Villois on his arrival at Versailles. Quote, he was nothing more than an old wrinkled balloon, out of which all the gas that inflated it has gone, says Saint-Simon. He went off to Paris and to Villois, having lost all the varnish that made him glitter, and having nothing more to show but the understratum. End quote. The king summoned Vendôme to place him at the head of the army of Flanders, quote, in hopes of restoring to it the spirit of vigor and audacity natural to the French nation, as he himself says. For two years past, amidst a great deal of ill-success, Vendôme had managed to keep in check Victor Amadeo and Prince Eugène, in spite of the embarrassment caused him by his brother the Grand Prior, the Duke of La Thuyade, Chamillard's son-in-law, and the orders which reached him directly from the king. He had gained during his two campaigns the name of Taker of Towns, and had just beaten the Austrians in the Battle of Cassinato. Prince Eugène had, however, crossed the Adige and the Po when Vendôme left Italy. Quote, Everybody here is ready to take off his hat when Marlborough's name is mentioned, he wrote to Chamillard on arriving in Flanders. The English and Dutch army occupied all the country from Ostend to Maestricht. The Duke of Orléans, nephew of the king, had succeeded the Duke of Vendôme. He found the army in great disorder, the generals divided and insubordinate. Turin besieged according to the plans of La Feuillade, against the advice of Vauban, who had offered, quote, to put his marshal's baton behind the door, and confine himself to giving his counsels for the direction of the siege, end quote. The prince, in his irritation, resigned his powers into the hand of Marshal Marsin. Prince Eugène, who had effected his junction with Victor Amadeo, encountered the French army between the rivers Doria and Stora. The soldiers remembered the Duke of Orléans at Steinkirk and Neerwinden. They asked him if he would grudge them his sword. He yielded and was severely wounded at the Battle of Turin on the 7th of September, 1706. Marsin was killed. Discouragement spread amongst the generals and the troops, and the siege of Turin was raised. Before the end of the year, nearly all the places were lost, and Dauphiny was threatened. Victor Amadeo refused to listen to a special peace. In the month of March, 1707, the Prince of Vaudemont, governor of Milanes for the King of Spain, signed a capitulation at Mantua, and led back to France the troops which still remained to him. The imperialists were masters of Naples. Spain no longer had any possessions in Italy. Philip V had been threatened with the loss of Spain as well as of Italy. For two years past, Archduke Charles, under the title of Charles III, had, with the support of England and Portugal, been disputing the crown with the young king. Philip V had lost Catalonia, and had just failed in his attempt to retake Barcelona. The road to Madrid was cut off, the army was obliged to make its way by Roussillon and Varn to resume the campaign. The king threw himself in person into his capital, whither he was escorted by Marshal Berwick, a natural son of James the Second, a Frenchman by choice, full of courage and resolution, quote, but a great stick of an Englishman who hadn't a word to say, end quote and who was distasteful to the young queen, Marie-Louise. Philip V could not remain at Madrid, which was threatened by the enemy. He removed to Burgos. The English entered the capital, and there proclaimed Charles III. This was too much. Spain could not let herself submit to have an Austrian king imposed upon her by heretics and Portuguese. The old military energy appeared again amongst that people besotted by priests and ceremonials. War broke out all at once at every point. The foreign soldiers were everywhere attacked openly or secretly murdered. The towns rose. A few horsemen sufficed for Berwick to recover possession of Madrid. 
The king entered it once more on the 4th of October, amidst the cheers of his people, whilst Berwick was pursuing the enemy whom he had cornered, or Rancogné, he says, in the mountains of Valencia. Charles III had no longer anything left in Spain but Aragon and Catalonia. The French garrisons, set free by the evacuation of Italy, went to the aid of the Spaniards. Quote, "'Your enemies ought not to hope for success,' wrote Louis the Fourteenth to his grandson." since their progress has served only to bring out the courage and fidelity of a nation always equally brave and firmly attached to its masters i am told that your people cannot be distinguished from regular troops we have not been fortunate in flanders but we must submit to the judgment of god he had already let his grandson understand that a great sacrifice would be necessary to obtain peace which he considered himself bound to procure before long for his people the hollanders refused their mediation quote, the three men who rule in europe to wit, the grand pensionary Heinsius, the Duke of Marlborough, and Prince Eugène desire war for their own interests, end quote, was the saying in France. The campaign of 1707 was signalized in Spain by the victory of Almanza, gained on the 13th of April by Marshal Berwick over the Anglo-Portuguese army, and by the capture of Lerida, which capitulated on the 11th of November into the hands of the Duke of Orléans. In Germany, Villars drove back the enemy from the banks of the Rhine, advanced into Swabia, and ravaged the Palatinate, crushing the country with requisitions, of which he openly reserved a portion for himself. Quote, Marshal Villars is doing very well for himself, said somebody one day to the king. Quote, yes, answered his majesty, and for me too. Quote, I wrote to the king that I really must fat my calf, said Villars. The inexhaustible elasticity and marvellous resources of France were enough to restore some hope in 1707. The invasion of Provence by Victor Amadeo and Prince Eugène, their check before Toulon, and their retreat, precipitated by the rising of the peasants, had irritated the Allies. The attempts at negotiation which the king had entered upon at The Hague remained without result. The Duke of Burgundy took the command of the armies of Flanders, with Vendôme for his second. It was hoped that the lieutenant's boldness, his geniality towards the troops, and his consummate knowledge of war would counterbalance the excessive gravity, austerity, and inexperience of the young prince so virtuous and capable, but reserved, cold, and unaccustomed to command. Discord arose amongst the courtiers. On the 5th of July, Ghent was surprised. Vendôme had intelligence inside the place. The Belgians were weary of their new masters. Quote, the states have dealt so badly with this country, said Marlborough, that all the towns are ready to play us the same trick as Ghent the moment they have the opportunity. End quote. Bruges opened its gates to the French. Prince Eugène advanced to second Marlborough, but he was late in starting. The troops of the Elector of Bavaria harassed his march. Quote, I shouldn't like to say a word against Prince Eugène, said Marlborough, but he will arrive at the appointed spot on the Moselle ten days too late. End quote. The English were by themselves when they encountered the French army in front of Audenard. The engagement began. Vendôme, who commanded the right wing, sent word to the Duke of Burgundy. The latter hesitated and delayed. The generals about him did not approve of Vendôme's movement. He fought single-handed and was beaten. The excessive confidence of one leader and the inertness of the other caused failure in all the operations of the campaign. Prince Eugène and the Duke of Marlborough laid siege to Lille, which was defended by old Marshal Boufflet, the bravest and the most respected of all the king's servants. Lille was not relieved, and fell on the 25th of October. The citadel held out until the 9th of December. The king heaped rewards on Marshal Boufflet. At the march out from Lille, Prince Eugène had ordered all his army to pay him the same honours as to himself. Ghent and Bruges were abandoned to the imperialists. Quote, we had made blunder upon blunder in this campaign, says Marshal Berwick in his memoir, and in spite of all that, if somebody had not made the last in giving up Ghent and Bruges, there would have been a fine game the year after. End quote. The Low Countries were lost, and the French frontier was encroached upon by the capture of Lille. For the first time, in a letter addressed to Marshal Berwick, Marlborough let a glimpse be seen of a desire to make peace. The king still hoped for the mediation of Holland, and he neglected the overtures of Marlborough. Quote, the army of the Allies is without doubt in evil plight, said Chamillard. The campaign in Spain had not been successful. The Duke of Orléans, weary of his powerlessness, and under suspicion at the court of Philip V, had given up the command of the troops. The English admiral, Leake, had taken possession of Sardinia, of the island of Minorca, and of Port Mahon. The archduke was master of the isles and of the sea. The destitution in France was fearful, and the winter so severe that the poor were in want of everything. Riots multiplied in the towns. The king sent his plate to the mint and put his jewels in pawn. He likewise took a resolution which cost him even more. He determined to ask for peace. 
Quote, although his courage appeared at every trial, says the Marquis of Torcy, he felt within him just sorrow for a war whereof the weight overwhelmed his subjects. More concerned for their woes than for his own glory, he employed, to terminate them, means which might have induced France to submit to the hardest conditions before obtaining a peace that had become necessary, if God, protecting the king, had not, after humiliating him, struck his foes with blindness. End quote. There are regions to which superior minds alone ascend, and which are not attained by the men, however distinguished, who succeed them. William the Third was no longer at the head of affairs in Europe, and the triumvirate of Heinsius, Marlborough, and Prince Eugène did not view the aggregate of things from a sufficiently calm height to free themselves from the hatreds and bitternesses of the strife when the proposals of Louis the Fourteenth arrived at the Hague. Quote, Amidst the sufferings caused to commerce by the war, there was room to hope, says Torcy, that the Grand Pensionary, thinking chiefly of his country's interest, would desire the end of a war of which he felt all the burdensomeness. Clothed with authority in his own republic, he had no reason to fear either secret design or cabals to displace him from a post which he filled to the satisfaction of his masters, and in which he conducted himself with moderation. Up to that time, the United Provinces had borne the principal burden of the war. The Emperor alone reaped the fruit of it. One would have said that the Hollanders kept the Temple of Peace, and that they had the keys of it in their hands. End quote. The king offered the Hollanders a very extended barrier in the Low Countries, and all the facilities they had long been asking for their commerce. He accepted the abandonment of Spain to the Archduke, and merely claimed to reserve to his grandson Naples, Sardinia, and Sicily. This was what was secured to him by the Second Treaty of Partition, lately concluded between England, the United Provinces, and France. He did not even demand Lotharingen. President Rouy, formerly French envoy to Lisbon, arrived disguised in Holland. Conferences were opened secretly at Bodegraven. The treaties of partition negotiated by William of Orange, as well as the wars which he had sustained against Louis the Fourteenth with such persistent obstinacy, had but one sole end, the maintenance of the European equilibrium between the houses of Bourbon and Austria, which were alone powerful enough to serve as mutual counterpoise to despoil one to the profit of the other, to throw all at once into the balance on the side of the empire all the weight of the Spanish succession, was to destroy the work of William III's far-sighted wisdom. Heinzius did not see it, but led on by his fidelity to the Allies, distrustful and suspicious as regarded France, burning to avenge the wrongs put upon the Republic, he, in concert with Marlborough and Prince Eugène, required conditions so hard that the French agents scarcely dared transmit them to Versailles. What was demanded was the abdication, pure and simple, of Philip V. Holland merely promised her good offices to obtain in his favor Naples and Sicily. England claimed Dunkirk, Germany wanted Strasbourg and the renewal of the Peace of Westphalia. Victor Amadeo aspired to recover Nice and Savoy. To the Dutch barrier stipulated for at Reiswick were to be added Lille, Condé, and Tournay. In vain was the matter discussed article by article. Rouilly for some time believed that he had gained Lille. Quote, you misinterpreted our intentions, said the deputies of the States General. We let you believe what you pleased. At the commencement of April, Lille was still in a bad condition. We had reason to fear that the French had a design of taking advantage of that. It was a matter of prudence to let you believe that it would be restored to you by the peace. Lille is at the present moment in a state of security. Do not count any longer on its restitution. Quote, Probably, said the State's delegate to Marlborough, the king will break off negotiations rather than entertain such hard conditions. Quote, so much the worse for France, rejoined the English general, for when the campaign is once begun, things will go farther than the king thinks. The Allies will never unsay their preliminary demands. End quote. And he set out for England, without even waiting for a favorable wind to cross. Louis the Fourteenth assembled his council, the same which in 1700 had decided upon acceptance of the crown of Spain. Quote, the king felt all these calamities so much the more keenly, says Torcy, in that he had experienced nothing of the sort ever since he had taken into his own hands the government of a flourishing kingdom. It was a terrible humiliation for a monarch accustomed to conquer, belauded for his victories, his triumphs, his moderation when he granted peace and prescribed its laws, to see himself now obliged to ask it of his enemies, to offer them to no purpose in order to obtain it, the restitution of a portion of his conquests, the monarchy of Spain, the abandonment of his allies, and forced, in order to get such offers accepted, to apply to that same republic whose principal provinces he had conquered in the year 1692, and whose submission he had rejected when she entreated him to grant her peace on such terms as he should be pleased to dictate. The king bore so sensible a change with the firmness of a hero, and with a Christian's complete submission to the decrees of providence, being less affected by his own inward pangs than by the suffering of his people, and being ever concerned about the means of relieving it and terminating the war. 
It was scarcely perceived that he did himself some violence in order to conceal his own feelings from the public. Indeed, they were so little known that it was generally believed that, thinking more of his own glory than of the woes of his kingdom, he preferred to the blessing of peace the keeping of certain places he had taken in person. This unjust opinion had crept in even amongst the council. End, quote. End of section 53 Section 54 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 45. Louis XIV, His Wars and His Reverses. Part 4. The reading of the Dutch proposals tore away every veil. Quote, the necessity of obtaining peace, whatever price it might cost, was felt so much the more. End quote. The king gave orders to Rouy to resume the conferences, demanding clear and precise explanations. Quote, if the worst comes to the worst, said he, I will give up Lille to the Hollanders, Strasbourg dismantled to the Empire, and I will content myself with Naples without Sicily for my grandson. You will be astounded at the orders contained in this dispatch, so different from those that I have given you hitherto and that I considered, as it was, too liberal, but I have always submitted to the divine will, and the evils with which he is pleased to afflict my kingdom do not permit me any longer to doubt of the sacrifice he requires me to make to him of all that might touch me most nearly. I waive, therefore, my glory. The Marquis of Torcy, Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, followed close after the dispatch. He had offered the king to go and treat personally with Heinsius. Quote, the grand pensionary appeared surprised when he heard that his majesty was sending one of his ministers to holland he had been placed at that post by the prince of orange who put entire confidence in him heinsius had not long before been sent to france to confer with louvois and in the discharge of that commission he had experienced the bad temper of a minister more accustomed to speak harshly to military officers than to treat with foreigners he had not forgotten that the minister had threatened to have him put in the bastille consummate master of affairs of which he had a long experience he was the soul of the league with Prince Eugène and the Duke of Marlborough. But the pensionary was not accused either of being so much in love with the importance given him by continuance of the war as to desire its prolongation or of any personally interested view. His externals were simple, there was no ostentation in his household. His address was cold without any sort of rudeness. His conversation was polished. He rarely grew warm in discussion." Torcy could not obtain anything from Heinsius any more than from Marlborough and Prince Eugène, who had both arrived at the Hague. The prince remained cold and stern. He had not forgotten the king's behavior towards his house. Quote, That's a splendid post in France, that of Colonel General, said he one day. My father held it. At his death we hoped that my brother might get it. The king thought it better to give it to one of his natural sons. He is master, but all the same, is one not sorry sometimes to find oneself in a position to make slights repented of. Quote, Marlborough displayed courtesy, insisting upon seeing in the affairs of the coalition the finger of God, who had permitted eight nations to think and act like one man. End quote. The concessions extorted from France were no longer sufficient. M. de Torcy gave up Sicily, and then Naples. A demand was made for Alsace, and certain places in Dauphiny and Provence. Lastly, the Allies required that the conditions of peace should be carried out at short notice, during the two months' truce it was agreed to grant and that Louis XIV should forthwith put into the hands of the Hollanders three places by way of guarantee, in case Philip V should refuse to abdicate. This was to despoil himself prematurely and gratuitously, for it was impossible to execute the definitive treaty of peace at the time fixed. Quote, the king did not hesitate about the only course there was for him to take, not only for his own glory, but for the welfare of his kingdom, says Torcy. He recalled his envoys, and wrote to the governors of the provinces and towns, quote, Sir, the hope of an imminent peace was so generally diffused throughout my kingdom that I consider it due to the fidelity which my people have shown during the course of my reign to give them the consolation of informing them of the reasons which still prevent them from enjoying the repose I had intended to procure for them. I would, to restore it, have accepted conditions much opposed to the security of my frontier provinces, but the more readiness and desire I displayed to dissipate the suspicions which my enemies affect to retain of my power and my designs, the more did they multiply their pretensions, refusing to enter into any undertaking beyond putting a stop to all acts of hostility until the first of the month of August, reserving to themselves the liberty of then acting by way of arms if the King of Spain, my grandson, persisted in his resolution to defend the crown which God has given him. Such a suspension was more dangerous than war for my people, for it secured to the enemy more important advantages than they could hope for from their troops, 
as I place my trust in the protection of God, and hope that the purity of my intentions will bring down his blessing on my arms, I wish my people to know that they would enjoy peace if it had depended only on my will to procure them a boon which they reasonably desire, but which must be won by fresh efforts, since the immense conditions I would have granted are useless for the restoration of the public peace. Signed, Louis. End quote. In spite of all the mistakes due to his past arrogance, the king had a right to make use of such language. In their short-sighted resentment, the Allies had overstepped reason. The young king of Spain felt this when he wrote to his grandfather, quote, I am transfixed at the chimerical and insolent pretensions of the English and Dutch regarding the preliminaries of peace. Never were seen the like. I am beside myself at the idea that anybody could have so much as supposed that I should be forced to leave Spain as long as I have a drop of blood in my veins. I will use all my efforts to maintain myself upon a throne on which God has placed me, and on which you, after him, have set me, and nothing but death shall wrench me from it or make me yield it." End quote. War recommenced on all sides. The king had just consented at last to give Chamillard his discharge. Quote, Sir, I shall die over the job. End quote. Had for a long time been the complaint of the minister worn out with fatigue. Quote, ah, well, we will die together, had been the king's rejoinder. France was dying, and Chamillard was by no means a stranger to the cause. Louis the Fourteenth put in his place Voisin, former superintendent of Hainaut, entirely devoted to Madame de Maintenon. He loaded with benefits the minister from whom he was parting, the only one whom he had really loved. The troops were destitute of everything. On assuming the command of the army of the Low Countries, Villars wrote in despair, quote, Imagine the horror of seeing an army without bread. There was none delivered today until the evening, and very late. Yesterday, to have bread to serve out to the brigades I had ordered to march, I made those fast that remained behind. On these occasions I pass along the ranks. I coax the soldier. I speak to him in such a way as to make him have patience and I have had the consolation of hearing several of them say, The marshal is quite right, we must suffer sometimes. Panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis hodie, or give us this day our daily bread, the men say to me as I go through the ranks. It is a miracle how we subsist, and it is a marvel to see the steadiness and fortitude of the soldier in enduring hunger. Habit is everything. I fancy, however, that the habit of not eating is not easy to acquire. End quote. In spite of such privations and sufferings, Villars found the army in excellent spirits, and urged the king to permit him to give battle. Quote, M. de Turenne used to say that he who means to altogether avoid battle gives up his country to him who appears to seek it. The marshal assured him. The king was afraid of losing his last army. The dukes of Harcourt and Berwick were covering the Rhine in the Alps. Marlborough and Prince Eugène, who had just made themselves master of Tournai, marched against Villars, whom they encountered on the 11th of September, 1709, near the hamlet of Malplaquet. Marshal Boufflet had just reached the army to serve as a volunteer. Villars had entrenched himself in front of the woods. His men were so anxious to get under fire that they threw away the rations of bread just served out. The Allies looked sulkily at the works. Quote, we are going to fight moles again, they said. There was a thick fog, as at Lutzen. The fighting went on from seven in the morning till midday. Villars had yielded the right wing, by way of respect, to Boufflet as his senior, says the Allies account, but the general command nevertheless devolved entirely upon him. Quote, At the hottest of the engagement, the marshal galloped furiously to the centre attacked by Prince Eugène. It was a sort of jaws of hell, a pit of fire, sulphur and saltpetre, which it seemed impossible to approach and live. One shot and my horse fell, says Villars. I jumped up, and a second broke my knee. I had it bandaged on the spot, and myself placed in a chair to continue giving my orders, but the pain caused a fainting fit, which lasted long enough for me to be carried off without consciousness to Quinoa. The Prince of Hesse, with the Imperial Cavalry, had just turned the entrenchments, which the Dutch infantry had attacked to no purpose. Marshal Boufflet was obliged to order a retreat, which was executed as on parade. Quote, the Allies had lost more than twenty thousand men, end quote, according to their official count. Quote, it was too much for this victory, which did not entail the advantage of entirely defeating the enemy, and the whole fruits of which were to end with the taking of Mons. End quote. Always a braggart, in spite of his real courage and indisputable military talent, Villars wrote from his bed to the king, on sending him the flags taken from the enemy, quote, If God give us grace to lose such another battle, your majesty may reckon that your enemies are annihilated. End quote. Boufflet was more proud, and at the same time more modest, when he said, quote, the series of disasters that have for some years past befallen your majesty's arms had so humiliated the french nation that one scarcer dared avow oneself a frenchman i dare assure you sir that the french name was never in so great esteem and was never perhaps more feared than it is at present in the army of the allies 
Louis the Fourteenth was no longer in a position to delude himself and to celebrate a defeat, even a glorious one, as a victory. Negotiations recommenced. Heinzius had held to his last proposals. It was on this sorry basis that Marshal Duxel and Abbé de Polignac began the parleys at Gertreudenberg, a small fortress of Mardic. They lasted from March 9 to July 25, 1710. The king consented to give some fortresses as guarantee, and promised to recommend his grandson to abdicate. In case of refusal, he engaged not only to support him no longer, but to furnish the allies into the bargain with a monthly subsidy of a million, whilst granting a passage through French territory. He accepted the cession of Alsace to Lothringen, the return of the three bishoprics to the empire. The Hollanders, commissioned to negotiate in the name of the coalition, were not yet satisfied, quote, the desire of the Allies, they said, is that the king should undertake, himself alone and by his own forces, either to persuade or to oblige the king of Spain to give up all his monarchy. Neither money nor the cooperation of the French troops suit their purpose. If the preliminary articles be not complied with in the space of two months, the truce is broken off. War will recommence, even though on the part of the king the other conditions should have been wholly fulfilled. The sole means of obtaining peace is to receive from the king's hands Spain and the Indies." End quote. The French plenipotentiaries had been recommended to have patience. Marshal Duxel was a courtier as smooth as he was clever. Abbé de Polignac was shrewd and supple, yet he could not contain his indignation. Quote, it is evident that you have not been accustomed to conquer, said he haughtily to the Dutch delegates. When the Allies' ultimatum reached the king, the pride of the sovereign and the affection of the father rose up at last in revolt. Quote, Since war there must be, said he, I would rather wage it against my enemies than against my grandson. End quote and he withdrew all the concessions which had reduced Philip V to despair. The Allies had already invaded Artois. At the end of the campaign they were masters of Douai, Saint-Venant, Bethune, and Air. France was threatened everywhere. The king could no longer protect the king of Spain. He confined himself to sending him Vendôme. Philip V, sustained by the indomitable courage of his young wife, refused absolutely to abdicate, quote, Whatever misfortunes may await me, he wrote to the king, I still prefer the course of submission to whatever it may please God to decide for me by fighting, to that of deciding for myself by consenting to an arrangement which would force me to abandon the people, on whom my reverses have hitherto produced no other effect than to increase their zeal and affection for me. End quote. It was therefore with none but the forces of Spain that Philip V, at the outset of the campaign of 1710, found himself confronting the English and Portuguese armies. The Emperor Joseph, brother of Archduke Charles, had sent him a body of troops commanded by a distinguished general, Count von Starenberg. Going from defeat to defeat, the young king found himself forced, as in 1706, to abandon his capital. He removed the seat of government to Valladolid and departed, accompanied by more than 30,000 persons of every rank, resolved to share his fortunes. The Archduke entered Madrid, quote, I have orders from Queen Anne and the Allies to escort King Charles to Madrid, said the English general, Lord Stanhope. When he is once there, God or the devil keep him in or turn him out. It matters little to me. That is no affair of mine. End quote. Stanhope was in the right not to pledge himself. The hostility of the population of Madrid did not permit the Archduke to reside there long. After running the risk of being carried off in his palace on the Prado, he removed to Toledo. Vendôme blocked the road against the Portuguese. The Archduke left the town and withdrew into Catalonia. Starenberg followed him on the 22nd of November, harassed on his march by the Spanish guerrillas rising everywhere upon his route. Every straggler, every wounded man, was infallibly murdered by the peasants. Stanhope, who commanded the rear guard, found himself invested by Vendôme in the town of Briuega. The Spaniards scarcely gave the artillery time to open a breach. The town was taken by assault, and the English made prisoners. Starenberg retraced his steps. On the 10th of December, fighting began near Villa Viciosa. The advantage was for a long time undecided and disputed. Night came. The Austrian general spiked his guns and retreated by forced marches. The Spaniards bivouacked on the battlefield. The king slept on a bed made of the enemy's flags. The Allies had taken refuge in Catalonia. Spain had won back her independence and her king. There was great joy at Versailles, greater than in the kingdom. The sole aspiration was for peace. The unexpected assistance was at hand. Queen Anne, wearied with the cupidity and haughtiness of the Duke and Duchess of Marlborough, had given them notice to quit. The friends of the Duke had shared his fall, and the Tories succeeded the Whigs in power. The Chancellor of the Exchequer, Harley, soon afterwards Earl of Oxford, and the Secretary of State, St. John, who became Lord Bolingbroke, were inclined to peace. Advances were made to France. A French priest, Abbe Gautier, living in obscurity in England, arrived in Paris during January 1711. He went to see M. de Torcy at Versailles. Quote, Do you want peace? said he. 
I have come to bring you the means of treating for it, and concluding independently of the Hollanders, unworthy of the king's kindnesses, and of the honor he has so often done them, of applying to them to pacificate Europe. Quote, to ask just then one of his majesty's ministers if he desired peace, says Torcy, was to ask a sick man suffering from a long and dangerous disease if he wants to be cured. End quote. Negotiations were secretly opened with the English cabinet. The emperor Joseph had just died, April 17, 1711. He left none but daughters. From that moment Archduke Charles inherited the domains of the House of Austria and aspired to the imperial crown. By giving him Spain, Europe re-established the monarchy of Charles V. She saw the dangers into which she was being drawn by the resentments or short-sighted ambition of the triumvirate. She fell back upon the wise projects of William III. Holland had abandoned them. To England fell the honor of making them triumphant. She has often made war upon the continent with indomitable obstinacy and perseverance, but at bottom and by the very force of circumstances England remains, as regards the affairs of Europe, an essentially pacific power. She cannot pretend to any territorial aggrandizement in Europe. It is the equilibrium between the continental powers that makes her strength, and her first interest was always to maintain it. End of section 54 Section 55 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 45. Louis the Fourteenth, His Wars and His Reverses. Part 5. The campaign of 1711 was everywhere insignificant. Negotiations were still going on with England, secretly and through subordinate agents. Manager, member of the Board of Trade for France, and for England, the poet Prior, strongly attached to Harley. On the 29th of January, 1712, the general conferences were opened at Utrecht. The French had been anxious to avoid The Hague, dreading the obstinacy of Heinsius in favor of his former proposals. Preliminary points were already settled with England. Enormous advantages were secured in America to English commerce, to which was ceded Newfoundland and all that France still possessed in Acadia. The general proposals had been accepted by Queen Anne and her ministers. In vain had the Hollanders and Prince Eugène made great efforts to modify them. St. John had dryly remarked that England had borne the greatest part in the burden of the war, and it was but just that she should direct the negotiations for peace. For five years past the United Provinces, exhausted by the length of hostilities, had constantly been defaulters in their engagements. It was proved to Prince Eugène that the imperial army had not been increased by two regiments in consequence of the war the emperor's ambassador, M. de Gala, displayed impertinence. He was forbidden to come to the court. In spite of the reserve imposed upon the English ministers by the strife of parties in a free country, their desire for peace was evident. The queen had just ordered the creation of new peers in order to secure a majority of the upper house in favor of a pacific policy. The bolts of heaven were falling one after another upon the royal family of France. On the 14th of April, 1711, Louis XIV had lost by smallpox his son, the Grand Dauphin, a mediocre and submissive creature, ever the most humble subject of the king, at just fifty years of age. His eldest son, the Duke of Burgundy, devout, austere, and capable, the hope of good men and the terror of intriguers, had taken the rank of Dauphin, and was seriously commencing his apprenticeship in government when he was carried off on the 18th of February, 1712, by spotted fever, or rougeole pourpre. Six days after his wife, the charming Mary Adelaide of Savoy, the idol of the whole court, supremely beloved by the king and by Madame de Maintenon, who had brought her up. Their son, the Duke of Brittany, four years old, died on the 8th of March. A child in the cradle, weakly and ill, the little Duke of Anjou remained the only shoot of the elder branch of the Bourbon. Dismay seized upon all France. Poison was spoken of. The Duke of Orléans was accused. It was necessary to have a post-mortem examination. Only the hand of God had left its traces. Europe, in its turn, was excited. If the little Duke of Anjou were to die, the crown of France reverted to Philip V. The Hollanders and the ambassadors of the Emperor Charles VI, recently crowned at Frankfurt, insisted on the necessity of a formal renunciation. In accord with the English ministers, Louis XIV wrote to his grandson, quote, You will be told what England proposes, that you should renounce your birthright, retaining the monarchy of Spain in the Indies, or renounce the monarchy of Spain, retaining your rights to the succession in France, and receiving in exchange for the crown of Spain the kingdoms of Sicily and Naples, the states of the Duke of Savoy, Montferrat and the Mantuan the said Duke of Savoy succeeding you in Spain. 
I confess to you that, notwithstanding the disproportion in the dominions, I have been sensibly affected by the thought that you would continue to reign, that I might still regard you as my successor, sure, if the Dauphin lives, of a regent accustomed to command, capable of maintaining order in my kingdom and stifling its cabals. If this child were to die, as his weakly complexion gives too much reason to suppose, you would enjoy the succession to me following the order of your birth, and I should have the consolation of leaving to my people a virtuous king, capable of commanding them, and one who, on succeeding me, would unite to the crown states so considerable as Naples, Savoy, Piedmont, and Montferrat. If gratitude and affection towards your subjects are to you pressing reasons for remaining with them, I may say that you owe me the same sentiments. You owe them to your own house, to your own country, before Spain. All that I can do for you is to leave you once more the choice, the necessity for concluding peace becoming every day more urgent. The choice of Philip V was made. He had already written to his grandfather to say that he would renounce all his rights of succession to the throne of France rather than give up the crown of Spain. This decision was solemnly enregistered by the Cortes. The English required that the Dukes of Berry and Orleans should likewise make renunciation of their rights to the crown of Spain. Negotiations began again, but war began again at the same time as the negotiations. The king had given Villal the command of the army of Flanders. The marshal went to Marly to receive his last orders. Quote, you see my plight, marshal, said Louis the Fourteenth. There are few examples of what is my fate, to lose in the same week a grandson, a grandson's wife and their son, all of very great promise and very tenderly beloved. God is punishing me, I have well deserved it, but suspend we my griefs at my own domestic woes, and look we to what may be done to prevent those of the kingdom. If anything were to happen to the army you command, what would be your idea of the course I should adopt as regards my person? The marshal hesitated. The king resumed, quote, This is what I think. You shall tell me your opinion afterwards. I know the courtiers' line of argument. They nearly all wish me to retire to Blois, and not wait for the enemy's army to approach Paris, as it might do if mine were beaten. For my part, I am aware that armies so considerable are never defeated to such an extent as to prevent the greater part of mine from retiring upon the Somme. I know that river. It is very difficult to cross. There are forts, too, which could be made strong. I should count upon getting to Peronne or Saint-Quentin, and there massing all the troops I had, making a last effort with you, and falling together or saving the kingdom. I will never consent to let the enemy approach my capital. End quote. Memoir de Villars, page 362. God was to spare Louis the Fourteenth that crowning disaster reserved for other times. In spite of all his defaults and the culpable errors of his life and reign, Providence had given this old man, overwhelmed by so many reverses and sorrows, a truly royal soul, and that regard for his own greatness which set him higher as a king than he would have been as a man. Quote, he had too proud a soul to descend lower than his misfortunes had brought him, says Montesquieu, and he well knew that courage may right a crown and that infamy never does. End quote. On the 25th of May, the king secretly informed his plenipotentiaries, as well as his generals, that the English were proposing to him a suspension of hostilities, and he added, quote, It is no longer a time for flattering the pride of the Hollanders, but whilst we treat with them in good faith, it must be with the dignity that becomes me. Quote, a style different from that of the conferences at The Hague and Gertreudenberg, end quote, is the remark made by M. de Torcy. That which the king's pride refused to the ill will of the Hollanders, he granted to the good will of England. The day of the commencement of the armistice, Dunkirk was put as guarantee into the hands of the English, who recalled their native regiments from the army of Prince Eugène. The king complained that they left him the auxiliary troops. The English ministers proposed to prolong the truce, promising to treat separately with France if the Allies refused assent to the peace. The news received by Louis Fourteenth gave him assurance of better conditions than any one had dared to hope for. Villars had not been able to prevent Prince Eugène from becoming master of Quenois on the 3rd of July. The imperialists were already making preparations to invade France. In their army, the causeway which connected Marchienne and Landrecy was called the Paris Road. The marshal resolved to relieve Landrecy, and having had bridges thrown over the Scheldt, he, on the 23rd of July, 1712, crossed the river between Bouchain and Denain. The latter little place was defended by the Duke of Albemarle, son of General Monk, with seventeen battalions of auxiliary troops in the pay of the Allies. Lieutenant-General Albagotti, an experienced soldier, considered the undertaking perilous. Quote, Go and lie down for an hour or two, Monsieur d'Albagotti, said Villard. Tomorrow by three in the morning you shall know whether the enemy's entrenchments are as strong as you suppose. End quote. Prince Eugène was coming up by forced marches to relieve Denain by falling on the rear guard of the French army. It was proposed to Villard to make fascines to fill up the fosses of Denain. Quote, 
"'Do you suppose,' said he, pointing to the enemy's army in the distance, "'that those gentry will give us the time? "'Our fascines shall be the bodies of the first of our men who fall in the fosse.' Quote, "'There was not an instant, not a minute to lose,' says the marshal in his memoir. "'I made my infantry march on four lines in the most beautiful order. "'As I entered the entrenchment at the head of the troops, "'I had not gone twenty paces when the Duke of Albermale "'and six or seven of the Emperor's lieutenant-generals were at my horse's feet. "'I begged them to excuse me if present matters did not permit me "'to show them all the politeness I ought, "'but that the first of all was to provide for the safety of their persons.' The enemy thought of nothing but flight. The bridges over the shell broke down under the multitude of vehicles and horses. Nearly all the defenders of Denain were taken or killed. Prince Eugène could not cross the river, watched as it was by French troops. He did not succeed in saving Marchienne, which the Count of Broglie had been ordered to invest in the very middle of the action in front of Denain. The imperialists raised the siege of Landrecy, but without daring to attack Villars, reinforced by a few garrisons. The marshal immediately invested Douai. On the 27th of August, the emperor's troops who were defending one of the forts demanded a capitulation. The officers who went out asked for a delay of four days, so as to receive orders from Prince Eugène. The marshal, who was in the trenches, called his grenadiers. Quote, this is my counsel on such occasions, said he to the astonished imperialists. My friends, these captains demand four days' time to receive orders from their general. What do you think? Quote, Leave it to us, Marshal, replied the grenadiers. In a quarter of an hour we will slit their windpipes. Quote, Gentlemen, said I to the officers, they will do as they have said, so take your own course. End quote. The garrison surrendered at discretion. Douai capitulated on the 8th of September. Le Quenoy was taken on the 4th of October, and Bouchard on the 18th. Prince Eugène had not been able to attempt anything. He fell back under the walls of Brussels. On the Rhine, on the Alps, in Spain, the French and Spanish armies had held the enemy in check. The French plenipotentiaries at Utrecht had recovered their courage. Quote, we put on the face the Hollanders had at Gerkreudenberg, and they put on ours, wrote Cardinal de Polignac from Utrecht. It is a complete turning of the tables. Quote, Gentlemen, peace will be treated for amongst you, for you and without you, was the remark made to the Hollanders. Hereditary adversary of the Van Witts and their party, Heinsius had pursued the policy of William III without the foresight and lofty views of William III. He had not seen his way in 1709 to shaking off the yoke of Marlborough and Prince Eugène in order to take the advantage in a peace necessary for Europe. In 1712 he submitted to the will of Harley and St. John, thus losing the advantages of the powerful mediatorial position which the United Provinces had owed to the eminent men successively entrusted with their government. Henceforth Holland remained a free and prosperous country, respected and worthy of her independence, but her political influence and importance in Europe were at an end. Under God's hand, great men make great destinies and great positions for their country, as well as for themselves. The Battle of Denain and its happy consequences hastened the conclusion of the negotiations. The German princes themselves began to split up. The King of Prussia, Frederick William I, who had recently succeeded his father, was the first to escape from the Emperor's yoke. Lord Bolingbroke put the finishing stroke at Versailles to the conditions of a general peace. The month of April was the extreme limit fixed by England for her allies. On the 11th, peace was signed between France, England, the United Provinces, Portugal, the King of Prussia, and the Duke of Savoy. Louis XIV recovered Lille, Aire, Bethune, and saint venant He strengthened with a few places the barrier of the Hollanders. He likewise granted to the Duke of Savoy a barrier on the Italian slope of the Alps. He recognized Queen Anne, at the same time exiling from France the pretender James III, whom he had but lately proclaimed with so much flourish of trumpets, and he raised the fortifications of Dunkirk. England kept Gibraltar and Menorca. Sicily was assigned to the Duke of Savoy. France recognized the King of Prussia. The peace was an honorable and an unexpected one. After so many disasters the King of Spain held out for some time. He wanted to set up an independent principality for the Princess des Ursins, or Camarera Mayor, to the Queen his wife, an able, courageous, and clever intriguer, all-powerful at court, who had done good service to the interests of France. He could not obtain any dismemberment of the United Provinces and at last Philip V, in his turn, signed. The emperor and the empire alone remained aloof from the general peace. War recommenced in Germany and on the Rhine. Villars carried Speer and Kaiserlauten. He laid siege to Landau. His lieutenants were uneasy. Quote, Gentlemen, said Villars, I have heard the Prince of Condé say that the enemy should be feared at a distance and despised at close quarters. End quote. Landau capitulated on the 20th of August. On the 30th of September, Villars entered Fribourg, the citadel surrendered on the 13th of November. The imperialists began to make pacific overtures. The two generals, Villars and Prince Eugène, were charged with the negotiations. 
Quote, I arrived at Rastatt on the 26th of November in the afternoon, writes Villars in his memoir, and the Prince of Savoy half an hour after me. The moment I knew he was in the courtyard, I went to the top of the steps to meet him, apologizing to him on the ground that a lame man could not go down. We embraced with the feelings of an old and true friendship, which long wars and various engagements had not altered. End quote. The two plenipotentiaries were headstrong in their discussions. Quote, if we begin war again, said Villars, where will you find money? Quote, it is true that we haven't any, rejoined the prince, but there is still some in the empire. Quote, Poor states of the empire, I exclaimed. Your advice is not asked about beginning the dance, yet you must of course follow the leaders. End quote. Peace was at last signed on the 6th of March, 1714. France kept Landau and Fort Louis. She restored Spire, Brissach, and Fribourg. The emperor refused to recognize Philip V, but he accepted the status quo. The crown of Spain remained definitively with the House of Bourbon. It had cost men and millions enough. For an instant the very foundations of order in Europe had seemed to be upset. The old French monarchy had been threatened. It had recovered of itself and by its own resources, sustaining single-handed the struggle which was pulling down all Europe in coalition against it. It had obtained conditions which restored its frontiers to the limits of the Peace of Reiswick. But it was exhausted, gasping, at wit's end for men and money. Absolute power had obtained from national pride the last possible efforts, but it had played itself out in the struggle. The confidence of the country was shaken. It had been seen what dangers the will of a single man had made the nation incur. The tempest was already gathering within men's souls. The habit of respect, the memory of past glories, the personal majesty of Louis the Fourteenth, still kept up about the aged king the deceitful appearances of uncontested power and sovereign authority. The long decadence of his great-grandson's reign was destined to complete its ruin. Quote, I loved war too much, was Louis the Fourteenth's confession on his deathbed. He had loved it madly and exclusively, but this fatal passion, which had ruined and corrupted France, had not at any rate remained infructuous. Louis the Fourteenth had the good fortune to profit by the efforts of his predecessors, as well as of his own servants. Richelieu and Mazarin, Condé and Turenne, Luxembourg, Catina, Vauban, Villars, and Louvois all toiled at the same work. Under his reign, France was intoxicated with excess of the pride of conquest, but she did not lose all its fruits. She witnessed the conclusion of five pieces, mostly glorious, the last sadly honorable. All tended to consolidate the unity and power of the kingdom. It is to the treaties of the Pyrenees, of Westphalia, of Nijmegen, of Reiswick, and of Utrecht, all signed with the name of Louis the Fourteenth, that France owed Roussillon, Artois, Alsace, Flanders, and Franche-Comté. Her glory has more than once cost her dear. It has never been worth so much and such sordid increment to her territory. End of section 55. End of chapter 45. Section 56 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 46. Louis the Fourteenth and Home Administration. Part 1. It is King Louis the Fourteenth's distinction and heavy burden in the eyes of history that it is impossible to tell of anything in his reign without constantly recurring to himself. He had two ministers of the higher order, Colbert and Louvois, several of good capacity, such as Seignelay and Torcy, others incompetent like Chamillard. He remained as much master of the administrators of the first rank as if they had been insignificant clerks. The home government of France from 1661 to 1715 is summed up in the king's relations with his ministers. Quote, I resolved from the first not to have any premier minister, says Louis the Fourteenth in his memoir, and not to leave to another the functions of king whilst I had nothing but the title. But on the contrary, I made up my mind to share the execution of my orders amongst several persons, in order to concentrate their authority in mine alone. I might have cast my eyes upon people of higher consideration than those I selected, but they seemed to me competent to execute, under me, the matters with which I purposed to entrust them. I did not think it was to my interest to look for men of higher standing, because as I wanted above all things to establish my own reputation, it was important that the public should know, from the rank of those of whom I made use, that I had no intention of sharing my authority with them, and that they themselves, knowing what they were, should not conceive higher hopes than I wished to give them. It has been said already that the court governed France in the reign of Louis the Fourteenth, and what was, in fact, the court the men who lived about the king, depending on his favor, the source or arbiter of their fortunes. 
the great lords served in the army with lustre when they bore the name of Condé, Turenne, or Luxembourg, but they never had any place amongst the king's confidential servants. Quote, Luck, in spite of us, has as much to do as wisdom, and more with the choice of our ministers, he says in his memoir, and in respect of what wisdom may have to do therewith, genius is far more effectual than counsel. It was their genius which made the fortunes and the power of Louis XIV's two great ministers, Colbert and Louvois. In advance, and on the faith of Cardinal Mazarin, the king knew the worth of Colbert. Quote, I had all possible confidence in him, says he, because I knew that he had a great deal of application, intelligence, and probity. End quote. Rough, reserved, taciturn, indefatigable in work, passionately devoted to the cause of order, public welfare, and the peaceable aggrandizement of France, Colbert, on becoming the controller of finance in 1661, brought to the service of the state superior views, consummate experience, and indomitable perseverance. The position of affairs required no fewer virtues. Quote, Disorder reigned everywhere, says the king, on casting over the various portions of my kingdom not eyes of indifference but the eyes of a master, I was sensibly affected not to see a single one which did not deserve and did not press to be taken in hand. The destitution of the lower orders was extreme, and the finances which give movement and activity to all this great framework of the monarchy were entirely exhausted and in such plight that there was scarcely any resource to be seen. The affluent, to be seen only amongst official people, on the one hand, cloaked all their malversations by diverse kinds of artifices, and uncloaked them on the other by their insolent and audacious extravagance, as if they were afraid to leave me in ignorance of them. The punishment of the tax collectors, or traitants, prosecuted at the same time as Superintendent Fouquet, the arbitrary redemption of rentes, or annuities, on the city of Paris, or on certain branches of the taxes, did not suffice to alleviate the extreme suffering of the people. The talliages from which the nobility and the clergy were nearly everywhere exempt, pressed upon the people with the most cruel inequality. Quote, the poor are reduced to eating grass and roots in our meadows like cattle, said a letter from Blaisois. Those who can find dead carcasses devour them, and unless God have pity upon them, they will soon be eating one another. End quote. Normandy, generally so prosperous, was reduced to the uttermost distress. Quote, the great number of poor has exhausted charity and the power of those who were accustomed to relieve them, says a letter to Colbert from the superintendent of Cayenne. In 1662 the town was obliged to throw open the doors of the great hospital, having no longer any means of furnishing subsistence to those who were in it. I can assure you that there are persons in this town who have gone for whole days without anything to eat. The country, which ought to supply bread for the towns, is crying for mercy's sake to be supplied therewith itself. The peasants, wasted with hunger, could no longer till their fields. Their cattle had been seized for taxes. Colbert proposed to the king to remit the arrears of talliages, and devoted all his efforts to reducing them whilst regulating their collection. His desire was to arrive at the establishment everywhere of real talliages, on landed property, etc., instead of personal talliages, variable imposts, depending upon the supposed means or social position of the inhabitants. He was only very partially successful, without, however, allowing himself to be repelled by the difficulties presented by differences of legislation and customs in the provinces. Quote, Perhaps, he wrote to the superintendent of Esch in 1681, on getting to the bottom of the matter and considering it in detail, you will not discover in it all the impossibilities you have pictured to yourself. End quote. Colbert died without having completed his work. The talliages, however, had been reduced by eight millions of livres within the first two years of his administration. Quote, all the imposts of the kingdom, he writes, in 1662, to the superintendent of Tours, who is complaining of the destitution of the people are, as regards the talliages, but about thirty-seven millions, and for forty or fifty years past they have always been between forty and fifty millions, except after the peace when His Majesty reduced them to thirty-two, thirty-three, and thirty-four millions. Peace was of short duration in the reign of Louis the Fourteenth, and often so precarious that it did not permit of disarmament. At the very period when the able minister was trying to make the people feel the importance of the diminution in the talliages, he wrote to the king, quote, I entreat your majesty to read these few lines attentively. I confess to your majesty that the last time you were graciously pleased to speak to me about the state of the finances, my respect, the boundless desire I have always had to please you and serve you to your satisfaction without making any difficulty or causing any hitch, and still more your natural eloquence which succeeds in bringing conviction of whatever you please deprived me of courage to insist and dwell somewhat upon the condition of your finances, for the which I see no other remedy but increase of receipts and decrease of expenses. 
Wherefore, though this is no concern at all of mine, I merely entreat your majesty to permit me to say that in war as well as in peace you have never consulted your finances for the purpose of determining your expenditure, which is a thing so extraordinary that assuredly there is no example thereof. For the past twenty years, during which I have had the honour of serving your majesty, though the receipts have greatly increased, you would find that the expenses have much exceeded the receipts, which might perhaps induce you to moderate and retrench such as are excessive. I am aware, sir, that the figure I present herein is not an agreeable one, but in your majesty's service there are different functions, some entail nothing but agreeables whereof the expenses are the foundation. That with which your majesty honours me entails this misfortune, that it can with difficulty produce anything agreeable, since the proposals for expenses have no limit, but one must console oneself by constantly labouring to do one's best. End quote. Louis the Fourteenth did not, quote, moderate or retrench his expenses. End quote. Colbert laboured to increase the receipts. The new imposts excited insurrections in Angoumois, in Guienne, and Brittany. Bordeaux rose in 1695 with shouts of, quote, Hurrah for the king without gable, end quote. Marshal d'Albret ventured into the streets in the district of Saint-Michel. He was accosted by one of the ringleaders, quote, Well, my friend, said the marshal, with whom is thy business? Dost wish to speak to me? Quote, yes, replied the townsman, I am deputed by the people of Saint-Michel to tell you that they are good servants of the king, but that they do not mean to have any gable or marks on pewter or tobacco or stamped papers or irref d'arbitrage or arbitration clerk's fee. End quote. It was not until a year afterwards that the taxes could be established in Gascony. Troops had to be sent to Rennes to impose the stamp tax upon the Bretons. Quote, Soldiers are more likely to be wanted in Lower Brittany than in any other spot, said a letter to Colbert from the lieutenant-general, M. de Lavardin. It is a rough and wild country which breeds inhabitants who resemble it. They understand French but slightly, and reason not much better. The Parliament is at the back of all this. End quote. Riots were frequent and were put down with great severity. Quote, the poor low Bretons collect by forty or fifty in the fields, writes Madame de Sévigny on the 24th of September, 1675. As soon as they see soldiers, they throw themselves on their knees, saying, Mea culpa, all the French they know. Quote, the severities are abating, she adds on the 3rd of November. After the hangings there will be no more hanging. End quote. All these fresh imposts, which had cost so much suffering and severity, brought in but two millions five hundred thousand livres at Colbert's death. The indirect taxes, which were at that time called ferme générale, or farmings general, amounted to thirty-seven millions during the first two years of Colbert's administration, and rose to sixty-four millions at the time of his death. Quote, I should be apprehensive of going too far, and that the prodigious augmentations of the ferme, or farmings, would be very burdensome to the people, wrote Louis XIV in 1680. The expenses of recovering the taxes, which had but lately led to great abuses, were diminished by half. Quote, the bailiffs generally, and especially those who are set over the recovery of talliages, are such terrible brutes that by way of exterminating a good number of these you could not do anything more worthy of you than suppress those, wrote Colbert to the criminal magistrate of Orléans. I am at this moment promoting two suits against the collectors of talliages, in which I expect at present to get ten thousand crowns damages, without counting another against an assessor's officer who wounded one Grimaud, the which had one of his daughters killed before his eyes, his wife, another of his daughters, and his female servant wounded with swords and sticks, the writ of distrainment being executed whilst the poor creature was being buried." The bailiffs were suppressed, and the king's justice was let loose not only against the fiscal officers who abused their power, but also against tyrannical nobles. Masters of requests and members of the Parliament of Paris went to Auvergne and Velay and held temporary courts of justice, which were called grands jours. Several lords were found guilty. Sieur de la Motte actually died upon the scaffold for having unjustly despoiled and maltreated the people on his estates. Quote, he was not one of the worst, says Fléchier in his Journal des Grands Jours d'Auvergne. The Duke of Bouillon, governor of the province, had too long favoured the guilty. Quote, I resolved, says the king in his memoir, to prevent the people from being subjected to thousands and thousands of tyrants instead of one lawful king, whose indulgence alone it is that causes all this disorder. End quote. The puissance of the provincial governors, already curtailed by Richelieu, suffered from fresh attacks under Louis the Fourteenth. Everywhere the power passed into the hands of the superintendents, themselves subjected in their turn to inspection by the masters of requests. Quote, acting on the information I had that in many provinces the people were plagued by certain folks who abused their title of governors in order to make unjust requisitions, says the king in his memoir, I posted men in all quarters for the express purpose of keeping myself more surely informed of such exactions, in order to punish them as they deserved. 
order was restored in all parts of France. Quote, the Auvergnat, said a letter to Colbert from President de Novion, never knew so certainly that they had a king as they do now. End quote. Quote, a useless banquet at a cost of a thousand crowns causes me incredible pain, said Colbert to Louis XIV, and yet, when it is a question of millions of gold for Poland, I would sell all my property, I would pawn my wife and children, and I would go afoot all my life to provide for it if necessary. Your Majesty, if it please you, you will forgive me this little transport. I begin to doubt whether the liberty I take is agreeable to your Majesty. It has seemed to me that you are beginning to prefer your pleasures and your diversions to everything else. At the very time when your Majesty told me at Saint-Germain that the morsel must be taken from one's mouth to provide for the increment of the naval armament, you spent two hundred thousand livres down for a trip to Versailles, to wit thirteen thousand pistoles for your gambling expenses and the Queen's, and fifty thousand livres for extraordinary banquets. You have likewise so intermingled our diversions with the war on land that it is difficult to separate the two, and if your Majesty will be graciously pleased to examine in detail the amount of useless expenditure you have incurred, you will plainly see that if it were all deducted, you would not be reduced to your present necessity. The right thing to do, sir, is to grudge five sous for unnecessary things, and to throw millions about when it is for your glory. End, quote. End of section 56 Section 57 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 46. Louis the Fourteenth and Home Administration, Part 2. Colbert knew, in fact, how to, quote, throw millions about, end quote, when it was for endowing France with new manufactures and industries. Quote, one of the most important works of peace, he used to say, is the re-establishment of every kind of trade in this kingdom, and to put it in a position to do without having recourse to foreigners for the things necessary for the use and comfort of the subjects. Quote, we have no need of anybody, and our neighbors have need of us. End quote. Such was the maxim laid down in a document of that date, which has often been attributed to Colbert, and which he certainly put incessantly into practice. The cloth manufacturers were dying out, they received encouragement. A Protestant Hollander, Van Robet, attracted over to Abbeville by Colbert, there introduced the making of fine cloths. At Beauvais and in the Gobelin establishment at Paris, under the direction of the great painter Lebrun, the French tapestries soon threw into the shade the reputation of the tapestries of Flanders. Venus had to yield up her secrets and her workmen for the glass manufactories of Saint-Gobain and Tourleville. The great lords and ladies were obliged to give up the Venetian point with which their dresses had been trimmed. The importation of it was forbidden, and lace manufactories were everywhere established in France. There was even a strike amongst the women at Alençon against the new lace which it was desired to force them to make. Quote, there are more than eighty thousand persons working at lace in Alençon, Seize, Argentin, Falaise, and the circumjacent parishes said a letter to Colbert from the superintendent of Alençon, and I can assure you, my lord, that it is manna and a blessing from heaven over all this district, where even little children of seven years of age find means of earning a livelihood. The little shepherd girls from the fields work like the rest at it. They say that they will never be able to make such fine point as this, and that one wants to take away their bread and their means of paying their talliage." Point d'Alençon won the battle, and the making of lace spread all over Normandy. Manufactures of soap, tin, arms, silk, gave work to a multitude of laborers. The home trade of France at the same time received development. The bad state of the roads was, quote, a dreadful hindrance to traffic, end quote. Colbert ordered them to be everywhere improved. Quote, the superintendents have done wonders, and we are never tired of singing their praises, writes Madame de Sévigny to her daughter during one of her trips. It is quite extraordinary what beautiful roads there are. There is not a single moment's stoppage. There are malls and walks everywhere, end quote. The magnificent canal of Languedoc, due to the generous initiative of Briquet, united the ocean to the Mediterranean. The canal of Orléans completed the canal of Briare, commenced by Henry IV. The inland custom houses which shackled the traffic between province and province were suppressed at diverse points. Many provinces demurred to the admission of this innovation, declaring that to set their affairs right, quote, there was need of nothing but order, 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 end quote. Colbert also wanted order, but his views were higher and broader than those of Breton or Gascon merchants. In spite of his desire to, quote, put the kingdom in a position to do without having recourse to foreigners for things necessary for the use and comfort of the French, end quote, 
He had too lofty, he had too lofty and too judicious a mind to neglect the extension of trade. Like Richelieu, he was for founding great trading companies. He had five for the East and West Indies, the Levant, the North, and Africa. Just as with Richelieu, they were with difficulty established, and lasted but a little while. It was necessary to levy subscriptions on the members of the sovereign corporations. Quote, Monsieur de Bercy put down his name for a thousand livres, says the journal of Olivier d'Ormesson. M. de Colbert laughed at him, and said that it could not be for his pocket's sake, and the end of it was that he put down three thousand livres. End quote. Colbert could not get over the mortifying success of the company of the Dutch Indies. Quote, I cannot believe that they pay forty per cent, said he. It was with the Dutch that he most frequently had commercial difficulties. The United Provinces produced but little, and their merchant navy was exclusively engaged in the business of transport. The charge of fifty sous per ton on merchandise carried in foreign vessels caused so much ill-humor amongst the Hollanders that it was partly the origin of their rupture with France and of the Treaty of the Triple Alliance. Colbert made great efforts to develop the French navy, both the fighting and the merchant. Quote, the sea traffic of all the world, he wrote in 1669 to Monsieur de Pomponne, then ambassador to Holland, is done with twenty thousand vessels or thereabouts. In the natural order of things, each nation should have its own share thereof in proportion to its power, population, and seaboard. The Hollanders have fifteen or sixteen thousand out of this number, and the French perhaps four or five hundred at most. The king is employing all sorts of means which he thinks useful in order to approach a little more nearly to the number his subjects ought naturally to have. End quote. Colbert's efforts were not useless. At his death, the maritime trade of France had developed itself, and French merchants were effectually protected at sea by ships of war. Quote, it is necessary, said Colbert in his instructions to Seignelay, that my son should be as keenly alive to all the disorders that may occur in trade, and all the losses that may be incurred by every trader, as if they were his own. End quote. In 1692, the Royal Navy numbered a 186 vessels. A 160,000 sailors were down on the books. The works at the ports of Toulon, Brest, and Rochefort were in full activity. Louis the Fourteenth was in a position to refuse the salute of the flag which England had up to that time exacted in the Channel from all nations. Quote, the king my brother and those of whom he takes counsel do not quite know me yet, wrote the king to his ambassador in London, when they adopt towards me a tone of haughtiness and a certain sturdiness which has a savour of menace. I know of no power under heaven that can make me move a step by that sort of way. Evil may come to me, of course, but no sensation of fear." The King of England and his Chancellor may, of course, see pretty well what my strength is, but they do not see my heart. I, who feel and know full well both one and the other, desire that for sole reply to so haughty a declaration, they learn from your mouth that I neither seek nor ask for any accommodation in the matter of the flag, because I shall know quite well how to maintain my right whatever may happen. I intend before long to place my maritime forces on such a footing that the English shall consider it a favour, if it be my good pleasure, then, to listen to modifications touching a right which is due to me more legitimately than to them. Duquesne and Tourville, Duguet Troin and John Bart, permitted the king to make good on the seas such proud words. From 1685 to 1712, the French fleets could everywhere hold their own against the allied squadrons of England and Holland. So many and such sustained efforts in all directions, so many vast projects, and of so great promise, suited the mind of Louis the Fourteenth as well as that of his minister. Quote, I tell you what I think, wrote Louis the Fourteenth to Colbert in 1674, but after all I end as I began, by placing myself entirely in your hands, being certain that you will do what is most advantageous for my service. End quote. Colbert's zeal for his master's service merited this confidence. Quote, Oh, he exclaimed one day, that I could render this country happy, and that far from the court, without favor, without influence, the grass might grow in my very courts. End quote. Louis the Fourteenth was the victim of three passions which hampered, and in the long run, destroyed the accord between king and minister. That for war, wetted and indulged by Louvois, that for kingly and courtly extravagance, and that for building and costly fancies. Colbert likewise loved, quote-unquote, buildments, or les bâtiments, as the phrase then was. He urged the king to complete the Louvre, plans for which were requested of Bernini, who went to Paris for the purpose. After two years in fructuous feelers and compliments, the Italian returned to Rome, and the work was entrusted to Perrault, whose plan for the beautiful colonnade still existing had always pleased Colbert. 
the completion of the castle of Saint-Germain, the works at Fontainebleau and at Chambord, the triumphal arches of Saint-Denis and Saint-Martin, the laying out of the Tuileries, the construction of the observatory, and even that of the Palais des Invalides, which was Louvois' idea, found the controller of the finances well disposed, if not eager. Versailles was a constant source of vexation to him. Quote, Your Majesty is coming back from Versailles, he wrote to the King on the 28th of September, 1685. I entreat that you will permit me to say two words about the reflections I often make upon this subject, and forgive me if it please you for my zeal. That mansion appertains far more to Your Majesty's pleasure and diversion than to your glory. If you would be graciously pleased to search all over Versailles for the five hundred thousand crowns spent within two years, you would assuredly have a difficulty in finding them. If your majesty thinks upon it, you will reflect that it will appear forever in the accounts of the treasurers of your buildments that, whilst you were expending such great sums on this mansion, you neglected the Louvre, which is assuredly the most superb palace in the world, and the most worthy of your majesty's grandeur. You are aware that, in default of splendid deeds of arms, there is nothing which denotes the grandeur and spirit of princes more plainly than buildments do, and all posterity measures them by the L of those superb mansions which they have erected during their lives. Oh, what pity it were that the greatest king, and the most virtuous in that true virtue which makes the greatest princes, should be measured by the L of Versailles. And nevertheless there is room to fear this misfortune. For my part I confess to your majesty that, notwithstanding the repugnance you feel to increase the cash orders, or comptants, if I could have foreseen that this expenditure would be so large, I should have advised the employment of cash orders, in order to hide the knowledge thereof forever." End quote. The cash orders, or ordonnances au comptant, did not indicate their object, and were not revised. The king merely wrote, Pay cash. I know the object of this expenditure, or bon comptant. Je sais l'objet de cette dépense. Colbert was mistaken in his fears for Louis the Fourteenth's glory. If the expenses of Versailles surpassed his most gloomy apprehensions, the palace which rose upon the site of Louis the Fourteenth's former hunting box, was worthy of the king who had made it in his own image, and who managed to retain all his court around him there by the mere fact of his will and of his royal presence. Colbert was dead before Versailles was completed. The bills amounted then to one hundred and sixteen millions. The castle of Marly, now destroyed, cost more than four millions. Money was everywhere becoming scarce. The temper of the controller of finances went on getting worse. Quote, whereas formerly it had been noticed that he set to his work rubbing his hands with joy, says his secretary Pedro, brother of the celebrated architect, he no longer worked but with an air of vexation, and even with sighs. From the good-natured and easy-going creature he had been, he became difficult to deal with, and there was not so much business by a great deal got through as in the early years of his administration. Quote, I do not mean to build any more, Mansart. I meet with too many mortifications, the king would say to his favorite architect. He still went on building, however, but he quarreled with Colbert over the cost of the great railings of Versailles. Quote, There's swindling here, said Louis the Fourteenth. Sir, rejoined Colbert, I flatter myself at any rate that that word does not apply to me. Quote, no, said the king, but more attention should have been shown. If you want to know what economy is, go to Flanders. You will see how little those fortifications of the conquered places cost. End quote. It was Vauban whose praise the king thus sang, and Vauban, devoted to Louvois, had for a long time past been embroiled with Colbert. The minister felt himself beaten in the contest he had so long maintained against Michael Le Tellier and his son. In 1664, at the death of Chancellor Seguier, Colbert had opposed the elevation of Le Tellier to this office, quote, telling the king that if he came in, he, Colbert, could not serve his majesty, as he would have him thwarting everything he wanted to do, end quote. On leaving the council, Le Tellier said to Brienne, quote, You see what a tone M. Colbert takes up. He will have to be settled with. End quote. The antagonism had been perpetuated between Colbert and Louvois. Their rivalry in the state had been augmented by the contrary dispositions of the two ministers. Both were passionately devoted to their work, laborious, indefatigable, honest in money matters, and both of fierce and domineering temper. But Louvois was more violent, more bold, less scrupulous as to ways and means of attaining his end, cruel in the exercise of his will and his wrath, less concerned about the sufferings of the people, more exclusively absorbed by one fixed idea. Both rendered great service to the king, but Colbert performing for the prince and the state only useful offices in the way of order, economy, wise and far-sighted administration, courageous and steady opposition, Louvois ever urging the king on, according to his bent, as haughty and more impassioned than he, entangling him and encouraging him in wars which rendered his own services necessary, without pity for the woes he entailed upon the nation. 
It was the misfortune and the great fault of Louis XIV that he preferred the counsels of Louvois to those of Colbert, and that he allowed all the functions so faithfully exercised by the dying minister to drop into the hands of his enemy and rival. At sixty-four years of age, Colbert succumbed to excess of labor and of cares. That man so cold and reserved, whom Madame de Sévigny called North, and Guy Patin the man of marble, or Vire Marmoreux, felt that disgust for the things of life which appears so strikingly in the seventeenth century amongst those who were most ardently engaged in the affairs of the world. He was suffering from stone. The king sent to inquire after him and wrote to him. The dying man had his eyes closed. He did not open them. Quote, I do not want to hear anything more about him, said he, when the king's letter was brought to him. Now, at any rate, let him leave me alone. End quote. His thoughts were occupied with his soul's salvation. Madame de Maintenon used to accuse him of always thinking about his finances, and very little about religion. He repeated bitterly, as the dying Cardinal Wolsey had previously said in the case of Henry, quote, If I had done for God what I have done for that man, I had been saved twice over, and now I know not what will become of me. End quote. He expired on the 6th of September, 1683, and on the 10th, Madame de Maintenon wrote to Madame de Saint-Gerin, The king is very well. He feels no more now than a slight sorrow. The death of M. de Colbert afflicted him, and a great many people rejoiced at that affliction. It is all stuff about the pernicious designs he had, and the king very cordially forgave him for having determined to die without reading his letter, in order to be better able to give his thoughts to God. M. de Signolet was anxious to step into all his posts, and has not obtained a single one. He has plenty of cleverness, but little moral conduct. His pleasures always have precedence of his duties. He has so exaggerated his father's talents and services that he has convinced everybody how unworthy and incapable he is of succeeding him. End quote. The influence of Louvois and the king's ill humor against the Colbert peep out in the injustice of Madame de Maintenon. Seignelay had received from Louis the Fourteenth the reversion of the navy. His father had prepared him for it with anxious strictness, and he had exercised the function since 1676. Well informed, clever, magnificent, Seignelay drove business and pleasure as a pair. In 1685 he gave the king a splendid entertainment in his castle of Scope. In 1686 he set off for Genoa, bombarded by Duquesne. In 1689 he, in person, organized the fleet of Tourville at Brest. Quote, he was general in everything, says Madame de Lafayette. Even when he did not give the word, he had the exterior and air of it. Quote, he is devoured by ambition, Madame de Maintenon had lately said. In 1689 she writes, quote, anxious, or l'inquiet, that is, Louvois, hangs but by a thread. He is very much shocked at having the direction of the affairs of Ireland taken from him. He blames me for it. He counted on making immense profits. Monsieur de Seignelay counts on nothing but perils and labors. He will succeed if he do not carry things with too high a hand. The king would have no better servant if he could rid himself a little of his temperament. He admits as much himself, and yet he does not mend. Seignelay died on the 3rd of November, 1690, at the age of 39. Quote, he had all the parts of a great minister of state, says Saint-Simon, and he was the despair of M. de Louvois, whom he often placed in the position of having not a word of reply to say in the king's presence. His defects corresponded with his great qualities. As a hater and a friend, he had no peer but Louvois. Quote, how young, how fortunate, how great a position, wrote Madame de Sévigny on hearing of the death of M. de Seignelay. It seems as if splendor itself were dead. End, quote. End of section 57. Section 58 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 46. Louis the Fourteenth and Home Administration, Part 3. Seignelay had spent freely, but he left at his death more than 400,000 livres a year. Colbert's fortune amounted to ten millions, legitimate proceeds of his high offices and the king's liberalities. He was born of a family of merchants, at Rheims, ennobled in the sixteenth century, but he was fond of connecting it with the Colbert of Scotland. The great minister would often tell his children to reflect, quote, what their birth would have done for them if God had not blessed his labors, and if those labors had not been extreme, end quote. He had married his daughters to the dukes of Beauvilliers and Mortemar. Seignelay had wedded Mademoiselle de Matignon, whose grandmother was an Orléans Longueville. Quote, Thus, said Mademoiselle de Montpensier, they have the honor of being as closely related as Monsieur le Prince to the King. Marie de Bourbon was cousin German to the King, my grandfather. 
That lends a grand air to M. de Seignelay, who had by nature sufficient vanity. End quote. Colbert had no need to seek out genealogies, and great alliances were naturally attracted to his power and the favor he was in. He had in himself that title which comes of superior merit, and which nothing can make up for, nothing can equal. He might have said, as Marshal Lannes said to the Marquis of Montesquieu, who was exhibiting a coat taken out of his ancestor's drawers, quote, I am an ancestor myself. End quote. Louvois remained henceforth alone, without rival and without check. The work he had undertaken for the reorganization of the army was pretty nearly completed. He had concentrated in his own hands the whole direction of the military service, the burden and the honor of which were both borne by him. He had subjected to the same rules and the same discipline all corps and all grades. The general as well as the colonel obeyed him blindly. M. de Turenne alone had managed to escape from the administrative level. Quote, I see quite clearly, he wrote to Louvois on the 9th of September, 1673, what are the king's wishes, and I will do all I can to conform to them, but you will permit me to tell you that I do not think that it would be to his majesty's service to give precise orders at such a distance to the most incapable man in France. End quote. Turenne had not lost the habit of command. Louvois, who had for a long while been under his orders, bowed to the will of the king, who required apparent accord between the marshal and the minister, but he never forgave Turenne for his cool and proud independence. The Prince of Condé more than once turned to advantage this latent antagonism. After the death of Louvois and of Turenne, after the retirement of Condé, when the central power fell into the hands of Chamillard or of Voisin, the pretense of directing war from the king's closet at Versailles produced the most fatal effects. Quote, if M. de Chamillard thinks that I know nothing about war, wrote Villard to Madame de Maintenon, he will oblige me by finding somebody else in the kingdom who is better acquainted with it. Quote, if your majesty, he said again, orders me to shut myself up in Bavaria, and if you want to see your army lost, I will get myself killed at the first opportunity, rather than live to see such a mishap. End quote. The king's orders, transmitted through a docile minister, ignorant of war, had a great deal to do with the military disasters of Louis XIV's later years. Meanwhile, order reigned in the army, and supplies were regular. Louvois received the nickname of Great Victualler, or Vivrier. The wounded were tended in hospitals devoted to their use. Quote, when a soldier is once down, he never gets up again, had but lately been the saying. Quote, had I been at my mother's in her own house, I could not have been better treated, wrote M. Daligny on the contrary, when he came out of one of the hospitals created by Louvois. He conceived the grand idea of the Hôtel des Invalides. Quote, it were very reasonable, says the preamble of the king's edict which founded the establishment, that they who have freely exposed their lives and lavished their blood for the defense and maintenance of this monarchy, who have so materially contributed to the winning of the battles we have gained over our enemies, and who have often reduced them to asking peace of us, should enjoy the repose they have secured for our other subjects, and should pass the remainder of their days in tranquillity. Up to his death, Louvois insisted upon managing the Hôtel des Invalides himself. Never had the officers of the army been under such strict and minute supervision. Promotion went by seniority, by, quote, the order on the list, end quote, as the phrase then was, without any favor for rank or birth. Commanders were obliged to attend to their corps. Quote, Sir, said Louvois one day to M. de Nogaret, your company is in a very bad state. Quote, Sir, answered Nogaret, I was not aware of it. Quote, you ought to be aware, said M. de Louvois. Have you inspected it? Quote, no, sir, said Nogaret. Quote, you ought to have inspected it, sir. Quote, sir, I will give orders about it. Quote, you ought to have given them. A man ought to make up his mind, sir, either to openly profess himself a courtier or to devote himself to his duty when he is an officer. End quote. Education in the schools for cadets, regularity in service, obligation to keep the companies full instead of pocketing a portion of the pay in the name of imaginary soldiers who appeared only on the registers and who were called dummies or passe volants, the necessity of wearing uniform introduced into the army customs to which French nobility, as undisciplined as they were brave, had hitherto been utter strangers. Artillery and engineering were developed under the influence of Vauban, quote, the first of his own time and one of the first of all times, end quote, in the great art of besieging, fortifying and defending places. Louvois had singled out Vauban at the sieges of Lille, Tournai and Douai, which he had directed in chief under the king's own eye. He ordered him to render the places he had just taken impregnable. Quote, this is no child's play, said Vauban on setting about the fortifications of Dunkirk, and I would rather lose my life than hear said of me some day what I hear said of the men who have preceded me. End quote. Louvois' admiration was unmixed when he went to examine the works. Quote, the achievements of the Romans, which have earned them so much fame, show nothing comparable to what has been done here, he exclaimed. 
They formerly leveled mountains in order to make high roads, but here more than four hundred have been swept away. In the place where all those sandbanks were, there is now to be seen nothing but one great meadow. The English and the Dutch often send people hither to see if all they have been told is true. They all go back full of admiration at the success of the work and the greatness of the master who took it in hand. End quote. It was this admiration and this dangerous greatness which suggested to the English their demands touching Dunkirk during the negotiations for the Peace of Utrecht. The honesty and moral worth of Vauban equaled his genius. He was as high-minded as he was modest. Evil reports had been spread about concerning the contractors for the fortifications of Lille. Vauban demanded an inquiry. Quote, you are quite right in thinking, my lord, he wrote to Louvois, to whom he was united by a sincere and faithful friendship, that if you do not examine into this affair, you cannot do me justice, and if you do it me not, that would be compelling me to seek means of doing it myself, and of giving up forever fortification and all its concomitants. Examine, then, boldly and severely, away with all tender feeling, for I dare plainly tell you that in a question of strictest honesty and sincere fidelity I fear neither the king, nor you, nor all the human race together. Fortune had me borne the poorest gentleman in France, but in requital she honoured me with an honest heart, so free from all sorts of swindles that it cannot bear even the thought of them without a shudder." It was not until eight years after the death of Louvois in 1699, when Vauban had directed fifty-three sieges, constructed the fortifications of thirty-three places, and repaired those of three hundred towns, that he was made a marshal, an honor that no engineer had yet obtained. Quote, the king fancied he was giving himself the baton, it was said, so often had he had Vauban under his orders in besieging places. End quote. The leisure of peace was more propitious to Vauban's fame than to his favor. Generous and sincere as he was, a patriot more far-sighted than his contemporaries, he had the courage to present to the king a memorial advising the recall of the fugitive Huguenot, and the renewal, pure and simple, of the Edict of Nantes. He had just directed the siege of Brissach and the defense of Dunkirk when he published a great economical work entitled La Dîme Royale, the fruit of the reflections of his whole life, fully depicting the misery of the people and the system of imposts he thought adapted to relieve it. The king was offended. He gave the marshal a cold reception and had the work seized. Vauban received his death blow from this disgrace. The royal edict was dated March 19, 1707. The great engineer died on the 30th. He was not quite 74. The king testified no regret for the loss of so illustrious a servant with whom he had lived on terms of close intimacy. Vauban had appeared to impugn his supreme authority. This was one of the crimes that Louis XIV never forgave. In 1683, at Colbert's death, Vauban was enjoying the royal favor, which he attributed entirely to Louvois. The latter reigned without any one to contest his influence with the master. It had been found necessary to bury Colbert by night to avoid the insults of the people, who imputed to him the imposts which crushed them. What an unjust and odious mistake of popular opinion, which accused Colbert of the evils which he had fought against, and at the same time suffered under to the last day. All Colbert's offices, except the navy, fell to Louvois or his creatures. Claude Le Pelletier, a relative of Le Tellier, became controller of France. He entered the council. M. de Blainville, Colbert's second son, was obliged to resign in Louvois' favor the superintendence of buildments, of which the king had previously promised him the reversion. All business passed into the hands of Louvois. Le Tellier had been chancellor since 1677. Peace still reigned. The all-powerful minister occupied himself in building Trianon, bringing the river Ure to Versailles, and establishing unity of religion in France. Quote, the counsel of constraining the Huguenots by violent means to become Catholics was given and carried out by the Marquis of Louvois, says an anonymous letter of the time. Quote, he thought he could manage consciences and control religion by those harsh measures which, in spite of his wisdom, his violent nature suggests to him almost in everything. End quote. Louvois was the inventor of the Dragonade. It was his father, Michael Le Tellier, who put the seals to the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, and a few days before he died, full of joy at his last work, he piously sang the canticle of Simeon. Louis the Fourteenth and his ministers believed in good faith that Protestantism was stamped out. Quote, the king, wrote Madame de Maintenon, is very pleased to have put the last touch to the great work of the reunion of the heretics with the church. Father Lachaise, the king's confessor, promised that it would not cost a drop of blood, and M. de Louvois said the same thing. Emigration in mass, the revolt of the Camisards, and the long-continued punishments were a painful surprise for the courtiers accustomed to bend beneath the will of Louis the Fourteenth. They did not understand that, quote, anybody should obstinately remain of a religion which was displeasing to the king, end quote. 
The Huguenots paid the penalty for their obstinacy. The intelligent and acute biographer of Louvois, M. Camille Rousset, could not defend him from the charge of violence in their case. On the 10th of June, 1686, he wrote to the superintendent of Languedoc, quote, on my representation to the king of the little heed paid by the women of the district, in which you are to the penalties ordained against those who are found at assemblies, his majesty orders that those who are not demoiselles, that is, noble, shall be sentenced by M. de Baville to be whipped and branded with the fleur de lis. He adds on the 22nd of July, quote, The king, having thought proper to have a declaration sent out on the 15th of this month, whereby his majesty orders that all those who are henceforth found at such assemblies shall be punished by death, M. de Baville will take no notice of the decree I sent you relating to the women, as it becomes useless by reason of this declaration. End quote. The king's declaration was carried out, as the sentences of the victims prove, condemned to the galleys or condemned to death for the crime of assemblies. This was the language of the Roman emperors. Seventeen centuries of Christianity had not sufficed to make men comprehend the sacred rights of conscience. The refined and moderate mind of Madame de Sévigny did not prevent her from writing to M. de Bussy on the 28th of October, 1685, quote, You have no doubt seen the edict by which the king revokes that of Nantes. Nothing can be more beautiful in its contents, and never did or will any king do anything more memorable, end quote. The noble libertine and free thinker replied to her, quote, I admire the steps taken by the king to reunite the Huguenots. The war made upon them in former times, and the St. Bartholomew gave vigor to this sect. His majesty has sapped it little by little, and the edict he has just issued, supported by dragoons and Bordeloup, has given it the finishing stroke. It was the honorable distinction of the French Protestants to proclaim during more than two centuries by their courageous resistance the rights and dues which were ignored all around them. Whilst the reformers were undergoing conversion, exile, or death, war was recommencing in Europe, with more determination than ever on the part of the Protestant nations, indignant and disquieted as they were. Louvois began to forget all about the obstinacy of the religionists, and prepared for the siege of Philipsburg and the capture of Mannheim and Koblenz. Quote, the king has seen with pleasure, he wrote to Marshal Boufflet, that after well burning Koblenz and doing all the harm possible to the elector's palace, you were to march back to Mayence. End quote. The haughtiness of the king and the violence of the minister went on increasing with the success of their arms. They treated the Pope's rights almost as lightly as those of the Protestants. The pamphleteers of the day had reason to write, quote, It is clearly seen that the religion of the court of France is a pure matter of interest. The king does nothing but what is for that which he calls his glory and grandeur. Catholics and heretics, holy pontiff, church, and anything you please, are sacrificed to his great pride. Everything must be reduced to powder beneath his feet. We in France are on the high road to putting the sacred rights of the Holy See on the same footing as the privileges granted to Calvinists. All ecclesiastical authority is annihilated. Nobody knows anything of canons, popes, councils. Everything is swallowed up in the authority of one man. Quote, the king willeth it. End quote. France had no other law any longer, and William III saved Europe from the same enslavement. The Palatinate was in flames. Louvois was urging on the generals and armies everywhere, sending dispatch after dispatch, orders upon orders. Quote, I'm a thousand times more impatient to finish this business than you can be, end quote, was the spirited reply he received from M. de la Hoguette, who commanded in Italy in the environs of Cuneo. Besides the reasons of duty which I have always before my eyes, I beg you to believe that the last letters I received from you were quite strong enough to prevent negligence of anything that must be done to prevent similar ones, and to deserve a little more confidence, but the most willing man can do nothing against roads encumbered with ice and snow. End quote. Louvois did not admit this excuse. He wanted soldiers to be able to cross the defiles of mountains in the depths of winter, just as he would have orange trees travel in the month of February. Quote, I received orders to send off to Versailles from La Mairet the orange trees which the Duke of Mazarin gave the king, writes Superintendent Foucault in his journal. M. Louvois, in spite of the representations I made him, would have them sent by carriage through the snow and ice. They arrived leafless at Versailles, and several are dead. I had sent him word that the king could take towns in winter, but could not make orange trees bear removal from their hothouses. End quote. The nature and the consciences of the Protestants were all that withstood Louis the Fourteenth and Louvois. On the 16th of July, 1691, death suddenly removed the minister, fallen in royal favor, detested and dreaded in France, universally hated in Europe, leaving, however, the king, France, and Europe with the feeling that a great power had fallen, a great deal of merit disappeared. Quote, I doubt not, wrote Louis the Fourteenth to Marshal Boufflet, that as you are very zealous for my service, you will be sorry for the death of a man who served me well. Quote, Louvois, said the Marquis of Lafarge, should never have been born, or should have lived longer. End quote. 
the public feeling was expressed in an anonymous epitaph, quote, Here lieth he who to his will bent every one, knew everything Louvois, beloved by no one, still leaves everybody sorrowing. End, quote. End of section 58. Section 59 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 46. Louis the Fourteenth and Home Administration, Part 4. The king felt his loss, but did not regret the minister whose tyranny and violence were beginning to be oppressive to him. He felt himself to be more than ever master in the presence of the young or inexperienced men to whom he henceforth entrusted his affairs. Louvois's son, Barbezieux, had the reversion of the war department. Pontchartrain, who had been controller of finance ever since the retirement of Le Pelletier, had been appointed to the navy in 1690, at the death of Seignelay. Quote, Monsieur de Pontchartrain had begged the king not to give him the navy, says Danjou ingenuously, because he knew nothing at all about it, but the king's will was absolute that he should take it. He now has all that Monsieur de Colbert had, except the buildments. What mattered the inexperience of ministers? The king thought that he alone sufficed for all. God had left it to time to undeceive the all-powerful monarch. He alone held out amidst the ruins. After the fathers, the sons were falling around him. Seignelay had followed Colbert to the tomb. Louvois was dead after Michael Le Tellier. Barbezieux died in his turn in 1701. Quote, this secretary of state had naturally good wits, lively and ready conception, and great mastery of details in which his father had trained him early, writes the Marquis of Argenson. He had been spoiled in youth by everybody but his father. He was obliged to put himself at the mercy of his officials, but he always kept up his position over them, for the son of Monsieur de Louvois, their creator, so to speak, could not fail to inspire them with respect, veneration, and even attachment. Louis the Fourteenth, who knew the defects of Monsieur de Barbezieux, complained to him and sometimes rated him in private, but he left him his place, because he felt the importance of preserving in the administration of war the spirit and the principles of Louvois. Quote, Take him for all in all, says Saint-Simon, he had the making of a great minister in him, but wonderfully dangerous, the best and most useful friend in the world so long as he was one, and the most terrible, the most inveterate, the most implacable and naturally ferocious enemy. He was a man who would not brook opposition in anything, and whose audacity was extreme. A worthy son of Louvois, as devoted to pleasure as he was zealous in business, he was carried off in five days at the age of thirty-three. The king, who had just put Chamillard into the place of Pontchartrain, made chancellor at the death of Boucherat, gave him the war department in succession to Barbezieux, quote, thus loading such weak shoulders with two burdens of which either was sufficient to break down the strongest. End quote. Louis the Fourteenth had been faithfully and mightily served by Colbert and Louvois. He had felt confidence in them, though he had never had any liking for them personally. Their striking merits, the independence of their character, which peeped out in spite of affected expressions of submission and deference, the spirited opposition of the one and the passionate outbursts of the other, often hurt the master's pride and always made him uncomfortable. Colbert had preceded him in the government, and Louvois, whom he believed himself to have trained, had surpassed him in knowledge of affairs as well as aptitude for work. Chamillard was the first, the only one of his ministers whom the king had ever loved. Quote, his capacity was nil, says Saint-Simon, who had very friendly feelings towards Chamillard, and he believed that he knew everything and of every sort. This was the more pitiable in that it had got into his head with his promotions, and was less presumption than stupidity, and still less vanity of which he had none. The joke is that the mainspring of the king's great affection for him was this very incapacity. He confessed it to the king at every step, and the king was delighted to direct and instruct him, in such sort that he grew jealous for his success, as if it were his own, and made every excuse for him." The king loved Chamillard, the court bore with him because he was easy and good-natured, but the affairs of the state were imperiled in his hands. Pontchartrain had already had recourse to the most objectionable proceedings in order to obtain money. The mental resources of Colbert himself had failed in presence of financial embarrassments and increasing estimates. It is said that during the war with Holland, Louvois induced the king to contract a loan. The premier president, Lamoignon, supported the measure, quote, you are triumphant, said Colbert, who had vigorously opposed it. You think you have done the deed of a good man. What? Did not I know as well as you that the king could get money by borrowing? But I was careful not to say so, and so the borrowing road is opened. What means will remain henceforth of checking the king in his expenditure? After the loans, taxes will be wanted to pay them, and if the loans have no limit, the taxes will have none either. At the king's death, the loans amounted to more than two milliards and a half. 
The deficit was getting worse and worse every day. There was no more money to be had, and the income from property went on diminishing. Quote, I have only some dirty acres which are turning to stones instead of being bread, wrote Madame de Sévigny. Trade was languishing. The manufactures founded by Colbert were dropping away one after another. The revocation of the Edict of Nantes and the emigration of Protestants had drained France of the most industrious and most skilful workmen. Many of the reformers had carried away a great deal of capital. The roads everywhere neglected were becoming impracticable. Quote, the tradesmen are obliged to put four horses instead of two to their wagons, said a letter to Barbezieux from the superintendent of Flanders, which has completely ruined the traffic. End quote. The administration of the provinces was no longer under supervision. Quote, Formerly, says Villard, the inspectors would pass whole winters on the frontiers. Now they are good for nothing but to take the height and measure of the men and send a fine list to the court. End quote. The soldiers were without victuals. The officers were not paid. The abuses but lately put down by the strong hand of Colbert and Louvois were cropping up again in all directions. The king at last determined to listen to the general cry and dismiss Chamillard. Quote, the dukes of Beauvilliers and Chevreuse were entrusted with this unpleasant commission, as well as with the king's assurance of his affection and esteem for Chamillard, and with the announcement of the marks thereof he intended to bestow upon him. They entered Chamillard's presence with such an air of consternation as may be easily imagined, they having always been very good friends of his. By their manner the unhappy minister saw at once that there was something extraordinary, and without giving them time to speak, "'What is the matter, gentlemen?' he said with a calm and serene countenance. If what you have to say concerns me only, you can speak out. I have been prepared a long while for anything. They could scarcely tell what brought them. Chamillard heard them without changing a muscle, and with the same air and tone with which he had put his first question, he answered, The king is master. I have done my best to serve him. I hope another may do it more to his satisfaction and more successfully. It is much to be able to count upon his kindness and to receive so many marks of it. Then he asked whether he might write to him and whether they would do him the favor of taking charge of his letter. He wrote the king, with the same coolness, a page and a half of thanks and regards, which he read out to them at once, just as he had at once written it in their presence. He handed it to the two dukes, together with the memorandum which the king had asked him for in the morning, and which he had just finished, sent word orally to his wife to come after him to l'étang, whither he was going, without telling her why, sorted out his papers, and gave up his keys to be handed to his successor. All this was done without the slightest excitement, without a sigh, a regret, a reproach, a complaint escaping him. He went down his staircase, got into his carriage, and started off to l'étang, alone with his son, just as if nothing had happened to him, without anybody's knowing anything about it at Versailles until long afterwards. End quote. Memoir de Saint-Simon, page 233. Desmarais in the finance and Voisin in the war department, both superintendents of finance, the former a nephew of Colbert's and initiated into business by his uncle, both of them capable and assiduous, succumbed, like their predecessors, beneath the weight of the burdens which were overwhelming and ruining France. Quote, I know the state of my finances, Louis the Fourteenth had said to Desmarais. I do not ask you to do impossibilities. If you succeed, you will render me a great service. If you are not successful, I shall not hold you to blame for circumstances. End quote. Desmarais succeeded better than could have been expected without being able to rehabilitate the finances of the state. Pontchartrain had exhausted the resource of creating new offices. Quote, Every time your majesty creates a new post, a fool is found to buy it, he had said to the king. Desmarais had recourse to the bankers, and the king seconded him by the gracious favor with which he received at Versailles the greatest of the collectors, or traitants, Samuel Barnard. Quote, by this means everything was provided for up to the time of the general peace, says M. d'Argenson. France kept up the contest to the end. When the Treaty of Utrecht was signed, the fleet was ruined and destroyed, the trade diminished by two-thirds, the colonies lost or devastated by the war, the destitution in the country so frightful that orders had to be given to sow seeds in the fields, the exportation of grain was forbidden on pain of death. Meanwhile the peasantry were reduced to browse upon the grass in the roads and to tear the bark off the trees and eat it. Thirty years had rolled by since the death of Colbert, twenty-two since that of Louvois. Everything was going to perdition simultaneously. Reverses in war and distress at home were uniting to overwhelm the aged king, alone upstanding amidst so many dead and so much ruin. Quote, Fifty years sway and glory had inspired Louis the Fourteenth with the presumptuous belief that he could not only choose his ministers well, but also instruct them and teach them their craft, says M. d'Argenson. 
His mistake was to think that the title of king supplied all the endowments of nature or experience. He was no financier, no soldier, no administrator, yet he would everywhere and always remain supreme master. He had believed that it was he who governed with Colbert and Louvois. Those two great ministers had scarcely been equal to the task imposed upon them by war and peace, by armies, buildments, and royal extravagance. Their successors gave way thereunder, and illusions vanished. The king's hand was powerless to sustain the weight of affairs becoming more and more disastrous. The gloom that pervaded the later years of Louis the Fourteenth reign veiled from his people's eyes the splendor of that reign which had so long been brilliant and prosperous, though always lying heavy on the nation, even when they forgot their sufferings in the intoxication of glory and success. It is the misfortune of men, even of the greatest, to fall short of their destiny. Louis the Fourteenth had wanted to exceed his, and to bear a burden too heavy for human shoulders arbiter for a while of the affairs of all europe ever absolute master in his own dominions he bent at last beneath the load that was borne without flinching by princes less powerful less fortunate less adored but sustained by the strong institutions of free countries william the third had not to serve him a conde a turenne a colbert a louvois he had governed from afar his own country and he had always remained a foreigner in the kingdom which had called him to the throne but despite the dislikes the bitternesses the fierce contests of parties he had strengthened the foundations of parliamentary government in england and maintained freedom in holland whilst the ancient monarchy of france which reached under louis the fourteenth the pinnacle of glory and power was slowly but surely going down to perdition beneath the internal and secret malady of absolute power without limit and without restraint end of section fifty nine end of chapter forty six Section 60 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 47. Louis the Fourteenth and Religion, Part 1. Independently of simple submission to the Catholic Church, there were three great tendencies which divided serious minds amongst them during the reign of Louis the Fourteenth. Three noble passions held possession of pious souls. Liberty, faith, and love were, respectively, the groundwork as well as the banner of Protestantism, Jansenism, and Quietism. It is in the name of the fundamental and innate liberty of the soul, its personal responsibility, and its direct relations with God, that the Reformation had sprung up and reached growth in France, even more than in Germany and in England. M. de saint Cyran, the head and founder of Jansenism, abandoned the human soul unreservedly to the supreme will of God. His faith soared triumphant over flesh and blood, and his disciples, disdaining the joys and the ties of earth, lived only for eternity. Madame Guillaume and Fenelon, less ardent and less austere, discovered in the tender mysticism of pure love that secret of God's which is sought by all pious souls. In the name of divine love, the quietists renounced all will of their own just as the Jansenists in the name of faith. Jansenism is dead after having for a long while brooded in the depths of the most noble souls. Quietism, as a sect, did not survive its illustrious founders. Faith and love have withstood the excess of zeal and the erroneous tendencies which had separated them from the aggregate of Christian virtues and doctrines. They have come back again into the pious treasury of the universal church. Neither time nor persecutions have been able to destroy in France the strong and independent groundwork of Protestantism. Faithful to its fundamental principle, it has triumphed over exile, the scaffold, and indifference, without other head than God himself and God alone. Richelieu had slain the political hydra of Huguenot in France. From that time the reformers had lived in modest retirement. Quote, I have no complaint to make of the little flock, Mazarin would say. If they eat bad grass, at any rate they do not stray. End quote. During the troubles of the Fronde, the Protestants had resumed, in the popular vocabulary, their old nickname of Tant sans faux, or Far From It, which had been given them at the time of the League. Quote, Faithful to the king in those hard times when most Frenchmen were wavering and continually looking to see which way the wind would blow, the Huguenots had been called Tant sans faux, as being removed from and beyond all suspicion of the League or of conspiracy against the State. And so were they rightly designated, inasmuch as to the cry, Qui vive? or whom are you for, instead of answering vive Guise, or vive la Ligue, they would answer tant s'en faut, vive le roi. So that when one leaguer would ask another, pointing to a Huguenot, is that one of ours? Tant s'en faut would be the reply, it is one of the new religion. End quote. 
Condé had represented to Cromwell all the reformers of France as ready to rise up in his favour. The agent sent by the protector assured him it was quite the contrary, and the bearing of the Protestants decided Cromwell to refuse all assistance to the princes. La Rochelle packed off its governor, who was favourable to the Fronde. Saint-Jean d'Angely equipped soldiers for the king. Montauban, to resist the Frondeurs, repaired the fortifications thrown down by Richelieu. Quote, the crown was tottering upon the king's head, said Count d'Arcourt to the pastors of Guienne, but you have made it secure. End quote. The royal declaration of 1652, confirming and ratifying the Edict of Nantes, was a recompense for the services and fidelity of the Huguenots. They did not enjoy it long, an Edict of 1656 annulled at the same time explaining the favorable declaration of 1652. In 1660, the last national synod was held at Loudun. Quote, His Majesty has resolved, said M. de la Magdeleine, deputed from the King to the synod, that there shall be no more such assemblies but when he considers it expedient. End quote. Fifteen years had rolled by since the synod of Charenton in 1645. Quote, we are only too firmly persuaded of the usefulness of our synods, and how entirely necessary they are for our churches, after having been so long without them. Sorrowfully exclaimed the moderator, Peter Dye. For two hundred and twelve years the Reformed Church of France was deprived of its synods. God at last restored to it this cornerstone of its interior constitution. The suppression of the edict chambers instituted by Henry the Fourth in all the parliaments, for the purpose of taking cognizance of the affairs of the Reformers, followed close upon the abolition of national synods. Peter Dubusc, pastor of the Church of Caen, an accomplished gentleman and celebrated preacher, was commissioned to set before the king the representations of the Protestants. Louis the Fourteenth listened to him kindly. Quote, that is the finest speaker in my kingdom, he said to his courtiers after the minister's address. The edict chambers were nevertheless suppressed in 1669. The half and half, or mi parti chambers, composed of reformed and Catholic councillors, underwent the same fate in 1679 and the Protestants found themselves delivered over to the intolerance and religious prejudices of the Parliaments, which were almost everywhere harsher as regarded them than the governors and superintendents of provinces. Quote, it seemed to me, my son, wrote Louis the Fourteenth in his memoir of the year 1661, that those who were for employing violent remedies against the religion styled reformed did not understand the nature of this malady, caused partly by heated feelings, which should be passed over unnoticed, and allowed to die out insensibly, instead of being inflamed afresh by equally strong contradiction, which, moreover, is always useless when the taint is not confined to a certain known number, but spread throughout the state. I thought, therefore, that the best way of reducing the Huguenots of my kingdom little by little was, in the first place, not to put any pressure upon them by any fresh rigor against them, to see to the observance of all that they had obtained from my predecessors, but to grant them nothing further, and even to confine the performance thereof, within the narrowest limits that justice and propriety would permit. But as to graces that depended upon me alone, I have resolved, and have pretty regularly kept my resolution ever since, not to do them any, and that from kindness, not from bitterness, in order to force them in that way to reflect from time to time of themselves, and without violence, whether it were for any good reason that they deprived themselves voluntarily of advantages which might be shared by them in common with all my other subjects. End quote. These prudent measures, quote, quite in kindness and not in bitterness, end quote, were not enough to satisfy the fresh zeal with which the king had been inspired. All powerful in his own kingdom, and triumphant everywhere in Europe, he was quite shocked at the silent obstinacy of those Huguenots who held his favor and graces cheap in comparison with a quiet conscience. His kingly pride and his ignorant piety both equally urged him on to that enterprise which was demanded by the zeal of a portion of the clergy. The system of purchasing conversions had been commenced, and Pelisson, himself originally a Protestant, had charge of the payments, a source of fraud and hypocrisies of every sort. A declaration of 1679 condemned the relapse to honorable amends, or public recantation, etc., to confiscation and to banishment. The doors of all employments were closed against Huguenots. They could no longer sit in the courts or parliaments, or administer the finances, or become medical practitioners, barristers, or notaries. Infants of seven years of age were empowered to change their religion against their parents' will. A word, a gesture, a look, were sufficient to certify that a child intended to abjure. Its parents, however, were bound to bring it up according to its condition, which often facilitated confiscation of property. Pastors were forbidden to enter the houses of their flocks, save to perform some act of their ministry. Every chapel into which a new convert had been admitted was to be pulled down, and the pastor was to be banished. 
it was found necessary to set a guard at the doors of the places of worship to drive away the poor wretches who repented of a moment's weakness. The number of quote-unquote places of exercise, as the phrase then was, received a gradual reduction. Quote, a single minister had the charge of six, eight, and ten thousand persons, says Elias Benoit, author of the Histoire de l'Édit de Nantes, quote, making it impossible for him to visit and assist the families, scattered sometimes over a distance of thirty leagues round his own residence. End quote. The wish was to reduce the ministers to give up altogether from despair of discharging their functions. The Chancellor had expressly said, quote, If you are reduced to the impossible, so much the worse for you. We shall gain by it. End quote. Oppression was not sufficient to break down the reformers. There was great difficulty in checking emigration, by this time increasing in numbers. Louvois proposed stronger measures. The population was crushed under the burden of military billets. Louvois wrote to Marillac, superintendent of Poitou, quote, His Majesty has learned with much joy the number of people who continue to become converts in your department. He desires you to go on paying attention thereto. He will think it a good idea to have most of the cavalry and officers quartered upon Protestants. If, according to the regular proportion, the religionists should receive ten, you can make them take twenty. End quote. The dragoons took up their quarters in peaceable families, ruining the more well to do, maltreating old men, women, and children, striking them with their sticks or the flat of their swords, hauling off Protestants in the churches by the hair of their heads, harnessing laborers to their own ploughs, and goading them like oxen. Conversions became numerous in Poitou. Those who could fly left France at the risk of being hanged if the attempt happened to fail. Quote, Pray lay out advantageously the money you are going to have, wrote Madame de Maintenon to her brother, M. d'Aubigny. Land in Poitou is to be had for nothing, and the desolation amongst the Protestants will cause more sales still. You may easily settle in grand style in that province. Quote, we are treated like enemies of the Christian denomination, wrote in 1662 a minister named Jurieu, already a refugee in Holland. Quote, we are forbidden to go near the children that come into the world. We are banished from the bars and the faculties. We are forbidden the use of all the means which might save us from hunger. We are abandoned to the hatred of the mob. We are deprived of that precious liberty which we purchased with so many services. We are robbed of our children who are a part of ourselves. Are we Turks? Are we infidels? We believe in Jesus Christ. We do. We believe him to be the eternal Son of God, the Redeemer of the world. The maxims of our morality are of so great purity that none dare gainsay them. We respect the king. We are good subjects, good citizens. We are Frenchmen as much as we are reformed Christians. Jurieu had a right to speak of the respect for the king which animated the French reformers. There was no trace left of that political leaven which formerly animated the old Huguenots, and made Duke Henry de Rouen say, quote, You are all Republicans. I would rather have to do with a pack of wolves than an assembly of parsons. Quote, the king is hoodwinked, the Protestants declared, and all their efforts were to get at him and tell his majesty of their sufferings. The army remained open to them, though without hope of promotion, and the gentlemen showed alacrity in serving the king. Quote, what a position is ours, they would say. If we make any resistance, we are treated as rebels. If we are obedient, they pretend we are converted, and they hoodwink the king by means of our very submission. End quote. The misfortunes were redoubling. From Poitou the persecution had extended through all the provinces. Superintendent Foucault obtained the conversion in mass of the province of Bern. He egged on the soldiers to torture the inhabitants of the houses they were quartered in, commanding them to keep awake all those who would not give in to other tortures. The dragoons relieved one another so as not to succumb themselves to the punishment they were making others undergo. Beating of drums, blasphemies, shouts, the crash of furniture which they hurled from side to side, commotion in which they kept these poor people in order to force them to be on their feet and hold their eyes open— were the means they employed to deprive them of rest. To pinch, prick, and haul them about, to lay them upon burning coals, and a hundred other cruelties, were the sport of these butchers. All they thought most about was how to find tortures which should be painful without being deadly, reducing their hosts thereby to such a state that they knew not what they were doing, and promised anything that was wanted of them in order to escape from those barbarous bands. Languedoc, Guienne, Angoumois, Saint-Onge, all the provinces in which the reformers were numerous, underwent the same fate. The self-restraining character of the Norman people, their respect for law, were manifested even amidst persecution. The children were torn away from Protestant families, and the chapels were demolished by act of Parliament. The soldiery were less violent than elsewhere, but the magistrates were more inveterate. Quote, God has not judged us unworthy to suffer ignominy for his name, said the ministers condemned by the Parliament for having performed the offices of their ministry. Quote, 
the king has taken no cognizance of the case, exclaimed one of the accused, Le Gendre, pastor of Rouen. He has relied upon the judges. It is not his majesty who shall give account before God. You shall be responsible, and you alone. You, who, convinced as you are of our innocence, have nevertheless condemned us and branded us. Quote, the Parliament of Normandy has just broken the ties which held us bound to our churches, said Peter de Busque. The banished ministers took the road to Holland. The seaboard provinces were beginning to be dispeopled. A momentary disturbance, which led to belief in a rising of the reformers of the Cévennes and the Vivarais, served as pretext for redoubled rigor. Dauphiny and Languedoc were given up to the soldiery. Murder was no longer forbidden them. It was merely punishing rebels. Several pastors were sentenced to death. Hommel, minister of Soyons in the Vivarais, seventy-five years of age, was broken alive on the wheel. Abjurations multiplied through terror. Quote, there had been sixty thousand conversions in the jurisdiction of Bordeaux, and twenty thousand in that of Montauban, wrote Louvois to his father in the first part of September, 1685. The rapidity with which this goes on is such that before the end of the month there will not remain ten thousand religionists in the district of Bordeaux, in which there were a hundred and fifty thousand on the fifteenth of last month. Quote, the towns of Nîmes, Alais, Uze, Villeneuve, and some others are entirely converted, writes the Duke of Noailles to Louvois in the month of October, 1685. Those of most note in Nîmes made abjuration in church the day after our arrival. There was then a lukewarmness, but matters were put in good train again by means of some billets that I had put into the houses of the most obstinate. I am making arrangements for going and scouring the Uven with the seven companies of Barbezieux, and my head shall answer for it that before the 25th of November not a Huguenot shall be left there. End, quote. End of section 60《セクション61 of a Popular History of France, Volume 5》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5 》by François Guizot Translated by Robert Black《Chapter 47 》Louis XIV and Religion, Part 2 And a few days later, at Alais, quote, I no longer know what to do with the troops, for the places in which I had meant to post them get converted all in a body and this goes on so quickly that all the men can do is to sleep for a night at the localities to which I send them. It is certain that you may add very nearly a third to the estimate given you of the people of the religion, amounting to the number of a hundred and eighty-two thousand men, and when I asked you to give me until the twenty-fifth of next month for their complete conversion, I took too long a term, for I believe that by the end of the month all will be settled. I will not, however, omit to tell you that all we have done in these conversions will be nothing but useless if the king do not oblige the bishops to send good priests to instruct the people who want to hear the gospel preached. But I fear that the king will be worse obeyed in that respect by the priests than by the religionists. I do not tell you this without grounds. Quote, there is not a courier who does not bring the king great causes for joy, writes Madame de Maintenon, that is to say, conversions by thousands. I can quite believe that all these conversions are not sincere, but God makes use of all ways of bringing back heretics. Their children, at any rate, will be Catholics. Their outward reunion places them within reach of the truth. Pray God to enlighten them all. There is nothing the king has more at heart. End quote. In the month of August, 1684, she said, quote, The king has a design of laboring for the entire conversion of the heretics. He often has conferences about it with Monsieur Le Tellier and Monsieur de Chateauneuf, whereat I was given to understand that I should not be one too many. M. de Chateauneuf proposed measures which are not expedient. There must be no precipitation. It must be conversion, not persecution. M. de Louvois was for gentleness, which is not in accordance with his nature, and his eagerness to see matters ended. The king is ready to do what is thought most likely to conduce to the good of religion. Such an achievement will cover him with glory before God and before men. He will have brought back all his subjects into the bosom of the church, and will have destroyed the heresy which his predecessors could not vanquish. End quote. The king's glory was about to be complete. The gentleness of Louvois had prevailed. He had found himself obliged to moderate the zeal of his superintendents. Quote, Nothing remained but to weed out the religionists of the small towns and villages. End quote. By stretching a point, the process had been carried into the Principality of Orange, which still belonged to the House of Nassau, on the pretext that the people of that district had received in their chapels the king's subjects. The Count of Tessé, who had charge of the expedition, wrote to Louvois, quote, Not only on one and the same day did the whole town of Orange become converted, 
but the State took the same resolution, and the members of the Parliament, who were minded to distinguish themselves by a little more stubbornness, adopted the same course twenty-four hours afterwards. All this was done gently, without violence or disorder. There is only a parson named Chambrun, patriarch of the district, who persists in refusing to listen to reason. For the President, who did aspire to the honour of martyrdom, would, as well as the rest of the Parliament, have turned Mohammedan if I had desired it. You would not believe how infatuated all these people were, and are still, about the Prince of Orange, his authority, Holland, England, and the Protestants of Germany. I should never end if I were to recount all the foolish and impertinent proposals they have made to me." M. de Tessé did not tell Louvois that he was obliged to have the pastors of Orange seized and carried off. They were kept twelve years in prison at pierre Arcis. None but M. de Chambrun, who had been taken to Valence, managed to escape and take refuge in Holland, bemoaning to the end of his days a moment's weakness. Quote, I was quite exhausted by torture, and I let fall this unhappy expression, Very well, then, I will be reconciled. This sin has brought me down, as it were, into hell itself, and I have looked upon myself as a dastardly soldier who turned his back on the day of battle, and as an unfaithful servant who betrayed the interests of his master. End quote. The king assembled his council. The lists of converts were so long that there could scarcely remain in the kingdom more than a few thousand recalcitrants. Quote, his majesty proposed to take an ultimate resolution as regarded the Edict of Nantes, writes the Duke of Burgundy in a memorandum found amongst his papers. Quote, Monseigneur represented that, according to an anonymous letter he had received the day before, the Huguenots had some expectation of what was coming upon them, that there was perhaps some reason to fear that they would take up arms, relying upon the protection of the princes of their religion, and that supposing they dared not do so, a great number would leave the kingdom which would be injurious to commerce and agriculture, and for that same reason would weaken the state. The king replied that he had foreseen all for some time past, and had provided for all that nothing in the world would be more painful to him than to shed a single drop of the blood of his subjects, but that he had armies and good generals whom he would employ in case of need against rebels who courted their own destruction. As for calculations of interest, he thought them worthy of but little consideration in comparison with the advantages of a measure which would restore to religion its splendor, to the state its tranquillity, and to authority all its rights. A resolution was carried unanimously for the suppression of the Edict of Nantes." End quote. The declaration, drawn up by Chancellor Le Tellier and Chateauneuf, was signed by the King on the 15th of October, 1685. It was dispatched on the 17th to all the superintendents. The Edict of Pacification, that great work of the liberal and prudent genius of Henry IV, respected and confirmed in its most important particulars by Cardinal Richelieu, recognized over and over again by Louis XIV himself, disappeared at a single stroke, carrying with it all hope of liberty, repose, and justice for fifteen hundred thousand subjects of the king. Quote, Our pains, said the preamble of the edict, have had the end we had proposed, seeing that the better and the greater part of our subjects of the religion styled reformed have embraced the Catholic. The execution of the edict of Nantes consequently remaining useless, we have considered that we could not do better for the purpose of effacing entirely the memory of the evils which this false religion has caused in our kingdom then revoke entirely the aforesaid Edict of Nantes, and all that has been done in favour of the said religion. End quote. The Edict of October 15, 1685, supposed the religion styled reformed to be already destroyed and abolished. It ordered the demolition of all the chapels that remained standing, and interdicted any assembly or worship. Recalcitrant or opiniatres ministers were ordered to leave the kingdom within fifteen days. The schools were closed, all newborn babies were to be baptized by the parish priests. Religionists were forbidden to leave the kingdom on pain of the galleys for the men and confiscation of person and property for the women. Quote, the will of the king, said Superintendent Mariac at Rouen, is that there be no more than one religion in this kingdom. It is for the glory of God and the well-being of the state. End quote. Two hours were allowed the reformers of Rouen for making their abjuration. One clause at the end of the Edict of October 15 seemed to extenuate its effect. Quote, those of our subjects of the religion styled reformed, who shall persist in their errors, pending the time when it may please God to enlighten them like the rest, shall be allowed to remain in the kingdom, country, and lands which obey the king, there to continue their trade and enjoy their property, without being liable to be vexed or hindered on pretext of prayer or worship of the said religion of whatever nature they may be. Quote, Never was their illusion more cruel than that which this clause caused people, says Benoit in his Histoire de l'Édit de Nantes. Quote, 
It was believed that the king meant only to forbid special exercises, but that he intended to leave conscience free, since he granted this grace to all those who were still reformers, pending the time when it should please God to enlighten them. Many gave up the measures they had taken for leaving the country with their families. Many voluntarily returned from the retreats where they had hitherto been fortunate enough to lie hid. The most mistrustful dared not suppose that so solemn a promise was only made to be broken on the morrow. They were all nevertheless mistaken, and those who were imprudent enough to return to their homes were only just in time to receive the dragoons there. A letter from Louvois to the Duke of Noailles put a stop to all illusion. Quote, I have no doubt, he wrote, that some rather heavy billets upon the few amongst the nobility and third estate still remaining of the religionists will undeceive them as to the mistake they are under about the edict M. de Chateauneuf drew up for us. His Majesty desires that you should explain yourself very sternly, and that extreme severity should be employed against those who are not willing to become of his religion. Those who have the silly vanity to glory in holding out to the last must be driven to extremity. The pride of Louis the Fourteenth was engaged in the struggle. Those of his subjects who refused to sacrifice their religion to him were disobedient, rebellious, and besotted with silly vanity. Quote, it will be quite ridiculous before long to be of that religion, wrote Madame de Maintenon. Even in his court and amongst his most useful servants, the king encountered unexpected opposition. Marshal Schomberg, with great difficulty, obtained authority to leave the kingdom. Duquesne was refused. The illustrious old man, whom the Algerian corsairs called, quote, the old French captain, whose bride is the sea, and whom the angel of death has forgotten, end quote, received permission to reside in France without being troubled about his religion. Quote, For sixty years I have rendered to Caesar that which was Caesar's said the sailor proudly, it is time to render unto God that which is God's. End quote. And when the king regretted that his religion prevented him from properly recognizing his glorious career, quote, Sir, said Duquesne, I am a Protestant, but I always thought that my services were Catholic. End quote. Duquesne's children went abroad. When he died, 1688, his body was refused to them. His sons raised a monument to him at Aubonne, in the canton of Bern, with this inscription, quote, This tomb awaits the remains of Duquesne. Passer, should you ask why the Hollanders have raised a superb monument to Reuter vanquished, and why the French have refused a tomb to Reuter's vanquisher, the fear and respect inspired by a monarch whose power extends afar do not allow me to answer. End quote. Of the rest, only the Marquis of Ruvigny and the Princess of Tarento, daughter-in-law of the Duke of La Tremaille and issue of the House of Hesse, obtained authority to leave France. All ports were closed, all frontiers watched. The great lords gave way one after another. Accustomed to enjoy royal favors, attaching to them excessive value, living at court close to Paris, which was spared a great deal during the persecution, they, without much effort, renounced a face which closed to them henceforth the door to all offices and all honors. The gentlemen of the provinces were more resolute. Many realized as much as they could of their property, and went abroad, braving all dangers, even that of the galleys in case of arrest. The Duke of La Force had abjured, then repented of his abjuration, only to relapse again. One of his cousins, seventy-five years of age, was taken to the galleys. He had for his companion Louis de Marolle, late king's counsellor. I live just now all alone, wrote the latter to his wife. My meals are brought from outside. If you saw me in my beautiful convict dress, you would be charmed. The iron I wear on my leg, though it weighs only three pounds, inconvenienced me at first far more than that which you saw me in at La Tournelle. End quote. Files of Protestant galley convicts were halted in the towns, in the hope of inspiring the obstinate with a salutary terror. The error which had been fallen into, however, was perceived at court. The stand made by Protestants astounded the superintendents as well as Louvois himself. Everywhere, men said, as they said at Dieppe, quote, We will not change our religion for anybody. The king has power over our persons and our property, but he has no power over our consciences, end quote. There was fleeing in all directions. The governors grew weary of watching the coasts and the frontiers. Quote, the way to make only a few go, said Louvois, is to leave them liberty to do so without letting them know it. End quote. Any way was good enough to escape from such oppression. Quote, Two days ago, wrote M. de Tessé, who commanded at Grenoble, a woman, to get safe away, hit upon an invention which deserves to be known. She made a bargain with a Savoyard, an ironmonger, and had herself packed up in a load of iron rods, the ends of which showed... It was carried to the custom-house, and the tradesman paid on the weight of the iron, which was weighed together with the woman, who was not unpacked until she was six leagues from the frontier. 
Quote, for a long time, says M. Floquet, there was talk in Normandy of the Count of Marance, who in the middle of a severe winter, flying with thirty-nine others on board a fishing smack, encountered a tempest, and remained a long time at sea without provisions, dying of hunger, he, the Countess, and all the passengers, amongst whom were pregnant women, mothers with infants at the breast, without resources of any sort, reduced for lack of everything to a little melted snow, with which they moistened the parched lips of the dying babies. End quote it were impossible to estimate precisely the number of emigrations. It was probably between three and four hundred thousand. Quote, to speak only of our own province, writes M. Floquet in his Histoire du Parlement de Normandie, about one hundred and eighty-four thousand religionists went away. More than twenty-six thousand habitations were deserted. In Rouen there were counted no more than sixty thousand men, instead of the eighty thousand that were to be seen there a few years before. Almost all trade was stopped there as well as in the rest of Normandy. The little amount of manufacture that was possible rotted away on the spot for want of transport to foreign countries, whence vessels were no longer found to come. Rouen, Darnetal, Elbeuf, Louviers, Caudebec, Le Havre, pont aux de mer Cayenne, Saint-Lô, Alençon, and Bayeux were falling into decay, the different branches of trade and industry which had but lately been seen flourishing there having perished through the emigration of the masters whom their skilled workmen followed in shoals." End quote. The Norman emigration had been very numerous, thanks to the extent of its coasts and to the habitual communication between Normandy, England, and Holland. Vauban, however, remained very far from the truth when he deplored, in 1688, quote, the desertion of one hundred thousand men, the withdrawal from the kingdom of sixty millions of livres, the enemy's fleets swelled by nine thousand sailors, the best in the kingdom, and the enemy's armies by six hundred officers and twelve thousand soldiers who had seen service, end quote. It is a natural but a striking fact that the reformers who left France and were received with open arms in Brandenburg, Holland, England, and Switzerland carried in their hearts a profound hatred for the king who drove them away from their country, and everywhere took service against him, while the Protestants who remained in France, bound to the soil by a thousand indissoluble ties, continued at the same time to be submissive and faithful. Quote, it is right, said Chanlet, in a memoir addressed to the king, whilst we condemn the conduct of the new converts, fugitives who have borne arms against France since the commencement of this war up to the present, it is right, say I, to give those who have stayed in France the praise and credit they deserve. Indeed, if we accept a few disturbances of little consequence which have taken place in Languedoc, we have, besides the fact of their remaining faithful to the king in the provinces, and especially in Dauphiny, even whilst the confederated armies of the Emperor of Spain and of the Duke of Savoy were in the heart of that province in greater strength than the forces of the king, to note that those who were fit to bear arms have enlisted amongst the troops of His Majesty and done good service. In 1745, after sixty years' persecution, consequent upon the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, Matthew Desubas, a young pastor accused before the superintendent of Languedoc, Lenin, said with high-spirited modesty, quote, The ministers preach nothing but patience and fidelity to the king. Quote, I am aware of it, sir, answered the superintendent. The pastors were hanged or burned, the faithful flock dragged to the galleys in the Tower of Constance. Prayers for the king, nevertheless, were sent up from the prescribed assemblies in the desert, whilst the pulpit of Surin at the Hague resounded with his anathemas against Louis the Fourteenth and the regiments of emigrant Huguenots were marching against the king's troops under the flags of England or Holland. End of section 61《section 62 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 47. Louis the Fourteenth and Religion, Part Three. The peace of Ryswick had not brought the Protestants the hoped-for alleviation of their woes. Louis the Fourteenth haughtily rejected the petition of the English and Dutch plenipotentiaries on behalf of quote, those in affliction who ought to have their share in the happiness of Europe. End quote. The persecution everywhere continued, with determination and legality in the north, with violence and passion in the south abandoned to the tyranny of M. de Lamoignon de Baville, a crafty and cold-bloodedly cruel politician, without the excuse of any zealous religious conviction. The execution of several ministers who had remained in hiding in the Cévennes, or had returned from exile to instruct and comfort their flocks, raised to the highest pitch the enthusiasm of the reformers of Languedoc. Deprived of their highly prized assemblies and of their pastor's guidance, men and women, greybeards and children, all at once fancied themselves animated by the spirit of prophecy. 
young girls had celestial visions the little peasant lasses poured out their utterances in french sometimes in the language and with the sublime eloquence of the bible sole source of their religious knowledge the rumor of these marvels ran from village to village meetings were held to hear the inspired maidens in contempt of edicts the galleys and the stake a gentleman glass-worker named abraham de la serre was as it were the samuel of this new school of prophets in vain did m de baville have three hundred children imprisoned at uz and then send them to the galleys the religious contagion was too strong for the punishments Quote, women found themselves in a single day husbandless childless houseless and penniless says cour they remained immovable in their pious ecstasy the assemblies multiplied the troops which had so long occupied languedoc had been summoned away by the war of succession in spain the militia could no longer restrain the reformers growing every day more enthusiastic through the prophetic hopes which were born of their long sufferings the archpriest of the Cévennes, abbe du chayla a tyrannical and cruel man had undertaken a mission at the head of the capuchins his house was crammed with condemned protestants the breath of revolt passed over the mountains on the night of july twenty seventh seventeen o two the castle of the archpriest was surrounded by huguenot in arms who demanded the surrender of the prisoners du chayla refused the gates were forced the condemned released the priests who happened to be in the house killed or dispersed the archpriest had let himself down by a window he broke his thigh he was found hiding in a bush the castle was in flames quote, no mercy no mercy shouted the madman the spirit willeth that he die end quote. every one of the huguenots stabbed the poor wretch with their poniards quote, that's for my father broken on the wheel that's for my brother sent to the galleys that's for my mother who died of grief that's for my relations in exile end quote. he received fifty-two wounds next day the Cévennes were everywhere in revolt a prophet named seguier was at the head of the insurrection he was soon made prisoner quote, how dost thou expect me to treat thee asked his judge quote, as i would have treated thee had i caught thee answered the prophet he was burned alive in the public square of pont de montvert a mountain burg quote, where do you live he had been asked at his examination quote, in the desert he replied and soon in heaven end quote he exhorted the people from the midst of the flames the insurrection went on spreading quote, say not what can we do we are so few we have no arms said another prophet named la porte quote, the lord of hosts is our strength we will intone the battle psalms and from the lozere to the sea israel shall rise and as for arms have we not our axes they will beget muskets End quote. the plain rose like the mountain baron saint com an early convert and colonel of the militia was assassinated near vauvert murders multiplied the priests were especially the object of the revolters vengeance they assembled under the name of children of god and marched under the command of two chiefs one named roland who formerly served under catina and the other a young man wiles a baker and wiles a shepherd who was born in the neighborhood of anduze and whose name has remained famous john cavalier was barely eighteen when m de baville launched his brother-in-law the count of broly with a few troops upon the revolted Cévenol the catholic peasants called them camisards the origin of which name has never been clearly ascertained m de broglie was beaten the insurrection which was entirely confined to the populace disappeared all at once in the woods and rocks of the country to burst once more unexpectedly upon the troops of the king the great name of lamoignon shielded baville chamillard had for a long while concealed from louis the fourteenth the rising in the Cévennes. he never did know all its gravity Quote, it is useless said madame de maintenon for the king to trouble himself with all the circumstances of this war it would not cure the mischief and would do him much Quote, take care wrote chamillard to baville on superseding the count of broglie by marshal montrevel not to give this business the appearance of a serious war End quote. the rumor of the insurrection in languedoc however began to spread in europe conflagrations murders executions in cold blood or in the heat of passion crimes on the part of the insurgents as well as cruelties on the part of judges and generals succeeded one another uninterruptedly without the military authorities being able to crush a revolt that it was impossible to put down by terror or punishments Quote, i take it for a fact said a letter to chamillard from m de julien an able captain of irregulars lately sent into languedoc to aid the count of broglie that there are not in this district forty who are real converts and are not entirely on the side of the camisards i include in that number females as well as males and the mothers and daughters would give the more striking proofs of their fury if they had the strength of the men i will say but one word more which is that the children who were in their cradles at the time of the general conversions as well as those who were four or five years old are now more huguenot than the fathers nobody however has set eyes upon any minister 
How then comes it that they are so Huguenot? Because the fathers and mothers brought them up in those sentiments all the time they were going to Mass. You may rely upon it that this will continue for many generations. End quote. M. de Julien came to the conclusion that the proper way was to put to the sword all the Protestants of the country districts and burn all the villages. M. de Baville protested, quote, It is not a question of exterminating these people, he said, but of reducing them, of forcing them to fidelity. The king must have industrious people and flourishing districts preserved to him. End quote. The opinion of the generals prevailed. The Sevenol were proclaimed outlaws, and the Pope decreed a crusade against them. The military and religious enthusiasm of the Camisards went on increasing. Cavalier, young and enterprising, divided his time between the boldest attempts at surprise and mystical ecstasies during which he singled out traitors who would have assassinated him, or sinners who were not worthy to take part in the Lord's Supper. The king's troops ravaged the country. The Camisards, by way of reprisal, burned the Catholic villages. Everywhere the war was becoming horrible. The peaceable inhabitants, Catholic or Protestant, were incessantly changing from wrath to terror. Cavalier, naturally sensible and humane, sometimes sank into despondency. He would fling himself on his knees, crying, quote, Lord, turn aside the king from following the counsels of the wicked, end quote. and then he would set off again upon a new expedition. The struggle had been going on for two years, and Languedoc was a scene of fire and bloodshed. Marshal Montrevel had gained great advantages when the king ordered Villars to put an end to the revolt. Quote, I made up my mind, writes Villars in his memoir, to try everything, to employ all sorts of ways except that of ruining one of the finest provinces in the kingdom, and that if I could bring back the offenders without punishing them, I should preserve the best soldiers there are in the kingdom. They are, said I to myself, Frenchmen, very brave and very strong, three qualities to be considered. Quote, I shall always, he adds, have two ears for two sides. Quote, we have to do here with a very extraordinary people, wrote the marshal to Chamillard soon after his arrival. It is a people unlike anything I ever knew, all alive, turbulent, hasty, susceptible of light as well as deep impressions, tenacious in its opinions. Add thereto zeal for religion, which is as ardent amongst heretics as Catholics, and you will no longer be surprised that we should be often very much embarrassed. There are three sorts of Camisards. The first, with whom we might arrange matters by reason of their being weary of the miseries of war. The second, stark mad on the subject of religion, absolutely intractable on that point. The first little boy or little girl that falls a-trembling and declares that the Holy Spirit is speaking to it, all the people believe it, and if God with all his angels were to come and speak to them, they would not believe them more. People, moreover, on whom the penalty of death makes not the least impression. In battle they thank those who inflict it upon them. They walk to execution singing the praises of God and exhorting those present insomuch that it has often been necessary to surround the criminals with drums to prevent the pernicious effect of their speeches. Finally, the third, people without religion, accustomed to pillage, to murder, to quarter themselves upon the peasants, a rascalry furious, fanatical, and swarming with prophetesses. Villars had arrived in Languedoc the day after the checks encountered by the Camisards. The despondency and suffering were extreme, and the marshal had Cavalier sounded. Quote, what do you want to lay down your arms? said the envoy. Quote, Three things, replied the Sevenol chief. Liberty of conscience, the release of our brethren detained in the prisons and the galleys, and if these demands are refused, permission to quit France with ten thousand persons. End quote. The negotiators were entrusted with the most flattering offers for Cavalier. Sensible and yet vain, moved by his country's woes, and flattered by the idea of commanding a king's regiment, the young Camisard allowed himself to be won. He repaired formally to Nîmes for an interview with the marshal. Quote, he is a peasant of the lowest grade, wrote Villard de Chamillard, who is not twenty-two and does not look eighteen. Short and with no imposing air, qualities essential for the lower orders, but surprising good sense and firmness. I asked him yesterday how he managed to keep his followers under. Is it possible, said I, that at your age, and not being long used to command, you found no difficulty in often ordering to death your own men? No, sir, said he, when it seemed to me just. But whom did you employ to inflict it? The first whom I ordered, and nobody ever hesitated to follow my orders. I fancy, sir, that you will consider this rather surprising. Furthermore, he shows great method in the matter of his supplies, and he disposes his troops for an engagement as well as very experienced officers could do. It is a piece of luck if I get such a man away from them. Cavalier's fellows began to escape from his sway. They had hoped for a while that they would get back that liberty for which they had shed their blood. 
Quote, they are permitted to have public prayer and chant their psalms. No sooner was that known all round, writes Villard, than behold my madmen rushing up from burgs and castles in the neighborhood, not to surrender, but to chant with the rest. The gates were closed, they leaped the walls, and forced the guards. It is published abroad that I have indefinitely granted free exercise of the religion. The bishops let the marshal be. Quote, Stuff we our ears, said the bishop of Narbonne, and make we an end. End quote. The Camisards refused to listen to Cavalier. Quote, thou art mad, said Roland. Thou hast betrayed thy brethren. Thou shouldst die of shame. Go tell the marshal that I am resolved to remain sword in hand until the entire and complete restoration of the Edict of Nantes. The Sevenol thought themselves certain of aid from England. Only a handful followed Cavalier, who remained faithful to his engagements. He was ordered with his troop to Alsace. He slipped away from his watchers and threw himself into Switzerland. At the head of a regiment of refugees, he served successively the Duke of Savoy, the States General, and England. He died at Chelsea in 1740, the only one amongst the Camisards to leave a name in the world. The insurrection still went on in Languedoc under the orders of Roland, who was more fanatical and more disinterested than Cavalier. He was betrayed and surrounded in the castle of Castelnau on the 16th of August, 1704. Roland just had time to leap out of bed and mount his horse. He was taking to flight with his men by a back door when a detachment of dragoons came up with him. The Camisard chief put his back against an old olive and sold his life dearly. When he fell, his lieutenants let themselves be taken, quote-unquote, like lambs beside his corpse. Quote, they were destined to serve as examples, writes Villard, but the manner in which they met death was more calculated to confirm their religious spirit in these wrong heads than to destroy it. Lieutenant Mai was a fine young man of wits above the common. He heard his sentence with a smile, passed through the town of Nîmes with the same air, begging the priest not to plague him. The blows dealt him did not alter this air in the least, and did not elicit a single exclamation. His arms broken, he still had strength to make signs to the priest to be off, and as long as he could speak, he encouraged the others. That made me think that the quickest death is always best with these fellows, and that their sentence should above all things bear reference to their obstinacy in revolt rather than in religion." Villard did not carry executions to excess, even in the case of the most stubborn. Little by little the chiefs were killed off in petty engagements or died in obscurity of their wounds. Provisions were becoming scarce, the country was wasted, submission became more frequent every day. The principals all demanded leave to quit France. Quote, there are left none but a few brigands in the upper Cévennes, says Villard. Some partial risings alone recalled, up to 1709, the fact that the old leaven still existed. The war of the Camisards was over. It was the sole attempt in history on the part of French Protestantism since Richelieu, a strange and dangerous effort made by an ignorant and savage people. Roused to enthusiasm by persecution, believing itself called upon by the Spirit of God to win, sword in hand, the freedom of its creed under the leadership of two shepherd soldiers and prophets. Only the Scottish Cameronians have presented the same mixture of warlike ardor and pious enthusiasm, more gloomy and fierce with the men of the north, more poetical and prophetical with the Sevenol, flowing in Scotland as in Languedoc from religious oppression and from constant reading of the Holy Scriptures. The silence of death succeeded everywhere in France to the plaints of the reformers and to the crash of arms. Louis the Fourteenth might well suppose that Protestantism in his dominions was dead. It was a little before the time when the last of the Camisards, Abraham Mazel and Clarisse, perished near Uz in 1710, that the king struck the last blow at Jansenism by destroying its earliest nest and its last refuge, the house of the nuns of Port-Royal-des-Champs. With truces and intervals of apparent repose, the struggle had lasted more than sixty years between the Jesuits and Jansenism. M. de saint cyran who left the Bastille a few months after the death of Richelieu, had dedicated the last days of his life to writing against Protestantism, being so much the more scared by the heresy in that perhaps he felt attracted thereto by a secret affinity. He was already dying when there appeared the book Frequent Communion by M. Arnaud, the youngest son and twentieth child of that illustrious family of Arnaud in whom Jansenism seemed to be personified. The author was immediately accused at Rome and buried himself for twenty years in retirement. M. de saint cyran was still working, dictating Christian thoughts and points touching death. Stantem mori opertet, or one should die in harness, he would say. On the 3rd of October, 1643, he succumbed suddenly in the arms of his friends. Quote, I cast my eyes upon the body, which was still in the same posture in which death had left it, writes Lancelot, 
and I thought it so full of majesty and of mien so dignified that I could not tire of admiring it, and I fancied that he would still have been capable, in the state in which he was, of striking with awe the most passionate of his foes had they seen him." It was the most cruel blow that could have fallen upon the pious nuns of Port Royal. Quote, Dominus in Soello, or Lord in Heaven, end quote, was all that was said by Mother Angelica Arnaud, who, like M. de saint Cyran himself, centred all her thoughts and all her affections upon eternity. End of section 62. Section 63 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France, From the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 47. Louis the Fourteenth and Religion. Part 4. With his dying breath, M. de saint Cyran had said to M. Goudrin, physician to the College of Jesuits, quote, Sir, tell your fathers when I am dead not to triumph, and that I leave behind me a dozen stronger than I, end quote. With all his penetration, the director of consciences was mistaken. None of those he left behind him would have done his work. He had inspired with the same ardor and the same constancy the strong and the weak, the violent and the pacific. He had breathed his mighty faith into the most diverse souls, fired with the same zeal, penitents and nuns, men rescued from the scorching furnace of life in the world, and women brought up from infancy in the shade of the cloister. M. Arnaud was a great theologian, an indefatigable controversialist, the oracle and guide of his friends in their struggle against the Jesuits. M. de Sassy and M. Saint-Glain were wise and able directors, as austere as M. de saint Cyran in their requirements, less domineering and less rough than he. But M. de saint Cyran alone was and could be the head of Jansenism. He alone could have inspired that idea of immolation of the whole being to the sovereign will of God, as to the truth which resides in him alone. Once assured of this point, M. de saint Cyran became immovable. Mother Angelica pressed him to appear before the Archbishop's Council, which was to pronounce upon his book Theologie Familière. Quote, it is always good to humble oneself, she said. Quote, As for you, he replied, who are in that disposition and would not in any respect compromise the honor of the truth, you could do it. But as for me, I should break down before the eyes of God if I consented thereto. The weak are more to be feared sometimes than the wicked. End quote. Mother Angelica Arnaud, to whom these lines were addressed, was the most perfect image and the most accomplished disciple of M. de saint Cyran. More gentle and more human than he, she was not quite as strong and quite as zealous. Quote, it is necessary to be dead to everything, and after that to await everything. Such was the motto of her inward life, and of the constant effort made by this impassioned soul, susceptible of all tender affections, to detach herself violently and irrevocably from earth. The instinct of command, loftiness and breadth of views, find their place with the holy priest and with the nun. The mind of M. de saint Cyran was less practical, and his judgment less simple than that of the abbess, habituated as she had been from childhood to govern the lives of her nuns as their conscience. A reformer of more than one convent since the day when she had closed the gates of Port-Royal against her father, M. Arnaud, in order to restore the strictness of the cloister, Mother Angelica carried rule along with her for she carried within herself the government, rigid, no doubt, for it was life in a convent, but characterized by generous largeness of heart, which caused the yoke to be easily borne. Quote, to be perfect, there is no need to do singular things, she would often repeat, after St. Francis de Sales. What is needed is to do common things singularly well. End quote. She carried the same zeal from convent to convent, from Port-Royal des Champs to Port-Royal de Paris from Montbuisson, whither her superiors sent her to establish a reformation, to Saint-Sacrement, to establish union between the two orders. Ever devoted to religion, without having chosen her vocation, attracting around her all that were hers, her mother, a wife at twelve years of age, and astonished to find herself obeying after having commanded her twenty children for fifty years, five of her sisters, nieces and cousins, and in, quote, the desert, End quote, beside Port Royal des Champs, her brothers, her nephews, her friends, steeped like herself in penitence. Before her, Saint Bernard had quote, dispeopled the world end quote, of those whom he loved by an error common to zealous souls and exclusive spirits, solely occupied with thoughts of salvation. Even in solitude, Mother Angelica had not found rest. Quote, I am not fit to live on earth, she would say. I know not why I am still here. I can no longer bear either myself or others. There is none that seeketh after God. End quote. She was piously unjust towards her age, and still more towards her friends. It was the honorable distinction of M. de saint Cyran and his disciples that they did seek after God and holiness, at every cost and every risk. 
Mother Angelica was nearing the repose of eternity, the only repose admitted by her brother M. Arnaud, when the storm of persecution burst upon the monastery. The Augustinus of Jansius, Bishop of Ypres, a friend of M. de saint cyran's had just been condemned at Rome. Five propositions concerning grace were pronounced heretical. Quote, the Pope has a right to condemn them, said the Jansenists, if they are to be found in the Augustinus, but in fact they are not to be found there. End quote. The dispute waxed hot. M. Arnaud threw himself into it passionately. He, in his turn, was condemned by the Sorbonne. Quote, this is the very day, he wrote to his sister, Mother Angelica, when I am to be wiped out from the number of the doctors. I hope of God's goodness that he will not on that account wipe me out from the number of his servants. That is the only title I desire to preserve. End quote. M. Arnaud's friends pressed him to protest against his condemnation. Quote, Would you let yourself be crushed like a child, they said. He wrote in the theologian's vein, lengthily and bitterly. His friends listened in silence. Arnaud understood them. Quote, I see quite well that you do not consider this document a good one for its purpose, said he. And I think you are right, but you who are young, end quote, and he turned towards Pascal, who had a short time since retired to Port-Royal, you ought to do something, end quote. This was the origin of the Lettre Provinciale. For the first time, Pascal wrote something other than a treatise on physics. He revealed himself all at once and entirely. The recluses of Port-Royal were obliged to close their schools. They had to disperse. Arnaud concealed himself with his friend Nicole. Quote, I am having search made everywhere for M. Arnaud, said Louis the Fourteenth to Boileau, who was supposed to be much attached to the Jansenists. Quote, Your Majesty always was lucky, replied Boileau. You will not find him. End quote. The nun's turn had come. Orders were given to send away the pensioners, or pupils. Mother Angelica set out for the house at Paris, quote, where was the battleground, end quote. Memoir pour servir à l'histoire de Port-Royal, page 127. As she was leaving the house in the fields, which was so dear to her, she met in the courtyard M. Dandilly, her brother, who was waiting to say good-bye to her. When he came up to her, she said to him, quote, "'Good-bye, my dear brother. Be of good courage, whatever happens.' Quote, "'Fear nothing, my dear sister. I am perfectly so.' Quote. But she replied, quote, "'Brother, brother, let us be humble. Let us remember that humility without fortitude is cowardice, but that fortitude without humility is presumption.' Quote. When she arrived at the convent in Paris, she found us for the most part very sad, writes her niece, Mother Angelica de Saint-Jean, and some were in tears. She, looking at us with an open and confident countenance, said, Why, I believe there is weeping here. Come, my children, what is all this? Have you no faith? And at what are you dismayed? What if men do rage? Eh? Are you afraid of that? They are but flies. You hope in God, and yet fear anything. Fear but him, and trust me, all will be well." and to madame de chevreuse who came to fetch her daughters madame when there is no god i shall lose courage but so long as god is god i shall hope in him End quote. she succumbed however beneath the burden and the terror she had always felt of death aggravated her sufferings quote, believe me my children she would say to the nuns believe what i tell you people do not know what death is and do not think about it as for me i have apprehended it all my life and have always been thinking about it but all I have imagined is less than nothing in comparison with what it is, with what I feel, and with what I comprehend at this moment. It would need but such thoughts to detach us from everything. M. Sanglin, being obliged to conceal himself, came secretly to see her. She would not have her nephew, M. de Sassy, run the same risk. Quote, I shall never see him more, she said. It is God's will. I do not vex myself about it. My nephew without God could be of no use to me, and God without my nephew will be all in all to me. End quote. The grand vicar of the Archbishop of Paris went to Port-Royal to make sure that the pensioners had gone. He sat down beside Mother Angelica's bed. Quote, so you are ill, Mother, said he. Pray, what is your complaint? Quote, I am dropsical, sir, she replied. Quote, Jesus, my dear Mother, you say that as if it were nothing at all. Does not such a complaint dismay you? Quote, no, sir, she replied, I am incomparably more dismayed at what I see happening in our house, for indeed I came hither to die here, but I did not come to see all that I now see, and I had no reason to expect the kind of treatment we are having. Sir, sir, this is man's day, God's day will come, who will reveal many things and avenge everything. End quote. She died on the 6th of August, 1661, murmuring over and over again, quote, Goodbye, goodbye. End quote. And when she was asked why she said that, she replied simply, quote, because I am going away, my children, end quote. She had given instructions to bury her in the pro, or courtyard, and not to have any nonsense, or badinerie, after her death. Quote, I am your Jonas, she said to the nuns, when I am thrown into the whale's belly, the tempest will cease, end quote. She was mistaken, the tempest was scarcely beginning. 
Cardinal de Retz was still titular Archbishop of Paris, and rather favorable to Jansenism. It was therefore the grand vicars who prepared the exhortation to the faithful, calling upon them to accept the papal decision touching Jansen's book. There was drawn up a formula, or formulary of adhesion, quote, turned with some skill, says Madame Perrier, in her biography of Jacqueline Pascal, and in such a way that subscription did not bind the conscience, as theologians most scrupulous about the truth affirmed. The nuns of Port-Royal, however, refused to subscribe. Quote, what hinders us, said a letter to Mother Angelica de Saint-Jean from Jacqueline Pascal, sister saint Ophimia in religion, what hinders all the ecclesiastics who recognize the truth to reply when the formulary is presented to them to subscribe, I know the respect I owe the bishops, but my conscience does not permit me to subscribe that a thing is in a book in which I have not seen it, and after that wait for what will happen. What have we to fear? Banishment and dispersion for the nuns, seizure of temporalities, imprisonment and death, if you will, but is not that our glory, and should it not be our joy? Let us renounce the gospel, or follow the maxims of the gospel, and deem ourselves happy to suffer somewhat for righteousness' sake. I know that it is not for daughters to defend the truth, though one might say, unfortunately, that since the bishops have the courage of daughters, the daughters must have the courage of bishops. But if it is not for us to defend the truth, it is for us to die for the truth, and suffer everything rather than abandon it. End quote. Jacqueline subscribed, divided between her instinctive repugnance and her desire to show herself a, quote, humble daughter of the Catholic Church. Quote, it is all we can concede, she said, for the rest, come what may, poverty, dispersion, imprisonment, death, all this seems to me nothing in comparison with the anguish in which I should pass the remainder of my life, if I had been wretch enough to make a covenant with death on so excellent an occasion of paying to God the vows of fidelity which our lips have pronounced. Quote, her health was so shaken by the shock which all this business caused her, writes Madame Prier, that she fell dangerously ill and died soon after. Quote, Think not, I beg of you, my father, she wrote to M. Arnaud, firm as I may appear, that nature does not greatly apprehend all the consequences of this, but I hope that grace will sustain me, and it seems to me as if I feel it. Quote, the king does all he wills, Madame de Guimanet had said to M. Le Tellier, whom she was trying to soften towards Port Royal. He makes princes of the blood, he makes archbishops and bishops, and he will make martyrs likewise. End quote. Jacqueline Pascal was, quote, the first victim, end quote, of the formulary. She was not the only one. Quote, it will not stop there, said the king, to whom it was announced that the daughters of Port Royal consented to sign the formulary on condition only of giving an explanation of their conduct. Cardinal de Retz had at last sent in his resignation. M. du Marca, archbishop designate in succession to him, died three days after receiving the bulls from Rome. Ardouin de Porifix had just been nominated in his place. He repaired to Port Royal. The days of grace were over. The nuns remained indomitable. Quote, what is the use of all your prayers, said he to Sister Christine Brisquet. What ground for God to listen to you? You go to him and say, My God, give me thy spirit and thy grace. But, my God, I do not mean to subscribe. I will take good care not to do that for all that may be said. After that, what ground for God to hearken to you? End quote. He forbade the nuns the sacraments. Quote, they are pure as angels and proud as demons, repeated the archbishop angrily as he left the convent. On the 25th of August he returned to Port Royal, accompanied by a numerous escort of ecclesiastics and exons. Quote, when I say a thing, so it must be, he said as he entered. I will not eat my words. End quote. He picked out twelve nuns who were immediately taken away and dispersed in different monasteries. M. Dandely was at the gate, receiving in his carriage his sister, Mother Agnes, aged and infirm, and his three daughters doomed to exile. Quote, I had borne up all day without weeping and without inclination thereto, writes Mother Angelica de Saint-Jean, on arrival at the Annonciade Bleu. But when night came, and after finishing all my prayers, I thought to lay me down and take some rest, I felt myself all in a moment bruised and lacerated in every part by the separations I had just gone through. I then found sensibly that, to escape weakness in the hour of deep affliction, there must be no dropping of the eyes that have been lifted to the mountains. End quote. Ten months later, the exiled nuns returned, without having subscribed, to Port Royal des Champs, a little before the moment when M. de Sassy, who had become their secret director since the death of M. Sanglin, was arrested, together with his secretary Fontaine, at six in the morning in front of the Bastille. Quote, as he had for two years past been expecting imprisonment, he had got the epistles of St. Paul bound up together, so as to always carry them about with him. Let them do with me what they please, he was wont to say, wherever they put me, provided that I have my St. Paul with me, I fear nothing. On the 13th of May, 1666, the day of his arrest, M. de Sassy had for once happened to forget his book. 
He was put into the Bastille after an examination, quote, which revealed a man of much wit and worth, said the king himself. Fontaine remained separated from him for three months. Quote, Liberty, for me, is to be with M. de Sassy, said the faithful secretary. Open the door of his room and that of the Bastille, and you will see to which of the two I shall run. Without him, everything will be prison to me. I shall be free whenever I see him. End quote. At last he had the joy of recovering his well-beloved master, strictly watched and still deprived of the sacraments. Like Luther at Wartburg, he was finishing the revisal of his translation of the Bible when his cousins M. de Pomponne and Arnaud entered his room on the 31st of October, 1668. They chatted a while without any appearance of impatience on the part of M. de Sassy. Quote, you are free, said his friends at last, who had wanted to prove him, and they showed him the king's order, which he read, says Abbé Arnaud, without any change of countenance, and as little affected by joy as he had been a moment before by the long iniquity of his release. End, quote. End of section 63. Section 64 of the Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 47. Louis XIV and Religion. Part 5. He lived fifteen years longer, occupied during the interval of rest which the peace of the church restored to Port-Royal, in directing and fortifying souls. He published, one after another, the volumes of his translation of the Bible, with expositions, or éclaircissements, which had been required by the examiners. In 1679, the renewal of the king's severities compelled him to retire completely to Pompon. On the 3rd of January, 1684, at seventy-one years of age, he felt ill and went to bed. He died next day without being taken by surprise, as regarded either his affairs or his soul, by so speedy an end. Quote, oh, blessed flames of purgatory, he said, as he breathed his last. He had requested to be buried at port royal des champs He was borne thither at night. The cold was intense, and the roads were covered with snow. The carriages were escorted by men carrying torches. The nuns looked a moment upon the face of the saintly director, whom they had not seen for many years, and then he was lowered into his grave. Quote, Needs hide in earth what is but earth, said Mother Angelica de Saint-Jean, in deep accents and a lowly voice, and return to nothingness what in itself is but nothing. End quote. She was nevertheless heartbroken, and tarried only for this pious duty to pass away in her turn. Quote, it is time to give up my veil to him from whom I received it, said she. A fortnight after the death of M. de Sassy, she expired at Port-Royal, just proceeding to the tomb her brother M. de Luzancy, who breathed his last at Pomponne, where he had lived with M. de Sassy. Quote, I confess, said the inconsolable Fontaine, that when I saw this brother and sister stricken with death by that of M. de Sassy, I blushed, I who thought I had always loved him, not to follow him like them, and I became consequently exasperated with myself for loving so little in comparison with those persons whose love had been strong as death. End quote. The human heart avenges itself for the tortures men pretentiously inflict upon it. The disciples of saint Cyran thought to stifle in their souls all earthly affections, and they died of grief on losing those they loved. Quote, their life ebbed away in those depths of tears, as M. Vinet has said. The great Paul royal was dead with M. de Sassy and Mother Angelica de Saint-Jean, faithful and modest imitators of their illustrious predecessors. The austere virtue and the pious severance from the world existed still in the house in the fields, under the direction of Duguet. The persecution, too, continued, persisted and noiseless. The king had given the direction of his conscience to the Jesuits. From Father Lachaise, moderate and prudent, he had passed to Father Le Tellier, violent and perfidious. Furthermore, the long persistence of the Jansenists in their obstinacy, their freedom of thought which infringed the unity so dear to Louis XIV, displeased the monarch, absolute even in his hour of humiliation and defeat. The property of Paul royal was seized, and Cardinal de Noailles, well disposed at bottom towards the Jansenists, but so feeble in character that determination disgusted him as if it were a personal insult, ended by once more forbidding the nuns the sacraments. The house in the fields was suppressed and its title merged in that of Port-Royal in Paris, for some time past replenished with submissive nuns. Madame de Chateau-Renaud, quote, the new abbess, went to take possession. The daughters of Mother Angelica protested, but without violence, as she would have done in their place, end quote. On the 29th of October, 1709, after prime, Father Le Tellier having told the king that, quote, Madame de Chateau-Renaud dared not to go to Port-Royal des Champs, being convinced that those headstrong, disobedient, and rebellious daughters would laugh at the king's decree, and that unless His Majesty would be pleased to give precise orders to disperse them, it would never be possible to carry it out, end quote. 
the king, being pressed in this way, sent his orders to M. d'Argenson, lieutenant of police. He appeared at Port-Royal with a commissary and two exons. He asked for the prioress. She was at church. When service was over, he summoned all the nuns. One, old and very paralytic, was missing. Quote, Let her be brought, said M. d'Argenson. His majesty's orders are, he continued, that you break up this assemblage, never to meet again. It is your general dispersal that I announce to you. You are allowed but three hours to break up. Quote, we are ready to obey, sir, said the mother prioress. Half an hour is more than sufficient for us to say our last good-bye, and take with us a breviary, a Bible, and our regulations. End quote. And when he asked her whither she meant to go, quote, sir, the moment our community is broken up and dispersed, it is indifferent to me in what place I may be personally, since I hope to find God wherever I shall be. End quote. They got into carriages, receiving one after another the farewell and blessing of the mother prioress, who was the last to depart. Remaining firm to the end, there were two and twenty, the youngest fifty years old. They all died in the convents to which they were taken. A seizure was at once made of all papers and books left in the cells. Cardinal Noailles did not interfere. M. de saint Cyran had depicted him by anticipation, when he said that the weak were more to be feared than the wicked. He was complaining one day of his differences with his bishops. Quote, what can you expect, Monseigneur? laughingly said a lady well disposed to the Jansenists. God is just. It is the stones of Port-Royal tumbling upon your head. End quote. The tombs were destroyed. Some coffins were carried to a distance. Others left and profaned. The plough passed over the ruins. The hatred of the enemies of Port-Royal was satiated. A few of the faithful, preserving in their hearts the ardent faith of M. de saint Cyran, narrowed, however, and absorbed by obstinate resistance. A few theologians dying in exile and leaving in Holland a succession of bishops detached from the Roman Church. This was all that remained of one of the noblest attempts ever made by the human soul to rise, here below, above that which is permitted by human nature. Virtues of the utmost force, Christianity zealously pushed to its extremest limits, and the most invincible courage sustained the Jansenists in a conscientious struggle against spiritual oppression. Its life died out, little by little, amongst the dispersed members. The Catholic Church suffered therefrom in its innermost sanctuary. Quote, the Catholic religion would only be more neglected if there were no more religionists, said Vauban in his memoir in favor of the Protestants. It was the same as regarded the Jansenists. The Jesuits and Louis XIV, in their ignorant passion for unity and uniformity, had not comprehended that great principle of healthy freedom and sound justice of which the scientific soldier had a glimmering. The insurrection of the Camisards in the Cévennes had been entirely of a popular character. The Jansenists had penitents amongst the great of this world, though none properly belonged to them or retired to their convents or their solitudes. It was the great French burgessdom, issue for the most part of the magistracy, which supplied their most fervent associates. Fenelon and Madame Guillon founded their little church at court amongst the great lords, and many remained faithful to them till death. The spiritual letters of Fenelon, models of wisdom, pious tact, moderation and knowledge of the human heart are nearly all addressed to persons engaged in the life and the offices of the court exposed to all the temptations of the world it is no longer the desert of the penitents of port royal or the strict cloister of mother angelica fenelon is for only inward restrictions and an abstention purely spiritual from afar and in his retreat at cambrai he watches over his faithful flock with a tender preoccupation which does not make him overlook the duties of their position Quote, Take as penance from your sins, he wrote, the disagreeable liabilities of the position you are in. The very hindrances which seem injurious to our advancement in piety turn to our profit, provided that we do what depends on ourselves. Fail not in any of your duties towards the court, as regards your office and the proprieties, but be not anxious for posts which awaken ambition. Such are, with their discreet tolerance, the teachings of Fenelon, adapted for the guidance of the dukes of Beauvilliers and Chevreuse, and of the duke of Burgundy himself. He went much further, and on less safe a road, when he was living at court, under the influence of Madame Guillon. A widow and still young, gifted with an ardent spirit and a lofty and subtle mind, Madame Guillon had imagined, in her mystical enthusiasm, a theory of pure love, very analogous fundamentally, if not in its practical consequences, to the doctrines taught shortly before by a Spanish priest named Molino, condemned by the court of Rome in 1687. It was about the same time that Madame Guillon went to Paris with her book on the moyen court et facile de faire l'oraison du cœur, or short and easy method of making a rise in with the heart. Prayer, according to this holy mystical teaching, loses the character of supplication or intercession to become the simple silence of a soul absorbed in God. Quote, 
Why are not simple folks so taught, she said? Shepherds keeping their flocks would have the spirit of the old anchorites, and laborers, whilst driving the plow, would talk happily with God. All vice would be banished in a little while, and the kingdom of God would be realized on earth. End quote. It was a far cry from the sanguinary struggle against sin and the armed Christianity of the Jansenists. The sublime and specious visions of Madame Guillon fascinated lofty and gentle souls. The Duchess of Charot, daughter of Fouquet, Madame de Beauvilliers, de Chevreuse, de Mortemar, daughters of Colbert and their pious husbands, were the first to be chained to her feet. Fenelon, at that time preceptor to the children of France, or royal family, saw her, admired her, and became imbued with her doctrines. She was for a while admitted to the intimacy of Madame de Maintenon. It was for this little nucleus of faithful friends that she wrote her book of torrents. The human soul is a torrent which returns to its source in God, who lives in perfect repose, and who would fain give it to those who are his. The Christian soul has nothing more that is its, neither will nor desire. It has God for soul. He is its principle of life. Quote, in this way there is nothing extraordinary, no visions, no ecstasies, no entrancements. The way is simple pure and plain. There the soul sees nothing but in God, as God sees himself and with his eyes. With less vagueness and quite as mystically, Fenelon defined the sublime love taught by Madame Guillon in the following maxim, afterwards condemned at Rome. Quote, there is an habitual state of love of God which is pure charity, without any taint of the motive of self-interest. Neither fear of punishment nor desire of reward have any longer part in this love. God is loved not for the merit or the perfection or the happiness to be found in loving him. End quote. What singular seductiveness in those theories of pure love which were taught at the court of Louis the Fourteenth by his grandchildren's preceptor at a woman's instigation and zealously preached fifty years afterwards by president of New Jersey College, Jonathan Edwards, in the cold and austere atmosphere of New England. Led away by the generous enthusiasm of his soul, Fenelon had not probed the dangers of his new doctrine. The gospel and church of Christ whilst preaching the love of God, had strongly maintained the fact of human individuality and responsibility. The theory of mere, or pure love, absorbing the soul in God, put an end to repentance, effort to withstand evil, and the need of a redeemer. Bossuet was not deceived. The elevation of his mind, combined with strong common sense, caused him to see through all the veils of the mysticism. Madame Guillon had submitted her books to him. He disapproved of them, at first quietly, then formally, after a thorough examination, in conjunction with two other doctors. Madame Guillon retired to a monastery of Meaux. She soon returned to Paris, and her believers rallied round her. Bossuet, in his anger, no longer held his hand. Madame Guillon was shut up first at Vincennes, and then in the Bastille. She remained seven years in prison, and ended by retiring to Nirbois, where she died in 1717, still absorbed in her holy and vague reveries, praying no more inasmuch as she possessed God, quote, a submissive daughter, however, of the Catholic, Apostolic, and Roman Church, having and desiring to admit no other opinion but its, end quote, as she says in her will. Bourdaloue calls mere or pure love, quote, a bare faith, which has for its object no verity of the Gospels, no mystery of Jesus Christ's, no attribute of God's, nothing whatever, unless it be in a word God, end quote. In the presence of death, on the approach of the awful realities of eternity, Madame Guillot no doubt felt the want of a more simple faith in the mighty and living God. Fenelot had not waited so long to surrender. The instinct of the pious and vigorous souls of the seventeenth century had not allowed them to go astray. There was little talk of pantheism, which had spread considerably in the sixteenth century, but there had been a presentiment of the dangers lurking behind the doctrines of Madame Guillon. Bossuet, that great and noble type of the finest period of the Catholic Church in France, made the mistake of pushing his victory too far. Fenelon, a young priest when the great Bishop of Meaux was already in his zenith, had preserved towards him a profound affection and a deep respect. We are, by anticipation, agreed, however you may decide, he wrote to him on the 28th of July, 1694. It will be no specious submission, but a sincere conviction. Though that which I suppose myself to have read should appear to me clearer than that two and two make four, I should consider it still less clear than my obligation to mistrust all my lights, and to prefer before them those of a bishop such as you. You have only to give me my lesson in writing, provided that you wrote me precisely what is the doctrine of the church, and what are the articles in which I have slipped, I would tie myself down inviolably to that rule. Bossuet required more. He wanted Fenelon, recently promoted to the Archbishopric of Cambrai, to approve of the book he was preparing on Etat d'Oraison, or States of Horizon, and explicitly to condemn the works of Madame Guillon. Fenelon refused with generous indignation. Quote, 
so it is to secure my own reputation, he writes to Madame de Maintenon in 1696, that I am wanted to subscribe that a lady, my friend, would plainly deserve to be burned with all her writings, for an execrable form of spirituality, which is the only bond of our friendship. I tell you, Madame, I would burn my friend with my own hands, and I would burn myself joyfully, rather than let the church be imperiled. But here is a poor captive woman, overwhelmed with sorrows. There is none to defend her, none to excuse her. They are always afraid to do so. I maintain that this stroke of the pen, given by me against my conscience, from a cowardly policy, would render me forever infamous and unworthy of my ministry and my position. Fenelon no longer submitted his reason and his conduct, then, to the judgment of Bossuet. He recognized in him an adversary, but he still spoke of him with profound veneration. Quote, Fear not, he writes to Madame de Maintenon, that I should gainsay M. de Meaux. I shall never speak of him, but as of my master, and of his propositions, but as the rule of faith. End quote. Fenelon was at Cambrai, being regular in the residence which removed him for nine months in the year from the court and the children of France, when there appeared in his Explication des Maximes des Saints sur la vie intérieure, or Exposition of the Maxims of the Saints Touching the Inner Life, almost at the same moment as Bossuet's Instruction sur les états d'oraison, or Lessons on States of Horizon. Fenelon's book appeared as dangerous as those of Madame Guillon. He himself submitted it to the Pope, and was getting ready to repair to Rome to defend his cause, when the king wrote to him, quote, I do not think proper to allow you to go to Rome. You must, on the contrary, repair to your diocese, whence I forbid you to go away. You can send to Rome your pleas in justification of your book. Fenelon departed to an exile which was to last as long as his life. On his departure he wrote to Madame de Maintenon, quote, I shall depart hence, Madame, to-morrow, Friday, in obedience to the king. My greatest sorrow is to have wearied him and to displease him. I shall not cease all the days of my life to pray God to pour his graces upon him. I consent to be crushed more and more. The only thing I ask of His Majesty is that the diocese of Cambrai, which is guiltless, may not suffer for the errors imputed to me. I ask protection only for the sake of the Church, and even that protection I limit to not being disturbed in those few good works which my present position permits me to do, in order to fulfill a pastor's duties. It remains for me, madame, only to ask your pardon for all the trouble I have caused you. I shall all my life be as deeply sensible of your former kindnesses as if I had not forfeited them, and my respectful attachment to yourself, madame, will never diminish. Fenelon made no mistake in addressing to madame de Maintenon his farewell and his regrets. She had acted against him with the uneasiness of a person led away for a moment by an irresistible attraction, and returning, quite affrighted, to rule and the beaten paths. The mere love theory had no power to fascinate her for long. The Archbishop of Cambrai did not drop out of that pleasant dignity. The pious counsellors of the king were working against him at Rome, bringing all the influence of France to weigh upon Innocent the Twelfth. Fenelon had taken no part in the declarations of the Gallican Church in 1682, which had been drawn up by Bossuet. The court of Rome was inclined towards him. The strife became bitter and personal. Pamphlets succeeded pamphlets. Letters. Bossuet published a Relation du Quietisme, or An Account of Quietism and remarks upon the reply of M. de Cambrai, quote, I write this for the people, he said, in order that the character of M. de Cambrai being known, his eloquence may, with God's permission, no more impose upon anybody, end quote. Fenelon replied with a vigor, a fullness, and a moderation which brought men's minds over to him, quote, You do more for me by the excess of your accusations, said he de Bossuet, than I could do myself. But what a melancholy consolation when we look at the scandal which troubles the house of God, and which causes so many heretics and libertines, or free thinkers, to triumph. Whatever end may be put by a holy pontiff to this matter, I await it with impatience, having no wish but to obey, no fear but to be in the wrong, no object but peace. I hope that it will be seen from my silence, my unreserved submission, my constant horror of illusion, my isolation from any book and any person of a suspicious sort, that the evil you would fain have caused to be apprehended is as chimerical as the scandal has been real, and that violent measures taken against imaginary evils turn to poison. End, quote. End of section 64. Section 65 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by Francois Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 47. Louis the Fourteenth and Religion. Part 6. Fenelon was condemned on the 12th of March, 1699. The sentence of Rome was mild, and hinted no suspicion of heresy. It had been wrested from the Pope by the urgency of Louis the Fourteenth. 
Quote, it would be painful to his majesty, wrote the bishop of Meaux in the king's name, to see a new chisholm growing up amongst his subjects at the very time that he is applying himself with all his might to the task of extirpating that of Calvin, and if he saw the prolongation, by manoeuvres which are incomprehensible, of a matter which appeared to be at an end. He will know what he has to do, and will take suitable resolutions, still hoping, nevertheless, that his holiness will not be pleased to reduce him to such disagreeable extremities. End quote. When the threat reached Rome, Innocent XII had already yielded. Fenelon submitted to the Pope's decision completely and unreservedly. Quote, God gives me grace to be at peace amidst bitterness and sorrow, he wrote to the Duke of Beauvilliers on the 29th of March, 1699. Amongst so many troubles I have one consolation little fitted to be known in the world, but solid enough for those who seek God in good faith, and that is that my conduct is quite decided upon, and that I have no longer to deliberate. It only remains for me to submit and hold my peace. That is what I have always desired. I have now but to choose the terms of my submission. The shortest, the simplest, the most absolute, the most devoid of any restriction, are those that I rather prefer. My conscience is disburdened in that of my superior. In all this, far from having an eye to my advantage, I have no eye to any man. I see but God, and I am content with what he does. Bossuet had triumphed. His vaster mind, his more sagacious insight, his stronger judgment had unravelled the dangerous errors in which Fenelon had allowed himself to be entangled. The Archbishop of Cambrai, however, had grown in the estimation of good men on account of his moderation, his gentle and high-spirited independence during the struggle, his submission, full of dignity, after the papal decision. The mind of Bossuet was the greater, the spirit of Fenelon was the nobler and more deeply pious. Quote, I cannot consent to have my book defended even indirectly, he wrote to one of his friends on the 21st of July, 1699. In God's name, speak not of me, but to God only, and leave men to think as they please. As for me, I have no object but silence and peace after my unreserved submission. Fenelon was not detached from the world and his hopes to quite such an extent as he would have had it appear. He had educated the Duke of Burgundy, who remained passionately attached to him, and might hope for a return of prosperity. He remained in the silence and retirement of his diocese, with the character of an able and saintly bishop, keeping open house, grandly and simply, careful of the welfare of the soldiery who passed through Cambrai, adored by his clergy and the people. Quote, Never a word about the court, or about public affairs of any sort that could be found fault with, or any that smacked the least in the world of baseness, regret, or flattery, writes Saint-Simon. Never anything that could give a bare hint of what he had been, or might be again. He was a tall, thin man, well-made, pale, with a large nose, eyes from which fire and intellect streamed like a torrent, and a physiognomy such that I have never seen any like it, and there was no forgetting it when it had been seen but once. It combined everything, and there was no conflict of opposites in it. There were gravity and gallantry, the serious and the gay. It savoured equally of the learned doctor, the bishop, and the great lord. That which appeared on its surface, as well as in his whole person, was refinement, intellect, grace, propriety, and, above all, nobility. It required an effort to cease looking at him. His manners corresponded therewith in the same proportion, with an ease which communicated it to others. With all this, a man who never desired to show more wits than they with whom he conversed, who put himself within everybody's range without ever letting it be perceived, in such wise that nobody could drop him, or fight shy of him, or not want to see him again. It was this rare talent, which he possessed to the highest degree, that kept his friends so completely attached to him all his life, in spite of his downfall, and that in their dispersion brought them together to speak of him, to sorrow after him, to yearn for him, to bind themselves more and more to him, as the Jews to Jerusalem, and to sigh after his return, and hope continually for it, just as that unfortunate people still expects and sighs after the Messiah. End quote. Those faithful friends were dropping one after another. The death of the Duke of Burgundy and of the Duke of Chevreuse in 1712, and that of the Duke of Beauvilliers in 1714, were a fatal blow to the affections as well as to the ambitious hopes of Fenelon. Of delicate health, worn out by the manifold duties of the episcopate, inwardly wearied by long and vain expectation, he succumbed on the 7th of January, 1715, at the moment when the attraction shown by the Duke of Orléans towards him and, quote, the king's declining state, end quote, were once more renewing his chances of power. Quote, he was already consulted in private and courted again in public, says Saint-Simon, because the inclination of the rising sun had already shone through. End quote. He died, however, without letting any sign of yearning for life appear. Quote, 
regardless of all that he was leaving, and occupied solely with that which he was going to meet, with a tranquillity, a peace, which excluded nothing but disquietude, and which included penitence, despoilment, and a unique care for the spiritual affairs of his diocese. The Christian soul was detaching itself from the world to go before God with sweet and simple confidence. Quote, oh, how great is God! How all in all! How as nothing are we when we are so near him, and when the veil which conceals him from us is about to lift. End quote. Oeuvre de Fenelon, Lettre Spirituelle, page 128. So many fires smouldering in the hearts, so many different struggles going on in the souls, that sought to manifest their personal and independent life, have often caused forgetfulness of the great mass of the faithful, who were neither Jansenists nor Quietists. Bossuet was the real head and the pride of the great Catholic Church of France in the seventeenth century. What he approved of was approved of by the immense majority of the French clergy. What he condemned was condemned by them moderate and prudent in conduct as well as in his opinions, pious without being fervent, holding discreetly aloof from all excesses, he was a Gallican without fear and without estrangement as regarded the papal power, to which he steadfastly paid homage. It was with pain, and not without having sought to escape therefrom, that he found himself obliged at the assembly of the clergy in 1682 to draw up the solemn declarations of the Gallican Church. The meeting of the clergy had been called forth by the eternal discussions of the civil power with the court of Rome on the question of the rights of regale, that is to say, the rights of the sovereign to receive the revenues of vacant bishoprics, and to appoint to benefices belonging to them. The French bishops were of independent spirit. The archbishop of Paris, Francis de Arlet, was on bad terms with Pope Innocent XI. Bossuet managed to moderate the discussions, and kept within suitable bounds the declaration which he could not avoid. He had always taught and maintained what was proclaimed by the assembly of the clergy of France, quote, that St. Peter and his successors, vicars of Jesus Christ, and the whole church itself, received from God authority over only spiritual matters, and such as appertain to salvation, and not over temporal and civil matters, in such sort that kings and sovereigns are not subject to tiny ecclesiastical power by order of God in temporal matters, and cannot be deposed directly or indirectly by authority of the keys of the church. Finally, that though the Pope has the principal part in questions of faith, and though his decrees concern all the churches, and each church severally, his judgment is nevertheless not irrefragable, unless the consent of the church intervene. End quote. Old doctrines in the Church of France, but never before so solemnly declared, and made incumbent upon the teaching of all the faculties of theology in the kingdom. Constantly occupied in the dogmatic struggle against Protestantism, Bossuet had imported into it a moderation in form which, however, did not keep out injustice. Without any inclination towards persecution, he, with almost unanimity on the part of the bishops of France, approved of the king's piety in the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. Quote, Take up your sacred pens, says he in his funeral oration over Michael Le Tellier, ye who compose the annals of the church, haste ye to place Louis amongst the peers of Constantine and Theodosius. Our fathers saw not, as we have seen, an inveterate heresy falling at a single blow, scattered flocks returning in a mass, and our churches too narrow to receive them, their false shepherds leaving them without even awaiting the order, and happy to have their banishment to allege as excuse. All tranquillity amidst so great a movement, the universe astounded to see in so novel an event the most certain sign as well as the most noble use of authority, and the prince's merit more recognized and more revered than even his authority." Moved by so many marvels, say ye to this new Constantine, this new Theodosius, this new Marciau, this new Charlemagne, what the six hundred and thirty fathers said aforetime in the council of Chaloedon. You have confirmed the faith, you have exterminated the heretics. That is the worthy achievement of your reign, that is its own characteristic. Through you heresy is no more. God alone could have wrought this marvel. King of heaven, preserve the king of earth. That is the prayer of the churches. That is the prayer of the bishops. End quote. Bossuet, like Louis the Fourteenth, believed Protestantism to be destroyed. Quote, Heresy is no more, he said. It was the same feeling that prompted Louis the Fourteenth, when dying, to the edict of March eighth, seventeen fifteen. We learn, said he, that abjurations being frequently made in provinces distant from those in which our newly converted subjects die, our judges to whom those who die relapsed are denounced find a difficulty in condemning them for want of proof of their abjuration. The stay which those who were of the religion styled reformed have made in our kingdom since we abolished therein all exercise of the said religion is a more than sufficient proof that they have embraced the Catholic religion, without which they would have been neither suffered nor tolerated. There did not exist, there could not exist, any more Protestants in France. 
all those who died without sacraments were relapsed, and as such dragged on the hurdle. Those who were not married at a Catholic church were not married. M. Guizot was born at Nîmes on the 4th of October, 1787, before Protestants possessed any civil rights in France. Bossuet had died on the 12th of April, 1704. When troubles began again in the church, the enemies of the Jansenists obtained from the king a decree interdicting the Réflexion morale sur le Nouveau Testament, an old and highly esteemed work by Father Quenel, sometime an oratorian who had become head of the Jansenists on the death of the great Arnaud. Its condemnation at Rome was demanded. Cardinal de Noailles, Archbishop of Paris, had but lately, as Bishop of Chalon, approved of the book. He refused to retract his approbation. The Jesuits made urgent representations to the Pope. Clement XI launched the bull Unigenitus, condemning a hundred and one propositions extracted from the Réflexion Morale. Eight prelates, with Cardinal de Noailles at their head, protested against the bull. It was nevertheless enregistered at the Parliament, but not without difficulty. The archbishop still held out, supported by the greater part of the religious orders and the majority of the doctors of Sorbonne. The king's confessor, Le Tellier, pressed him to prosecute the cardinal and get him deposed by a national council. The affair dragged its slow length along at Rome. The archbishop had suspended from the sacred functions all the Jesuits of his diocese. The struggle had commenced under the name of Jansenism against the whole Gallican church. The king was about to bring the matter before his bed of justice when he fell ill. He saw no more of Cardinal de Noailles, and this rupture vexed him. Quote, I am sorry to leave the affairs of the church in the state in which they are, he said to his counsellors. I am perfectly ignorant in the matter. You know, and I call you to witness, that I have done nothing therein but what you wanted, and that I have done all you wanted. It is you who will answer before God for all that has been done, whether too much or too little. I charge you with it before him, and I have a clear conscience. I am but a know-nothing who have left myself to your guidance. End quote an awful appeal from a dying king to the guides of his conscience. He had dispeopled his kingdom, reduced to exile, despair, or falsehood fifteen hundred thousand of his subjects, but the memory of the persecutions inflicted upon the Protestants did not trouble him. They were for him rather a pledge of his salvation and of his acceptance before God. He was thinking of the Catholic Church, the holy priests exiled or imprisoned, the nuns driven from their convent, the division among the bishops, the scandal amongst the faithful. The great burden of absolute power was evident to his eyes. He sought to let it fall back upon the shoulders of those who had enticed him or urged him upon that fatal path. A vain attempt in the eyes of men, whatever may be the judgment of God's sovereign mercy. History has left weighing upon Louis Fourteenth the crushing weight of the religious persecutions ordered under his reign. End of section 65 End of chapter 47《Section 66 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter 48. Louis Fourteenth, Literature and Art, Part 1. It has been said in this history that Louis Fourteenth had the fortune to find himself at the culminating point of absolute monarchy, and to profit by the labors of his predecessors, reaping a portion of their glory. He had likewise the honor of enriching himself with the labors of his contemporaries, and attracting to himself a share of their luster. The honor, be it said, not the fortune, for he managed to remain the center of intellectual movement as well as of the court, of literature and art, as well as affairs of state. Only the abrupt and solitary genius of Pascal, or the prankish and ingenuous geniality of La Fontaine, held aloof from king and court. Racine and Molière, Bossuet and Fenelon, La Bruyère and Boileau lived frequently in the circle of Louis Fourteenth, and enjoyed in different degrees his favor. M. de La Rochefoucauld and Madame de Sévigny were of the court. Le Brun, Rigaud, Mignard painted for the king. Perrault and Mansart constructed the Louvre and Versailles. The learned of all countries considered it an honor to correspond with the new academies founded in France. Louis Fourteenth was even less a man of letters or an artist than an administrator or a soldier. But literature and art, as well as the superintendents and the generals, found in him the king. The puissant unity of the reign is everywhere the same. The king and the nation are in harmony. Pascal, had he been born later, would have remained independent and proud, from the nature of his mind and of his character, as well as from the connection he had full early with Port-Royal, where they did not rear courtiers. He died, however, at thirty-nine in 1661, the very year in which Louis Fourteenth began to govern. Born at Clermont and Auvergne, educated at his father's and by his father, though it was not thought desirable to let him study mathematics, 
he had already discovered by himself the first thirty-two propositions of Euclid, when Cardinal Richelieu, holding on his knee little Jacqueline Pascal, and looking at her brother, said to Monsieur Pascal, the two children's father, who had come to thank him for a favour, quote, "'Take care of them. I mean to make something great of them.'" This was the native and powerful instinct of genius, divining genius. Richelieu, however, died three years later, without having done anything for the children who had impressed him, beyond giving their father a share in the superintendence of Rouen. He thus put them in the way of the great Corneille, who was affectionately kind to Jacqueline, but took no particular notice of Blaise Pascal. The latter was seventeen. He had already written his Traité des Coniques, or Treatise on Conics, and begun to occupy himself with, quote, his arithmetical machine, end quote, as his sister Madame Perrier calls it. At twenty-three he had ceased to apply his mind to human sciences. Quote, when he afterwards discovered the roulette, or cycloid, it was without thinking, says Madame Perrier, and to distract his attention from a severe toothache he had. End quote. He was not twenty-four when anxiety for his salvation and for the glory of God had taken complete possession of his soul. It was to the same end that he composed the Lettre Provinciale, the first of which was written in six days, and the style of which, clear, lively, precise, far removed from the somewhat solemn gravity of Port Royal, formed French prose as Malherbe and Boileau formed the poetry. This was the impression of his contemporaries, the most hard of them to please in the art of writing. Quote, that is excellent, that will be relished, said the recluses of Port Royal, in spite of the misgivings of M. Singlin. More than thirty years after Pascal's death, Madame de Sévigné, in 1689, wrote to Madame de Grignan, quote, Sometimes, to divert ourselves, we read the little letters to a provincial. Good heavens, how charming, and how my son reads them! I always think of my daughter, and how that excess of correctness of reasoning would suit her. But your brother says that you consider that it is always the same thing over again. Ah, oh, my goodness, so much the better! Could any one have a more perfect style, a raillery more refined, more natural, more delicate, worthier offspring of those dialogues of Plato which are so fine? And when after the first ten letters he addresses himself to the reverend Jesuit fathers, what earnestness, what solidity, what force, what eloquence, what love for God and for the truth! What a way of maintaining it and making it understood! I am sure that you have never read them but in a hurry, pitching on the pleasant places, but it is not so when they are read at leisure." End quote. Lord Macaulay once said to M. Guizot, quote, Amongst modern works I know only two perfect ones, to which there is no exception to be taken, and they are Pascal's Provincials and the letters of Madame de Sévigny. End quote. Boileau was of Lord Macaulay's opinion, at least as regarded Pascal. Quote, Corbinelli wrote to me the other day, says Madame de Sévigny, on the 15th of January, 1690. He gave me an account of a conversation and a dinner at M. de la Moignon's. The persons were the master and mistress of the house, M. de Troyes, M. de Toulon, Father Bourdaloue, a comrade of his, Despreaux, and Corbinelli. The talk was of ancient and modern works. Despreaux supported the ancient, with the exception of one single modern, which surpassed, in his opinion, both old and new. Bourdaloue's comrade, who assumed the well-read air, and who had fastened on to Despreaux and Corbinelli, asked him what in the world this book could be that was so remarkably clever. Despreaux would not give the name— Corbinelli said to him, Sir, I conjure you to tell me that I may read it all night. Despreaux answered, laughing, Ah, sir, you have read it more than once, I am sure. The Jesuit joins in with a disdainful air and presses Despreaux to name this marvellous writer. Do not press me, father, says Despreaux. The father persists. At last Despreaux takes hold of his arm and, squeezing it very hard, says, You will have it, father. Well, then he gad, it is Pascal. Pascal, says the father, all blushes and astonishment. Pascal is as beautiful as the false can be. False, replied Despreaux, false. Let me tell you that he is as true as he is inimitable. He has just been translated into three languages. The father rejoined, He is none the more true for that. Despreaux grew warm and shouted like a madman, Well, father, will you say that one of yours did not have it printed in one of his books that a Christian was not obliged to love God? Dare you say that that is false? Sir, said the father in a fury, we must distinguish— Distinguish, cried Despreaux, distinguish, egad, distinguish, distinguish whether we are obliged to love God. And taking Corbinelli by the arm, he flew off to the other end of the room, coming back again and rushing about like a lunatic, but he would not go near the father any more, and went off to join the rest of the company. Here end of the story, the curtain falls, end quote. Literary taste and religious sympathies combined, in the case of Boileau, to exalt Pascal. The provincials could not satisfy for long the pious ardour of Pascal's soul. 
he took in hand his great work on the Verité de la Religion. He had taken a vigorous part in the discussions of Port-Royal as to subscription of the formulary. His opinion was decidedly in favour of resistance. It was the moment when Messieurs Arnaud and Nicole had discovered a restriction, as it was then called, which allowed a subscribing with a safe conscience. Quote, Monsieur Pascal, who loved truth above all things, writes his niece Marguerite Perrier, who moreover was pulled down by a pain in the head which never left him, who had exerted himself to make them feel as he himself felt, and who had expressed himself very vigorously in spite of his weakness, was so grief-stricken that he had a fit and lost speech and consciousness. Everybody was alarmed, exertions were made to bring him round, and then those gentlemen withdrew. When he was quite recovered, Madame Perrier asked him what had caused this incident. He answered, When I saw all those persons that I looked upon as being those whom God had made to know the truth, and who ought to be its defenders, wavering and falling. I declare to you that I was so overcome with grief that I was unable to support it, and could not help breaking down. Blaise Pascal was the worthy brother of Jacqueline. In the former, as well as the latter, the soul was too ardent and too strong for its covering of body. Nearly all his relatives died young. Quote, I alone am left, wrote Mademoiselle Perrier when she had become exceptionally very aged. Quote, I might say, like Simon Maccabeus, the last of all his brethren, all my relatives and all my brethren are dead in the service of God and in the love of truth. I alone am left. Please God, I may never have a thought of backsliding. End quote. Pascal was unable to finish his work. Quote, God, who had inspired my brother with this design and with all his thoughts, writes his sister, did not permit him to bring it to its completion, for reasons to us unknown. End quote. The last years of Pascal's life, invalid as he had been from the age of eighteen, were one long and continual torture, accepted and supported with an austere disdain of suffering. Incapable of any application, he gave his attention solely to his salvation and the care of the poor. Quote, I have taken it into my head, says he, to have in the house a sick pauper, to whom the same service shall be rendered as to myself, particular attention to be paid to him, and in fact no difference to be made between him and me in order that I may have the consolation of knowing that there is one pauper as well treated as myself, in the perplexity I suffer from finding myself in the great affluence of every sort in which I do find myself." The spirit of M. de saint Cyran is there, and also the spirit of the gospel, which caused Pascal, when he was dying, to say, quote, I love poverty, because Jesus Christ loved it. I love wealth, because it gives the means of assisting the needy." End quote. A genius unique in the extent and variety of his faculties, which were applied with the same splendid results to mathematics and physics, to philosophy and polemics, disdaining all preconceived ideas, going unerringly and straightforwardly to the bottom of things with admirable force and profundity, independent and free even in his voluntary submission to the Christian faith, which he accepts with his eyes open, after having weighed it, measured it, and sounded it to its uttermost depths too steadfast and too simple not to bow his head before mysteries, all the while acknowledging his ignorance. Quote, if there were no darkness, says he, man would not feel his corruption. If there were no light, man would have no hope of remedy. Thus it is not only quite right, but useful for us that God should be concealed in part, and revealed in part, since it is equally dangerous for man to know God without knowing his own misery, and to know his own misery without knowing God. End quote. The lights of this great intellect had led him to acquiesce in his own fogs. Quote, One can be quite sure that there is a God without knowing what he is, says he. In 1627, four years after Pascal, and like him in a family of the long robe, was born at Dijon his only rival in that great art of writing prose which established the superiority of the French language. At sixteen, Bossuet preached his first sermon in the drawing-room of Madame de Rambouillet, and the great Condé was pleased to attend his theological examinations. He was already famous at court as a preacher and a polemist, when the king gave him the title of Bishop of Condon, almost immediately inviting him to become preceptor to the Dauphin. A difficult and an irksome task for him who had already written for Turenne an exposition of the Catholic faith, and had delivered the funeral orations over Madame Henriette and the Queen of England. Quote, the king has greatly at heart the Dauphin's education, wrote Father Lacou to Colbert. He regards it as one of his grand state strokes in respect of the future. End quote. The Dauphin was not devoid of intelligence. Quote, Monseigneur has plenty of wits, said Councillor Le Goût de saint seine in his private journal, but his wits are under a bushel. End quote. The boy was indolent, with little inclination for work, roughly treated by his governor, the Duke of Montausier, who was endowed with more virtue than ability in the superintendence of a prince's education. Quote, oh, cried Monseigneur when official announcement was made to him of the project of marriage which the king was conducting for him with the Princess Christine of Bavaria. 
We shall see whether M. Huet, or afterwards Bishop of Avranches, will want to make me learn ancient geography any more. Bossuet had better understood what ought to be the aim of a king's education. Quote, Remember, Monseigneur, he constantly repeated to him, that destined as you are to reign some day over this great kingdom, you are bound to make it happy. End quote. He was in despair at his pupil's inattention. Quote, there is a great deal to endure with a mind so destitute of application, he wrote to Marshal Belfond. There is no perceptible relief, and we go on, as St. Paul says, hoping against hope. End quote. He had written a little treatise on inattention, de incogitantia, in the vain hope of thus rousing his pupil to work. Quote, I dread nothing in the world so much, Louis the Fourteenth would say, as to have a sluggard or fainéant dauphin. I would much prefer to have no son at all. End quote. Bossuet foresaw the innumerable obstacles in the way of his labors. Quote, I perceive, as I think, he wrote to his friends, in the Dauphin the beginnings of great graces, a simplicity, a straightforwardness, a principle of goodness, an attention, amidst all his flightiness, to the mysteries, a something or other which comes with a flash, in the middle of his distractions, to call him back to God. You would be charmed if I were to tell you the questions he puts to me, and the desire he shows to be a good servant of God. But the world, the world, the world, pleasures, evil counsels, evil examples, save us, Lord, save us. Thou didst verily preserve the children from the furnace, but thou didst send thine angel. And as for me, alas, what am I? Humility, trepidation, absorption into one's own nothingness. End quote. It was not for Bossuet that the honor was reserved of succeeding in the difficult task of a royal education. Fenelon encountered in the Duke of Burgundy a more undisciplined nature, a more violent character, and more dangerous tendencies than Bossuet had to fight against in the Grand Dauphin. But there was a richer mind and a warmer heart. The preceptor, too, was more proper for the work. Bossuet, nevertheless, labored conscientiously to instruct his little prince, studying for him and with him the classical authors, preparing grammatical expositions, and lastly writing for his edification the Traité de la Connaissance de Dieu et de Soi-même, or Treatise on the Knowledge of God and of Self. The Discours sur l'Histoire Universelle, or Discourse on Universal History, and the Politique tirée de l'Écriture Sainte, or Polity derived from Holy Writ. The labor was in vain. The very loftiness of his genius, the extent and profundity of his views, rendered Bossuet unfit to get at the heart and mind of a boy who was timid, idle, and kept in fear by the king as well as by his governor. The Dauphin was nineteen when his marriage restored Bossuet to the church and to the world. The king appointed him almoner to the Dauphiness, and before long Bishop of Meaux. Neither the assembly of the clergy and the part he played therein, nor his frequent preachings at court, diverted Bossuet from his duties as bishop. He habitually resided at Meaux, in the midst of his priests. The greater number of his sermons, written at first in fragments, collected from memory in their aggregate, and repeated frequently with divergences in wording and development, were preached in the cathedral of Meaux. The Dauphin sometimes went thither to see him. Quote, Pray, sir, he had said to him in his childhood, take great care of me whilst I am little. I will of you when I am big. End quote. Assured of his righteousness as a priest and his fine tact as a man, the king appealed to Bossuet in the delicate conjunctures of his life. It is related that it was the Bishop of Meaux who dissuaded him from making public his marriage with Madame de Maintenon. She, more anxious for power than splendor, did not bear him any ill will for it. Amidst the various leanings of the court, divided as it was between Jansenism and Quietism, it was to the simple teaching of the Catholic Church, represented by Bossuet, that she remained practically attached. Right-minded and strong-minded, but a little cold-hearted, Madame de Maintenon could not suffer herself to be led away by the sublime excesses of the Jansenists, or the pious reveries of Madame Guillon. The Jesuits had influence over her, without her being a slave to them, and that influence increased after the death of Bossuet. The guidance of the Bishop of Meaux, in fact, answered the requirements of spirits that were pious and earnest without enthusiasm. Less ardent in faith and less absolute in religious practice than M. de Saint-Cyran and Port-Royal, less exacting in his demands than Father Bourdaloue, susceptible now and then of mystic ideas, as is proved by his letters to Sister Corneau. He did not let himself be won by the vague ecstasies of absolute or pure love. He had a mind large enough to say, like Mother Angelica Arnaud, quote, I am of all saints' order, and all saints are of my order, end quote. But his preferences always inclined towards those saints and learned doctors who had not carried any religious tendency to excess, and who had known how to rest content with the spirit of a rule and a faith that were practical. A wonderful genius, discovering by flashes and as if by instinct the most profound truths of human nature, and giving them expression in an incomparable style, forcing, straining the language to make it render his idea 
darting at one bound to the sublimest height by use of the simplest terms which he so to speak bore away with him wresting them from their natural and proper signification Quote, there in spite of that great heart of hers is that princess so admired and so beloved there such as death has made her for us End quote. Bossuet alone could speak like that End of section 66. Section 67 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. The Slippervox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 48. Louis XIV. Literature and Art. Part 2. He was writing incessantly, all the while that he was preaching at Meaux and at Paris, making funeral orations over the Queen, Maria Theresa, over the Princess Palatine, Michael Le Tellier, and the Prince of Condé. The Edict of Nantes had just been revoked. Controversy with the Protestant ministers, headed by Claude and Jurieu, occupied a great space in the life of the Bishop of Meaux. He at that time wrote his Histoire des Variations, often unjust and violent, always able in its attacks upon the Reformation. He did not import any zeal into persecution, though all the while admitting unreservedly the doctrines universally propagated amongst Catholics. Quote, I declare, he wrote to M. de Baville, that I am and have always been of opinion, first, that princes may by penal laws constrain all heretics to conform to the profession and practices of the Catholic Church. Secondly, that this doctrine ought to be held invariable in the Church, which has not only conformed to, but has even demanded similar ordinances from princes. End quote. He at the same time opposed the constraint put upon the new converts to oblige them to go to Mass without requiring from them any other act of religion. Quote, when the emperors imposed a like obligation on the Donatists, he wrote to the Bishop of Mirepoix, it was on the supposition that they were converted or would be but the heretics at the present time, who declare themselves by not fulfilling their Easter, or communicating, ought to be rather hindered from assisting at the mysteries that constrained thereto, and the more so in that it appears to be a consequence thereof, to constrain them likewise to fulfill their Easter, which is expressly to give occasion for frightful sacrilege. They might be constrained to undergo instruction, but so far as I can learn, that would hardly advance matters, and I think that we must be reduced to three things— one is to oblige them to send their children to the schools, or in default, to find means of taking them out of their hands. Another is to be firm as regards marriages, and the last is to take great pains to become privately acquainted with those of whom there are good hopes, and to procure for them solid instruction and veritable enlightenment. The rest must be left to time and to the grace of God. I know of nothing else. End quote. About the same time, Fenelon engaged upon the missions in Poitou, being as much convinced as the Bishop of Meaux of a sovereign's rights over the conscience of the faithful, as well as of the terrible danger of hypocrisy, wrote to Bossuet, telling him that he had demanded the withdrawal of the troops in all the districts he was visiting. Quote, it is no light matter to change the sentiments of a whole people. What difficulty must the apostles have found in changing the face of the universe, overcoming all passions, and establishing a doctrine till then unheard of, seeing that we cannot persuade the ignorant by clear and express passages which they read every day in favor of the religion of their ancestors, and that the king's own authority stirs up every passion to render persuasion more easy for us. The remnants of this sect go on sinking little by little, as regards all exterior observance, into a religious indifference which cannot but cause fear and trembling. If one wanted to make them abjure Christianity and follow the Koran, there would be nothing required but to show them the dragoons, Provided that they assemble by night and withstand all instruction, they consider that they have done enough. End quote. Cardinal Noailles was of the same mind as Bossuet and Fenelon. Quote, the king will be pained to decide against your opinion as regards the new converts, says a letter to him from Madame de Maintenon. Meanwhile, the most general is to force them to attend at Mass. Your opinion seems to be a condemnation of all that has been hitherto done against these poor creatures. It is not pleasant to hark back so far and it has always been supposed that in any case they must have a religion. End quote. In vain were liberty of conscience and its inviolable rights still misunderstood by the noblest spirits. The sincerity and high-mindedness of the great bishops instinctively revolted against the hypocrisy engendered of persecution. The tacit assuagement of the severities against the reformers between 1688 and 1700 was the fruit of the representations of Bossuet, Fenelon, and Cardinal Noailles. Madame de Maintenon wrote at that date to one of her relatives, quote, 
You are converted. Do not meddle in the conversion of others. I confess to you that I do not like the idea of answering before God and the king for all those conversions. End quote. At the same time with the controversial treatises, the Elevation sur les Mystères and the Meditation sur l'Évangile were written at Meaux, drawing the bishop away to the serener regions of supreme faith. There might he have chanced to meet those reformers as determined as he in the strife, as attached at bottom as he for life and death to the mysteries and to the lights of a common hope. Quote, when God shall give us grace to enter paradise, St. Bernard used to say, we shall be above all astonished at not finding some of those whom we had thought to meet there, and at finding others whom we did not expect. End quote. Bossuet had a moment's glimpse of this higher truth. In concert with Leibniz, a great intellect of more range and knowledge and less steadfastness than he in religious faith, he tried to reconcile the Catholic and Protestant communions in one and the same creed. There were insurmountable difficulties on both sides. The attempt remained unsuccessful. The Bishop of Meaux had lately triumphed in the matter of quietism, breaking the ties of old friendship with Fenelon, and more concerned about defending sound doctrine in the church than fearful of hurting his friend, who was sincere and modest in his relations with him, and humbly submissive to the decrees of the court of Rome. The Archbishop of Cambrai was in exile at his own diocese. Bossuet was ill at Meaux, still, however, at work, going deeper every day into that profound study of holy writ and of the fathers of the church which shines forth in all his writings. He had stoned and suffered agonies, but would not permit an operation. On his deathbed, surrounded by his nephews and his vicars, he rejected with disdain all eulogies on his episcopal life. Quote, Speak to me of necessary truths, said he, preserving to the last the simplicity of a great and strong mind, accustomed to turn from appearances and secondary doctrines to embrace the mighty realities of time and of eternity. He died at Paris on the 12th of April, 1704, just when the troubles of the church were springing up again. Great was the consternation amongst the bishops of France, wont as they were to shape themselves by his counsels. Quote, Men were astounded at this mortal's mortality. End quote. Bossuet was seventy-three. A month later, on the 13th of May, Father Bourdaloue in his turn died, a model of close logic and moral austerity, with a stiff and manly eloquence, so impressed with the miserable insufficiency of human efforts, that he said as he was dying, quote, My God, I have wasted life, it is just that thou recall it, end quote. There remained only Fenelon in the first rank, which Massillon did not as yet dispute with him. Malbranche was living retired in his cell at the oratory, seldom speaking, writing his Recherches sur la Vérité, or Researches into Truth, and his Entretien sur la Métaphysique, or Discourses on Metaphysics, bolder in thought than he was aware of or wished, sincere and natural in his meditations as well as in his style. In spite of Fléchier's eloquence in certain funeral orations, posterity has decided against the modesty of the Archbishop of Cambrai, who said at the death of the Bishop of Nîmes in 1710, quote, We have lost our master. End quote. In his retirement or his exile, after Bossuet's death, it was around Fenelon that was concentrated all the lustre of the French episcopate, long since restored to the respect and admiration it deserved. Fenelon was born in Perigord, at the castle of Fenelon, on the 6th of August, 1651. Like Cardinal Retz, he belonged to an ancient and noble house, and was destined from his youth for the church. Brought up at the seminary of St. Sulpice, lately founded by M. Ollier, he for a short time conceived the idea of devoting himself to foreign missions. His weak health and his family's opposition turned him ere long from his purpose, but the preaching of the gospel amongst the heathen continued to have for him an attraction which is perfectly depicted in one of the rare sermons of his which have been preserved. He had held himself modestly aloof, occupied with confirming new Catholics in their conversion or with preaching to the Protestants of Poitou. He had written nothing but his Traité de l'Éducation des Filles, intended for the family of the Duke of Beauvilliers, and a book on the Ministère du Pasteur. He was in bad order with Arlet, Archbishop of Paris, who had said to him curtly one day, quote, You want to escape notice, Monsieur Abbé, and you will. End quote. Nevertheless, when Louis the Fourteenth chose the Duke of Beauvilliers as governor to his grandson, the Duke of Burgundy, the Duke at once called Fenelon, then thirty-eight years of age, to the important post of preceptor. Whereas the Grand Dauphin, endowed with ordinary intelligence, was indolent and feeble, his son was, in the same proportion, violent, fiery, indomitable. Quote, the Duke of Burgundy, says Saint-Simon, was a born demon, or naqui terrible, and in his early youth caused fear and trembling. Harsh, passionate, even to the last degree of rage against inanimate things, 
madly impetuous, unable to bear the least opposition, even from the hours and the elements, without flying into furies enough to make you fear that everything inside him would burst, obstinate to excess, passionately fond of all pleasures, of good living, of the chase madly, of music with a sort of transport, and of play, too, in which he could not bear to lose, often ferocious, naturally inclined to cruelty, savage in raillery, taking off absurdities with the patness which was killing. From the height of the clouds he regarded men as but atoms to whom he bore no resemblance, whoever they might be. Barely did the princes his brothers appear to him intermediary between himself and the human race, although there had always been an affectation of bringing them all three up in perfect equality. Wits, penetration, flashed from every part of him, even in his transports. His repartee were astounding. His replies always went to the point and deep down, even in his mad fits. He made child's play of the most abstract sciences. The extent and vivacity of his wits were prodigious, and hindered him from applying himself to one thing at a time, so far as to render him incapable of it." As a sincere Christian and a priest, Fenelon saw from the first that religion alone could triumph over this terrible nature. The Duke of Beauvilliers, as sincere and as Christianly as he, without much wits, modestly allowed himself to be led, all the motives that act most powerfully on a generous spirit, honor, confidence, fear, and love of God, were employed one after the other to bring the prince into self-subjection. He was but eight years old, and Fenelon had been only a few months with him when the child put into his hands one day the following engagement. Quote, I promise M. l'abbé de Fenelon, on the honor of a prince, to do at once whatever he bids me, and to obey him the instant he orders me anything, and if I fail to, I will submit to any kind of punishment and disgrace. Done at Versailles, the 29th of November, 1689. Signed, Louis. End quote. The child, however, would forget himself, and relapse into his mad fits. When his preceptor was chiding him one day for a grave fault, he went so far as to say, quote, No, no, sir, I know who I am, and what you are. End quote. Fenelon made no reply. Coldly and gravely he allowed the day to close, and the night to pass without showing his pupil any sign of either resentment or affection. Next day the Duke of Burgundy was scarcely awake when his preceptor entered the room. Quote, I do not know, sir, said he, whether you remember what you said to me yesterday, that you know what you are and what I am. It is my duty to teach you that you do not know either one or the other. You fancy yourself, sir, to be more than I. Some lackeys, no doubt, have told you so, but I am not afraid to tell you, since you force me to it, that I am more than you. You have sense enough to understand that there is no question here of birth. You would consider anybody out of his wits who pretended to make a merit of it that the rain of heaven had fertilized his crops without moistening his neighbors. You would be no wiser if you were disposed to be vain of your birth, which adds nothing to your personal merit. You cannot doubt that I am above you in lights and knowledge. You know nothing but what I have taught you, and what I have taught you is nothing compared with what I might still teach you. As for authority, you have none over me, and I, on the contrary, have it fully and entirely over you." The king and Monseigneur have told you so often enough. You fancy, perhaps, that I think myself very fortunate to hold the office I discharge towards you. Disabuse yourself once more, sir. I only took it in order to obey the king, and give pleasure to Monseigneur, and not at all for the painful privilege of being your preceptor. And that you may have no doubt about it, I am going to take you to his majesty, and beg him to get you another one, whose pains I hope may be more successful than mine." End quote. The Duke of Burgundy's passion was past, and he burst into sobs. Quote, ah, sir, he cried, I am in despair at what took place yesterday. If you speak to the king, you will lose me his affection. If you leave me, what will be thought of me? I promise you, I promise you, that you shall be satisfied with me. But promise me. End quote. Fenelon promised nothing. He remained, and the foundation of his authority was laid forever in the soul of his pupil. The young prince did not forget what he was, but he had felt the superiority of his master. Quote, I leave the Duke of Burgundy behind the door, he was accustomed to say, and with you I am only little Louis. End quote. God, at the same time with Fenelon, had taken possession of the Duke of Burgundy's soul. Quote, After his first communion, we saw disappearing little by little all the faults which in his infancy caused us great misgivings as to the future, writes Madame de Maintenon. His piety has caused such a metamorphosis that, from the passionate thing he was, he has become self-restrained, gentle, complacent. One would say that that was his character, and that virtue was natural to him. Quote, All his mad fits and spites yielded at the bare name of God, Fenelon used to say. One day, when he was in a very bad temper and wanted to hide in his passion what he had done in his disobedience, I pressed him to tell me the truth before God. Then he put himself into a great rage and bawled, Why ask me before God? 
Very well, then, as you ask me in what way, I cannot deny that I committed that fault. He was, as it were, beside himself with excess of rage, and yet religion had such dominion over him that it wrung from him so painful an avowal. Quote, from this abyss, writes the Duke of Saint-Simon, came forth a prince affable, gentle, humane, self-restrained, patient, modest, humble, and austere towards himself, wholly devoted to his obligations, and feeling them to be immense. He thought of nothing but combining the duties of a son and a subject with those to which he saw himself destined. End quote. Quote, from this abyss, end quote, came forth also a prince singularly well informed, fond of study, with a refined taste in literature, with a passion for science. For his instruction, Fenelon made use of the great works composed for his father's education by Bossuet, adding thereto writings more suitable for his age. For him he composed the Fable and the Dialogue des Morts, and a Histoire de Charlemagne, which has perished. In his stories, even those that were imaginary, he paid attention before everything to truth. Quote, Better leave a history in all its dryness than enliven it at the expense of truth, he would say. The suppleness and richness of his mind sufficed to save him from wearisomeness. The liveliness of his literary impressions communicated itself to his pupil. Quote, I have seen, says Fenelon in his letter to the French Academy, I have seen a young prince but eight years old overcome with grief at the sight of the peril of little Josh. I have seen him lose patience with the chief priest for concealing from Josh his name and his birth. I have seen him weeping bitterly as he listened to these verses. O miseram eridicin anima fugiente vocabat, eridicin toto ferebant flumine ripei. The soul and mind of Fenelon were sympathetic. Bossuet, in writing for the Grand Dauphin, was responsive to the requirements of his own mind, never to those of the boys with whose education he had been entrusted. Fenelon also wrote Télémaque, quote, It is a fabulous narrative, he himself says, in the form of an heroic poem, like Homer's or Virgil's, wherein I have set forth the principal actions that are meet for a prince whose birth points him out as destined to reign. I did it at a time when I was charmed with the marks of confidence and kindness showered upon me by the king. I must have been not only the most ungrateful, but the most insensate of men to have intended to put into it satirical and insolent portraits. I shrink from the bare idea of such a design. It is true that I have inserted in these adventures all the verities necessary for government and all the defects that one can show in the exercise of sovereign power, but I have not stamped any of them with a peculiarity which would point to any portrait or caricature. The more the work is read, the more it will be seen that I wish to express everything without depicting anybody consecutively. It is, in fact, a narrative done in haste, in detached pieces and at different intervals. All I thought of was to amuse the Duke of Burgundy and whilst amusing, to instruct him, without ever meaning to give the work to the public. Telemaque was published, without any author's name and by an indiscretion of the copyists, on the 6th of April, 1699. Fenelon was in exile at his diocese. Public rumor before long attributed the work to him. The Maxime des Saints had just been condemned. Telemaque was seized. The printers were punished. Some copies had escaped the police. The book was reprinted in Holland. All Europe read it, finding therein the illusions and undermeanings against which Fenelon defended himself. Louis the Fourteenth was more than ever angry with the archbishop. Quote, I cannot forgive M. de Cambrai for having composed the Telemaque, Madame de Maintenon would say. Fenelon's disgrace, begun by the Maxime des Saints touching absolute or pure love, was confirmed by his ideal picture of kingly power. Chimerical in his theories of government, high-flown in his pious doctrines, Fenelon, in the conduct of his life as well as in his practical directions to his friends, showed a wisdom, a prudence, a tact which singularly belied the free speculations of his mind or his heart. He preserved silence amid the commendations and criticisms of the Telemaque. Quote, I have no need and no desire to change my position, he would say. I am beginning to be old, and I am infirm. There is no occasion for my friends to ever commit themselves, or to take any doubtful step on my account. I never sought out the court. I was sent forth thither. I stayed there nearly ten years without obtruding myself, without taking a single step on my own behalf, without asking the smallest favor, without meddling in any matter, and confining myself to answering conscientiously in all matters about which I was spoken to. I was dismissed. All I have to do is to remain at peace in my own place. I doubt not that besides the matter of my condemned work, the policy of Telemaque was employed against me upon the king's mind, but I must suffer and hold my tongue. End, quote. End of section 67section 68 of a popular history of france volume 5 the slibervox recording is in the public domain 
A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter 48 Louis the Fourteenth, Literature and Art, Part 3 Every tongue was held within range of King Louis the Fourteenth. It was only on the 22nd of December, 1701, four years after Fenelon's departure, that the Duke of Burgundy thought he might write to him in the greatest secrecy, quote, at last, my dear Archbishop, I find a favorable opportunity of breaking the silence I have kept for four years. I have suffered many troubles since, but one of the greatest has been that of being unable to show you what my feelings towards you were during that time, and that my affection increased with your misfortunes, instead of being chilled by them. I think with real pleasure on the time when I shall be able to see you again, but I fear that this time is still a long way off. It must be left to the will of God, from whose mercy I am always receiving new graces." I have been many times unfaithful to him since I saw you, but he has always done me the grace of recalling me to him, and I have not, thank God, been deaf to his voice. I continue to study all alone, although I have not been doing so in the regular way for the last two years, and I like it more than ever. But nothing gives me more pleasure than metaphysics and ethics, and I am never tired of working at them. I have done some little pieces myself, which I should very much like to be in a position to send you, that you might correct them as you used to do my themes in old times." I shall not tell you here how my feelings revolted against all that has been done in your case, but we must submit to the will of God, and believe that all has happened for our good. Farewell, my dear Archbishop. I embrace you with all my heart. I ask your prayers and your blessing. Louis. Quote, I speak to you of God and yourself only, answered Fenelon in a letter full of wise and tender counsels. It is no question of me. Thank God I have a heart at ease. My heaviest cross is that I do not see you, but I constantly present you before God in closer presence than that of the senses. I would give a thousand lives like a drop of water to see you such as God would have you. End quote. Next year, in 1702, the king gave the Duke of Burgundy the command of the army in Flanders. He wrote to Fenelon, quote, I cannot feel myself so near you without testifying my joy thereat, and at the same time, that which is caused by the king's permission to call upon you on my way. He has, however, imposed the condition that I must not see you in private. I shall obey this order, and yet I shall be able to talk to you as much as I please, for I shall have with me Saumery, who will make the third at our first interview after five years' separation. End quote. The archbishop was preparing to leave Cambrai so as not to be in the prince's way. He now remained, only seeing the Duke of Burgundy, however, in the presence of several witnesses. When he presented him with his table-napkin at supper, the prince raised his voice, and turning to his old master, said, with a touching reminiscence of his childhood's passions, quote, I know what I owe you, you know what I am to you, end quote. The correspondence continued, with confidence and deference on the part of the prince, with tender, sympathetic, far-sighted, paternal interest on the part of the archbishop, more and more concerned for the perils and temptations to which the prince was exposed, in proportion as he saw him nearer to the throne, and more exposed to the incense of the world. Quote, the right thing is to become the counsel of his majesty, he wrote to him on the death of the Grand Dauphin, the father of the people, the comfort of the afflicted, the defender of the church. The right thing is to keep flatterers aloof and distrust them, to distinguish merit, seek it out and anticipate it, to listen to everything, believe nothing without proof, and being placed above all, to rise superior to every one. The right thing is to desire to be father and not master. The right thing is not that all should be for one, but that one should be for all, to secure their happiness. End quote. A solemn and touching picture of an absolute monarch submitting to God and seeking his will alone. Fenelon had early imbued his pupil with the spirit of it, and the pupil appeared on the point of realizing it, but God at a single blow destroyed all these fair hopes. Quote, all my ties are broken, said Fenelon. I live but on affection, and of affection I shall die. We shall recover ere long that which we have not lost. We approach it every day with rapid strides. Yet a little while, and there will be no more cause for tears. End quote. A week later he was dead, leaving amongst his friends, so diminished already by death, an immeasurable gap, and amongst his adversaries themselves the feeling of a great loss. Quote, I am sorry for the death of Monsieur de Cambrai wrote Madame de Maintenon on the 10th of January, 1715. He was a friend I lost through quietism, but it is asserted that he might have done good service in the council if things should be pushed so far. End quote. Fenelon had not been mistaken when he wrote once upon a time to Madame de Maintenon, who consulted him about her defects, quote, You are good towards those for whom you have liking and esteem, but you are cold so soon as the liking leaves you. When you are frigid, your frigidity is carried rather far, and when you begin to feel mistrust, your heart is withdrawn too brusquely from those to whom you had shown confidence. 
Fenelon had never shown any literary prepossessions. He wrote for his friends or for the Duke of Burgundy, lavishing the treasures of his mind and spirit upon his letters of spiritual guidance, composing, in order to convince the Duke of Orléans, his Traité de l'Existence de Dieu, indifferent as to the preservation of the sermons he preached every Sunday, paying more attention to the plans of government he addressed to the young Dauphin than to the publication of his works. Several were not collected until after his death. In delivering their eulogy of him at the French Academy, neither M. de Bose, who succeeded him, nor M. Dacier, director of the Academy, dared to mention the name of Télémaque, clever or spirituel, quote, to an alarming extent, end quote, or faire part, in the minutest detail of his writings, rich, copious, harmonious, but not without tendencies to lengthiness, the style of Fenelon is the reflex of his character. Sometimes a little subtle and covert, like the prelate's mind, it hits and penetrates without any flash, or éclat, and without dealing heavy blows. Quote, Graces flowed from his lips, said Chancellor D'Aguesseau, and he seemed to treat the greatest subjects as if, so to speak, they were child's play to him. The smallest grew to nobleness beneath his pen, and he would have made flowers grow in the midst of thorns. A noble singularity, pervading his whole person, and a something sublime in his very simplicity, added to his characteristics a certain prophet-like air. Always original, always creative, he imitated nobody, and himself appeared inimitable. His last act was to write a letter to Father Le Tellier to be communicated to the king. Quote, I have just received extreme unction, that is, the state, reverend father, when I am preparing to appear before God, in which I pray you with instance to represent to the king my true sentiments. I have never felt anything but docility towards the church and horror at the innovations which have been imputed to me. I accepted the condemnation of my book in the most absolute simplicity. I have never been a single moment in my life without feeling towards the king personally the most lively gratitude, the most genuine zeal, the most profound respect, and the most inviolable attachment. I take the liberty of asking of his majesty two favors, which do not concern either my own person or anybody belonging to me. The first is that he will have the goodness to give me a pious and methodical successor, sound and firm against Jansenism, which is in prodigious credit on this frontier. The other favor is that he will have the goodness to complete with my successor that which could not be completed with me on behalf of the gentlemen of St. Sulpice. I wish His Majesty a long life, of which the Church as well as the State has infinite need. If peradventure I go into the presence of God, I shall often ask these favors of him." How dread is the power of sovereign majesty, operative even at the deathbed of the greatest and noblest spirits, causing Fenelon in his dying hour to be anxious about the good graces of a monarch ere long like him a dying. Our thoughts may well linger over those three great minds, Pascal, Bossuet, and Fenelon, one layman and two bishops, all equally absorbed by the great problems of human life and immortality. With different degrees of greatness and fruitfulness, they all serve the same cause. Whether as defenders or assailants of Jansenism and Quietism, the solitary philosopher or the prelates engaged in the court or in the guidance of men, all three of them serving God on behalf of the soul's highest interests, remained unique in their generation and without successors as they had been without predecessors. Leaving the desert and the church, and once more entering the world, we immediately encounter amongst women one and one only in the first rank, Marie de Rabutin Chantal, Marchioness of Sévigny, born at Paris on the 5th of February, 1627, five months before Bossuet. Like a considerable number of women in Italy in the 16th century, and in France in the 17th, she had received a careful education. She knew Italian, Latin, and Spanish. She had for masters Manage and Chaplain and she early imbibed a real taste for solid reading, which she owed to her leaning towards the Jansenists and Port Royal. She was left a widow at five-and-twenty by the death of a very indifferent husband, and she was not disposed to make a second venture. Before getting killed in a duel, M. de Sévigny had made a considerable gap in the property of his wife, who, however, had brought him more than five hundred thousand livres. Madame de Sévigny had two children. She made up her mind to devote herself to their education, to restore their fortune, and to keep her love for them and for her friends. Of them she had many, often very deeply smitten with her. All remained faithful to her, and she deserted none of them, though they might be put on trial and condemned like Fouquet, or perfidious and cruel like her cousin, M. de bussy Rabutin. The safest and most agreeable of acquaintances, ever ready to take part in the joys as well as the anxieties of those whom she honoured with her friendship, without permitting this somewhat superficial sympathy to agitate the depths of her heart, she had during her life but one veritable passion, which she admitted nobody to share with her. 
her daughter, Madame de Grignan, the prettiest girl in France, clever, virtuous, business-like, appears in her mother's letters fitful, cross-grained, and sometimes rather cold. Madame de Sévigny is a friend whom we read over and over again, whose emotions we share, to whom we go for an hour's distraction and delightful chat. We have no desire to chat with Madame de Grignan. We gladly leave her to her mother's exclusive affection, feeling infinitely obliged to her, however, for having existed, inasmuch as her mother wrote letters to her. Madame de Sévigny's letters to her daughter are superior to all her other letters, charming as they are. When she writes to M. de Pomponne, to M. de Coulanges, to M. de Bussy, the style is less familiar, the heart less open, the soul less stirred. She writes to her daughter as she would speak to her. It is not letters, it is an animated and charming conversation, touching upon everything, embellishing everything with an inimitable grace. She gave her daughter in marriage to Count de Grignan in January 1669. Next year her son-in-law was appointed lieutenant-general of the king in Provence. He was to fill the place there of the Duke of Vendôme, too young to discharge his functions as governor. In the month of January 1671, Monsieur de Grignan removed his wife to Esch. He was a Provençal, he was fond of his province, his castle of Grignan, and his wife. Madame de Sévigny found herself condemned to separation from the daughter whom she loved exclusively. Quote, In vain I seek my darling daughter, I can no longer find her, and every step she takes removes her father from me. I went to St. Mary's, still weeping and still dying of grief. It seemed as if my heart and my soul were being wrenched from me, and in truth, what a cruel separation! I asked leave to be alone. I was taken into Madame de Yosset's room, and they made me up a fire. Agnes sat looking at me without speaking. That was our bargain. I stayed there till five o'clock, without ceasing to sob. All my thoughts were mortal wounds to me. I wrote to M. de Grignan, you can imagine in what key. Then I went to Madame de Lafayette's, who redoubled my griefs by the interest she took in them. She was alone, ill and distressed at the death of one of the nuns. She was just as I could have desired. I returned hither at eight, but when I came in, oh, can you conceive what I felt as I mounted these stairs, that room into which I used always to go, alas? I found the doors of it open, but I saw everything disfurnished, everything disarranged, and your little daughter who reminded me of mine. The wakenings of the night were dreadful. I think of you continuously. It is what devotee call an habitual thought, such as one should have of God, if one did one's duty. Nothing gives me any distraction. I see that carriage which is forever going on and will never come near me. I am forever on the highways. It seems as if I were afraid sometimes that the carriage will upset with me. The rains there have been for the last three days reduce me to despair. The Rhone causes me strange alarm. I have a map before my eyes. I know all the places where you sleep. This evening you are at Nevers. On Sunday you will be at Lyon where you will receive this letter. I have received only two of yours. Perhaps a third will come. That is the only comfort I desire. As for others, I seek for none. End quote. During five and twenty years, Madame de Sévigny could never become accustomed to her daughter's absence. She set out for the Rocher, near Vitry, a family estate of M. de Sévigny's. Her friend, the Duke of Chaulnes, was governor of Brittany. Quote, you shall now have news of our states as your penalty for being a Breton. M. de Chaulne arrived on Sunday evening to the sound of everything that can make any in Vitry. On Monday morning he sent me a letter. I wrote back to say that I would go and dine with him. There are two dining tables in the same room, fourteen covers at each table. Monsieur presides at one, Madame at the other. The good cheer is prodigious. Joints are carried away quite untouched, and as for the pyramids of fruit, the doors require to be heightened. Our fathers did not foresee this sort of machine. Indeed, they did not even foresee that a door required to be higher than themselves. Well, a pyramid wants to come in, one of those pyramids which make everybody exclaim from one end of the table to the other. But so far from that boding damage, people are often, on the contrary, very glad not to see any more of what they contain. This pyramid, then, with twenty or thirty porcelain dishes, was so completely upset at the door that the noise it made put to silence the violins, haute bois, and trumpets. After dinner, M. de Locmaria and M. de Coeclogon danced with two fair Bretons some marvellous jigs, or passe and some minuets in a style that the court people cannot approach, wherein they do the bohemian and Breton step with a neatness and correctness which are charming. I was thinking all the while of you, and I had such tender recollections of your dancing and of what I had seen you dance, that this pleasure became a pain to me. The states are sure not to be long. There is nothing to do but to ask for what the king wants. Nobody says a word, and it is all done." As for the governor, he finds, somehow or other, more than forty thousand crowns coming in to him. 
an infinity of presents, pensions, repairs of roads and towns, fifteen or twenty grand dinner-parties, incessant play, eternal balls, comedies three times a week, a great show of dress, that is the state's. I am forgetting three or four hundred pipes of wine which are drunk, but if I did not reckon this little item, the others do not forget it and put it first. This is what is called the sort of twaddle to make one go to sleep on one's feet, but it is what comes to the tip of your pen when you are in Brittany and have nothing else to say." Even in Brittany and at the Rocher, Madame de Sévigny always has something to say. The weather is frightful. She is occupied a good deal in reading the romances of La Calprenède and the Grand Cyrus, as well as the ethics of Nicole. Quote, For four days it has been one continuous tempest. All our walks are drowned. There is no getting out any more. Our masons, our carpenters keep their rooms. In short, I hate this country, and I yearn every moment for your son. Perhaps you yearn for my reign. We do well, both of us. I am going on with the ethics of Nicole, which I find delightful. It has not yet given me any lesson against the rain, but I am expecting it, for I find everything there, and conformity to the will of God might answer my purpose if I did not want a specific remedy. In fact, I consider this an admirable book. Nobody has written as these gentlemen have, for I put down to Pascal half of all that is beautiful. It is so nice to have one's self and one's feelings talked about, that though it be in bad part, one is charmed by it. What is called searching the depths of the heart with a lantern is exactly what he does. He discloses to us that which we feel every day, but have not the wit to discern or the sincerity to avow. I have even forgiven the swelling in the heart, or l'enfleur du cœur, for the sake of the rest, and I maintain that there is no other word to express vanity and pride, which are really wind. Try and find another word. I shall complete the reading of this with pleasure. Here we have the real Madame de Sévigny, whom we love, on whom we rely, who is as earnest as she is amiable and gay, who goes to the very core of things, and who tells the truth of herself as well as of others. Quote, you ask me, my dear child, whether I continue to be really fond of life. I confess to you that I find poignant sorrows in it, but I am even more disgusted with death. I feel so wretched at having to end all this thereby, that if I could turn back again, I would ask for nothing better. I find myself under an obligation which perplexes me. I embarked upon life without my consent, and I must go out of it but that overwhelms me. And how shall I go? Which way? By what door? When will it be? In what condition? Shall I suffer a thousand thousand pains, which will make me die desperate? Shall I have brain fever? Shall I die of an accident? How shall I be with God? What shall I have to show Him? Shall fear, shall necessity bring me back to Him? Shall I have no sentiment but that of dread? What can I hope? Am I worthy of heaven? Am I worthy of hell? Nothing is such madness as to leave one's salvation in uncertainty, but nothing is so natural, and the stupid life I lead is the easiest thing in the world to understand. I bury myself in these thoughts, and I find death so terrible that I hate life more because it leads me thereto than because of the thorns with which it is planted. You will say that I want to live forever then. Not at all. But if my opinion had been asked, I should have preferred to die in my nurse's arms. That would have removed me from vexations of spirit, and would have given me heaven full surely and easily. End of section 68 Section 69 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 48 Louis the Fourteenth, Literature and Art, Part Four. Madame de Sévigny would have very much scandalized those gentlemen of Port Royal if she had let them see into the bottom of her heart as she showed it to her daughter. Pascal used to say, quote, "There are but three sorts of persons: those who serve God, having found Him; those who employ themselves in seeking Him, not having found Him; and those who live without seeking Him or having found Him. The first are reasonable and happy; the last are mad and miserable." the intermediate are miserable and reasonable, end quote. Without ever having sought and found God, in the absolute sense intended by Pascal, Madame de Sévigny kept approaching him by gentle degrees, quote, We are reading a treatise by M. Namon of Port Royal on continuous prayer. Though he is a hundred feet above my head, he nevertheless pleases and charms us. One is very glad to see that there have been and still are in the world people to whom God communicates his Holy Spirit in such abundance, but, O oh God, when shall we have some spark, some degree of it? How sad to find one's self so far from it and so near to something else! O oh, fie, let us not speak of such plight as that. It calls for sighs and groans and humiliations a hundred times a day. 
after having suffered so much from separation and so often traversed france to visit her daughter in provence madame de sevigny had the happiness to die in her house at grignan she was sixty-nine and she had been ill for some time she was subject to rheumatism her son's wildness had for a long while retarded the arrangement of her affairs at last he had turned over a new leaf he was married he was a devotee madame de grignan had likewise found a wife for her son whom the king had made a colonel at a very early age and a husband for her daughter little pauline now madame de simiane Quote, all this together is extremely nice and too nice wrote madame de sevigny to m de bussy for i find the days going so fast and the months and the years that for my part my dear cousin i can no longer hold them time flies and carries me along in spite of me it is all very fine for me to wish to stay it it bears me away with it and the idea of this causes me great fear you will make a pretty shrewd guess why death came at last and madame de sevigny lost all her terrors she was attacked by smallpox whilst her sick daughter was confined to her bed and died on the nineteenth of april sixteen ninety six thanking god that she was the first to go after having so often trembled for her daughter's health Quote, what calls far more for our admiration than for our regrets writes m de grignan to m de coulanges is the spectacle of a brave woman facing death of which she had no doubt from the first days of her illness with astounding firmness and submission this person so tender and so weak towards all that she loved showed nothing but courage and piety when she believed that her hour was come and we could not but remark of what utility and of what importance it is to have the mind stocked with good matter and holy reading for the which madame de sevigny had a liking not to say a wonderful hungering from the use she managed to make of that good store in the last moments of her life she had often taken her daughter to task for not being fond of books quote, there is a certain person who undoubtedly has plenty of wits but of so nice and so fastidious a sort that she cannot read anything but five or six sublime works which is a sign of distinguished taste she cannot bear historical books a great deprivation this and of that which is a subsistence to everybody else she has another misfortune which is that she cannot read twice over those choice books which she esteems exclusively this person says that she is insulted when she is told that she is not fond of reading another bone to pick Madame de Sevigny's liking for good books accompanied her to the last, and helped her to make a good end. All the women who had been writers in her time died before Madame de Sevigny. Madame de Motteville, a judicious and sensible woman, more independent at the bottom of her heart than in externals, had died in 1689, exclusively occupied from the time that she lost Queen Anne of Austria in the works of piety and in drawing up her memoir. Madame de Montpensier, quote, my great mademoiselle, as Madame de Sevigny used to call her, had died at Paris on the 5th of April, 1693, after a violent illness as feverish as her life. Impassioned and haughty, with her head so full of her greatness that she did not marry in her youth, thinking nobody worthy of her except the king and the emperor, who had no fancy for her, and ending by a private marriage with the Duke of Lausanne, quote, a cadet of Gascony, end quote, whom the king would not permit her to espouse publicly, clever courageous hair-brained generous she has herself sketched her own portrait quote, i am tall neither fat nor thin of a very fine and easy figure i have a good mien arms and hands not beautiful but a beautiful skin and throat too i have a straight leg and a well-shaped foot my hair is light and of a beautiful auburn my face is long its contour is handsome nose large and aquiline mouth neither large nor small but chiselled and with a very pleasing expression lips vermilion, teeth not fine, but not frightful either. My eyes are blue, neither large nor small, but sparkling, soft and proud like my mien. I talk a great deal without saying silly things or using bad words. I am a very vicious enemy, being very choleric and passionate, and that, added to my birth, may well make my enemies tremble. But I have also a noble and a kindly soul. I am incapable of any base and black deed, and so I am more disposed to mercy than to justice." I am melancholic, I like reading good and solid books. Trifles bore me, except verses, and them I like, of whatever sort they may be, and undoubtedly I am as good a judge of such things as if I were a scholar." A few days after Mademoiselle died, likewise at Paris, Madeleine de Lavergne, Marchioness of Lafayette, the most intimate friend of Madame de Sévigny, quote, Never did we have the smallest cloud upon our friendship, the latter would say. Long habit had not made her merit stale to me. The flavor of it was always fresh and new. I paid her many attentions from the mere prompting of my heart, without the propriety to which we are bound by friendship having anything to do with it. I was assured, too, that I constituted her dearest consolation, and for forty years past it had always been the same thing." 
sensible, clever, a sweet and safe acquaintance, Madame de Lafayette was as simple and as true in her relations with her confidants as in her writings. La Princesse d'Olive alone has outlived the times and the friends of Madame de Lafayette following upon the quote-unquote great sword-thrusts of la Calprenède or Mademoiselle de Scudery, this delicate, elegant, and virtuous tale, with its pure and refined style, enchanted the court, which recognized itself at its best, and painted under its brightest aspect. It was farewell to ever to the quote-unquote pays de tendre. Madame de Lafayette had very bad health. She wrote to Madame de Sévigny on the 14th of July, 1693, quote, here is what I have done since I wrote to you last. I have had two attacks of fever. For six months I had not been purged. I am purged once. I am purged twice. The day after the second time I sit down to table. Oh, dear, I feel a pain in my heart. I do not want any soup. I have a little meat, then. No, I do not want any. Well, you will have some fruit. I think I will. Very well, then have some. I don't know. I think I will have something by and by. Let me have some soup and a chicken this evening. Here is the evening, and there are the soup and the chicken. I don't want them. I am nauseated. I will go to bed. I prefer sleeping to eating. I go to bed. I turn round. I turn back. I have no pain, but I have no sleep either. I call. I take a book. I shut it up. Day comes. I get up. I go to the window. It strikes four, five, six. I go to bed again. I doze till seven. I get up at eight. I sit down to table at twelve, to no purpose, as yesterday. I lay myself down in my bed again in the evening, to no purpose, as the night before. Are you ill? Nay, I am in this state for three days and three nights. At present I am getting some sleep again, but I still eat merely mechanically, horsewise, rubbing my mouth with vinegar, otherwise I am very well, and I haven't even so much pain in the head. End quote. Fault was found with Madame de Lafayette for not going out. Quote, she had a mortal melancholy. What absurdity again! Is she not the most fortunate woman in the world? That is what people said, writes Madame de Sévigny. It needed that she should be dead to prove that she had good reason for not going out, or for being melancholy. Her reins and her heart were all gone. Was not that enough to cause those fits of despondency of which she complained? And so, during her life, she showed reason, and after her death she showed reason, and never was she without that divine reason which was her principal gift. Madame de Lafayette had in her life one great sorrow, which had completed the ruin of her health. On the 16th of March, 1680, after the closest and longest of intimacies, she had lost her best friend, the Duke of La Rochefoucauld. Carried away in his youth by party strife and an ardent passion for Madame de Longueville, he had at a later period sought refuge in the friendship of Madame de Lafayette. Quote, when women have well-formed minds, he would say, I like their conversation better than that of men. You find with them a certain gentleness which is not met with amongst us, and it seems to me, besides, that they express themselves with greater clearness and that they give a more pleasant turn to the things they say. End quote. A meddler and intriguer during the Fronde, sceptical and bitter in his Maxime, the Duke of La Rochefoucauld was amiable and kindly in his private life. Factions in the courts had taught him a great deal about human nature. It's, he had seen it and judged of it from its bad side. Witty, shrewd, and often profound, he was too severe to be just. The bitterness of his spirit breathed itself out completely in his writings. He kept for his friends that kindliness and that sensitiveness of which he made sport. Quote, he gave me wit, Madame de Lafayette would say, but I reformed his heart. End quote. He had lost his son at the passage of the Rhine in 1672. He was ill, suffering cruelly. Quote, I was yesterday at Monsieur de la Rochefoucauld's, writes Madame de Sévigny in 1680. I found him uttering loud shrieks. His pain was such that his endurance was quite overcome without a single scrap remaining. The excessive pain upset him to such a degree that he was sitting out in the open air with a violent fever upon him. He begged me to send you word and to assure you that the wheel-broken do not suffer during a single moment what he suffers one half of his life, and so he wishes for death as a happy release. End quote. He died with Bossuet at his pillow. Quote, Very well prepared as regards his conscience, says Madame de Sévigny again. That is all settled. But in other respects it might be the illness and death of his neighbor which is in question. He is not flurried about it. He is not troubled about it. Believe me, my daughter, it is not to no purpose that he has been making reflections all his life. He has approached his last moments in such wise that they have had nothing that was novel or strange for him. End quote. M. de La Rochefoucauld thought worse of men than of life. Quote, I have scarcely any fear of things, he had said. I am not at all afraid of death. End quote. With all his rare qualities and great opportunities, he had done nothing but frequently embroil matters in which he had meddled, and had never been anything but a great lord with a good deal of wit. Actionless penetration and sceptical severity may sometimes clear the judgment and the thoughts, but they give no force or influence that has power over men. Quote, 
There was always a something, or je ne sais quoi, about M. de la Rochefoucauld, writes Cardinal de Retz, who did not like him. He was for meddling in intrigues from his childhood, and at a time when he had no notion of petty interests, which were never his foible, and when he did not understand great ones, which on the other hand were never his strength. He was never capable of doing anything in public affairs, and I am sure I don't know why. His views were not sufficiently broad, and he did not even see comprehensively all that was within his range. But his good sense, very good, speculatively, added to his suavity, his insinuating style, and his easy manners, which are admirable, ought to have compensated more than it did for his lack of penetration. He always showed habitual a resolution, but I really do not know to what to attribute this irresolution. It could not, with him, have come from the fertility of his imagination, which is anything but lively. He was never a warrior, though he was very much the soldier. He was never a good partyman, though he was engaged in it all his life. That air of bashfulness and timidity which you see about him in private life was turned in public life into an air of apology. He always considered himself to need one, which fact, added to his maxims, which do not show sufficient belief in virtue, and to his practice, which was always to get out of affairs with as much impatience as he had shown to get into them, leads me to conclude that he would have done far better to know his own place, and to reduce himself to passing, as he might have passed, for the most polite of courtiers and the worthiest, or le plus honnête, man, as regards ordinary life, that ever appeared in his century." Cardinal de Retz had more wits, more courage, and more resolution than the Duke of La Rochefoucauld. He was more ambitious and more bold. He was, like him, meddlesome, powerless, and dangerous to the state. He thought himself capable of superseding Cardinal Mazarin, and far more worthy than he of being premier minister. But every time he found himself opposed to the able Italian, he was beaten. All that he displayed during the fronde of address, combination, intrigue, and resolution would barely have sufficed to preserve his name in history if he had not devoted his leisure in his retirement to writing his memoir. Vigorous, animated, always striking, often amusing, sometimes showing rare nobleness and high-mindedness, his stories and his portraits transport us to the very midst of the scenes he desires to describe, and the personages he makes the actors in them. His rapid, nervous, picturesque style is the very image of that little dark, quick, agile man, more soldier than bishop, and more intriguer than soldier, faithfully and affectionately beloved by his friends, detested by his very numerous enemies, and dreaded by many people, for the causticity of his tongue, long after the troubles of the Fronde had ceased, and he was reduced to be a wanderer in foreign lands, still Archbishop of Paris, without being able to set foot in it. Having retired to Commercy, he fell under Louis the Fourteenth's suspicion. Madame de Sévigny, who was one of his best friends, was anxious about him. Quote, "'As to our cardinal, I have often thought as you,' she wrote to her daughter, "'but whether it be that the enemies are not in condition to cause fear, "'or that the friends are not subject to take alarm, "'it is certain that there is no commotion. "'You show a very proper spirit in being anxious about the welfare of a person who is so distinguished, "'and to whom you owe so much affection. Quote, "'Can I forget him who I see everywhere in the story of our misfortunes?' exclaimed Bossuet in his funeral oration over Michael Le Tellier that man so faithful to individuals, so formidable to the state, of a character so high that he could not be esteemed or feared or hated by halves, that steady genius whom, the while he shook the universe, we saw attracting to himself a dignity which in the end he determined to relinquish as having been too dearly bought, as he had the courage to recognize in the place that is the most eminent in Christendom, and as being, after all, quite incapable of satisfying his desires, so conscious was he of his mistake and of the emptiness of human greatness." but so long as he was bent upon obtaining what he was one day to despise, he kept everything moving by means of powerful and secret springs, and after that all parties were overthrown, he seemed still to uphold himself alone, and alone to still threaten the victorious favorite with his sad but fearless gaze. When Bossuet sketched this magnificent portrait of Mazarin's rival, Cardinal de Retz had been six years dead in 1679. Mesdames de Sévigny and de Lafayette were of the court, as were the Duke of La Rochefoucauld and Cardinal de Retz. La Bruyère lived all his life rubbing shoulders with the court. He knew it, he described it, but he was not of it, and could not be of it. Nothing is known of his family. He was born at Dordain in 1639, and had just bought a post in the treasury, or trésorier de France, at Cayenne, when Bossuet, who knew him, induced him to remove to Paris as teacher of history to the duke, grandson of the great Condé. He remained forever attached to the person of the prince, who gave him a thousand crowns a year, and he lived to the day of his death at Condé's house. Quote, he was a philosopher, says Abbé d'Olivet, in his Histoire de l'Académie Française. All he dreamt of was a quiet life, with his friends and his books, making a good choice of both, 
not courting or avoiding pleasure, ever inclined for moderate fun, and with a talent for setting it going, polished in manners and discreet in conversation, dreading every sort of ambition, even that of displaying wit, end quote. This was not quite the opinion formed by Boileau of La Bruyère. Quote, Maximilian came to see me at Auteuil, writes Boileau to Racine on the 19th of May, 1687, the very year in which the Caractère was published. He read me some of his Theophrastus. He is a very worthy or honnête man, and one who would lack nothing if nature had created him as agreeable as he is anxious to be. However, he has wit, learning, and merit. End quote. Amidst his many and various portraits, La Bruyère has drawn his own with an amiable pride. Quote, I go to your door, Stéphon. The need I have of you hurries me from my bed and from my room. Would to heaven I were neither your client nor your bore. Your slaves tell me that you are engaged and cannot see me for a full hour yet. I return before the time they appointed, and they tell me that you have gone out. What can you be doing, Stéphon, in that remotest part of your rooms, of so laborious a kind as to prevent you from seeing me? You are filing some bills, you are comparing a register, you are signing your name, you are putting the flourish. I had but one thing to ask you, and you had but one word to reply, yes or no. Do you want to be singular? Render service to those who are dependent upon you, you will be more so by that behavior than by not letting yourself be seen." O oh, man of importance and overwhelmed with business, who in your turn have need of my offices, come into the solitude of my closet. The philosopher is accessible. I shall not put you off to another day. You will find me over those works of Plato which treat of the immortality of the soul and its distinctness from the body, or with pen in hand to calculate the distances of Saturn and Jupiter. I admire God in his works, and I seek by knowledge of the truth to regulate my mind and become better." Come in, all doors are open to you. My antechamber is not made to wear you out with waiting for me. Come right in to me without giving me notice. You bring me something more precious than silver and gold, if it be an opportunity of obliging you. Tell me, what can I do for you? Must I leave my books, my study, my work, this line I have just begun? What a fortunate interruption for me is that which is of service to you. End, quote. End of section 69. Section 70 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 48. Louis the Fourteenth, Literature and Art, Part 5. From the solitude of that closet went forth a book unique of its sort, full of sagacity, penetration, and severity, without bitterness a picture of the manners of the court and of the world, traced by the hand of a spectator who had not essayed its temptations, but who guessed them and passed judgment on them all, quote, a book, as M. de Malézieux said to La Bruyère, which was sure to bring its author many readers and many enemies, end quote. Its success was great from the first, and it excited lively curiosity. The courtiers liked the portraits, the attempts were made to name them, the good sense, shrewdness, and truth of the observation struck everybody. People had met a hundred times those whom La Bruyère had described. The form appeared of a rarer order than even the matter. It was a brilliant, uncommon style, as varied as human nature, always elegant and pure, original and animated, rising sometimes to the height of the noblest thoughts, gay and grave, pointed and serious avoiding, by richness in turns and expression, the uniformity native to the subject, La Bruyère riveted attention by a succession of touches making a masterly picture, a terrible one sometimes, as in his description of the peasant's misery. Quote, to be seen are certain ferocious animals, male and female, scattered over the country, dark, livid, and all scorched by the sun, affixed to the soil which they rummage and throw up with indomitable pertinacity. They have a sort of articulate voice, and when they rise to their feet, they show a human face. They are, in fact, men. At night they withdraw to the caves, where they live on black bread, water, and roots. They spare other men the trouble of sowing, tilling, and reaping for their livelihood, and deserve, therefore, not to go in want of the very bread they have sown. Few people at the court, and in La Bruyère's day, would have thought about the sufferings of the country folks, and conceived the idea of contrasting them with a sketch of a court ninny. Quote, Gold glitters, say you, upon the clothes of Philemon. It glitters as well as the tradesman's. He is dressed in the finest stuffs. Are they a whit the less so when displayed in the shops and by the piece? Nay, but the embroidery and the ornaments add magnificence thereto. Then I give the workman credit for his work. If you ask him the time, he pulls out a watch which is a masterpiece. His sword-guard is an onyx. 
He has on his finger a large diamond which he flashes into all eyes, and which is perfection. He lacks none of those curious trifles which are worn about one as much for show as for use. And he does not stint himself either of all sorts of adornment befitting a young man who has married an old millionaire. You really pique my curiosity. I positively must see such precious articles as those. Send me that coat and those jewels of Philemon's. You can keep the person. Thou art wrong, Philemon, if with that splendid carriage and that large number of rascals behind thee and those six animals to draw thee, thou thinkest thou art thought more of. We take off all those appendages which are extraneous to thee to get at thyself who are but a ninny. End quote. More earnest and less bitter than La Rochefoucauld and as brilliant and as firm as Cardinal de Retz, La Bruyere was a more sincere believer than either. Quote, I feel that there is a God, and I do not feel that there is none. That is enough for me. The reasoning of the world is useless to me. I conclude that God exists. Are men good enough, faithful enough, equitable enough to deserve all our confidence, and not make us wish at least for the existence of God, to whom we may appeal from their judgments, and have recourse when we are persecuted or betrayed? End quote. A very strong reason and of potent logic, naturally imprinted upon an upright spirit and a sensible mind, irresistibly convinced, both of them, that justice alone can govern the world. La Bruyere had just been admitted into the French Academy in 1693. In his admission speech he spoke in praise of the living, Bossuet, Fenelon, Racine, La Fontaine. It was not as yet the practice. Those who were not praised felt angry, and the journals of the time bitterly attacked the new academician. He was hurt, and withdrew almost entirely from the world. Four days before his death, however, quote, he was in company. All at once he perceived that he was becoming deaf, yes, stone deaf. He returned to Versailles, where he had apartments at Condé's house. Apoplexy carried him off in a quarter of an hour on the 11th of May, 1696, end quote, leaving behind him an incomparable book, wherein, according to his own maxim, the excellent writer shows himself to be an excellent painter, and four dialogues against quietism, still unfinished, full of lively and good-humoured hostility to the doctrines of Madame Guyon. They were published after his death. We pass from prose to poetry, from La Bruyère to Corneille, who had died in 1684, too late for his fame, in spite of the vigorous returns of genius which still flash forth sometimes in his feeblest works. Throughout the Regency and the Fronde, Corneille had continued to occupy almost alone the great French stage. Rotrou, his sometime rival with his piece of Venceslas, and ever tenderly attached to him, had died in 1650, at Dreux, of which he was civil magistrate. An epidemic was ravaging the town, and he was urged to go away. Quote, I am the only one who can maintain good order, and I shall remain, he replied. At the moment of my writing to you, the bells are tolling for the twenty-second person today. Perhaps tomorrow it will be for me, but my conscience has marked out my duty. God's will be done. End quote. Two days later, he was dead. Corneille had dedicated Polyeucte to the regent Anne of Austria. He published in a single year Rodogun and Mort de Pompée, dedicating this latter piece to Mazarin, in gratitude, he said, for an act of generosity with which his eminence had surprised him. At the same time, he borrowed from the Spanish drama the canvas of the Menteur, the first really French comedy which appeared on the boards, and which Molière showed that he could appreciate at its proper value. After this attempt, due perhaps to the desire felt by Corneille to triumph over his rivals, in the style in which he had walked abreast with them, he let tragedy resume its legitimate empire over a genius formed by it. He wrote Heraclius and Nicomede, which are equal in parts to his finest masterpieces. But by this time the great genius no longer soared with equal flight. Theodore and Pertherite had been failures. Quote, I don't mention them, Corneille would say, in order to avoid the vexation of remembering them. End quote. He was still living at Rouen, in a house adjoining that occupied by his brother, Thomas Corneille, younger than he, already known by some comedies which had met with success. The two brothers had married two sisters. Quote, Their houses twain were made in one, with keys and purse the same was done. Their wives can never have been two, their wishes tallied at all times. No games distinct their children knew. The fathers lent each other rhymes, same wine for both the drawers drew. End quote. Ducis. It is said that when Peter Corneille was puzzled to end a verse, he would undo a trap that opened into his brother's room, shouting, quote, Sans souci, a rhyme. End quote. Corneille had announced his renunciation of the stage. He was translating into verse the imitation of Christ. Quote, it were better, he had written in his preface to Pertherite, that I took leave myself instead of waiting till it is taken of me altogether. It is quite right that after twenty years' work I should begin to perceive that I am becoming too old to be still in the fashion. 
This resolution is not so strong but that it may be broken. There is every appearance, however, of my abiding by it. End quote. Fouquet was then in his glory, quote, no less superintendent of literature than of finance, end quote, and he undertook to recall to the stage the genius of Corneille. At his voice, the poet and the tragedian rose up at a single bound. Quote, I feel the self-same fire, the self-same nerve, I feel, that roused the indignant Cid, drove home Horatius as steel. As cunning as of yore this hand of mine I find, that sketched great Pompey's soul, depicted Cinna's mind, end quote wrote Corneille in his thanks to Fouquet. He had some months before said to Mademoiselle Dupart, who was an actress in Molière's company, which had come to Rouen, and who was, from her grand airs, nicknamed by the others the Marchioness, quote, Marchioness, if age hath set on my brow his ugly dye, at my years, pray don't forget, you will be as old as I. Yet do I possess of charms one or two, so slow to fade, that I feel but scant alarms at the havoc time hath made." You have such as men adore, but these that you scorn to-day may perchance be to the fore when your own are worn away. These can from decay reprieve eyes I take a fancy to. Make a thousand years believe whatsoe'er I please of you. With that new, that coming race, who will take my word for it, all the warrant for your face will be what I may have writ. Corneille reappeared upon the boards with a tragedy called Epid, more admired by his contemporaries than by posterity. On the occasion of Louis the Fourteenth's marriage, he wrote for the king's comedians the Toisson d'Or, and put into the mouth of France those prophetic words, quote, My natural force abates from long success alone. Triumphant blooms the state, the wretched people groan, their shrunken bodies bend beneath my high emprise. Whilst glory gilds the throne, the subject sinks and dies, end quote. Sertorius appeared at the commencement of the year 1662, quote, Pray where did Corneille learn politics and war? asked Turenne when he saw this piece played. Quote, you are the true and faithful interpreter of the mind and courage of Rome, Balzac wrote to him. Quote, I say further, sir, you are often her teacher, and the reformer of olden times, if they have need of embellishment and support. In the spots where Rome is of brick, you rebuild it of marble. Where you find a gap, you fill it with a masterpiece, and I take it that what you lend to history is always better than what you borrow from it. Quote, they are grander and more Roman in his verses than in their history, said La Bruyere. Once only, in the Cid, Corneille had abandoned himself unreservedly to the reality of passion. Scared at what he might find in the weaknesses of the heart, he would no longer see aught but its strength. He sought in man that which resists and not that which yields, thus giving his times the sublime pleasure of an enjoyment that can belong to naught but the human soul, a cherished proof of its noble origin and its glorious destiny the pleasure of admiration, the appreciation of the beautiful and the great, the enthusiasm aroused by virtue. He moves us at sight of a masterpiece, thrills us at the sound of a noble deed, enchants us at the bare idea of a virtue which three thousand years have forever separated from us. Corneille et son temps by M. Guizot Every other thought, every other prepossession are strangers to the poet. His personages represent heroic passions which they follow out without swerving, and without suffering themselves to be shackled by the notions of a morality which is still far from fixed, and often in conflict with the interests and obligations of parties, thus remaining perfectly of his own time and his own country, all the while that he is describing Greeks or Romans or Spaniards. There is no pleasure in tracing the decadence of a great genius. Corneille wrote for a long while without success, attributing his repeated rebuffs to his old age, the influence of fashion, the capricious taste of the generation for young people. He thought himself neglected, appealing to the king himself who had ordered Cinna and Pompey to be played at court. Quote, Go on. The latest born have not degenerate. Not have they which would stamp them illegitimate. They, miserable fate, were smothered at the birth, and one kind glance of yours would bring them back to earth. The people and the court, I grant you, cry them down. I have, or else they think I have, too feeble grown. I've written far too long to write so well again. The wrinkles on the brow reach even to the brain. But counter to this vote, how many could I raise, if to my latest works you should vouchsafe your praise? How soon so kind a grace, so potent to constrain, would court and people both win back to me again? So Sophocles of yore at Athens was the rage, so boiled his ancient blood at five score years of age. Would they to envy cry, when Oedipus at bay before his judges stood and bore the votes away? End quote. Posterity has done for Corneille more than Louis the Fourteenth could have done. It has left in oblivion Agesilus, Attila, Titus, and Pulcherie. It preserved the memory of the triumphs only. 
The poet was accustomed to say with a smile when he was reproached with his slowness and emptiness in conversation, quote, I am Peter Corneille all the same, end quote. The world has passed similar judgment on his works. In spite of the rebuffs of his latter years, he has remained, quote, the great Corneille, end quote. When he died in 1684, Racine, elected by the Academy in 1673, found himself on the point of becoming its director. He claimed the honor of presiding at the obsequies of Corneille. The latter had not been admitted to the body until 1641, after having undergone two rebuffs. Corneille had died in the night. The Academy decided in favor of Abbé de Lavaux, the outgoing director, quote, Nobody but you could pretend to bury Corneille, said Ben Serrad to Racine, yet you have not been able to obtain the chance, end quote. It was only when he received into the academy Thomas Corneille, in his brother's place, that Racine could praise to his heart's content the master and rival who in old age had done him the honor to dread him. Quote, My father had not been happy in his speech at his own admission, says Louis Racine ingenuously. He was in this because he spoke out of the abundance of his heart, being inwardly convinced that Corneille was worth much more than he. End quote. Louis the Fourteenth had come in for as great a share as Corneille in Racine's praises. He, informed of the success of the speech, desired to hear it. The author had the honor of reading it to him, after which the king said to him, quote, I am very pleased. I would praise you more if you had praised me less. End quote. It was on this occasion that the great Arnaud, still in disgrace and carefully concealed, wrote to Racine, quote, I have to thank you, sir, for the speech which was sent me from you. There certainly was never anything so eloquent, and the hero whom you praise is so much the more worthy of your praises, in that he considered them too great. I have many things that I would say to you about that, if I had the pleasure of seeing you, but it would need the dispersal of a cloud which I dare to say is a spot upon this sun. I assure you that the ideas I have thereupon are not interested, and that what may concern myself affects me very little. A chat with you and your companion would give me much pleasure, but I would not purchase that pleasure by the least poltroonery. You know what I mean by that, and so I abide in peace and wait patiently for God to make known to this perfect prince that he has not in his kingdom a subject more loyal, more zealous for his true glory, and if I dare say so, loving him with a love more pure and more free from all interest. That is why I should not bring myself to take a single step to obtain liberty to see my friends, unless it were to my prince alone that I could be indebted for it." Fenelon and the great Arnaud held the same language, independent and submissive, proud and modest at the same time. Only their conscience spoke louder than their respect for the king. At the time when Racine was thus praising at the Academy the king and the great Corneille, his own dramatic career was already ended. He was born, in 1639, at La Ferté-Milan. He had made his first appearance on the stage in 1664 with the frère ennemi, and had taken leave of it in 1673 with Phèdre. Esther and Nathalie, played in 1689 and 1691 by the young ladies of Saint-Cyr, were not regarded by their author and his austere friends as any derogation from the pious engagements he had entered into. Racine, left an orphan at four years of age, and brought up at Port Royal under the influence and the personal care of Monsieur Le Maître, who called him his son, did not at first answer the expectations of his master. The glowing fancy of which he already gave signs caused dismay to Lancelot, who threw into the fire one after the other two copies of the Greek tale Théenne et Chariclée, which the young man was reading. The third time, the latter learnt it off by heart, and taking the book to his severe censor, quote, Here, said he, you can burn this volume too, as well as the others. End quote. Racine's pious friends had fine work to no purpose. Nature carried the day, and he wrote verses. Quote, Being unable to consult you, I was prepared, like Malherbe, to consult an old servant at our place, he wrote to one of his friends, if I had not discovered that she was a Jansenist like her master, and that she might betray me, which would be my utter ruin considering that I receive every day letter upon letter, or rather excommunication upon excommunication, all because of a poor sonnet, end quote. To deter the young man from poetry, he was led to expect a benefice, and was sent away to Uze to his uncle's, Father Sconet, who set him to study theology. Quote, I pass my time with my uncle, St. Thomas, and Virgil, he wrote on the 17th of January, 1662, to Monsieur Vitard, steward to the Duke of Luynes. I make lots of extracts from theology and some from poetry. My uncle has kind intentions towards me. He hopes to get me something. Then I shall try to pay my debts. I do not forget the obligations I am under to you. I blush as I write. Erubuit puer, salva rest est. Or, the lad has blushed. It is all right. But that conclusion is all wrong. My affairs do not mend. End quote. Racine had composed at Uze the frère ennemi, which was played on his return to Paris in 1664, not without a certain success. 
Alexandre met with a great deal in 1665. The author had at first entrusted it to Molière's company, but he was not satisfied and gave his piece to the comedians of the Hôtel de Dorgogne. Molière was displeased and quarrelled with Racine, towards whom he had up to that time testified much good will. The disagreement was not destined to disturb the equity of their judgments upon one another. When Racine brought out Les Plaideurs, which was not successful at first, Molière, as he left, said out loud, quote, The comedy is excellent, and they who deride it deserve to be derided. End quote. One of Racine's friends, thinking to do him a pleasure, went to him in all haste to tell him of the failure of the misanthrope at its first representation. Quote, the piece has fallen flat, said he. Never was there anything so dull. You can believe what I say, for I was there. Quote, you were there, and I was not, replied Racine. And yet I do not believe it, because it is impossible that Molière should have written a bad piece. Go again and pay more attention to it. End, quote. End of section 70. Section 71 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 48. Louis the Fourteenth, Literature and Art, Part 6. Racine had just brought out Alexandre when he became connected with Boileau, who was three years his senior, and who had already published several of his satires. Quote, I have a surprising facility in writing my verses, said the young tragic author ingenuously. Quote, I want to teach you to write them with difficulty, answered Boileau, and you have talent enough to learn before long. End quote. Andromaque was the result of this novel effort, and was Racine's real commencement. He was henceforth irrevocably committed to the theatrical cause. Nicole attacking Desmarais, who had turned prophet after the failure of his Clovis, alluded to the author's comedies, and exclaimed with all the severity of Port Royal, quote, A romance writer and a scenic poet is a public poisoner not of bodies, but of souls. End quote. Racine took these words to himself and he wrote in defense of the dramatic art two letters so bitter, biting and insulting towards Port Royal and the protectors of his youth, that Boileau dissuaded him from publishing the second, and that remorse before long took possession of his soul, never to be entirely appeased. He had just brought out Les Plaideurs, which had been requested of him by his friends and partly composed during the dinners they frequently had together. Quote, I put into it only a few barbarous law terms which I might have picked up during a lawsuit, and which neither I nor my judges ever really heard or understood. End quote. After the first failure of the piece, the king's comedians one day risked playing it before him. Quote, Louis XIV was struck by it, and did not think it a breach of his dignity or taste to utter shouts of laughter so loud that the courtiers were astounded. End quote. The delighted comedians, on leaving Versailles, returned straight to Paris, and went to awaken Racine. Quote, Three carriages during the night in a street where it was unusual to see a single one during the day woke up the neighborhood. There was a rush to the windows, and as it was known that a councillor of requests, or law officer, had made a great uproar against the comedy of the plaideur, nobody had a doubt of punishment befalling the poet who had dared to take off the judges in the open theatre. Next day all Paris believed that he was in prison. End quote. He had a triumph, on the contrary, with Britannicus, after which the king gave up dancing in the court ballets for fear of resembling Nero. Berenice was a duel between Corneille and Racine for the amusement of Madame Henriette. Racine bore away the bell from his illustrious rival without much glory. Bajazet soon followed. Quote, Here is Racine's piece, wrote Madame de Sévigny to her daughter in January 1672. If I could send you La Chamelle, you would think it good, but without her it loses half its worth. The character of Bajazet is cold as ice. The manners of the Turks are ill-observed in it. They do not make so much fuss about getting married. The catastrophe is not well led up to. There are no reasons given for that great butchery. There are some pretty things, however, but nothing perfectly beautiful, nothing which carries by storm, none of those bursts of Corneille's which make one creep. My dear, let us be careful never to compare Racine with him. Let us always feel the difference. Never will the former rise any higher than Andromaque. Long live our old friend Corneille. Let us forgive his bad verses for the sake of those divine and sublime beauties which transport us. They are master strokes which are inimitable. End quote. Corneille had seen Bajazet. Quote, I would take great care not to say so to anybody else, he whispered in the ear of Sagré, who was sitting beside him, because they would say that I said so from jealousy, but mind you, there is not in Bajazet a single character with the sentiments which should and do prevail at Constantinople. They have all, beneath a Turkish dress, the sentiments that prevail in the midst of France. End quote. 
The impassioned loyalty of Madame de Sévigny and the clear-sighted jealousy of Corneille were not mistaken. Bajazet is no Turk, but he is none the less very human. Quote, there are points by which men recognize themselves, though there is no resemblance. There are others in which there is resemblance without any recognition. Certain sentiments belong to nature in all countries. They are characteristic of man only, and everywhere man will see his own image in them. End quote. Corneille et son temps by M. Guizot. Racine's reputation went on continually increasing. He had brought out Mithridati and Iphigenie. Phedra appeared in 1677. A cabal of great lords caused its failure at first. When the public, for a moment led astray after the Phedre of Pradon, returned to the masterwork of Racine, vexation and wounded pride had done their office in the poet's soul. Pious sentiments ever smouldering in his heart, the horror felt for the theatre by Port Royal, and penitence for the sins he had been guilty of against his friends there, revived within him, and Racine gave up profane poetry forever. Quote, the applause I have met with has often flattered me a great deal, said he at a later period to his son, but the smallest critical censure, bad as it may have been, always caused me more of vexation than all the praises have given me of pleasure. End quote. Racine wanted to turn Carthusian, his confessor dissuaded him, and his friends induced him to marry. Madame Racine was an excellent person, modest and devout, who never went to the theatre, and scarcely knew her husband's plays by name. She brought him some fortune. The king had given the great poet a pension, and Colbert had appointed him to the treasury, or trésorier, at Moulins. Louis the Fourteenth, moreover, granted frequent donations to men of letters. Racine received from him nearly fifty thousand livres. He was appointed historiographer to the king. Boileau received the same title. The latter was not married, but Racine before long had seven children. Quote, Why did not I turn Carthusian? He would sometimes exclaim in the disquietude of his paternal affection when his children were ill. He devoted his life to them with pious solicitude, constantly occupied with their welfare, their good education, and the salvation of their souls. Several of his daughters became nuns. He feared above everything to see his eldest son devote himself to poetry, dreading for him the dangers he considered he himself had run. Quote, As for your epigram, I wish you had not written it, he wrote to him. Independently of its being commonplace, I cannot too earnestly recommend you not to let yourself give way to the temptation of writing French verses, which would serve no purpose but to distract your mind. Above all, you should not write against anybody. End quote. This son, the object of so much care, to whom his father wrote such modest, grave, paternal, and sagacious letters, never wrote verses, lived in retirement, and died young without ever having married. Little Louis, or Léon Val, Racine's last child, was the only one who ever dreamed of being a writer. Quote, you must be very bold, said Boileau to him, to dare write verses with the name you bear. It is not that I consider it impossible for you to become capable some day of writing good ones, but I mistrust what is without precedent, and never, since the world was world, has there been seen a great poet's son of a great poet. Louis Racine never was a great poet, in spite of the fine verses which are to be met with in his poems La Religion and La Grâce. His memoir of his father, written for his son, describe Racine in all the simple charm of his domestic life. Quote, he would leave all to come and see us, writes Louis Racine. An equerry of the Duke's came one day to say that he was expected to dinner at Condé's house. I shall not have the honour of going, said he. It is more than a week since I have seen my wife and children, who are making holiday to-day to feast with me on a very fine carp. I cannot give up dining with them. And when the equerry persisted, he sent for the carp, which was worth about a crown. Judge for yourself, said he, whether I can disappoint these poor children who have made up their minds to regale me, and would not enjoy it if they were to eat this dish without me. He was loving by nature, adds Louis Racine. He was loving towards God when he returned to him, and from the day of his return to those who, from his infancy, had taught him to know him, he was so towards them without any reserve. He was so all his life towards his friends, towards his wife, and towards his children. End quote. Boileau had undertaken the task of reconciling his friend with Port Royal. Nicole had made no opposition, quote, not knowing what war was. End quote. M. Arnaud was intractable. Boileau one day made up his mind to take him a copy of Phèdre, pondering on the way as to what he should say to him. Quote, shall this man, said he, be always right, and shall I never be able to prove him wrong? I am quite sure that I shall be right today. If he is not of my opinion, he will be wrong. End quote. And going to M. Arnaud's, where he found a large company, he set about developing his thesis, pulling out Phèdre, and maintaining that if tragedy were dangerous, it was the fault of the poets. The younger theologians listened to him disdainfully, but at last M. Arnaud said out loud, quote, If things are as he says, he is right, and such tragedy is harmless. End quote. Boileau declared that he had never felt so pleased in his life. M. Arnaud, being reconciled to Phèdre, 
The principal step was made. Next day the author of the tragedy presented himself. The culprit entered, humility and confusion depicted on his face. He threw himself at the feet of M. Arnaud, who took him in his arms. Racine was thenceforth received into favor by Port Royal. The two friends were preparing to set out with the king for the campaign of 1677. The besieged towns opened their gates before the poets had left Paris. Quote, How is it that you had not the curiosity to see a siege? The king asked them on his return. It was not a long trip. Quote, True, sir, answered Racine, always the greater courtier of the two, but our tailors were too slow. We had ordered travelling suits, and when they were brought home, the places which your majesty was besieging were taken. End quote. Louis the Fourteenth was not displeased. Racine thenceforth accompanied him in all his campaigns. Boileau, who ailed a great deal and was of shy disposition, remained at Paris. His friend wrote to him constantly, at one time from the camp and at another from Versailles, whither he returned with the king. Quote, Madame de Maintenon told me this morning, writes Racine, that the king had fixed our pensions at four thousand francs for me and two thousand for you. That is not including our literary pensions. I have just come from thanking the king. I laid more stress upon your case than even my own. I said in as many words, Sir, he has more wit than ever, more zeal for your majesty, and more desire to work for your glory than ever he had. I am nevertheless really pained at the idea of my getting more than you, but independently of the expenses and fatigue of the journeys from which I am glad that you are delivered, I know that you are so noble-minded and so friendly that I am sure you would be heartily glad that I were even better treated. I shall be very pleased if you are. End quote. Boileau answered at once, quote, are you mad with your compliments? Do not you know perfectly well that it was I who suggested the way in which things have been done? And can you doubt of my being perfectly well pleased with a matter in which I am accorded all I ask? Nothing in the world could be better, and I am even more rejoiced on your account than on my own. End quote. The two friends consulted one another mutually about their verses. Racine sent Boileau his spiritual songs. The king heard the combat du chrétien sung, set to music by Moreau. Quote, O oh God, my God, what deadly strife! Two men within myself I see. One would that full of love to thee my heart were leal in death and life. The other, with rebellion rife, against thy laws inciteth me. End quote. He turned to Madame de Maintenon, and quote, Madame, said he, I know those two men well. End quote. Boileau sends Racine his ode on the capture of Namur. Quote, I have risked some very new things, he says, even to speaking of the white plume which the king has in his hat. But, in my opinion, if you are to have novel expressions in verse, you must speak of things which have not been said in verse. You shall be judged with permission to alter the whole if you do not like it. Boileau's generous confidence was the more touching, in that Racine was sarcastic and bitter in discussion. Quote, Did you mean to hurt me? Boileau said to him one day. Quote, God forbid, was the answer. Quote, well, then, you made a mistake, for you did hurt me. End quote. Racine had just brought out Esther at the Theatre of Saint-Cyr. Madame de Brinon, lady superior of the establishment which was founded by Madame de Maintenon for the daughters of poor noblemen, had given her pupils a taste for theatricals. Quote, Our little girls have just been playing your Andromaque, wrote Madame de Maintenon to Racine, and they played it so well that they never shall play it again in their lives or any other of your pieces. End quote. She at the same time asked him to write, in his leisure hours, some sort of moral and historical poem from which love should be altogether banished. This letter threw Racine into a great state of commotion. He was anxious to please Madame de Maintenon, and yet it was a delicate commission for a man who had a great reputation to sustain. Boileau was for refusing. Quote, that was not in the calculations of Racine, says Madame de Caylus in her souvenir. He wrote Esther. Quote, Madame de Maintenon was charmed with the conception and the execution, says Madame de Lafayette. The play represented in some sort the fall of Madame de Montespan and her own elevation. All the difference was that Esther was a little younger and less particular in the matter of piety. The way in which the characters were applied was the reason why Madame de Maintenon was not sorry to make public a piece which had been composed for the community only and for some of her private friends. There was exhibited a degree of excitement about it which is incomprehensible. Not one of the small or the great but would go to see it, and that which ought to have been looked upon as merely a convent play became the most serious matter in the world. The ministers, to pay their court by going to this play, left their most pressing business. At the first representation at which the king was present, he took none but the principal officers of his hunt. The second was reserved for pious personages, such as Father Lachaise, and a dozen or fifteen Jesuits, with many other devotees of both sexes. Afterwards it extended to the courtiers. Quote, I paid my court at Saint-Cyr the other day more agreeably than I had expected, writes Madame de Sévigny to her daughter. 
listened, Marshal Belfond and I, with an attention that was remarked, and with certain discreet commendations which were not perhaps to be found beneath the headdresses of all the ladies present. I cannot tell you how exceedingly delightful this piece is. It is a unison of music, verse, songs, persons, so perfect that there is nothing left to desire. The girls who act the kings and other characters were made expressly for it. Everything is simple, everything innocent, everything sublime and affecting. I was charmed, and so was the marshal, who left his place to go and tell the king how pleased he was, and that he sat beside a lady well worthy of having seen us there. The king came over to our seats. Madame, he said to me, I am assured that you have been pleased. I, without any confusion, replied, Sir, I am charmed. What I feel is beyond expression. The king said to me, Racine is very clever. I said to him, Very, sir, but really these young people are very clever, too. They throw themselves into the subject as if they had never done aught else. Ah, as to that, he replied, it is quite true. And then his majesty went away and left me the object of envy. The prince and princess came and gave me a word, Madame de Maintenon a glance. She went away with the king. I replied to all, for I was in luck. Atali had not the same brilliant success as Esther. The devotee and the envious had affrighted Madame de Maintenon, who had requested Racine to write it. The young ladies of Saint-Cyr, in the uniform of the house, played the piece quite simply at Versailles before Louis the Fourteenth and Madame de Maintenon, in a room without a stage. When the players gave a representation of it at Paris, it was considered heavy. It did not succeed. Racine imagined that he was doomed to another failure like that of Phèdre, which he preferred before all his other pieces. Quote, I am a pretty good judge, Boileau kept repeating to him. It is about the best you have done. The public will come round to it. End quote. Racine died before success was achieved by the only perfect piece which the French stage possesses, worthy both of the subject and of the sources whence Racine drew his inspiration. He had, with an excess of scrupulousness, abandoned the display of all the fire that burned within him, but beauty never ceased to rouse him to irresistible enthusiasm. Whilst reading the Psalms to M. de Seignelay, when lying ill, he could not refrain from paraphrasing them aloud. He admired Sophocles so much that he never dared touch the subjects of his tragedies. Quote, one day, says M. de Valicourt, when he was at Auteuil, at Boileau's, with M. Nicole and some distinguished friends, he took up a Sophocles in Greek and read the tragedy of Oedipus, translating it as he went. He read so feelingly that all his auditors experienced the sensations of terror and pity with which this piece abounds. I have seen our best pieces played by our best actors, but nothing ever came near the commotion into which I was thrown by this reading, and at this moment of writing I fancy I still see Racine, book in hand, and all of us awe-stricken around him." Thus it was that, whilst repeating but a short time before the verses of Mithridate as he was walking in the Tuileries, he had seen the workmen leaving their work and coming up to him, convinced as they were that he was mad and was going to throw himself into the basin. End of section 71 Section 72 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 48. Louis the Fourteenth, Literature and Art. Part 7. Racine for a long while enjoyed the favors of the king, who went so far as to tolerate the attachment the poet had always testified towards Port Royal. Racine, moreover, showed tact in humoring the susceptibilities of Louis the Fourteenth and his counsellors. Father Bonheur and Father Rapin, Jesuits, were in my study when I received your letter, he writes to Boileau. I read it to them on breaking the seal, and I gave them very great pleasure. I kept looking ahead, however, as I was reading, in case there was anything too Jansenistical in it. I saw towards the end the name of M. Nicole, and I skipped boldly, or rather mean-spiritedly, over it. I dared not expose myself to the chance of interfering with the great delight and even shouts of laughter caused them by many very amusing things you sent me. They are both of them, I assure you, very friendly towards you, and indeed very good fellows." All this caution did not prevent Racine, however, from displeasing the king. After a conversation he had held with Madame de Maintenon about the miseries of the people, she asked him for a memorandum on the subject. The king demanded the name of the author and flew out at him. Quote, because he is a perfect master of verse, said he, does he think he knows everything? And because he is a great poet, does he want to be minister? End quote. Madame de Maintenon was more discreet in her relations with the king than bold in the defense of her friends. She sent Racine word not to come and see her until further orders. Quote, Let this cloud pass, she said. I will bring the fine weather back. End quote. 
Racine was ill, his naturally melancholy disposition had become sombre. Quote, I know, madame, he wrote to madame de Maintenon, what influence you have, but in the house of Port Royal I have an aunt who shows her affection for me in quite a different way. This holy woman is always praying God to send me disgraces, humiliations, and subjects for penitence. She will have more success than you. End quote. At bottom his soul was not sturdy enough to endure the rough doctrines of Port Royal. His health got worse and worse. He returned to court. He was readmitted by the king, who received him graciously. Racine continued uneasy. He had an abscess of the liver, and was a long while ill. Quote, when he was convinced that he was going to die, he ordered a letter to be written to the superintendent of finances, asking for payment, which was due, of his pension. His son brought him the letter. Why, said he, did you not ask for payment of Boileau's pension, too? We must not be made distinct. Write the letter over again, and let Boileau know that I was his friend even to death. When the latter came to wish him farewell, he raised himself up in bed with an effort. I regard it as a happiness for me to die before you, he said to his friend. An operation appeared necessary. His son would have given him hopes. And you, too, said Racine, you would do as the doctors and mock me. God is the master and can restore me to life, but death has sent in his bill. End quote. He was not mistaken. On the 21st of April, 1699, the great poet, the scrupulous Christian, the noble and delicate painter of the purest passions of the soul, expired at Paris at fifty-nine years of age, leaving life without regret, spite of all the successes with which he had been crowned. Unlike Corneille with the Cid, he did not take tragedy and glory by assault. He conquered them both by degrees, raising himself in each new effort, and gaining over, little by little, the most passionate admirers of his great rival. At the pinnacle of this reputation and this victory, at thirty-eight years of age, he had voluntarily shut the door against the intoxications and pride of success. He had mutilated his life, buried his genius in penitence, obeying simply the calls of his conscience, and with singular moderation in the very midst of exaggeration, becoming a father of a family and remaining a courtier, at the same time that he gave up the stage in glory. Racine was gentle and sensible even in his repentance and his sacrifices. Boileau gave religion the credit for this very moderation. Quote, reason commonly brings others to faith. It was faith which brought M. Racine to reason. End quote. Boileau had more to do with his friend's reason than he probably knew. Racine never acted without consulting him. With Racine, Boileau lost half his life. He survived him twelve years without ever setting foot again within the court after his first interview with the king. Quote, I have been at Versailles, he writes to his publisher, M. Brassette where I saw Madame de Maintenon, and afterwards the king, who overcame me with kind words. So here I am, more historiographer than ever. His Majesty spoke to me of Monsieur Racine in a manner to make courtiers desire death, if they thought he would speak of them in the same way afterwards. Meanwhile that has been but very small consolation to me for the loss of that illustrious friend, who is none the less dead, though regretted by the greatest king in the universe. Quote, Remember, Louis the Fourteenth had said, that I have always an hour a week to give you when you like to come. End quote. Boileau did not go again. Quote, what should I go to court for, he would say. I cannot sing praises any more. At Racine's death, Boileau did not write any longer. He had entered the arena of letters at three-and-twenty, after a sickly and melancholy childhood. The Art Poétique and the Lutrin appeared in 1674. The first nine satires and several of the epistles had preceded them. Rather a witty, shrewd, and able versifier than a great poet, Boileau displayed in the Lutrin a richness and suppleness of fancy which his other works had not foreshadowed. The broad and cynical buffoonery of Scarron's burlesques had always shocked his severe and pure taste. Quote, Your father was weak enough to read Virgile Travesti and laugh over it, he would say to Louis Racine, but he kept it dark from me. End quote. In the Lutrin, Boileau sought the gay and the laughable under noble and polished forms. The gay lost by it, the laughable remained stamped with an ineffaceable seal. Quote, Monsieur de Pro, wrote Racine to his son, has not only received from heaven a marvelous genius for satire, but he has also, together with that, an excellent judgment which makes him discern what needs praise and what needs blame. End quote. This marvelous genius for satire did not spoil Boileau's natural good feeling. Quote, he is cruel in verse only, Madame de Sévigny used to say. Racine was tart, bitter in discussion. Boileau always preserved his coolness. His judgments frequently anticipated those of posterity. The king asked him one day who was the greatest poet of his reign. Quote, Molière, sir, answered Boileau without hesitation. Quote, I shouldn't have thought it, rejoined the king, somewhat astonished, but you know more about it than I do. End quote. Molière, in his turn, 
defending La Fontaine against the pleasantries of his friends, said to his neighbor at one of those social meals in which the illustrious friends delighted, quote, Let us not laugh at the good soul, or bonhomme, he will probably live longer than the whole of us. End quote. In the noble and touching brotherhood of these great minds, Boileau continued invariably to be the bond between the rivals. Intimate friend as he was of Racine, he never quarreled with Moliere, and he hurried to the king to beg that he would pass on the pension with which he honored him to the aged Corneille, groundlessly deprived of the royal favors. He entered the academy on the 3rd of July, 1684, immediately after La Fontaine. His satires had retarded his election. Quote, he praised without flattery, he humbled himself nobly, says Louis Racine, and when he said that admission to the academy was sure to be closed against him for so many reasons, he set a thinking all the academicians he had spoken ill of in his work. End quote. He was no longer writing verses when Perrault published his Parallèle des Anciens et des Modernes. Quote, if Boileau do not reply, said the Prince of Conti, you may assure him that I will go to the academy and write on his chair, Brutus, thou sleepest. End quote. The ode on the capture of Namur, intended to crush Perrault whilst celebrating Pindar, not being sufficient, Boileau wrote his Réflexions sur Longin, bitter and often unjust towards Perrault, who was far more equitably treated and more effectually refuted in Fenelon's letter to the French Academy. Boileau was by this time old. He had sold his house at Auteuil, which was so dear, but he did not give up literature, continuing to revise his verses carefully, preoccupied with new editions, and reproaching himself for this preoccupation. Quote, it is very shameful, he would say, to be still busying myself with rhymes and all those Parnassian trifles, when I ought to be thinking of nothing but the account I am prepared to go and render to God. End quote. He died on the 13th of March, 1711, leaving nearly all he had to the poor. He was followed to the tomb by a great throng. Quote, he had many friends, was the remark amongst the people, and yet we are assured that he spoke evil of everybody. End quote. No writer ever contributed more than Boileau to the formation of poetry. No more correct or shrewd judgment ever assessed the merits of authors. No loftier spirit ever guided a stronger and a juster mind. Through all the vicissitudes undergone by literature, in spite of the sometimes excessive severity of his decrees, Boileau has left an ineffaceable impression upon the French language. His talent was less effective than his understanding. His judgment and his character have had more influence than his verses. Boileau had survived all his friends. La Fontaine, born in 1621 at Chateau Thierry, had died in 1695. He had entered in his youth the brotherhood of the oratory, which he had soon quitted, being unable, he used to say, to accustom himself to theology. He went and came between town and town, amusing himself everywhere and already writing a little. Quote, for me, the whole round world was laden with delights. My heart was touched by flower, sweet sound, and sunny day. I was the sot of friends and eke of Lady Gay. End quote. Fontaine was married without caring much for his wife, whom he left to live alone at Chateau Thierry. He was in great favor with Fouquet. When his patron was disgraced, in danger of his life, La Fontaine put into the mouth of the nymphs of Vaux his touching appeal to the king's clemency. Quote, May he then o'er the life of high-souled Henry Poor who with the power to take, for vengeance yearned no more. Oh, into Louis's soul this gentle spirit breathe. End quote. Later on, during Fouquet's imprisonment at Pignerol, La Fontaine wrote further, quote, I sigh to think upon the object of my prayers. You take my sense, Ariste. Your generous nature shares the plaints I make for him who so unkindly fares. He did displease the king, and lo, his friends were gone. Forthwith a thousand throats roared out at him like one. I wept for him despite the torrent of his foes. I taught the world to have some pity for his woes. End quote. La Fontaine has been described as a solitary being, without wit and without external charm of any kind. La Bruyere has said, quote, A certain man appears loutish, heavy, stupid. He can neither talk nor relate what he has just seen. He sets himself to writing, and it is a model of storytelling. He makes speakers of animals, trees, stones, everything that cannot speak. There is nothing but lightness and elegance, nothing but natural beauty and delicacy in his works. Quote, he says nothing or will talk of nothing but Plato, Racine's daughters used to say. All his contemporaries, however, of fashion and good breeding, did not form the same opinion of him. The dowager duchess of Orléans, Marguerite of Lorraine, had taken him as one of her gentlemen-in-waiting. The duchess of Bouillon had him in her retinue in the country. Madame de Montespan and her sister, Madame de Tiange, liked to have a visit from him. He lived at the house of Madame de la Sablière, a beauty and a wit, who received a great deal of company. He said of her, quote, Warm is her heart, and knit with tenderest ties to those she loves, and elsewise otherwise. 
for such a sprite whose birthplace is the skies of manly beauty blent with woman's grace no mortal pen though fain can fitly trace End quote. Quote, i have only kept by me she would say my three pets or animaux my dog my cat and la fontaine End quote. when she died Monsieur and Madame Dervas received into their house the now old and somewhat isolated poet. As Dervas was on his way to go and make the proposal to La Fontaine, he met him in the street. Quote, I was coming to ask you to put up at our house, said he. Quote, I was just going thither, answered Fontaine with the most touching confidence. There he remained to his death, contenting himself with going now and then to Chateau Thierry, as long as his wife lived, to sell, with her consent, some strip of ground. The property was going, old age was coming. Quote, John did no better than he had begun, spent property and income both as one, of treasure saw small use in any way, knew very well how to get through his day, split it in two, one part as he thought best, he passed in sleep, did nothing all the rest. End quote. He did not sleep, he dreamed. One day dinner was kept waiting for him. Quote, I have just come, said he as he entered, from the funeral of an aunt. I followed the procession to the cemetery, and I escorted the family home. End quote. It has been said that La Fontaine knew nothing of natural history. He knew and loved animals. Up to his time, fable writers had been merely philosophers or satirists. He was the first who was a poet, unique not only in France but in Europe, discovering the deep and secret charm of nature, animating it with his inexhaustible and graceful genius, giving lessons to men from the example of animals, without making the latter speak like man. Ever supple and natural, sometimes elegant and noble, with penetration beneath the cloak of his simplicity, inimitable in the line which he had chosen from taste, from instinct, and not from want of power to transport his genius elsewhither. He himself has said, quote, Yes, call me truly, if it must be said, Parnasian butterfly, and like the bees wherein old Plato found our similes. Light rover I, forever on the wing, flutter from flower to flower, from thing to thing, with much of pleasure mix a little fame. End quote and in psyche, quote, music and books, and junketings and love, and town and country, all to me is bliss. There nothing is that comes amiss, in melancholy's self-grim joy I prove, end quote. The grace, the naturalness, the original independence of the mind and the works of La Fontaine had not the luck to please Louis the Fourteenth, who never accorded him any favor, and La Fontaine did not ask for any, quote, all dumb I shrink once more within my shell, where unobtrusive pleasures dwell, True, I shall here by fortune be forgot, her favors with my verse agree not well, to importune the gods beseems me not. End quote. Once only, from the time of Fouquet's trial, the poet demanded a favor. Louis the Fourteenth, having misgivings about the propriety of the Comte of La Fontaine, had not yet given the assent required for his election to the French Academy when he set out for the campaign in Luxembourg. La Fontaine addressed to him a ballad. Quote, just as in Homer Jupiter we see alone or all the other gods prevail. You, one against a hundred though it be, balance all Europe in the other scale. Them like an eye to those who in the tale mountain on mountain piled, presumptuously warring with heaven and Jove. The earth clave he, and hurled them down beneath huge rocks to wail. So take you up your bolt with energy, a happy consummation cannot fail. Sweet thought that doth this month or two avail to somewhat soothe my muse's anxious care. For certain minds at certain stories rail, certain poor jests which naught but trifles are. If I with deference their lessons hail, what would they more? Be you more prone to spare, more kind than they, less sheathed in rigorous mail. Prince, in a word, your real self declare, a happy consummation cannot fail. End quote. The election of Boileau to the Academy appeased the king's humor, who preferred the other's intellect to that of La Fontaine. Quote, the choice you have made of Monsieur Despreaux is very gratifying to me, he said to the board of the Academy. It will be approved of by everybody. You can admit La Fontaine at once. He has promised to be good. End quote. It was a rash promise, which the poet did not always keep. The friends of La Fontaine had but lately wanted to reconcile him to his wife. They had with that view sent him to Chateau Thierry. He returned without having seen her whom he went to visit. Quote, My wife was not at home, said he. She had gone to the Sacrament, or Salut. End quote. He was becoming old. Those same faithful friends, Racine, Boileau, and Maucroix, were trying to bring him home to God. Racine took him to church with him. A testament was given him. Quote, that is a very good book, said he. I assure you it is a very good book. End quote. Then all at once addressing Abbe Boileau, quote, Doctor, do you think that St. Augustin was as clever as Rabelais? End quote. He was ill, however, and began to turn towards eternity his dreamy and erratic thoughts. 
he had set about composing pious hymns. Quote, the best of thy friends has not a fortnight to live, he wrote to Mocroy. For two months I have not been out, unless to go to the academy for amusement. Yesterday, as I was returning, I was seized in the middle of Rue du Chantre with a fit of such great weakness that I really thought I was dying. Oh, my dear friend, to die is nothing, but thinkest thou that I am about to appear before God? Thou knowest how I have lived. Before thou hast this letter, the gates of eternity will perchance be opened for me. End quote. Quote, he is as simple as a child, said the woman who took care of him in his last illness. If he has done amiss, it was from ignorance rather than wickedness. End quote. A charming and a curious being, serious and simple, profound and childlike, winning, by reason of his very vagaries, his good-natured originality, his helplessness in common life, La Fontaine knew how to estimate the literary merits as well as the moral qualities of his illustrious friends. Quote, when they happened to be together, says he in his tale of Psyche, and had talked to their hearts content of their diversions, if they chanced to stumble upon any point of science or literature, they profited by the occasion, without, however, lingering too long over one and the same subject, but flitting from one topic to another, like bees that meet as they go with different sorts of flowers. Envy, malignity, or cabal had no voice amongst them. They adored the works of the ancients, refused not the moderns the praises which were their due, spoke of their own with modesty, and gave one another honest advice when any one of them fell ill of the malady of the age and wrote a book, which happened now and then. In this case, Acanthus, or Racine, did not fail to propose a walk in some place outside the town, in order to hear the reading with less noise and more pleasure. He was extremely fond of gardens, flowers, foliage, Folifille, or La Fontaine, resembled him in this, but then Folifille might be said to love all things. Both of them were lyrically inclined, with this difference, that Acanthus was rather the more pathetic, Polyphile the more ornate, end quote. When La Fontaine died on the 13th of April, 1695, of the four friends lately assembled at Versailles to read the tale of Psyche, Molière alone had disappeared. La Fontaine had admired at Vaux the young comic poet, who had just written the Fâcheux for the entertainment given by Fouquet to Louis Fourteenth. Quote, it is a work by Molière. This writer, of a style so rare, is nowadays the court's delight. His fame, so rapid is its flight, beyond the bounds of Rome must be. Amen, for he's the man for me. End quote. In his old age he gave vent to his grief and his regret at Molière's death in this touching epitaph. Quote, Beneath this stone Plautus and Terence lie. Though lieth here but Molière alone, their threefold gifts of mind made up but one that witched all France with noble comedy. Now are they gone, and little hope have I that we again shall look upon the three dead men. Methinks, while countless years roll by, Terentius, Plautus, Moliere will be. End, quote. End of section 72. Section 73 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter 48. Louis XIV, Literature and Art, Part 8. Molière and French comedy had no need to take shelter beneath the mantle of the ancients. They, together, had shed upon the world incomparable luster. Shakespeare might dispute with Corneille and Racine the scepter of tragedy. He had succeeded in showing himself as full of power, with more truth as the one, and as full of tenderness with more profundity as the other. Molière is superior to him in originality, abundance, and perfection of characters. He yields to him neither in range, nor penetration, nor complete knowledge of human nature. The lives of these two great geniuses, authors and actors both together, present in other respects certain features of resemblance. Both were intended for another career than that of the stage. Both, carried away by an irresistible passion, assembled about them a few actors, leading at first a roving life, to end by becoming the delight of the court and of the world. John Baptist Poquelin, who before long assumed the name of Molière, was born at Paris in 1622. His father, upholstery groom of the chamber, or valet de chambre tapissier, to Louis XIV, had him educated with some care at Clermont, afterwards Louis Le Grand College, then in the hands of the Jesuits. He attended, by favor, the lessons which the philosopher Gassendi, for a long time the opponent of Descartes, gave young Chapelle. He imbibed at these lessons, together with a more extensive course of instruction, a certain freedom of thinking which frequently cropped out in his plays, and contributed later on to bring upon him an accusation of irreligion. In 1645, or possibly 1643, Molière had formed with the ambitious title of Illustré Théâtre a small company of actors who, being unable to maintain themselves at Paris, 
For a long while tramped the provinces through all the troubles of the Fronde. It was in 1653 that Molière brought out at Lyon his comedy Les Tourdis, the first regular piece he had ever composed. The Dépit Amoureux was played at Béziers in 1656, at the opening of the session of the States of Languedoc. The company returned to Paris in 1658. In 1659, Molière, who had obtained a license from the king, gave at his own theatre Les Précieuses Ridicules. He broke with all imitation of the Italians and the Spaniards, and taking off to the life the manners of his own times, he boldly attacked the affected exaggeration and absurd pretensions of the vulgar imitators of the Hôtel de Rambouillet. Quote, Bravo, Molière, cried an old man from the middle of the pit. This is real comedy. End quote. When he published his piece, Molière, anxious not to give umbrage to a powerful clique, took care to say in his preface that he was not attacking real précieuses, but only the bad imitations. Just as he had recalled Corneille to the stage, Fouquet was for protecting Molière upon it. The École des Mans and the Facheux were played at Vaux. Amongst the ridiculous characters in this latter, Molière had not described the huntsman. Louis the Fourteenth himself indicated to him the Marquis of Soyecourt. Quote, There's one you have forgotten, he said. Twenty-four hours later, the boar of a huntsman, with all his jargon of venery, had a place forever amongst the facheux of Molière. The École des Femmes, the Impromptu de Versailles, the Critique de l'École des Femmes, began a bellicose period in the great comic poet's life. Accused of impiety, attacked in the honour of his private life, Molière, returning insult for insult, delivered over those amongst his enemies who offered a butt for ridicule to the derision of the court and of posterity. The festin de Pierre and the signal punishment of the libertine, or free thinker, were intended to clear the author from the reproach of impiety. La princesse de Lide and l'amour médecin were but charming interludes in the great struggle henceforth instituted between reality and appearance. In 1666, Molière produced Le Misanthrope, a frank and noble spirit sublime invective against the frivolity, perfidious, and showy semblances of court. Quote, this misanthrope's despitefulness against bad verses was copied from me. Molière himself confessed as much to me many a time, wrote Boileau one day. The indignation of Alceste is deeper and more universal than that of Boileau against bad poets. He is disgusted with the court and the world because he is honest, virtuous, and sincere and sees corruption triumphant around him. He is wroth to feel the effects of it in his life, and almost in his soul. He is a victim to the eternal struggle between good and evil, without the strength and the unquenchable hope of Christianity. The misanthrope is a shriek of despair uttered by virtue, excited and almost distraught at the defeat she forebodes. The tartuffe was a new effort in the same direction, and bolder in that it attacked religious hypocrisy, and seemed to aim its blows even at religion itself. Molière was a long time working at it. The first acts had been played in 1664 at court under the title of L'Hypocrite, at the same time as La Princesse de Lide. Quote, the king, says the account of the entertainment in the Gazette de Lorraine, saw so much analogy of form between those whom true devotion sets in the way of heaven and those whom an empty ostentation of good deeds does not hinder from committing bad, that his extreme delicacy in respect of religious matters could with difficulty brook this resemblance of vice to virtue and though there might be no doubt of the author's good intentions he prohibited the playing of this comedy before the public until it should be quite finished and examined by persons qualified to judge of it so as not to let advantage be taken of it by others less capable of just discernment in the matter though played once publicly in sixteen sixty seven under the title of l'imposteur the piece did not appear definitively on the stage until sixteen sixty nine having undoubtedly excited more scandal by interdiction than it would have done by representation the king's good sense and judgment at last prevailed over the terrors of the truly devout and the resentment of hypocrites. He had just seen an impious piece of buffoonery played, quote, I should very much like to know, said he to the Prince of Condé, who stood up for Molière, an old fellow student of his brother's, the Prince of Conti's, why people who are so greatly scandalized at Molière's comedy say nothing about Scaramouche. Quote, the reason of that, answered the prince, is that Scaramouche makes fun of heaven and religion, about which those gentry do not care, and that Molière makes fun of their own selves, which they cannot brook. End quote. The prince might have added that all the blows in Tartuffe, a masterpiece of shrewdness, force, and fearless and deep wrath, struck home at hypocrisy. Whilst waiting for permission to have Tartuffe played, Molière had brought out Le Médecin Malgré Lui, L'Amphitryon, Georges Dandin, and Lavard lavishing freely upon them the inexhaustible resources of his genius, which was ever ready to supply the wants of kingly and princely entertainments. M. de Porsognac was played for the first time at Chambord on the 6th of October, 1669. 
a year afterwards, on the same stage, appeared Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme, with the interludes and music of Lully. The piece was a direct attack upon one of the most frequent absurdities of his day. Many of the courtiers felt in their hearts that they were attacked. There was a burst of wrath at the first representation, by which the king had not appeared to be struck. Molière thought it was all over with him. Louis the Fourteenth desired to see the piece a second time. Quote, "'You have never written anything yet which has amused me so much. Your comedy is excellent,' said he to the poet. The court was at once seized with a fit of admiration." The king had lavished his benefits upon Molière, who had an hereditary post near him as groom of the chamber. He had given him a pension of seven thousand livres, and the license of the king's theatre. He had been pleased to stand godfather to one of his children, to whom the Duchess of Orléans was godmother. He had protected him against the superciliousness of certain servants of his bedchamber, but all the monarch's puissance and constant favours could not obliterate public prejudice, and give the comedian whom they saw every day on the boards the position and rank which his genius deserved." Moliere's friends urged him to give up the stage. Quote, Your health is going, Boileau would say to him, because the duties of a comedian exhaust you. Why not give it up? Quote, Alas, replied Moliere with a sigh, it is a point of honor that prevents me. Quote, a what? rejoined Boileau. What? To smear your face with a moustache as Scannarel, and come on the stage to be thrashed with a stick. That is a pretty point of honor for a philosopher like you. End quote. Moliere might probably have followed the advice of Boileau, he might probably have listened to the silent warnings of his failing powers, if he had not been unfortunate and sad. Unhappy in his marriage, justly jealous and yet passionately fond of his wife, without any consolation within him against the bitternesses and vexations of his life, he sought in work and incessant activity the only distractions which had any charm for a high spirit, constantly wounded in its affections and its legitimate pride. Psyche, les fourberies de Scapin, la comtesse d'Escarbagnat, betrayed nothing of their author's increasing sadness or suffering. Les femmes savantes had at first but little success. The piece was considered heavy. The marvelous nicety of the portraits, the correctness of the judgments, the delicacy and elegance of the dialogue were not appreciated until later on. Molière had just composed Le Malade Imaginaire, the last of that succession of blows which he had so often dealt the doctors. He was more ailing than ever. His friends, even his actors themselves, pressed him not to have any play. Quote, what would you have me do? he replied. There are fifty poor workmen who have but their day's pay to live upon. What will they do if we have no play? I should reproach myself with having neglected to give them bread for one single day if I could really help it. End quote. Moliere had a bad voice, a disagreeable hiccough, and harsh inflections. Quote, he was nevertheless, say his contemporaries, a comedian from head to foot. He seemed to have several voices, everything about him spoke, and by a caper, by a smile, by a wink of the eye and a shake of the head, he conveyed more than the greatest speaker could have done by talking in an hour. End quote. He played as usual on the 17th of February, 1673. The curtain had risen exactly at four o'clock. Molière could hardly stand, and he had a fit during the burlesque ceremony, at the end of the play, whilst pronouncing the word juro. He was icy cold when he went back to Baron's box, who was waiting for him, who saw him home to Rue Richelieu, and who at the same time sent for his wife and two sisters of charity. When he went up again with Madame Molière into the room, the great comedian was dead. He was only fifty-one. It has been a labor of love to go into some detail over the lives, works, and characters of the great writers during the age of Louis the Fourteenth. They did too much honor to their time and their country. They had too great and too deep an effect in France and in Europe upon the successive developments of the human intellect to refuse them an important place in the history of that France to whose influence and glory they so powerfully contributed. Molière did not belong to the French Academy. His profession had shut the doors against him. It was nearly a hundred years after his death, in 1778, that the Academy raised to him a bust beneath which was engraved, quote, Oh, his glory lacks not, ours did lack him, end quote. It was by instinct and of its own free choice that the French Academy had refused to elect a comedian. It had grown, and its liberty had increased under the sway of Louis XIV. In 1672, at the death of Chancellor Seguier, who had become its protector after Richelieu, quote, it was so honored that the king was graciously pleased to take upon himself this office. The body had gone to thank him. His majesty desired that the Dauphin should be witness of what passed on an occasion so honorable to literature. After the speech of M. Arlet, Archbishop of Paris, and the man in France with most inborn talent for speaking, the king, appearing somewhat touched, gave the academicians very great marks of esteem, inquired the names, one after another, of those whose faces were not familiar to him, who was there in his capacity of simple academician. You will let me know what I must do for these gentlemen. 
Perhaps M. Colbert, that minister who was so zealous for the fine arts, never received an order more in conformity with his own inclinations. End quote. From that time the French Academy held its sittings at the Louvre, and as regarded complimentary addresses to the king on state occasions, it took rank with the sovereign bodies. For thirty-five years the Academy had been working at its dictionnaire. From the first the work had appeared interminable. Quote, These six years past they toil at letter F, and I'd be much obliged if destiny would whisper to me, Thou shalt live to G, wrote Bois-Robert to Balzac. The Academy had entrusted Vaugelas with the preparatory labor. Quote, it was, says Pellisson, the only way of coming quickly to an end. End quote. A pension, which he had not been paid for a long time past, was revived in his favor. Vaugelas took his plan to Cardinal Richelieu. Quote, well, sir, said the minister, smiling with a somewhat contemptuous air of kindness, you will not forget the word pension in this dictionary. Quote, no, monseigneur, replied M. de Vaugelas, with a profound bow, and still less reconnaissance, or gratitude. End quote. Vaugelas had finished the first volume of his Remarques sur la langue française, which has ever since remained the basis of all works on grammar. Quote, he had imported into the body of the work a something or other so estimable, or d'honnête homme, and so much frankness that one could scarcely help loving its author. End quote. He was working at the second volume when he died in 1649, so poor that his creditors seized his papers, making it very difficult for the Academy to recover his memoir. The dictionary, having lost its principal author, went on so slowly that Colbert, curious to know whether the academicians honestly earned their modest medals for attendance, or jetons de présence, which he had assigned to them, came one day unexpectedly to a sitting. He was present at the whole discussion, quote, after which, having seen the attention and care which the Academy was bestowing upon the composition of its dictionary, he said, as he rose, that he was convinced that it could not get on any faster, and his evidence ought to be of so much more the weight and that never man in his position was more laborious or more diligent. End, quote. End of section 73. Section 74 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 48. Louis XIV, Literature and Art, Part 9. The academicians who were men of letters worked at the dictionary. The academicians who were men of fashion had become pretty numerous. Arnaud d'Andilly and M. de Lamoignon, whom the body had honoured by election, declined to join, and the Academy resolved to never elect anybody without a previously expressed desire and request. At the time when M. de Lamoignon declined, the kin, fearing that it might bring the Academy into some disfavour, procured the appointment in his stead of the coadjutor of Strasbourg, Armand de Rouen Subise, quote, Splendid as your triumph may be, wrote Boileau to M. de Lamoignon, I am persuaded, sir, from what I know of your noble and modest character, that you are very sorry to have caused this displeasure to a body which is after all very illustrious, and that you will attempt to make it manifest to all the earth. I am quite willing to believe that you had good reasons for acting as you have done. End quote. The Academy from that moment regarded the title it conferred as irrevocable. It did not fill up the place of the Abbé de Saint-Pierre when it found itself obliged to exclude him from its sittings by order of Louis XV. It did not fill up the place of Monseigneur dupin loup when he thought proper to send in his resignation. In spite of court intrigues, it from that moment maintained its independence and its dignity. Quote, Monsieur Despreaux, writes the banker Le Verrier to the Duke of Noailles, represented to the Academy with a great deal of heat that all was rack and ruin, since it was nothing more but a cabal of women that put academicians in the place of those who died. Then he read out loud some verses by Monsieur de saint Hilaire. Thus M. Despreaux, before the eyes of everybody, gave M. de saint Hilaire a black ball, and nominated, all by himself, M. de Mimure. Here, Monseigneur, is proof that there are Romans still in the world, and for the future I will trouble you to call M. Despreaux no longer your dear poet, but your dear Cato. With his extreme deafness, Boileau had great difficulty in fulfilling his academic duties. He was a member of the Academy of Medals and Inscriptions, founded by Colbert in 1662, quote, in order to render the acts of the king immortal by deciding the legends of the medals struck in his honor. Pontchartrain raised to forty the number of the members of the Petite Académie, extended its functions, and entrusted it thenceforth with the charge of publishing curious documents relating to the history of France. Quote, we had read to us today a very learned work, but rather tiresome, says Boileau to M. Pontchartrain, and we were bored right eruditely. But afterwards there was an examination of another which was much more agreeable, and the reading of which attracted considerable attention. 
As the reader was put quite close to me, I was in a position to hear and to speak of it. All I ask you to complete the measure of your kindnesses is to be kind enough to let everybody know that, if I am of so little use at the Academy of Medals, it is equally true that I do not, and do not wish to obtain, any pecuniary advantage from it." The Academy of Sciences had already for many years had sittings in one of the rooms of the King's Library. Like the French Academy, it had owed its origin to private meetings at which Descartes, Gassendi, and young Pascal were accustomed to be present. Quote, there are in the world scholars of two sorts, said a note sent to Colbert about the formation of the new academy. One give themselves up to science because it is a pleasure to them. They are content, as the fruit of their labors, with the knowledge they acquire, and if they are known, it is only amongst those with whom they converse unambitiously and for mutual instruction. These are bona fide scholars, whom it is impossible to do without in a design so great as that of the Académie Royale. There are others who cultivate science only as a field which is to give them sustenance, and as they see by experience that great rewards fall only to those who make the most noise in the world, they apply themselves especially not to making new discoveries, for hitherto that has not been recompensed, but to whatever may bring them into notice. These are scholars of the fashionable world, and such as one knows best. Colbert had the true scholar's taste. He had brought Cassini from Italy to take the direction of the new observatory. He had ordered surveys for a general map of France. He had founded the Journal des Savants, Literary men, whether Frenchmen or foreigners, enjoyed the king's bounties. Colbert had even conceived the plan of a universal academy, a veritable forerunner of the Institute. The arts were not forgotten in this grand project. The Academy of Painting and Sculpture dated from the Regency of Anne of Austria. The pretensions of the Masters of Arts, or Maître des Arts, who placed an interdict upon artists not belonging to their corporation, had driven Charles Lebrun, himself the son of a master, to agitate for its foundation. Colbert added to it the Academy of Music and the Academy of Architecture, and created the French School of Painting at Rome. Beside the palace, for a long time past dedicated to this establishment, lived for more than thirty-five years Le Poussin, the first and the greatest of all the painters of that French school which was beginning to spring up, whilst the Italian school, though blooming still in talent and strength, was forgetting more and more every day the nobleness, the purity, and the severity of taste which had carried to the highest pitch the art of the fifteenth century. The tradition of the masters in vogue in Italy, of the Caracci, of Guido, of Paul Veronese, had reached Paris with Simon Vouet, who had long lived at Rome. He was succeeded there by a Frenchman, quote, whom from his grave and thoughtful air you would have taken for a father of Sorbonne, says M. Vitet in his charming Vie de l'Estuar. Quote, his black eye beneath his thick eyebrow nevertheless flashed forth a glance full of poesy and youth. His manner of living was not less surprising than his personal appearance. He might be seen walking in the streets of Rome, tablets in hand, hitting off by a stroke or two of his pencil at one time the antique fragments he came upon, at another the gestures, the attitudes, the faces of the persons who presented themselves in his path. Sometimes in the morning he would sit on the terrace of Trinity del Monte, beside another Frenchman five or six years younger, but already known for rendering landscapes with such fidelity, such fresh and marvellous beauty, that all the Italian masters gave place to him, and that after two centuries he has not yet met his rival. Quote. Quote, of these two artists, the older evidently exercised over the other the superiority which genius has over talent. The smallest hints of Le Poussin were received by Claude Lorrain with deference and respect, and yet, to judge from the prices at which they severally sold their pictures, the landscape painter had for the time an indisputable superiority. Claude Gelet, called Lorrain, had fled when quite young from the shop of the confectioner with whom his parents had placed him. He had found means of getting to Rome. There he worked, there he lived, and there he died, returning but once to France, in the height of his renown, for just a few months, without even enriching his own land with any great number of his works. Nearly all of them remained on foreign soil. Le Poussin, born at Andelys in 1593, made his way with great difficulty to Italy. He was by that time thirty years old, and had no more desire than Claude to return to France, where painting was with difficulty beginning to obtain a standing. His reputation, however, had penetrated thither. King Louis XIII was growing weary of Simon Vouet's factitious luster. He wanted Le Poussin to go to Paris. The painter for a long while held out. The king insisted, quote, I shall go, said Le Poussin, like one sentence to be sawn in halves and severed in twain, end quote. He passed eighteen months in France, welcomed enthusiastically, lodged at the Tuileries, magnificently paid, but exposed to the jealousies of Simon Vouet and his pupils. Worried, thwarted, frozen to death by the hoar-frosts of Paris, he took the road back to Rome in November 1642, on the pretext of going to fetch his wife, and did not return any more. 
He had left in France some of his masterpieces, models of that new, independent and conscientious art, faithfully studied from nature in all its Italian grandeur and from the treasures of the antique. Quote, How did you arrive at such perfection? People would ask Le Poussin. Quote, By neglecting nothing, the painter would say. In the same way, Newton was soon to discover the great laws of the physical world, quote, by always thinking thereon, end quote. During Le Poussin's stay at Paris, he had taken as a pupil Eustache Le Sueur, who had been trained in the studio of Simon Vouet, but had been struck from the first with the incomparable genius and proud independence of the master sent to him by fate. Alone he had supported Le Poussin in his struggle against the envious. Alone he entered upon the road which revealed itself to him whilst he studied under Le Poussin. He was poor. He had great difficulty in managing to live. The delicacy, the purity, the suavity of his genius could shine forth in their entirety nowhere but in the convent of the Carthusians, whose cloister he was commissioned to decorate. There he painted the life of St. Bruno, breathing into this almost mystical work all the religious poetry of his soul and of his talent, ever delicate and chaste even in the allegorical figures of mythology with which he before long adorned the Hôtel Lambert. He had returned to his favorite pursuits, embellishing the churches of Paris with incomparable works, when overwhelmed by the loss of his wife, and exhausted by the painful efforts of his genius, he died at thirty-seven, in that convent of the Carthusians which he glorified with his talent, at the same time that he edified the monks with his religious zeal. Le Sueur succumbed in a struggle too rude and too rough for his pure and delicate nature. Le Brun had returned from that Italy which Le Sueur had never been able to reach. The old rivalry, fostered in the studio of Simon Vouet, was already being renewed between the two artists. The angelic art gave place to the worldly and the earthly. Le Sueur died. Le Brun found himself master of the position, assured by anticipation, and as it were by instinct, of sovereign dominion under the sway of the young king for whom he had been created. Old Philip of Champagne alone might have disputed with him the foremost rank. He had passionately admired Le Poussin. He had attached himself to Le Sueur. Quote, Never, says M. Vitet, had he sacrificed to fashion. Never had he fallen into the vagaries of the degenerate Italian style. End quote. This upright, simple, painstaking soul, this inflexible conscience, looking continually into the human face, had preserved in his admirable portraits the life and the expression of nature which he was incessantly trying to seize and reproduce. Le Brun was preferred to him as the first painter to the king by Louis the Fourteenth himself. Philip of Champagne was delighted thereat. He lived in retirement in fidelity to his friends of Port Royal, whose austere and vigorous lineaments he loved to trace, beginning with Monsieur de saint Cyran and ending with his own daughter, Sister Suzanne, who was restored to health by the prayers of Mother Agnes Arnaud. Le Brun was as able a courtier as he was a good painter. The clever arrangement of his pictures, the richness and brilliancy of his talent, his faculty for applying art to industry, secured him with Louis Fourteenth a sway which lasted as long as his life. He was first painter to the king. He was director of the Gobelin and of the Academy of Painting. Quote, he let nothing be done by the other artists but according to his own designs and suggestions. The worker in tapestry, the decorative painter, the statuary, the goldsmith, took their models from him. All came from him, all flowed from his brain, all bore his imprint. End quote. The painter followed the king's ideas, being entirely after his own heart. For fourteen years he worked for Louis the Fourteenth, representing his life and his conquests at Versailles, painting for the Louvre the victories of Alexander, which were engraved almost immediately by Audrin and Edelink. He was jealous of the royal favor, sensitive and haughty towards artists, honestly concerned for the king's glory and for the tasks confided to himself. The growing reputation of Mignard, whom Louvois had brought back from Rome, troubled and disquieted Lebrun. In vain did the king encourage him. Le Brun, already ill, said in the presence of Louis XIV that fine pictures seemed to become finer after the painter's death. Quote, Do not you be in a hurry to die, Monsieur Le Brun, said the king. We esteem your pictures now quite as highly as posterity can. End quote. The small gallery at Versailles had been entrusted to Mignard. Le Brun withdrew to Montmorency, where he died in 1690, jealous of Mignard at the end as he had been of Le Soir at the outset of his life. Mignard became first painter to the king. He painted the ceiling of Val de Grasse, which was celebrated by Molière, but it was as a painter of portraits that he excelled in France. Quote, Monsieur Mignard does them best, said Le Poussin not long before, with lofty good nature, though his heads are all paint, without force or character. End quote. To Mignard succeeded Rigaud as portrait painter, worthy to preserve the features of Bossuet and Fenelon. 
the unity of organization, the brilliancy of style, the imposing majesty which the king's taste had everywhere stamped about him upon art as well as upon literature, were by this time beginning to decay simultaneously with the old age of Louis Fourteenth, with the reverses of his arms and the increasing gloominess of his court. The artists who had illustrated his reign were dying one after another, as well as the orators and the poets. The sculptor James Sarrazin had been gone some time. Puget and the Anguier were dead, as well as Mansart, Perrault, and Le Notre. Girardon had but a few months to live. Only Coisevaux was destined to survive the king, whose statue he had many a time moulded. The great age was disappearing slowly and sadly, throwing out to the last some noble gleams, like the aged king who had constantly served as its centre and guide, like olden France, which he had crowned with its last and its most splendid wreath. End of section 74. End of chapter 48. End of a popular history of France from the earliest times, volume 5, by François Guizot.